Cremel Hair Tonic and Cremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> Well, once again, it's Monday night, and time to call on our good friend and host, Dr. Watson. I'm sure he's waiting for us in his study, so let's join him, shall we? Good evening, Dr. Watson. Oh, there you are, Mr. Bell. I was just having a glass of extremely mellow port. Perhaps you'd care to join me. Thank you, Dr. Watson. You're always the perfect host, just as you are the perfect storyteller. Oh, you flatter me, my boy, though I must confess that the ingredients which make up tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure are so strangely assorted that even an old gentleman like myself can hardly fail to make it an exciting yarn. And just what are the ingredients in tonight's story, Dr. Watson? Well, let me see. Take an almost deserted island set deep in a Scottish lock. Sprinkle it generously with the following assorted selections of humanity. One measure of evil scientist. A faint wisp of human skeleton. A considerable pinch of fat lady. A handful of professional contortionist. And a dash of midget. Agitate these ingredients well, then add to the mixture a detective by the name of Sherlock Holmes and a certain doctor by the name of Watson. <laughs> Season generously with fear, danger, and sudden death. And you have the recipe for the story I call The Island of Death. Dr. Watson, you're, you're beginning to make the hackles rise in the back of my neck. Indeed, then, since hackle means hair, I think perhaps you'd better have your word with our listeners before I begin my story. Yes, I will. Men, if you want to be a success in life, if you want to look like a success in life, remember that well-groomed hair means a lot to a man's appearance. I've heard so many men complain lately that the hairdressing they use is too greasy or too highly perfumed, that it leaves a sticky and flaky residue on the hair. That's why I urge you to try Kreml hair tonic. This highly specialized hair tonic has just enough light oil to keep hair handsomely groomed, every hair in place, with a rich, healthy-looking luster. And it gives hair such a natural, well-groomed appearance. Yet Kreml never leaves hair looking or feeling greasy or sticky. This is because Kreml contains a special combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. After you apply Kreml, just run your hand over your hair. Notice how delightfully clean your hair feels. So tempting for the ladies to touch. Notice how no greasy film comes off on your hand or hat band. Kreml always gives hair such a handsome, clean-cut look. As if you just combed it. And it keeps it that way all day long. K-R-E-M-L, Kreml Hair Tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, how about the new Sherlock Holmes story, The Island of Death? Well, Mr. Bell, as I told you, most of that exciting adventure took place on a tiny island in the Scottish Lake District. However, it began innocuously enough, as so many of our adventures began, in our rooms at Baker Street. It was on a stormy September evening, and Holmes and I were seated on either side of our fireplace. I remember after dinner that he began to analyze the old cliché that truth is indeed stranger than fiction. I can almost hear him now, as he said... My dear Watson, the true picture of the criminal world is stranger than anything which the mind of man could invent. Oh, I'm not sure that I agree with you, Holmes. The police reports and the papers are usually quite undistinguished and dull. True, old chap. But that's the fault of the reporters. Depend upon it, Watson, there's nothing so unnatural as the commonplace. Oh, let's put it to a practical test. I pick up the evening paper. Uh, here is the first heading upon which I come. A husband's cruelty to his wife. Now, there's uh, half a column of print, and I bet you that without reading it, I can tell you the gist of the trouble. I accept your bet, Watson. Give me your deduction. Oh, it's not very hard. There is, of course, the other woman. The extra drink, the push, the blow, the bruise, and the sympathetic sister, or landlady. The crudest of writers could invent nothing more crude. <laughs> your example is an unfortunate one for your argument, old fellow. I'm very fortunate, old The old article old. to which you refer is the Dundas separation case. Hmm? The husband was a teetotaler. There was no other woman, and the conduct complained of was that he had drifted into the unfortunate habit of winding up every meal by taking out his false teeth and hurling them at his wife. An action which I think you will agree is uh, not likely to occur to the imagination of the average storyteller. Hurling false teeth? Oh, absolutely fantastic. Quite. Uh, what else can that be? You expecting a visitor? Yes, Watson, I am. And he might well prove a client who will point out the moral of our little discussion. Oh, what makes you say that? The gentleman calling on me is a distinctly colorful personality by the name of Stephen Singer. He's nearly seven feet tall, and yet he weighs under eight stone. 
Uh, card uh, from him this morning inform me of his intention of calling here at 7 o'clock tonight. You said that he weighs under eight stone. That's only 130 pounds. He must be a human skeleton. That was the unfortunate title applied to him at the circus sideshow at which I first met him. It's got circus freaks here in Baker Street. Huh. I'll have seen everything. Freak is an unkind and inappropriate word, Watson. Stephen Singer is a fellow human being, and a more than usually, unusually worthy one. In the case of the Bagshot Circus murders, he was good enough to take advantage of his uh, almost unique physical proportion and oblige me by hiding in the barrel of a circus cannon. His evidence was instrumental in sending a diabolical murderer to the gallows. Uh, let him in, will you, Watson? Yes, yeah, of course. Good evening, Mr. Singer. Come along in, won't you? It's all right, thank you, Mrs. Hudson. It's good to see you again, Stephen. Hello, Mr. Holmes. Don't want to make a nuisance of myself, but I did have a little problem, and I thought perhaps you'd help me with it. Of course, Stephen. Sit down, won't you? By the way, this is my colleague, Dr. Watson. How do you do, Doctor? How do you do, Mr. Singer? My friend was just telling me that you once held him, helped him in a, in a murder case. Oh, that. To hurt nothing. Just slipped myself into the cannon barrel and heard one or two things I wasn't meant to. <laughs> Nevertheless, your help was invaluable, Stephen. I shall be only too happy to do what I can to repay the favor. What's your problem? Well, uh, perhaps I'm imagining things and perhaps I'm not. But wouldn't you say it was a rum thing if a professor offered me and three of my pals from the circus 50 quid apiece to go to some island in Scotland for a week? Yes, indeed. I should say that uh, that's extremely odd. Can you give me a few more facts? Well, Mr. Holmes, this professor come to the circus three nights ago when we was playing at Stafford at a bow. Hmm. What was his name? Uh, professor McElwraith. Funny-looking cove with a bushy red beard he was. Indeed. I've heard of the gentleman. I understand that he is something of a rebel in the medical profession. He returned from Vienna recently where he's been studying under Dr. Freud. Dr. Freud? Never heard of him. You will, Watson, you will. Mm -hmm. He devotes himself to the psychological aspects of the human body. Pray continue with your story, Stephen. Well, Mr. Holmes, he approached me and three of my pals. And uh, who are those uh, pals? Well, there was Bill Carew... The major we call him, he's a midget. And there was Belle Brackett, the fat lady. And the third was a bloke who joined the circus two days ago. Jeff Walton is his name. I haven't seen his act, but he builds himself as the injured rubber man. Oh, uh, Professor promised us 50 quid apiece our tickets on the Scotch Express tomorrow morning and told us he'd have a boat waiting to ferry us out to his island when we got there. Holmes, there's something devilish going on here. Professor who studies psychology wants four people to go to a lonely island. A midget, a contortionist, a fat lady, and the fourth... Oh, oh. oh that's all right. I'm used to it, Doctor. The force of human skeleton. Oh, I wouldn't say that. That's what you were going to say. Now, we all agreed to go up there. Uh, we didn't like the bloke, but none of us can turn down 50 quid. Mm, but we got to talking after he'd gone. Supposing he's up to doing us a bit of no good. And anyway, he made us sign that paper. Paper? What paper? I don't remember it too well, Mr. Holmes, but it did say that if anything was to happen to us, the professor wasn't responsible. That's what started us to talking and worrying after he'd gone. And that's why I've come to you. I'm glad that you did, Stephen. Did you inform your friends of your decision to come to see me? See me? Uh, no, Mr. Holmes, I didn't. I might have done it if I'd have been sure you wouldn't have laughed at me. I'm convinced that this is no laughing matter, Stephen. Unless I'm much mistaken, there's devil's work afoot. And then you'll come up there with us, Mr. Holmes? Yes. Tomorrow morning, Dr. Watson and I will meet you in Scotland. <laughs> The lake looks extremely choppy, Holmes. The boat's quite small. I hope it's not too far to the island. I'm a wretched sailor, you know. I'm sure it'll be a smooth trip, Watson. Well, I certainly hope so. Hello. Here comes Singer with the other three. Great Scott. What strange-looking traveling companions. Well, since they traveled on an earlier train, I think it's time to have Stephen introduce us. Hello, Stephen. Hello, Mr. Holmes. I'd like you to meet some pals of mine. Uh, Dr. Watson, Mr. Holmes... This is Miss Belle Brackett. What? Be careful, Belle, watch your step on the gangplank. <laughs> well, dearie, got to be a strong plank to hold me up. How are you, Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson? How do you do? How do, you do? Uh, Thank you. This is Bert Olney. Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson. How do you do, sir? Don't know what you do on the pill, Governors. 
but I can kick the back of my head with both feet at once. Oh, really? Very useful, I should imagine. Providing you're not standing up. What's your act, gentlemen? Act? Well, we haven't exactly got an act. Just regard us as friends of Stephen's. We thought a little trip to the Highlands might do us good. Huh. It'll do me 50 pounds worth of good. That's all I know. Put 50 more pounds on me, dearie, and I'd explode. And this is Bill Carew, the major, we call him. And Dr. Watson, and Mr. Sherlock Holmes. How do you do, Mr. Holmes? gentlemen, I do hope this isn't going to be a long journey. I'm really rather a poor sailor. Well, I just said the same thing myself, Mr. Carew. Oh, call me major. Everyone calls me major. I suppose it's incongruous when you consider that I'm only four foot three, but I do like, like the nickname. Have a cigar. Cigar? Oh, no, thank you, Rose. Well, Major. we're all aboard, Mr. Holmes. Might as well get going, I suppose. Why not, Stephen? All right, Captain. We're all here. You may as well get started. Dr. Watson. Uh, yes, Mr. Alder? Do me a favor, will you? Give us a scratch between the shoulder blades. Give you a what? A scratch between the shoulder blades. Oh, that's, oh, that's it. As soon as we crossed the border, these Scots police started to bite on me. Thank you kindly. A starlit night, Watson, and a spanking breeze. I wonder what adventure lies in store for us. I have a feeling that Professor McElwraith may not be too glad to see us. Why do you come here, Holmes? I know who you are and what you do. Why are you so interested in my obscure experiments? For two reasons, Professor McElwraith. First, Stephen Singer is a friend of mine, and second, I have an insatiable curiosity, particularly for experiments that require obscurity. I want to know why a student of psychology wishes to isolate four malformed humans on a lonely island. All right, stay. Stay into the devil with your boat. You can't leave this island until I give the word, my inquisitive friends. Quiet! Quiet! Now, four of you and my employees for the next few days. Two of you, Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson, are uninvited guests. Professional meddlers, as they assured me. And I've no reason to doubt that assurance. <laughs> Holmes, the man's as mad as a hat and quiet, Watson. Uh, since you're all to be on my island during my experiments... I should like you to study this map and acquaint yourself with the place. Here you'll see are the guest houses, all interconnected by telephones. And I've installed the very latest form of that admirable new device. Now, down this path lies the snake house. Snakes? I can't bear snakes. It may not be necessary for you to meet them, Miss Brackett. Of course, I do use them in my experiments. Oh! Now, this path over here leads to the haunted watchtower. An interesting edifice, as you will discover. Seven enemies of James VI met a most peculiar death there. <laughs> You'll find that they continue to meet that death quite regularly. Look here, Professor. I don't like the sound of these. Nor do I. You tell us what these experiments are that you keep talking about. With yes. pleasure. Tell us. I've long known that the malformation of the body, of uh, freaks, if you'll forgive the expression, as caused by glandular deficiencies and imbalances. My studies have convinced me that these same glandular defects produce psychological alterations. For instance, you, Miss Bartlett, weigh four times as much as you, Mr. Singer. It'll be interesting to see how differently each of you reacts to the same stimuli. What do you think we are, guinea pigs? Well, you talk of applying different stimuli to these people, Professor McElwraith. What kind of stimuli do you intend to apply, may I ask? Every stimulus that the many resources of this island will enable me to apply. Fear, hunger, desire, envy, hatred. It should prove most illuminating. Most illuminating. I won't stand for it. We're human beings, not a bunch of animals. That's right. Let's go out. Larry, you're right, Belle. Of course he is. The bloke's barmy. Let's get on the boat and go back. I quite agree with you, sir. You're com Absolutely inhuman, Professor. Mind your own business, you meddling fool. I paid these people to come here, and they're going to stay. You and your friend are more than welcome to leave, however. No, Professor. I shall make myself personally responsible for seeing that these good people return to the mainland tonight. Oh. That's right, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Indeed. Then you must be an extremely strong swimmer, Mr. Holmes. What do you mean? The boat left this island an hour ago. It'll not return for five days. You fools! You grotesque idiots! You're trapped! So 
the good of your quarters, all of you. Go on. And don't be surprised if I begin my experiments before the night is over. Well, Holmes, if we are marooned on an island with a madman and four members of a circus, I suppose we might as well make the best of it. Oh, dear. I think I'll turn in. What the devil's that? The telephone. Wretched instrument. Just a passing fad. I'll never catch on. You mark my words. Yes, what is it? Mr. Holmes, are you in your cottage? Since I'm obviously at the other end of this wire, yes. Dr. Watson, is he with you? Yes, why? I'm worried, Holmes. A few moments ago, I caught the glimpse of a figure standing near my library window. I'm speaking from there now. I thought it might be you or Dr. Watson. But if it isn't, I'm afraid... And well, you might be, if only of your own conscience. I'm afraid of them, the freaks. They're so angry. They might well... I'd hardly blame them. If you're frightened for your safety, the best thing to do is to let us all leave here at once. Are you sure it's impossible to summon the boat before five days are gone? Well, no, I did lie about that. I could give a signal in the morning by hoisting a flag on the watchtower. Just a moment. That was a stone dust against my window. I'll be back, Holmes. Don't hang up. What does that devil want, Holmes? Sounds distinctly subdued. He's frightened, Watson. He says there's someone lurking outside his window. Holmes, are you still there? Yes, Professor. What's wrong? That, that figure just standing in the shadows. I can see it from where I'm talking. I can't see the face, but it's... Holmes, it's raising its arm. It's got it. Oh. I'm afraid it's murder, Watson. Quick, we must get over to the big house as fast as we can. In just a moment, we'll find out just what happened to Professor McElrath. Every man who takes pride in his appearance should know that handsome, healthy-looking hair needs a hygienic scalp. And when you buy a hair tonic, be sure to get your money's worth. Be sure that you enjoy the extra advantages of Kreml hair tonic. This highly specialized hair tonic contains an amazing combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. Kreml keeps dry, stubborn hair neatly in place all day. And it always gives hair such a natural, well-groomed appearance. Never sticky or greasy. But men, Kreml does lots more than keep hair looking handsome. Kreml leaves your scalp feeling so alive. At the same time, it removes dandruff flakes. And it's simply great to lubricate a dry scalp. And if you, like so many men, have hair so dry it breaks off and falls when you comb it, Kreml actually helps condition the hair in that it makes it feel softer and more pliable. So men, buy a bottle of Kreml at any drug counter. Ask for an application at your barber shop. Let Kreml help keep your scalp hygienic. Your hair always looking its very best. K-R-E-M-L. Kreml hair tonic. Well, Dr. Watson, when you got over to the big house, did you find Professor McElwraith was dead? Yes, Mr. Bell. A quick examination of his crumpled body told me that he was beyond mortal aid. Holmes lost no time in examining that room of death. This crime isn't very hard to reconstruct, Watson. The dead man was standing here as he spoke his last words to me on this telephone. Yes, and the window is beside the instrument. The glass in one pane is shattered. Yes, at a height of approximately five feet. Oh, the professor was shot in the temple. He was about six feet tall. The line from his wound through the broken pane would indicate that the killer stood out there in the rose garden. Watch up, Mr. Holmes. Yes, we heard a shot. Anyone get a theory? Yes, I'm afraid they did. Professor McElrath has just been murdered. Murdered? Well, can't say I'm sorry. Perhaps not, Major. But the fact remains that his killer must be brought to justice. By the way, only three of you are here. Yes, where's Bert Alner, the contortionist? I don't know. He went straight to his cottage when we got back from the big house. Uh, that's the last I saw of him. You know, it's a funny thing. I was only half awake, Mr. Holmes, but I thought I heard two shots, uh, about five minutes apart. Two shots? And Bert Alner has not appeared? We must go over to his cottage at once. <laughs> Is he hurt bad, Dr. Watson? No, a flesh wound in the back. He was lucky. Curious. Observe the revolver lying on the floor beside him. 
The same caliber as the one used to kill the professor. Ah, see what Bert's done, Mr. Holmes. He killed the professor to save us all. That's right, Stephen. And then he tried to kill himself because he knew you'd catch him, Mr. Holmes. That's the way it must have been. Oh, he was a brave man. An interesting theory. Yes, but only a theory. Look at the position of the wound. I'll stake my medical reputation that it couldn't possibly have been self-inflicted. Holmes, this has been an attempt at another murder. More coffee, Watson? No, thank you, Holmes. I've drunk a blasted gallon and I'm still sleepy. And I've smoked almost the entire <sighs> supply of tobacco I brought on this trip, and I'm still very wide awake. I asked questions until well after midnight. And what did I learn? That the servants all alibi each other. Precisely. And... and that of our party of four, no one is able to provide an alibi for the other. So that it must be one of them. As ill-assorted a group of suspects as we ever met. Yes. It's a strange business. Why the attack on Olney? The professor, yes, that's quite understandable. But why Olney? What singled him out from the others? Well, I don't know. He's a contortionist, but he's perfectly normal-looking. He, he doesn't seem like a freak. Of course. That's it. Thank you, Watson. You've given me the other end of the thread. Oh, have I? Round up the others and bring them to the haunted tower. The dawn is beginning to break, but before we hang that signal for rescue, I shall find the answer to this bizarre problem. Before we fix this signal flag, ladies and gentlemen, I wish to warn you that as soon as we reach land, I shall turn Professor McElwraith's murderer over to the authorities. Let it go, Mr. Holmes. Whoever it was did us all a good turn. Let's forget it. I'm afraid that murder is not a matter to be forgotten, Major. But surely you haven't forgotten the attempt on your own life, Mr. Olney. I feel nearly as good as new, Governor. I think the Major's right. Let's forget it. No, Mr. Olney. Not even on your request. Because the whole case centers around you. Who? Me? Last night, while the murderer was standing outside his window, the professor telephoned me. He wanted to know if both Dr. Watson and I were in our cottage. The implication is obvious. You mean that the mysterious figure he'd seen resembled us in Bill? Precisely, Watson. Now, Mr. Singer's nearly seven feet tall. You, Miss Brackett, if you'll forgive me, could hardly be mistaken for us. You said it, dear. Well, no, because the Major, he told us that he's only four foot three. It must have been you, Mr. Olney. But I got shot, too. And you said when you examined me that it was impossible. I could have done it. <sighs> Medically impossible for a normal man, but I'd forgotten your profession. You're a contortionist. You could easily have shot yourself at, at, at such an angle. What do you have to say, Mr. Olney? That I, uh... Why not admit the truth? You're not a contortionist, are you? No, Mr. Holmes, I'm not. You see, my, my twin brother got the bid for this here job, but he had another engagement. And since the professor was so particular about the date, my brother told me to come here and we'd split the fee. But how did you know that he wasn't a contortionist, Holmes? You should remember, Watson. Huh? When we first saw him on the boat, he complained of the Scottish fleas and asked you to scratch between his shoulders. So he did, yes. A real contortionist would not have needed your assistance. So your medical verdict still holds good, Watson. Olney could not have shot himself. But you ruled the rest of us out, Mr. Holmes. Not quite, Stephen. The simplest answer is that the mysterious figure that the professor described was disguised. Disguised? That theory would be confirmed by the fact that the killer, when he was in the garden, saw the professor standing at the telephone and deliberately attracted his attention by throwing a pebble at the window. Look here, Mr. Holmes. The sun's well up. I'm tired of all this theory stuff. I'm going to hang the flag on the tower. Very well, Major. But, Mr. Holmes, don't keep us on edge like this. Yes, dearie. You said someone disguised themselves. Now, who was it? Well, surely the answer's apparent. Not to me, it ain't. Could you, Miss Brackett, have reduced your excessive weight to appear the size of a normal man? No. Nor could you, Stephen, have decreased your excessive height. But the Major could have made himself appear taller with improvised stilts. And the Major's the only possibly gil guilty party. The Major? Well, I mean, it's hard to believe he'd done it. Well, even if he did, I still don't think we ought to turn him in, Mr. Holmes. Oh, no. Remember, he did it for us, dear. Well, he didn't really hurt me when he took that shot at me. But that's just it, Olney. I might have been tempted if it were only the professor's murder. 
But he deliberately tried not to murder you, Mr. Olney, but to make it appear that you had killed the professor. But if he's arrested, there'll be a trial, dearie. And if there's a trial, you know how it'll be. They'll make out it was all because he's a freak. It'll be, it'll be harder than ever for people to accept us just as, uh, as people. The bell's right, Mr. Holmes. It'd be bad for all of us. I think the Major has thought of that possibility. Look at him up there on the tower. He's hoisted the flag. Huh? He... Now he's teetering on, on the edge of the parapet. He's going to... Major! Major! Slimy! He jumped! Must be a couple of hundred feet down there. He doesn't have a chance. Ah, oh, the poor Major! He done it for us! Come on, oh, Belle. I'll take you back to the cottage. Major. I suggest we all return to our quarters and pack. This unhappy tragedy has reached its final conclusion. What a shocking business. You're right, Dr. Watson. When I came to you in Baker Street, I never dreamed it would end up like this. One thing I'd like to say, Mr. Holmes. Yes, Stephen? I, I want to thank you, uh, not just for solving the case, but because you treated all of us not as freaks, but as ordinary human beings. Makes a big difference, you know. I know of only one way to treat people, Stephen, and that is as each person deserves to be treated. If Professor McElwraith had only realized that truth, he would not have paid with his life. <laughs> When you girls go out on an important date, you naturally want your hair to appear just as beautiful and lustrous as it can be. So here's a tip from some of the world's most divinely beautiful girls, Powers Models. Girls who are famous for their enchantingly lovely silken sheen hair. We glamour bathe our hair with cremel shampoo. And I want to state that no other shampoo leaves the hair more sparkling clean. Really, girls... You'll be amazed how cremel shampoo brings out all your hair's natural gleaming luster. It leaves hair shimmering with brilliant highlights that last for days. Cremel shampoo is not a cream shampoo, not a soapless shampoo, not a drying detergent. After a cremel shampoo, the hair fairly radiates natural glossy highlights. Cremel shampoo even has a built-in oil base, which actually helps keep the hair from becoming dry or brittle. How right you are, Mr. Bell. Cremel shampoo leaves the hair so much softer, silkier, with satin smoothness. The hair holds a wave better, too. So, ladies, buy a bottle of cremel shampoo at any drug counter. See how easy it is to have naturally lustrous hair and a vision of shining beauty. K-R-E-M-L, cremel shampoo. Now, Dr. Watson, what about next week? Well, I'll never see it next week. Well, now... Next week, I think I'll tell you uh, about another of our encounters with the infamous Professor Moriarty and how Holmes deduced that an apparently unimportant robbery in a Sussex vicarage was in reality part of a plot that threatened the safety of all England. I call it the strange adventure of the pointless robbery. <laughs> Tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, A Case of Identity. Nigel Bruce appeared through the courtesy of California Pictures. Tom Conway through the permission of Eagle Lion Pictures. The Sherlock Holmes series is produced by Tom McKnight, with original music composed and conducted by Alex Steinert. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Kreml Hair Tonic and Kreml Shampoo, and inviting you to be with us next week at this same time when Dr. Watson will tell us about the strange adventure of the pointless robbery. America is strong only if her school system is strong. Today it's overcrowded and inadequate. So support your parent-teachers association... Do all you can to improve conditions in America's schools. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.
Cremel Hair Tonic and Cremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. Starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. And now for that pleasant moment when we pay our weekly visit to Sherlock Holmes' celebrated friend, the eminent Dr. John H. Watson. Good evening, Mr. Bell. Come in and sit down. Oh, I thought you might have forgotten your date, Dr. Watson, when I saw that your door was closed. <laughs> Not at all, my dear fellow. Rather the opposite. I'm afraid I neglected to keep an eye on the time. I was so deeply engrossed in searching through my files. With satisfactory results, I trust? Well, I hope you will find them so. You may remember after I told you the story of the lion's mane the week before last that you asked if Holmes had any other adventures in his beekeeping days. I do indeed, Dr. Watson. Well, I've been running through my notes concerning the remarkable affair of the pointless robbery. And I think you'll find it thrilling enough to keep you on the edge of your chair. I'm sure we all will, Dr. Watson. But first, men, I'm sure you'll be interested to hear why Kremel hair tonic is preferred among America's most prosperous and successful men. Kremel keeps hair handsomely groomed from morning until night just the way you combed it in the morning. Cremel contains a special combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. This wonderful, natural-looking hairdressing has just enough light oil to keep hair perfectly groomed with an attractive, healthy-looking luster. Yet Cremel never leaves the hair looking or feeling greasy or sticky. Cremel always looks and feels so clean on both hair and scalp. Be sure to try it, men. K-R-E-M-L, Cremel Hair Tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, what's the story of the pointless robbery? Well, it all began, Mr. Bell, on a delightful summer morning in August 1913. I was spending the first day of a week's holiday visiting Holmes at the small farm on the South Downs to which he'd retired and where he was devoting himself to nothing more serious than the raising of bees. (coughs) I must say, Holmes, that the quality of breakfast here convinces me that I've discovered the real reason... For your devotion to rustic life. A very sound deduction, Watson. And there's much to be said for the peaceful atmosphere of the countryside after the noisy hubbub of London. A peace which I fear may be only too transient, Watson. I suggest that you omit reading the morning paper during uh, your stay. All that talk of war in Europe, you mean? Nonsense, Holmes. In this year of our Lord, 1913, no civilized nation would dream of resorting to the outmoded fallacies of armed force. I trust you're right, Watson. I trust you're right. But, uh... Uh, I say, Holmes, you, you've got a visitor. Somebody's coming up the path. It's Mr. Kenmore, the rector of our local church. Another donation is indicated, no doubt. It would take the national budget to keep the church's ancient organ in good repair. Be a good fellow, Watson, and open the door while I refill the tea uh, pot. That you are, Holmes. Good morning, Mr. Holmes. Good morning, Mr. Kenmore. This is my good friend, Dr. Watson. How, How do you do, do sir? A cup of tea? Uh, no, 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 thank you. No tea. And I must apologize for this unwarranted intrusion at such an early hour. Some pressing matter in connection with the church? Uh, no, Mr. Holmes. The cause of my visit is a most mysterious and disturbing occurrence which took place at my residence last night. Oh, really? Uh, suppose you give me the facts. Uh, no doubt it will seem a minor matter to you, but I feel considerable agitation over it. Briefly... At some time last night, the rectory was broken into by thieves who ransacked the entire house, with the exception of the rooms in which my daughter Alice and I were sleeping. Gracious me. And what was stolen? Uh, Nothing. Nothing whatever. Was the thief frightened off? No, Mr. Holmes. We knew nothing of it until Alice came downstairs this morning to prepare my breakfast. She found the house in a state of the utmost confusion, obvious signs of forcible entry, and not a single thing missing. Odd. Very odd. I... I hesitate to ask you, Mr. Holmes, to concern yourself with such a trifle, but you know our worthy constable, Tom Wilson. Yes, an excellent man when it comes to unlighted bicycle lamps, but beyond that... uh, Come, Watson, let's accompany Mr. Kenmore to the rectory and see what we can discover. Holmes, as Father told you, absolutely nothing seems to be missing. 
Not that the possessions of a country rector are of such great value. Nevertheless, that silver service on the sideboard would undoubtedly attract any thief's eye. A family inheritance, Mr. Holmes, one of my few valuables. I see that you've got rather quite a large library, Mr. Kenmore. Any books of great value there? Not at all, Dr. Watson. Sound suggestion, though, Watson. Oh, <laughs> This uh, French window which gives on to the garden seems to be where the thief made his entry. Quite. A circle of glass cut out of one of the panes. Then a gloved hand reaching in to turn the key. A gloved hand, Mr. Holmes? Undoubtedly, my dear. The blurred impressions are quite characteristic. And now that you've seen everything, Mr. Holmes, what do you make of it? It presents a most interesting problem, Mr. Kenmore. The disorder of the rooms would indicate a search for some definite object, even though you assure me that you know of nothing of value in your possession. And we must wait for developments. I think you and your daughter should most certainly be on your guard against the thief's return. You really think... Uh, there Mr. Is... Mr. Kenmore, I... my friend is apt to see criminals behind every bush. The natural result of a, a lifelong career. Oh, perhaps, <laughs> Watson, perhaps. Well, we must be getting along. Uh, I wonder, Mr. Holmes, if you and Dr. Watson would do me a great favor before oh, you go. Of course, if it's in our power. Well, what is it? Would you think me too bold... If I asked you to let me take a snapshot of you both? Oh, really, Alice. Uh, I gave Alice a camera for her birthday last week, Mr. Holmes, and ever since then she's been making life miserable for everyone. I'm sure you could find two handsomer subjects, my dear. But Watson and I will be glad to have you immortalize our features. Yes, of course, naturally. Oh, thank you, Mr. Holmes. I brought my camera down from my room, hoping you'd say yes. Well, I'm very really sorry I was just wearing this old Norfolk jacket. <laughs> if you stand here, right beside the front door... Uh, well, just a moment. The wind's blowing my hair about a bit. Ah, there we are. <laughs> All right. Just look this way. Fine. Thank you so much. I hope you'll spare me a print or two if they turn out, my dear. I'll be very glad to. As a matter of fact, that was the last picture in the roll. Now I can take it down to the village and have Mr. Dilworthy, the chemist, develop it for me. I say, well, we're, we're passing by the chemist's shop. Uh, can't I drop it off for you? Thank you very much, Mr. Watson. That's very kind. Here it is. And thank you again, Mr. Holmes, for your kindness in troubling yourself with my problem. Not at all. And remember, Mr. Kenmore, be on your guard against a return visit. <laughs> Looks to me as though you're falling asleep over your book, Watson. <laughs> I must admit, Holmes, that the combination of country air and that excellent dinner had a very soporific effect on me. Oh, don't apologize. We country dwellers keep early hours. <laughs> Certainly different from the old days in Baker Street. I'm surprised that you don't miss the excitement of the chase, Holmes. And Professor Moriarty was the spice who kept the daily routine from becoming monotonous. But apparently he, too, seems to be in retirement. Oh, have you any news of him, Holmes? The last I heard, Scotland Yard had him fairly definitely located in South America. South America, eh? Huh? Which would indicate to anyone knowing the professor as well as I do that he may be anywhere on the face of the globe with the exception of South America. <laughs> well, old fella, I'm going upstairs to sleep to sleep. What the devil's that? The church bell. Come on, Watson. There must be something wrong at the rectory. <laughs> And I thought the quickest way of raising the alarm, Mr. Holmes, was to sound the church bell. Very wise. Uh, tell me, Mr. Kenmore, what was the first thing you heard? A sharp cry from my daughter awakened me, followed by a thud. I rushed into her room and found her. Well, she'll be all right, don't you worry, Mr. Kenmore. I've had to take several stitches, but she'll have a slight concussion for the next few days. But there's no cause for alarm. Oh, thank heaven, Doctor. When I rushed in and saw her lying on the floor... Her assailant had fled by the time you entered? The open window showed only too clearly the miscreant's path. Well, you keep her in bed for a few days, give her a light diet, and she'll be right as rain. Oh, oh that face, the window... Oh, she's very conscious, oh. poor girl, to be quite expected after oh. such a blow. No, don't touch me, please. It's there, there on the shelf. No... No. The sleeping draft that I gave her will take effect soon. I blame myself, Mr. Holmes, for not having paid more attention to your warning. But I... That's thought... of no importance now, Mr. Kenmore. Uh, what's that? Uh, someone at the door. Pardon me. Wilson. High time you got here. 
You received my message? Oh, take your message as it brought me here, Mr. Kenmore. Ah, where the constable, Watson? There's been worse things happening in the village. What is it, Wilson? Oh. Oh, good evening, Mr. Holmes. Oh, there's fair devil's work afoot tonight. Oh, come, come, my man. What's up? Well, it's Mr. Dilworthy, the chemist. Well, what about him? In his rooms where he lives. Back of his shop. Dead. Oh. Lying there on the floor with his head crushed in something savage. Did were they? Oh, horrible. Some prowling thief. No. Oh, no, sir. With the cash box sitting there in plain sight. With four pound and some odd shillings plain to see and not a penny touched. Dilworthy, wait a moment. The ransacking of this house, the attack on Miss Alice, and now this. There's only one common denominator which applies to all three. I don't understand, Mr. Holmes. That film from Alice's camera, Watson... After we left here this morning and went to the village, you left it at Dilworthy's? Of course, I... Oh, it's good. Uh, well, matter of fact, Holmes, I'm, I'm afraid I, I forgot all about it. Here's the roll in, in my pocket. I must apologize to Miss Alice. Not a bit of it, Watson. What do you mean, not a bit of it, Watson? I'm convinced that roll of film holds the solution of the mysterious events of the past 24 hours. And due to your convenient lapse of memory, we are in possession of the prize. But what prize are we in possession of? That, Watson, remains to be seen. Come, we just have time to catch the late train for London. A vis visit to Scotland Yard's laboratory will reveal the precious secret which that film is evidently concealing. In just a moment, we'll find out what that precious secret is. Men, when you buy a hair tonic, why not buy one that does lots more than just keep hair looking handsome? Why not get your money's worth and buy Kreml hair tonic? No other hair tonic keeps the hair more neatly groomed and attractive looking. In addition, Kreml is simply great to lubricate a dry scalp. At the same time, it removes itchy, loose dandruff and leaves the scalp feeling so clean, refreshed, and alive. No wonder Kreml is preferred among America's most successful men. Buy a bottle of Kreml at any drug counter. Ask for an application at your barber shop. Use this highly specialized hair tonic daily. For better groomed hair, a more hygienic scalp. K-R-E-M-L. Kreml hair tonic. And now, Dr. Watson, what did you discover on that precious roll of film which had already caused the death of one person and a murderous assault upon another? Well, as soon as we reached Scotland Yard's laboratory, Holmes wasted no time in getting permission to develop the photographs. Just hand me that second tray, will you, Watson? The one this side of the red lamp. There you are. There. That does it. Look, Watson. The images are starting to appear. Oh, I'll take your word for it. That red lamp gives about as much light as a glowworm. Sorry, but that's all we can use until we finish the development. Look, Watson. They're coming much, much, much more strongly now. Yes. I see. That seems to be a picture of the rector. Doesn't look to me as though that were worth committing murder for. There are twelve pictures on the roll, Watson. This next one seems to be a somewhat out-of-focus picture of the directory. Oh, that third one, Sharper, isn't a croaky match. I'm quite sure that we haven't gone tearing off on a wild goose chase, Holmes. Impossible, Watson. All the evidence indicates that this film must have been the objective. Ah, well, that looks more interesting. Two girls on the beach in bathing suits. I say, Holmes. What? That girl on the left's got a fine figure, eh? Undoubtedly. <laughs> but the composition is not improved by those other people in the middle background. I think that... Watson, hand me that lens. The large magnifier there. Ah, I thought you were displaying a cavalier lack of interest in such a shapely young lady. Well, I trust it's repaying your intense study. Look, Watson. Look here. Examine it closely through the lens. Oh, a daring bathing suit, I must say. Hmm. Has no sleeves. Not the girl, you idiot. What? The girl? The two men in the background. Oh. Take a good look at that one on the right. Oh, there's certainly something familiar about him. Holmes. Holmes, it, it can't be. But it is, Watson. Beyond any shadow of doubt, Professor Moriarty himself, and no nearer to South America than the beaches of England. But I... I don't see why Moriarty should have been so anxious to secure this film. After all, Holmes, there's nothing particularly damning in, in a photograph of two men seated on a beach. When one of them is the world's most notorious criminal, and when he's quite ready to commit murder to regain the film. Watson, 
Ask the inspector to call us a car. Where are we going? You and I and this precious film are paying a visit to Sir Edward at the foreign office at once. <laughs> Your deduction was absolutely sound, Holmes. You recognize Moriarty's companion then, Sir Edward? Beyond any question. He goes by many names, but our files would indicate that the real one is von Schelling, probably the cleverest among the senior members of the Imperial German Secret Service. Good heavens, a spy. Yes, precisely, Dr. Watson. I should imagine, Sir Edward, that his dealings with Moriarty must be of great importance since they required him to come to England in person. I'm quite sure of it. But the peaceful surroundings of the South Downs and the quiet beaches, what would a spy be doing there? With Portsmouth, England's greatest naval base only a few miles away, and the present situation in Europe, Professor Moriarty does not concern himself with trifles. Under the circumstances, I have no hesitation in telling you two gentlemen that the first trials of our new battle cruisers have been taking place off Portsmouth these last few days. Great Scott! Yes, Doctor in what we thought was the utmost secrecy. There's still a ray of hope, Sir Edward. Moriarty would not have gone to such lengths to suppress this photograph had his transactions with von Schelling been completed. Do you mean, Holmes, that there may still be time to forestall him? Dr. Watson and I will do whatever is in our power, Sir Edward. <laughs> Judging from the sudden change in your expression after your silence this past hour, you've evidently had an inspiration. We must bait a trap, Watson. And that film must be our bait. Professor Moriarty must be in a fury at his bungling subordinates, who have twice failed to recover it. If I know the professor, he'll make the next attempt himself. Well, you can't take an advertisement in the newspaper, Holmes, to lure Moriarty into a trap. If Alice and her father will cooperate, I have a method that is better than any advertisement. Oh? Well, what's that? Evidently, Watson, you're not acquainted with the post office and the postmistress of the average village, to which Fallworth is no exception. She fills the function of a town crier with the utmost efficiency. She will be our advertisement. Morning, Mr. Kenmore. And how are you this fine morning? And how is poor Miss Alice coming along? Very well indeed, thank you, Mrs. Roberts. Ah, uh, that's a blessing. And what can I do for you today? A shilling's worth of penny stamps, please. I do hope the young lady will be up and about again soon. We miss her cheery face. You know, Mrs. Roberts, there was an odd thing about that robbery at the rectory. What is that? All the intruder took was Alice's camera. Fancy that. After he struck her down. Not a very valuable bit of loot. No, indeed. Alice is glad she happened to remove the film that very afternoon. It's still on the library desk. Is it really now? I must remember to have it developed. Well, it's a mercy that nothing worse happened. Oh, I almost forgot. Here's your stamps, Mr. Kenmore. <laughs> And I think I can assure you, Mr. Holmes, knowing our worthy postmistress, as I do, that the misinformation I gave her has by now been widely disseminated. Excellent, Mr. Kenmore. And uh, I appreciate what you and Alice have been willing to risk on behalf of your country. At least the falsehood I told was in a worthy cause. I only wish Dr. Watson would let me get out of bed and come downstairs into the library with you when you take up your vigil tonight. I'd like to see that those horrible men get their just desserts. Really, my dear? You sound almost bloodthirsty. Well, I can't say that I blame Miss Ellis for that. If someone had given me a crack on the head, I'd look forward to that downfall. Mr. Kenmore, I would have felt happier if you and Alice were not in the house. But with my knowledge of Moriarty, I fear that he may have the place under observation. And the departure of you and your daughter might make him suspicious. Is that why you and Dr. Watson are wearing those filthy farmer's clothes, Mr. Holmes? Precisely, my dear. Hmm. Eight o'clock. Time we were beginning our vigil. 
Mr. Kenmore, you will remain on guard with Alice here in her room. No matter what happens in the library, this is your post of duty. Very well, Mr. Holmes. You have your service revolver, Watson? Certainly. Come then. We must be concealed and in readiness for our visitor at whatever hour he may arrive. Hmm. Only two o'clock. I'm so cramped from standing behind these curtains that I thought it must be the morning. What price the peaceful countryside now, Watson? Well, I must say that... What? What is it? A faint sound. On the gravel path, it might be a nocturnal animal or... Oh, there it is again. Footsteps. Is your gun ready, Watson? Ready, Holmes. You'll probably come through the French windows. It's the most inviting entrance. On your guard... Don't move. We've got you covered. The light switch, Watson, with your left hand. There. Well, Professor Moriarty, we meet again. If it isn't Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. Keep that gun on him, Watson, while I see if he's carrying a weapon. And render myself liable to a long prison sentence. My dear Holmes, your retirement to pastoral pursuits must have impaired your reasoning powers. It's all right, Watson. He's unarmed. You can lower your hands now, Professor. But I'd strongly advise against making any sudden move. I wish he would, the dirty traitor. I'm inclined to agree with your sentiments, Watson. Moriarty, for once I intend to take the law into my own hands. I can forgive a criminal, or a forger, or a thief, or even a murderer. But a traitor is something else. I don't understand what you're driving at. Certain backward Balkan countries, Moriarty, have an extremely convenient system of disposing of unwanted prisoners. They are invariably shot while attempting to escape you. You wouldn't dare. You who have always stood on the side of the law. Have you ever known me to break my word? I assure you, Moriarty, that unless you consent to turn over von Schaling to us, together with any information you have for him, you will be dead by the time I count ten. And I promise you that Watson won't hesitate either. No, you bet I won't, Holmes. Take your choice, Moriarty. One, two, three, four. All right, Holmes. You win. This time. Hmm. A wise decision. Where were you to meet von Schaling? And what were you to deliver to him? At midnight, tomorrow, on a beach six miles south of here. He has a rendezvous there with a submarine that is to take him back to Germany. And the figures on the new cruisers are hidden at my lodgings in Portsmouth. We'll keep that appointment with von Schaling tomorrow night. And to make sure that you have no chance for further treachery, you'll remain with us until he's in our hands. This is the spot, Professor Moriarty? 500 yards south of the abandoned dock, yes. Very well. Watson and I will remain here behind these bushes. You, Professor, will walk out alone onto the sands. I intend to take no chances of scaring off our current quarry. I haven't much choice in the matter. Just a moment. Yes? Remember that we have you in plain sight, that the moonlight is strong, and that the slightest sign of treachery will be the signal for your well-deserved execution. I won't forget, Mr. Holmes. I hate to think of his going scot-free, Holmes. You cannot hate it more than I do, Watson. But letting him go free is a cheap price to pay for the scotching of his plans and the capture of von Schaling. Here comes a car. This must be von Schaling. No one else would be on this deserted road at this hour of night. Oh, the, the car's stopping. There's only one man in it. He's getting out. It is von Schaling. Ah, yeah, Professor. I knew I could depend on you. Right, Watson. Uh, put up your hands, you. The devil... Look out, Watson. <coughs> Quick work, Watson. Oh, curse you, Moriarty. You have betrayed me. Precisely, Herr von Schelling. But why should the fact that a traitor will engage in a double betrayal surprise you? He'll be all right, Holmes. Barring a nasty flesh wound in his leg. Well, Mr. Holmes, you have the papers and the spy. I've kept my part of the bargain. Now you keep yours. Don't worry, Moriarty, I shall. 
But you can count yourself lucky that the stakes for which we were playing were far more value than your traitorous life. I promise you that next time we meet, you will pay your long overdue reckoning. <laughs> I shall look forward to it. Au revoir. Till our next meeting. What infernal cheek. I hate to see him go free. No more than I do, Watson. Well, at least we've had the best of the bargain. Now let's load our prisoner into the car. And, and who are you, anyway? The devil? Oh, hardly so eminent a personage, Conchailing. My name is Sherlock Holmes. So, I might have guessed. Oh, he's fainted. Oh, just as well, perhaps. Here, Holmes, we'll, we'll put him in the back seat of the, of the, of the car. Well, you've got the spy, and that finishes that. I wonder. There's an east wind coming, Watson. East wind? Oh, I don't think so, Holmes. It's particularly warm. <laughs> Good old Watson. You're the one fixed point in a changing age. There's an east wind coming all the same. Such a wind as never blew on England yet. It will be cold and bitter. And a good many of us may wither before its blast. But it's God's own wind nonetheless. And a cleaner, better, stronger land will lie in the sunshine when the storm has cleared. Start the car up, Watson. It's time we were on our way. And now may I introduce one of the outstanding authorities on feminine beauty. He is John Robert Powers, who has received hundreds of thousands of requests from girls all over the country. Girls wishing to join his exclusive Powers Girls. And now, especially transcribed, Mr. John Robert Powers. Good evening, friends. I'm very happy tonight to bring along one of my very attractive Powers girls, Miss Pat Fordyce. And maybe we can coax Pat to tell us what she considers one of the most important requirements of a Powers girl. How about it, Pat? Well, I think one of the most important requisites is lovely, shining, bright hair. Hair that reflects natural, glossy luster and highlights. I certainly agree, Pat. And I heartily agree with you about using cremel shampoo. Yes, Pat. I advise all my Powers girls to use cremel shampoo. In my opinion, no other shampoo leaves the hair more radiant with such natural gloss and highlights. Why, I've interviewed hundreds of girls with beautiful faces, but with such dull, lifeless-looking hair. Then, after using cremel shampoo, what a difference. Their hair emerges a vision of shining beauty. I love its rich, velvety oil base, too. A very good point, Pat. Because this oil base actually helps hair from becoming dry or brittle. Cremel shampoo also whips up a wonderful, luxurious, active foam, even in the hardest water. Yes, Pat, to glamour bathe the hair, you simply can't beat cremel shampoo. And I sincerely recommend it to every girl who is discouraged about the way her hair looks. To every girl... Who wants her hair to look its shining best? Thank you, Mr. Powers, and also your very, very beautiful Powers girls, Miss Pat Fordyce. And now, Dr. Watson, what about next week? Well, now, let me see. Uh, next week, I think I shall tell you a weird story about the strange experience of Mr. John Scott Eccles, wherein Holmes solves the murder of a certain Aloysius, or as you say, Aloysius Garcia, and finds a kitchen full of voodoo fetishes. I call the story The Adventure of Wisteria Lodge. Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, His Last Bow. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of California Pictures. Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. The Sherlock Holmes series is produced by Tom McKnight with original music composed and conducted by Alex Steinert. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo and inviting you to listen next week at the same time when Dr. Watson will tell us about the adventure of Wisteria Lodge. <laughs> ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.
Time now for Rocky Jordan. Not far from the mosque Sultan Hassan in Cairo stands the Café Tambourine, run by Rocky Jordan. The Café Tambourine, crowded with forgotten men, alive with the babble of many languages. For this is Cairo, where modern adventure and intrigue unfold against the backdrop of antiquity. Tonight's story, The Big Ditch. Maybe there's a reason why I happen to settle down in Cairo. Maybe because it's on a great river like the Mississippi that flows down past St. Louis. Only the Nile's somehow different. Egypt lives by its rise and fall. And when it starts to run low in summer, the spirits of the people seem to go down with it. That includes me. And the best thing to give me a lift is to see an old friend. Even a guy like Matt Gallagher. I'd had a big Saturday night in the tambourine, and along about 11 in the morning, I got the receipts out of the safe and sat down to front table where I could be under a fan while counting up. I was just finished when there was a knock at the door. I shoved the money bag under the counter. As I threw the latch on the door, I saw his face through the window. It hadn't changed much in five years, except for a few new scars picked up in some waterfront brawls. He barged in like a big battered freighter riding out a storm. <laughs> Well, oh, Rocky, me boy, the saints be praised. Well, what wind blew you in, Matt? A good wind it was, lad, for the sight of you again. Let's see, now, where was it? Uh, uh, Calcutta, Frisco, Singapore? Oh, no, don't make me remember. <laughs> if you're thinking of the set to, we had a sultan's daughter in Istanbul. We rode it out, didn't we, lad? Sure. Uh, by the way, how much money did I loan you to get out of town? Uh, uh, bygones, Rocky, bygones. Come now, uh, set me up with a nip, will you? Sure, just add it to your bill. Yeah, that's an idea. Hey, and bring around the bottle, me lad. We'll be drinking to all times. Uh, just leave a little of the cash customers, huh? yeah, Never worry, me lad, never worry. One day you'll be marking my account paid in full. And, and plenty to boot. Well, yeah, I won't hold my breath till then. Rocky, then it's all of us. <clears throat> that calls for it. All right, just one more. Who yeah. two this time? Yeah, I got an answer to that, lad. To Francie Bayon. As lovely a lady as ever set her dainty feet on the streets of Cairo. Who? Uh, up with it now, Rocky. Don't be insulting the lady. All right. <laughs> Who's Francie? Not a new girlfriend. Aye, aye, sir. And there'll never be another. With eyes as blue as the lakes of Killarney. Uh, you never learn, do you, Matt? Ah, oh, Rocky, I know what you're thinking. But never again. This is the real thing. Now, tell me, when did a girl ever come into your life that there wasn't trouble? Lad, I won't have you saying that about Francie. She ain't like the others. Sure, okay, okay. You say uh, Baby Blue Eyes is here in Cairo? At the Shadrach Hotel, pining her heart out for me at this very minute. Oh, there's nobody like her, me lad. You got it bad again. Aye, and we'll be settling down if all goes well. And that's what I'm wanting to talk to you about. Okay. How much? Well, the fact of the matter is this, that it, uh, I, I, I will be needing a little money. I wondered when you'd get around to it. But it, you don't understand, lad. I'm cutting you in. On what? Rocky, how would you like to own the Suez Canal? <laughs> Great. How about it, lad? The Suez? Sure. <laughs> i put it right alongside the Brooklyn Bridge. Uh, you, you think I'm lying to you? Eh? Uh, no more than usual. But I'm telling you, Rocky... Look, Matt, this is a touch, and we both know it. It's nothing of the kind. You only show up once every four or five years, but every time I end up with less money. Now, come on, how much do you want? Ah, now, that's more like it, me lad. A hundred and fifty pounds will swing it. I don't know what I'm doing this, but I'll let you have twenty. Only twenty pounds? But the deal, lad. You're lucky I had a good night. I tell you, it's a touch now, Rocky. All right, call it a wedding present, then. Here. Well, you want it or not? I'll take it. But are you... Uh, you... There's a phone in my office. I'll be right back. I'll be waiting, Rocky. You can lay to that. (laughs) 
It was a call asking for a contribution to the home for indigent goat herders. Oh, I brushed it off, naturally, and went back front. First thing I noticed was that Gallagher was gone. Second, he'd taken the bottle from the table with him. That's when I made for the money bag behind the bar. Oh, it was there, and so were a few loose piastres, but that was all. I yanked the front door open, but the street was deserted. Matt Gallagher had made a smoother getaway than the super chief. A little figuring told me that along with the 20 I'd given him, he'd gotten off with a total of 150 Egyptian pounds, which comes to exactly 600 good round American dollars. Well, that's what you get for helping a guy. I don't like being suckered, so I didn't tell anybody, just waited around. He didn't turn up among the other million and a half people around Cairo, so I decided he'd lit out for places unknown. I was sure of it after a couple of weeks went by, but I still hadn't cooled off. Then I got a call from Captain Sam Sabaya. Jordan, is it possible that you know a man named Matt Gallagher? Sure I know him, Sam, and I'm looking for him. Indeed. For what purpose? I'm going to dig 150 pounds out of his hide that he owes me. I fear you will have trouble collecting, Jordan. Yeah? Why? Come to the morgue and you will see. Matt Gallagher is on a slab. Well, you can't stay sore at a guy on a slab. I wanted it over with and forgotten, so I caught the first cab that came along for headquarters. Sam was waiting for me and led me downstairs to the morgue where he drew back one of the sheets. Gunshots, as you can see, Jordan. Uh, where'd you find him, Sam? Lying in some out-of-the-way ruins near the old uh, Babylon Roman fortress in the old part of the city. He had been dead for several days. How'd you happen to call me? A match pack from the cafe tambourine was in his pocket. There was the small chance you might have seen him there. I've known Gallagher off and on for a long time. When did you see him last? A couple of Sundays ago at my cafe. He, uh, borrowed a pocket full of money while I wasn't looking. And you did not report this to me, Jordan? Oh, it was a personal affair. Personal affair indeed. Too often you take matters into your own hands, but someday you will learn. Sure, sure. Uh, what else was in his pocket, Sam? There was no money, if that is what you mean. What about identification? No, oh, this passport and Seaman's card. You may see them if you like. Thanks. Also, a few other personal articles, if you care to look at them. Oh, I know, I've seen enough. Now, Jordan, if there is anything more you can tell me about this man... Nothing at all, Sam. He's all yours. Very well. But, Jordan, give it some thought. I intend that this murder be disposed of very quickly... I could feel Sam's eyes on the back of my head as I went out. He generally figures I'm holding something back. And this time he was right. To begin with, I'd never seen that man on a slab before. It wasn't Matt Gallagher at all. Besides, Gallagher was a seaman. And this was a fair-skinned man with soft hands that had never done a lick of rough work in his life. Now, I wondered if Sam had noticed that. Well, I had a hunch now that Gallagher was still kicking around Cairo with my 150 pounds... I wanted first crack at him. What he had to do with the murder and the switch in identity was anybody's guess. Looking in on Matt's girlfriend at the Shadrach Hotel was one thing I'd avoided up to now. But this is where I had to see her. It turned out she was sharing a suite with somebody, so I got the room number and went on up. The door was opened by a friendly-looking little guy with a mustache and his gray hair parted in the middle. Uh, yes, uh, yes. Uh, what can I do for you? I'd like to see Francie Bion. Name's Jordan. Oh, of course, of course. Please come in. Thanks. Who is it, Uncle Julius? It's Mr. Jordan, Francie. Oh, so you're Rocky Jordan. That's right. Matt Gallagher mentioned my name? Yes. Bosom pals, he said. A big oaf. Yeah. Uh, Francie, perhaps Mr. Jordan will be able to tell us... Give him time, Uncle dear. Oh, uh, yes, of course, of course, uh, my dear. Well? I'm looking for Gallagher. Where is he? I haven't seen him for weeks. What's your guess? Well, from what he told me, you ought to know everything about him. What did he tell you? Oh, something about you and him settling down. Real cozy. <laughs> Fine chance. He'd better show up in a hurry, that's all I gotta say. What's he up to, Francie? He's up to his gills and Irish whiskey, if you ask me. Eh, uh, what else? Oh, I don't know. He's been acting crazy for the last month. A lot of wild talk. Brother, what he wasn't going to do for me, buy me minks and sables and yachts. Did he say what with? <laughs> Who cares? It makes sense. What do you want with him? 
A hundred and fifty pounds, due and payable. Did he steal it from you? Well, he didn't exactly sign a promissory note. Uh, Francie, my dear, this is just as I told you. I expressly do not approve of that man for you. We've been all over that, Uncle Julius. But a girl of your culture and refinement, I cannot understand what you see in a person like that. Then stop trying. Where do I look for him, Francie? You might take a swim in the Suez Canal. He says he's going to buy it. Oh. Gallagher told you that, too, huh? <laughs> That's what he's telling everybody. And the more he talks, the crazier he gets. All he needs is a little dough to swing it, he says. Then it's big times for us. <laughs> Can you beat that guy? Well, let me know when he shows up, will you? Better be in a hurry. We're washing out of this town plenty quick. Okay, thanks. Don't mention it. Oh, uh, Mr. Jordan. Hmm? Mr. Jordan. Yeah, Julius? Uh, about this, uh, robbery. Have you mentioned it to the police? Not yet. Why? Well, it's for Francie's sake. She's such a sensitive child. Well, don't worry, Julius. What I've got to settle with Matt Gallagher is between just him and me. I finally shook Uncle Julius from my lapels, got out of the Shadrack Hotel and back to my tambourine. As I walked into the cafe, Chris flagged me down from behind the bar and handed over a package wrapped in old dirty paper. It's for you, Rocky. Well, what is it? I don't know. Messenger said he was supposed to give it to you personal. Only got tired waiting. And did he say who it was from? Yeah, Matt Gallagher. Gallagher? Let's have a look. It ain't wrapped up so good. Uh, I'm interested in what's inside. Oh, careful. It's coming apart. Oh, here. Help me here, will you, Chris? Yeah. Great jumping Jehoshaphat, Rocky. What's that? The bundle had come apart in my hands, and a lot of strange-looking pieces of paper lay scattered all around me. While Chris was getting them together, I picked one up and had a look. Like all the rest, it was old-looking and yellow, with everything written in French. At the top, in real fancy lettering, it read, Compagnie Universelle du Canal Maritain de Suez. I began scrambling through the others, and they were all the same, except for a different serial number. I didn't need to know much French to realize that these were shares of stock. Yeah? From where I stood, I, Rocky Jordan, now own part of the Suez Canal. You are listening to The Big Ditch, an adventure with Rocky Jordan. You'll find mystery to your heart's content on CBS, fine yarns woven by some of radio's top mystery writers. But you can also vary the fare with music and comedy. Here's a comedy you won't want to miss. Monday night, on CBS Radio Theater, Mickey Rooney stars in Merton of the Movies, a satire on the movie-making industry. Remember, CBS Radio Theater, tomorrow, Monday night, at 6. Now we return you to Cairo and tonight's adventure with Rocky Jordan, The Big Ditch. What would you do if somebody sent you a whole stack of shares in the Suez Canal? Paper the wall with them or ask a few questions first? Well, my curiosity got the best of me, too, so I wrapped up the bundle again and headed for the Cairo Securities Exchange. I didn't expect to find the answer there to why a murdered man was found with Matt Gallagher's identification on him, or why Gallagher had sent the shares to me. That was something else. I finally got to the right man at the exchange, gave him my name, opened up the bundle on his desk, and waited for him to start laughing. Yes, Mr. Jordan? Well, what about these things? Hmm. It's the Company Universal de Suez. I say, Mr. Jordan. Yeah? Uh, this is most remarkable. You're bringing such valuable securities in this fashion. Now, wait a minute. Don't tell me they're the real thing. Authentic in every detail. I've seen many of these. The man is indeed fortunate to possess Suez Canal shares. But what are they doing here? A big pardon. I mean, doesn't the Suez belong to a government? France or England? Oh, a common error, Mr. Jordan. True, the British Crown owns seven sixteenths of the Suez Canal. Thanks, of course, to the brilliant statesmanship of Disraeli when he purchased them from the Khedive of Egypt. Uh, oh, yeah, sure. A uh, great man, Disraeli. A credit to the empire, Mr. Jordan. Uh, look, getting back to these shares. Oh, oh, oh quite. <laughs> Carried away, you know. Sorry. Um, 
Are you trying to tell me that private individuals can own shares in the Suez Canal? Most assuredly. Many people are fortunate to own stock in the Suez. Uh, the fact of it is, thousands of shares have been lost through the years. The company is nearing its century mark, you know. Well, how much are they worth? Uh, they sold originally for £250 a share. They now run as high as £20,000. Each? Yes, you have 200 shares here. It's possible that dividends have accumulated. All in all, these are worth, uh, in your currency, approximately uh, $16 million. May I ask where you got them? I bought them for £150. Oh, oh I say, Mr. Jordan, you're pulling my leg. No, I wouldn't dare. Uh, now, now, of course, these must be transferred to your name. Oh, yeah, sure, but uh, some other time. Uh, you mean you're taking them with you in this manner? Yeah, thanks for everything. Uh, but why? I've decided to get my money back. I put the bundle inside my coat and came out of there with a great education on the Suez Canal. Enough to know that there was a sweet setup for a neat little racket. Only it gets too big when a man's murdered and the stuff's planted on me. And right then I knew I had to find Gallagher and shove the whole bundle down his throat. It was already evening and I moved along the street, not noticing the beggars or anything else, till a little native water salesman started getting under my feet. Effendi, I have the pure fine water for you. Water like crystal. All right, move along. Him, she. Oh, but it is not of the Nile, Effendi. My water is from the hidden springs of the desert. One piaster is all. Hello, your cheek. What's good now? Uh, two centimes, then. Only for you. No water. Him, she. Uh, Mr. Jordan. Where did you learn the name? This concerns another matter. The Afranki would be wise to listen. All right, get it out. Mr. Jordan, there are certain people with money. They will bargain well. What people? What do they want? I cannot tell you who they are, but they are interested in certain pieces of paper. Well, you tell certain people that certain pieces of paper aren't for sale. Get it? Alwa Effendi. Uh, you know where Matt Gallagher is? The name I do not know. Yeah. This helps? Uh, but uh, perhaps there is another who can help you. Who? The street of many knives up the hill past the rug weaver's hut. I'll need more than that. I have the water. Hey, wait a minute. Get it, your water, like fine crystal water. I could have followed the water cellar, but already night was setting in and I had another errand. It took a lot of asking around and some strange looks, but I was finally in the street of many knives. Nothing more than a passageway that winds up through the desolate native quarter to the east. It's a place a foreigner doesn't go around, even in daylight, much less at night. And I could guess how it got its name. The wild dogs were out, but they'd found something else and didn't bother with me. Just before the street ended at a hill, I found the rug weaver's hut and a door just beyond. There was no light, but I knocked. I thought I heard a quick movement inside. So I knocked again. I tried the knob. It was locked. I put my shoulder against the door and one shot was all it took. The lock snapped and I was inside just as a hulking figure lunged from the shadows. He had powerful arms around me and we went down. My knees came up and we went on over. Then I was on top with my hand in his face. And Matt and the smell of Irish whiskey cut it short. Matt. Rocky. Rocky, lad, I, I didn't know. How'd you find me? Yeah, we'll skip that. Oh, let's get some light in here. There's a candle on a corner table. But you have to light it now, lad. Why not? Oh, Rocky boy, am I glad to see you. Yeah, you won't be, Matt. Not till you hand over my money. Oh, no, 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 Rocky lad. Go easy on me. I've been in for a rough time of it. Why the hideout? Well, I'll admit it to you, Rocky. I'm scared. Of what, the police? Uh, not exactly. But I, I'm in a bit of trouble. Why not run to Francie? She's getting out of Cairo. Well, uh, I, I tell you, lad, I, I'm giving her up. Francie's too good for the likes of me. Ah. Uh, Anyhow, I've learned me lesson, Rocky. There's been a bit of strike north of Johannesburg. I'm going there and dig for gold. Come on with me now. I'll start clearing it up, Matt. What about the guy down in the morgue? Uh, in, in the morgue? You know he's dead. He was carrying your seaman's card and your passport. Sure. Sure, I, I know. But you don't think I killed him, lad. You couldn't think that. I, I value life too much. Spit to... it out, Gallagher. Who was he? Uh, Walter Logan. He used to work for the Suez Company in Paris. You get all those shares from him? Right, me boy. He offered a quick sale for 150 pounds. Well, they'd be worth thousands. Why a price like that? 
Now, Rock, you know I don't bother with trifles, asking a lot of embarrassing questions. Go on. We had a little rendezvous, and I bought the shares. I left him, and I wasn't more than a block away, and I heard the gunshots. I ran back and found him dead. See anybody else around? No, Rocky. But I knew people would be accusing me. They always make things tough and poor, Matt Gallagher. Come on, come on. Why the switch? Well, I had to think fast. If they thought I was dead, they wouldn't be looking for me. So I put my stuff in his pockets. Then why send the shares to me? That was our deal, Rocky. Anyhow, uh, I was sort of hot and I knew you'd take care of them. Yeah. All that over a stack of worthless paper. Worthless? What do you mean, Rocky? A lot of Suez shares have been lost. Nobody knows what happened to them. You say Logan worked for the company in Paris. He could have found out the serial numbers of the missing shares, made up some to match the real ones. Uh, counterfeit? Sure. He turns up with a bunch of lost shares, and if he's lucky, no one's a wiser. Only, he wasn't so lucky. What now, then, lad? I still want my 150 pounds. But, Rocky, I'd give it to you if I had it. Hey, hold it, Matt, hold it. Yes. Maybe I heard, or maybe I just fell it, but I knew there was somebody at the door. As I opened it, a barefoot native ducked away. I was after him fast, and just as I was on him, he whirled and faced me. Mr. Jordan. All right, what is it now, Buster? You don't sell water around here. Uh, no, it concerns the other matter, Effendi. Uh, you ready to tell me who sent you? I cannot, uh, but about the certain pieces of paper, uh, my master offers you 5,000 pounds. Uh... Is that all? Oh, but Mr. Jordan, he is prepared to go higher. Possibly six or seven thousand pounds. I'll go the other way. The other way? Yeah. Tell your master he can have the pieces of paper for 150 pounds. You will give them to me? Not on your life. I'll deliver them in person. Well, I meet your master. At the ruins of the Minya Tower in Old Cairo. Uh, there you will not be disturbed. I'll be there at 11 o'clock. <laughs> The little water cellar vanished in thin air, and I was back dragging Gallagher into the street and down the hill. I figured as long as he'd started this thing for me, he could be in at the finish. He complained like a dyspeptic camel all the way, but I finally got him with me to the tambourine, and there I put in a quick call to Sabaya. What are you trying to say to me, George? I told you, the guy you have in the morgue isn't Matt Gallagher. But you saw him yourself. Why did you not tell me? You didn't ask me, Sam. I didn't. You, of all the incredible... Then who is this man? His name's Walter Logan. Jordan, listen to me. You have completely upset my investigation. You have come dangerously... Sam, do you want to find Gallagher or not? Indeed I do. Then put on your snowshoes and mush on out to the Minya Tower in Old Cairo. Jordan, you will first explain this to me, Jordan. See you there, Sam. Gallagher heard every word of the conversation and he was crying real tears as I tucked the pieces of paper under my arm and shoved him into a taxi out front. Between him and the lazy taxi driver, I had myself a time as we rolled south into Old Cairo. Finally, we drove through what once, centuries ago, was the gate to the Roman fortress called Babylon. A little farther on, the cabbie pulled up and he wouldn't go an inch farther for all the fish in the Nile. So, we walked it from there. In another quarter hour, we were nearing the crumbling Minya Tower, surrounded by ruins. Just a few minutes before 11. A full moon was out now, almost white against the ancient sandstone walls. It was quite a sight, but Gallagher wasn't impressed. Rocky. Rocky, I, I don't like it at all. Ah, we're early. There's nobody here. It's right there that Walter Logan was killed, don't you see? Yeah. Somebody might repeat themselves. Look, Rocky. This is not for me. Let's get out of here. I, I'm sorry for getting you into this land. But I'll make it up if it takes the rest of my life. Might not be long enough, Matt. No, Rocky, me boy. That's exactly get back what in I the mean. shadows. We'll wait here. Matt dug for a buck corner and we waited. Not more than three or four minutes. Then we heard footsteps along the passageway from the way we'd come. Whoever it was kept to the shadows on the far side. The steps were confident with no trace of hesitation. They passed. And then the figure stepped out into the moonlight beneath the tower. Francie. Matt, what are you doing here? He came with me, Francie. Gallagher's in on the deal. All right. Let's get it over with. Oh, I don't understand it. I don't understand it at all. Where'd that muddled head of yours ever understand anything? But all this time you... Yes, gonna... playing you for a sucker. Francie, darling. Oh, no, no, no. Let Rocky I... explain it. He's the smart one. Uh, later. Your little water boy mentioned an offer for uh, 
Certain pieces of paper. Five thousand pounds. Why did you make it a hundred and fifty? I'm satisfied. Do you have them? Yeah. All right, give them to me. Oh, let's keep it honest, Blue Eyes. <laughs> Here's your money. Now hand them over. They're all yours. Thanks. Now we'll get a few things straight. Skip it, Rocky. Come on out, Julius. Yes, I'll take over now, Francie. Julius. It's Uncle Julius. I've been wanting... Careful, Matt. That gun in his hand, he'll use it. You're quite right, Mr. Jordan. Oh, I'm getting it now. I should have known why you didn't like me, Uncle Julius. Always come between Francie and me. What's bothering you, Julius? Matt and I know too much. You've still got a lot of phony shares to sell. You could quite well interfere with our plans. So I'm going to kill you. Just like you did Walter Logan. Yes. Well, he fixed you up with his stuff. Why drop him? He was a little man. Our meth frightened him. He began trying to dump the shares at quick prices. There was no telling what he would do next. I had to kill him. That leaves just you and Francie. Great team. I give her full credit. It is she who masterminded our plan. It ain't true. It ain't true at all. Or not. Have you saying that about Francie? Shut up, you stupid ox. You fostered it, George. You never liked me. And I don't like you either, George. Matt, keep back. You'll be poison of mind against me no more. Stop, you fool. Stop. You or nobody can stop Matt Gavin. Matt stopped two slugs head on and kept walking in. Then his big gnarled hands were on the man's neck and driving back. Julius had no more chance than a day-old kitten. All at once it was a snap and he dropped like a wet ball rag. Matt stood over him for a full second and then he piled on top. <laughs> Francie was suddenly wild and running, and I didn't follow because just then I saw Sam Sabaya and a couple of his men coming up to meet her. Well, there was a lot of talk and explaining for a while. Then Uncle Julius was wheeled off to the morgue, Matt Gallagher to the hospital, and Francie off to a cell. Sam kept the package, and about an hour later, he and I were resting at a table in my cafe tambourine. Jordan, you you make very good coffee. Sounds that way, Sam. Mm. You should confine your activities to just such things as this. Oh, I'm willing. But when a poor sucker like Gallagher comes around, what are you going to do? It is possible there will not be another time. Uh, <laughs> takes one a couple of slugs to knock out a guy like him. What Francie did to him will hurt him worse. Mm, perhaps, Sam. By the way, Jordan, I'm wondering now what I should do about you. Me? What for? You are guilty of selling counterfeit shares for 150 pounds. I uh, think it's about time you looked in that package, Sam. What do you mean? My deal with Francie was for certain pieces of paper. And that's just what she got. All torn out of the Cairo Gazette. <laughs> It's CBS at this same time next week for another story of adventure and intrigue when we take you back to Cairo and the Cafe Tambourine, run by Rocky Jordan. Rocky Jordan, written by Larry Roman and Gomer Cool, stars Jack Moyles in the title role and is produced and directed by Cliff Howell with original music by Richard Arant. Larry Thor speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. now for Rocky Jordan. Not far from the mosque Sultan Hassan in Cairo stands the Cafe Tambourine, run by Rocky Jordan. The Cafe Tambourine, crowded with forgotten men. 
alive with the babble of many languages. For this is Cairo, where modern adventure and intrigue unfold against a backdrop of antiquity. Tonight's story, The Map of Murder. To begin with, I'm a businessman. I run a cafe, and when business gets bad, I look for ways to pep it up. So when Musine Duval came in asking for a job as a singer, I decided to try some entertainment. All Musine asked was a week's tryout and a little salary advance to keep her going. Uh, anyhow, I'll admit it, I sort of liked her. Maybe it was the way her coal black hair was bobbed, sort of like the Sphinx, and the round curve of her white shoulders as she sat at the piano under a spotlight. Anyhow, you couldn't keep the customers away. Things went swell till the fourth night. I was in my office about ten o'clock listening to the jingle of my cash register up front when it all started. What are you doing? Just who do you think you are interrupting my song and grabbing me like a common woman of the street? I got to the door and could see Mouzine screaming at a big swarthy guy who was standing up trying to get a word in. A couple of waiters were hovering around just in case. I decided to cut in. I do not go with the drinks, monsieur. I'd like to find out just what you do go with. You will, you will find out. You do not leave and stop molesting me. Okay, what's this about? Who are you? Jordan, I run this place. I don't go in for having my entertainers and stuff. Okay, Jordan, my name is Ralph Garnett. I was only looking for a certain girl. Sure, sure. I thought this might be the one. So when she came by my table, I just reached up to turn her around. She slipped and fell in my lap. <laughs> fell? It is not so rocky. He pulled me. All right, I'll handle him, Mouzine. I didn't mean to cause this much of an incident. I'll try a different approach next time. Look, Jordan, when I find the woman I want, there aren't going to be any polite words wasted between us. You ever see this guy before, Mouzine? Never. Never in my life, Rocky. All right, Garnett. I suppose you blow. Okay, we're playing in your park. But I'd like to meet you on my home ground sometime. I'll work you into my 1960 skill. We play a rough game there, Jordan. I've never lost. Garnett jostled his way through the tables to the door and was gone. Right then, I wrote it off the books. And that was my first mistake. About three days later, I had a note saying an old friend of mine was in town. Gunter Rentz of the 32nd Foreign Legion Regiment. I'd met Rentz a couple of years before. He comes into Cairo every once in a while and takes a hotel room where he sits in comparative solitude and reads good books, drinks good liquor, and plays bad gin rummy. I usually join him for a quiet brandy and a few hands of gin. This time he was staying room 409 at the International Hotel on El Hakur Street. So I went over to see him. I was due at 7 and almost on time. A sign in the cage elevator said out of order, so I took the steps. Just as I reached the third floor, I heard somebody scream. <laughs> Nobody screams in Cairo for fun. It seemed to come from the room almost in front of me, so I got over to the door and knocked. No one answered, so I tried the doorknob and it opened. And what I saw made me forget for the moment about my date with Rents. The phone began ringing, so I walked over and picked it up before I realized what I was doing. Hello? Is this room 309? Uh, just a minute. Yeah, yes, yeah, 309. Who's this? Mr. Amar, the hotel manager. Do you have a girl in your room? I'm afraid I do. Well, she will have to come down and register. Well, don't expect her, Mr. Amar. And why not, may I ask? She's as dead as the air in your closets. I put down the phone and took another look at the girl. And it hurt. I was going to miss her at the tambourine. Yeah, it was Musine Duval sprawled on the floor. Her beauty spoiled by a knife handle sticking from her chest. I started to look around, then changed my mind. There was nothing I could do for her now, and this was no place to be found. So I slipped out and hurried down the dark corridor to the back stairs. I was up just three steps when I heard a door slam and running footsteps. I made it back on the double. There was nobody in the corridor, but I was certain I'd heard somebody run in or out of that room. So right then, I had another look. Huzin was still alone. I looked around and found nothing. This time I took a spread from the bed to lay over her pathetic figure. 
As I bent over, I noticed a thin, flat package showing from beneath her blouse at the throat. I figured the package might be an ace in the hole, so I grabbed it, shoved it in my pocket, and got out again. I met the excited manager as he hit the top step. He'd already called the police, so I decided to wait. In another 15 minutes, Captain Sam Sabaya had joined us. He listened real patiently. Yes. So that is your story, Jordan. Every bit of it, Sam. He was in this room when I called Captain Sabaya. He answered the phone. Jordan, you say your being here was a coincidence. Yet she worked at your cafe. Look, don't start getting ideas, Sam. I gave it to you straight. I'd like to know the answer, too. There is much more you can tell us. Yours was the voice on the phone. One moment. Mr. Ma, who rented this room? Not the girl. Some man whom I did not see because I was not at the desk when he registered. Where are you when everything happens? At the time, I might have been counting linen. Do not pick at me. I am nervous enough. What was the man's name? The register says John Smith. I cannot read the city. It is blotted. Ah. Uh, take care of us, Sam. Indeed, I shall, Jordan. And as for you, I will get in touch with you soon. <laughs> I was in no mood for it, but I decided to keep my date with Gunter Rentz. But first I stopped on the back stair landing for a look at the package I'd found on Muzine. It contained two sets of passports and visas. One for a girl I'd never seen before named Helen Brecht, and the other for a man named Rudolf Crane, only there was no picture of him. Then there was a ring with a curious design on it, and most of all, five $1,000 American bills. I put the bills in one pocket and the rest of the stuff in the other. And I went up and knocked on Rance's door. Ah, uh, my good friend Rocky Jordan. Come in, please. Hello, Rance. Welcome to the big city. <laughs> well, the, the city is good only because I can get away for a while from the confinement of the barracks. To the confinement of a hotel room? Eh? Yeah, yeah. But in this room, I can pick my friends. Well, like you, Rocky. Yeah, yeah. Yes, please, sit down. Thanks. Well, come, Rocky. Are you not glad to see me? Oh, sure, sure. Just some unpleasant excitement. Oh, excitement? The girl was killed in a room downstairs. Ah, death. Ah, that is too bad. Uh, l let us not talk of death. You will play cards, huh? I have found some things you might help me with. Oh, so? Yeah, this, this ring here has some kind of German design. Mm. Maybe you can tell me what it is. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, I can most certainly tell you. This is a ring worn by the members of a certain German regiment during the last war. The 274th Schutzstaffel, to be precise. Well, I found it on the girl. Ah. And these, these passports, too. Well, let me see. Hmm. Ah, well, no, no, these, these are nothing. But should you not turn them over to the police? Yeah, I'll give them this a buy in the morning. Well, now perhaps a drink would help. No? Yeah, a, a big tall one, huh? Brandy and soda. Well, in a minute I will have it. While Rance was in the washroom to fix a drink, some kind of intuition told me I'd better get rid of the stuff I'd found before somebody came digging around. I got up quickly, tried one of the knobs on the brass bedpost. It slipped off. I dropped the $5,000 down inside. I knew nobody would ever touch it with Rance as a watchdog. There was no room for the papers, and besides, Rance was coming back, so I put the knob back on and sat down. Ah, here you are, Rocky. Brandy and soda. Ah, thanks. And now the cards. The best antidote for a weary mind. Uh, uh, you shuffle, huh? Yeah, sure. Now, uh, tell me, Rocky, who do they think killed the girl? They think I did. You? Oh. <laughs> oh, no. An excellent joke. <laughs> well, uh, cut the cards, Rocky. Well, I stayed late playing gin with Rents and started home long about midnight. The taxis were scarce, so I caught a trolley as far as I could, walked the deserted streets the rest of the way to the tambourine. I was a couple of blocks from the cafe when it happened. I couldn't see who it was or where he came from. All I could hope for was a lucky punch, but it was no good. He kept behind me. And the old silken cord treatment is one thing you can't fight. I came out of it maybe a couple of minutes later, slumped against a wall and wondering why I was still alive. My pockets were inside out and my neck burned where the cord had been. I was stripped of everything I carried. The papers, the ring, the billfold, and my watch. Now I knew there was a killer in Cairo I had to meet again. 
You are listening to The Map of Murder, tonight's adventure with Rocky Jordan. Among other entertainment programs on CBS, mystery holds its own. You'll find more chills and more thrills per listening minute on CBS. Take Inner Sanctum, for example. This week, Everett Sloan stars as a waiter who overhears a murder plot and tries to defend its victim. It's a real thriller called Pattern for Fear and a yarn that takes its place among the outstanding shows which have been heard on Inner Sanctum. Yes, listen to Inner Sanctum at 9 Monday night, and you'll see what I mean. More chills and more thrills per listening minute on CBS Mystery Programs. And now we take you back to Cairo and tonight's adventure with Rocky Jordan, The Map of Murder. Well, the next morning before I opened up the tambourine, I picked up a paper from the boy down in the corner. It told the whole story of Mouzine Duval's death, but with names. I was listed as the man who found the body and a potential suspect. And I went back in the cafe by my back office door, and just in time, someone was going through my desk drawers before he had a chance to straighten up my tambourine. He rolled, and I rolled with him. He brought his knee up. I moved aside and gave him an elbow. His fist caught me in the back of the ear. Another one of the kidneys had all but paralyzed my legs. I hit him again. I knew he felt it this time. He was on top. I doubled up my legs and threw him upward. Lifted him and his head caught the edge of the desk. That's when he quit fighting. Like I said, Jordan, you're... You're great in your home field. I know the park on it. Come on, get up. Okay. You do lots of things besides annoy pretty girls, don't you? You got a good memory for faces. What were you looking for? What you missed last night? Last night? Last night when you rolled me. I never rolled anybody in my life. Yeah? What were you doing to my desk? Looking for a stamp. <coughs> that help you remember? No more of that, Jordan. I read in the papers you found that girl, by whatever she calls herself, that nothing was found on the body. You think she had something? Plenty, if she's who I think she is. And you just dropped around to see if I had it tucked away in an odd corner. Maybe eh? you have. Shall we call Sabaya in or start explaining? (laughs) You won't believe me. It's pretty likely. I've been following a girl halfway around the world. I was once in love with her. Then she stole $8,000 and a map from me and disappeared. What kind of a map? Why should I tell you? Because I got an idea you registered in the International Hotel under the not-too-original name of John Smith and killed the girl. Well, Jordan, you're wrong. I should have killed her, but I didn't. What about the map? Well, during the war, I was an American Army officer in charge of a front-line PW enclosure in Alsace-Lorraine. There was a German general there who wanted to get out. He offered me a map for his freedom. He said it was a map showing where he'd buried his family's wealth when it looked as if Germany was going to lose. It was worth at least $200,000. Uh, go on. I told him I'd think it over. But the next day, he was killed when the Germans started cross-shelling. I took the map off his body. Yeah. To the victor, it goes... The map was of a small area, but it didn't tell the general part of Germany it was in. I searched all over Germany, but I couldn't find the place. Where does the girl figure in? Well, I'd gone home to America. I was getting ready to go back to Germany for another try when... And I met this girl. She said she knew Germany like her own backyard. We were going to look for it together. Then we were going to get married. And she ended up taking all your dough and the map. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. It's a great yarn, Garnett, only it's a four-star phony. It's true, Jordan, every bit of it. So what would the girl you're looking for be doing in Cairo? Why was she wasting her time in my cafe? Cute way of hiding out, I'd say. Till her accomplice showed up. Maybe they planned to meet here. You say a museum might be the girl, but you don't know. Why? Well, she... She looks the same. She has the same build. Only she was blonde and white-skinned. Was she French? No. 
But Helen could have dyed her hair and assumed an accent. Wait a minute. Did you say Helen? Yeah, that was her name. Helen Breck. Yeah. Hey, what are you doing? Who are you calling? Headquarters. Give me Captain Sam Sabaya. Jordan, what possible good will that? Uh, hold it, Gunner. Sabaya speaking. Uh, it's Rocky, Sam. What now, Jordan? Listen, did the girl who was killed yesterday have most of her body stained brown and her hair dyed black? Uh, how did you know that? Thanks, Sam. That's all I wanted to know. And it's true. Yeah, maybe. Look, leave your address in the desk where I can find you, Garnett. Right now, I've got an errand. When will I hear from you? Uh, with luck, in a couple of hours. With no luck, never. <laughs> All at once, Garnett's story was making plenty of sense. Helen Brecht was the name on the passport I'd found on Museum. Right then, I was on my way to the Hotel International to hunt up Gunther Rentz. But I got just two blocks from the tambourine when I realized I wouldn't have to look for him. He'd found me. Get in, Rocky. Oh, okay, Rentz. Oh, it uh, so happens I was on my way to see you. Oh, convenient. I was just going to see you, Rocky. I hired this car and thought we might drive out of the city. Well, there's uh, nothing this way but the desert. Uh, you know, you're right. There's almost nothing to see and even less to hear. Rents, uh, didn't you once tell me you came from Schwiegschaben? I admire your memory. What next, Rocky? Also, that your name isn't Rentz. It's Baudic. Von Baudic. Do you have a brother? A general who died in a PW camp in Alsace-Lorraine? Ah, so you have found out. Oh, I just got it today. Ah. Well, now is an excellent time, and here is an excellent place to talk. Okay. Stand your mind. Well, to begin with, this. Uh, oh, yeah. I always respect a gun. I regret to be so crude, my friend. But you have things I want. And it is necessary to get them if I must kill you. Exactly what? The money and the map you took from that girl. You'd kill me for that. Well, why not? I have killed more people than are in your cafe every night. War and murder are two different things. Ah, there is always war. <laughs> sometimes it is national, sometimes individual. Well, just don't recruit me for your private skirmishes, Wrench. What about the money and the map? You can have the money, but I don't have the map. Where is it? I don't know. Rocky, it belongs to me, to my family. My brother was murdered for it. Yeah. Killed by a shell and the map taken off of him. Ah, so you know the man who took the map? Yeah. Well, he is a liar. A murdering liar. And once I have the map, I will certainly pay my debt to him. Well, uh, that's your war. Are you quite sure you don't have the map, Rocky? You got everything but the money when you rolled me last night. Ah, I am sorry. I tried not to let you see me. I happen to know an old Legion trick when it's played on me. Tell me, uh, how'd you know the girl had the stuff? It's very simple. I commissioned her to get it for me. Oh. Well, okay. Take me back to town, I'll deliver one idea. Well, um, how can I trust you? Look, Rance, I never let a friend down, even if he's turned into something else. Ah, so, yeah. Yeah, very well. But if you fail me, Rocky, nothing will stop me from reaching you. It's a deal. And, Rocky, this is only between us, huh? Sure. Sure, Rance. Just between friends. <laughs> Well, there you are. In two days, I've been taken in by two people I thought were friends. And if I was going to shake the police and rents and a guy named Garnett off my trail, I had my job cut out for me. Finding a certain map. But I figured the room at the International Hotel where Muzine was killed would stand a little more searching. It took a five-pound note to bribe the key away from the room clerk, and it wasn't worth it, because I turned up nothing. So that left only one other chance. Muzine's effects at the police station. At headquarters, I gave Sabaya the whole story, top to bottom. Then we had a look at Muzine's clothing and luggage. No more luck. 
There is no map, Jordan. But it's got to be Sam. She wouldn't let a thing as valuable as that map get two feet away from her. If there ever was one. Well, I'm betting on it. Everybody's story checks too well. The fact remains, Jordan, we have searched everything. Uh, uh, wait a minute. What about the murder weapon? Only a knife. Well, let's have a look. Where is it? Yeah, in this case. That's our last hope, Sam. A faint hope, Jordan. After all, this was held by the murderer. And... It won't hurt to try. Maybe this handle it. Oh, careful, careful. Here, use this handkerchief. Right. Look at that, Sam. The handle comes off. Let's take a look inside. Here, these tweezers will get it out. Right. Here she comes. Now, let's see. That's it, Sam. Yes. We have the map. You know what this means? Indeed I do, Jordan. This was Musine's knife. Who's the only person she'd have to draw it on for her own protection? Rains? No, she was working for him. That leaves only the American, Garnet. Yeah. He was looking for her and she was afraid of him. Then why would she go to his room? I don't know. You see, Jordan, I am interested in finding the murderer. We still have no proof. All right, I'll get it for you. Just let me have that map for a little while. And for what purpose? Give, Sam. We're going to lay a little trap. Sam finally saw it my way. In another hour, I was in my office at the tambourine, and sitting across from me was Ralph Garnett. He'd received my call and gotten there in a hurry. Okay, Jordan, what's this about? You want the map, don't you, Garnett? You found it? Yeah. The map and 5,000 money Musine took from it. Where, Jordan? Let's see it. Why, you... Uh, I went to a lot of trouble to find the stuff, Garnett. Oh. A deal, huh? Well, don't think I risk my neck for nothing, do you? <laughs> Jordan, you're my type of man. You know, we could work well together. What are your terms? You get 40% of anything we find and dig up. That's fair enough. Except for one thing. Yeah? When I'm working with a guy, it's got to be an open book. Did you kill Musine? No, Jordan. After that night in your cafe, I cornered her on the street. She admitted she was Helen Breck. She promised to come to my room at the hotel and make a deal. You were there when she got there? No, I was late. And when I arrived at the hotel, the police were around and I stayed out of sight. I don't know how she got into my room. All right, Garnett, do you want the map or don't you? What does it take to get it? The confession? Right down the line. Just between the two of us? It won't change the deal. Just so I know. All right. All right, I killed her. I was scared away before I could find the map of the money. I couldn't have... You swear to that? Yes, yes, I swear to it. It's all yours, Sam. What? Mr. Garnett, you under arrest. Why, Jordan, you lousy liar. Don't move, Garnett. You had the cop planted in your closet just to dig a confession. Yeah, it worked. Well, I didn't kill the girl. I just said that so you'd give me the map. I find that very hard to believe. Why would I follow her halfway around the world and then kill her before I got the map? Oh, take him away, Sam. Get him out of here. Sabaya had his man, and I should have felt real proud of myself. Only somehow I didn't. I sat there for a long time trying to push the mess out of my mind. But always there were loose ends there that didn't tie up. Well, I'd promised to deliver the 5000 to Gunter Rents. Once that was over, I could wash out of the whole affair. So I went back to his hotel, and he was waiting for me. Well, come in, Rocky. Are you surprised I kept my promise, Rents? Oh, no. I, I never doubted you would come. You are too intelligent to underestimate my determination. Thanks. Uh, my gun remains on the bureau, Rocky. Oh, don't worry. I'm just making sure it's not used. Yeah. Now we're even, Rex. Where is the money, Rocky? In that left corner bedpost. I can become impatient. You want to look or not? Ah, ah so it is. Five thousand dollars. Well, your cleverness amuses me. Now, if you want the map, go talk to Sam Sabaya. The map? He has it? That's right. Well, I have every right to it. He will give it to me. And he has something else. A guy named Garnett who just confessed to Musine's murder. Ah, so the killing is finally solved. Yep, only for a while it figured kind of different. <laughs> what? With me as a suspect, perhaps? It sure looked that way. Let's say you found out she had a deal with Garnett. Yeah. Playing his offer for the map against yours. Oh, well, that much is true. All right, Garnett's room is directly below yours, so you went down to talk to him. Just then the girl came in. 
You argued, she pulled the knife, and you killed her. Uh, well, it is over now. As you say, Garnet has confessed all. So, now let us have a drink together. Hmm? Yeah, sure. Mix him up, Rance. It will only take a moment. Oh, Rance. Yeah, Rocky? This uh, fire escape outside the window. You been on it recently? Oh, certainly not. Why do you ask? A uh, footprint in a flower box. Somebody's been out here. Well, what of it, Rocky? Uh, if I didn't know different, I'd say that explained how you got into Garnet's room. Ah, now, please. Why do you not forget all about this? Unfa- Rocky, where are you going? To police headquarters, Rents. To tell Sam Sapphire you killed Musine Duval. And with that, I took off down the hall, running as fast as I could. I knew if that got a rise out of Rents, I was finally right about the whole thing. It didn't take me long to find out. Rocky! Rents was out of the room and down the corridor after me faster than I could believe, with speed born of a lifetime of military training. He caught me from behind, just as we reached the top of the stairs. We hit hard, we rolled down the whole flight of stairs. We hit the landing and kept rolling. Then there was a loud crash of splintering glass. Rents disappeared through the low window, and a second later I heard him hit the alleyway, three stories below. There was a pretty good crowd around by the time I got down there. A couple of police were trying to hold people back, but they finally let me through and I was bending over Wrench. He was pretty hard to look at. Wrench? Wrench, oh. it's Rocky. Oh. Rocky. You... You're not going to make it. You know that, don't you? Rocky. Rocky. My true name will be known only to you. My family... Must never know. It's a promise, Rance. You killed Musain, didn't you? Ha. Didn't you? Ha. Yeah. Yeah. As you said, Rocky. I killed her. Well, Sam Sabaya got the story from me and a few other witnesses. Garnett was released, but he was still pretty sore at me. It took him a long time to prove the 5,000 was really his. But Sabaya kept the map and turned it over to the military government of Germany to decide where it belonged. So nobody's very happy. Me? Well, I'm going to miss Musine's singing. And my customers are demanding entertainment. (laughs) Wonder when Cairo's going to get television. It's CBS again at this same time next week for another story of adventure and intrigue when we take you back to Cairo and the Cafe Tambourine run by Rocky Jordan. Rocky Jordan. Starring Jack Moyles in the title role is produced and directed by Cliff Powell with original music by Richard Arant. Tonight's story was by John Michael Hayes, edited by Gomer Cool and Larry Roman. Larry Thor speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Time now for Rocky Jordan. Not far from the mosque Sultan Hassan in Cairo stands the Cafe Tambourine, run by Rocky Jordan. The Cafe Tambourine, crowded with forgotten men, alive with the babble of many languages. For this is Cairo, where modern adventure and intrigue unfold against a backdrop of antiquity. 
Tonight's story, The Broken Wing. There's a saying I've heard around Cairo that all a man needs for happiness is good food and good companions. Me, I add one thing more. That's lots of sleep. So naturally, I don't like it when somebody comes pounding at my tambourine door at 2 o'clock in the morning. But that's what happened. And the pounding got wilder and wilder. So I finally got up, put on my shoes and a robe, and went down that balcony steps into the cafe. Mr. Jarvis! I beg you! Open the door! All right! Cut off the noise! I'm coming. Please, Mr. Jarvis! Thank me! I switched on the front light. Through the door glass, I could make out a stooped figure, gray-bearded in burnous and fez. I threw the latch, opened the door, and he bowed down, groveling at my feet. I look, Buster, just get up and state your business. Oh, Mr. Jordan, my true effendi, I come to you on my knees. Ben Abram. Halwa, it is I, Ben, the once honored house of Abram. Ben Abram, you don't have to bow down to me. You should know that. Thus, I express my distress, Mr. Jordan. Well, look, if there's something wrong, tell me. My good effendi, you will recall that when you first came to Cairo... I was able to do you a small service. Oh, you bet I remember. You stood between me and certain of your own people who want to give me trouble. Believe me, I've never forgotten it. It was not with the thought of ever asking a service in return. Sure, I knew that. I owe a great debt to you, Ben Abram. Mr. Jordan, I must entrust to you my greatest treasure for you to guard and protect. A treasure? Well, sure. There are many things I cannot explain to you, my affinity. You must only trust. I trust you just as you trust me. It has been written. A promise is a man's most priceless gift. You have my promise. Now, where is his treasure? Allah be pleased. Wait here for the moment. And Abram ducked quietly down the sidewalk to a dark doorway. In another second, he was coming back. But this time, he wasn't alone. Just two steps behind came someone else. I didn't see who it was until he stepped aside to tenderly draw her before me. A slight but erect figure in native robes. And all I could see was her soft, dark eyes above the veil that covered her face. Mr. Jordan, my only daughter, Tarina. Your daughter? Mashallah. She is my treasure. Guard her with your life. Oh, wait a minute, Ben Abram. You can't be leaving her with me. I have no choice. It is your promise. Oh, I know I promise. Farewell, Tarina, my child. Saida, my father. I commend her to you, Mr. Jordan. Hide her quickly. Allah protect Ben Abram, wait. Ah. Well, this beats anything yet. My master is not pleased. Oh, everything's just fine. Great. I am most happy, my master. Look, would you mind not calling me... I'll skip it. As you wish, my master. It's just that uh, there's no place for a girl like you. But you are here. Uh, that's just it, I... My father says that you will protect me. From what, Tarina? He does not permit me to tell. But in all else, I am at your command. Uh, sure. What now? Where do you want me to sleep? Sleep? Oh, uh... Up those back steps, it's all yours. But will you not show me? Yeah, that's the way you want it. Up this way. I will follow my master. Uh, there's the bed. Fresh sheets are over there. Where will you sleep? Uh, outside, lady. Just give me time to get a few things out of here. Uh, wait, Serena. Yes? What happened to the veil? In her own quarters, a woman does not wear the veil. Did you not know? Uh, no. I trust my master will sleep well. Thanks. Then I was outside, but I still had my problem. A girl with the innocent round face of the Nile people of foreigner rarely sees. A face that trusted me for protection. From what? I had no idea. I started for my office downstairs, then changed my mind and bedded down on the stair landing just outside the door. 
The floor was hard, and the strange puzzle that had been handed me didn't help with the sleep. But I finally dozed off. I slept for maybe two hours, and I was suddenly sitting up wide awake. I slammed the door open in time to see two big robed figures coming in through the shattered window from the adjoining roof. I made a dive for the first one. It was like tackling a small pillar. He wrestled me more like a bear than a man. I got a lucky chance, and he went over my head and spoke. I was set for the second one, and my fist drove him back. He lunged at me. I ducked and let him go by and turned to meet number one. I must get the chair. I saw the chair coming down, but I was too late. It caught me above the left ear. I was on the floor telling myself to get up, only I didn't. When I finally cleared away some of the cobwebs, the room was empty. From below, I heard the crash of a door being broken open. I threw on some things in quick time, was down through the cafe, through the open door, and out onto the street. Far off down the dark street, I heard running footsteps, and I followed. They were always far enough ahead, so I couldn't see. When I reached the Sharia Ragoon, they were still nowhere in sight. I hesitated, and I stopped as a little form moved out of the shadows. Boxes, FNB. Boxes for a poor blind man. Uh, how much does it cost to see a few things? Fendi, I am a helpless man, very poor. A couple of big Egyptians with a girl. Which way they go? Uh, but the, the dark, it is everywhere. I see nothing. No bakshi. Here, yeah, yeah. Let's help. Ah, the, the piastas. But wait, Fendi, wait. Come on, you don't have to test them. They're good. As you say, Fendi, they are genuine. Now, what do you see now? Only two piastres. There's some more, but not till you tell me. Ah, suddenly the eyes of this humble man pierce the veil. I'll make it four piastres. Uh, they went into that great white house over the Nile. Now, dear, go buy yourself some carrots. Muta Shakir. In two minutes more, I had reached the great house on the Nile. All white symbol of power in Egypt. A front gate led to the wide courtyard, and I kept going past the fountain toward the main door till two guards quickly moved from their boots to bar my way. The intruder will be gone. Uh, I got lots of business here. The house of Sheikh el Bey sleeps. Well, let's wake him up. Back. The unbeliever is asking trouble. A lot of trouble you don't want to get mixed up in, brother. To the streets with you. It is a command. Yeah, well, I'm going the other way. Uh -huh. Papa, it is El Hatbe. Who comes to disturb the quiet of my house? An Americani, master. Let him approach me. The guards let go of my arms, and Sheik El Hatbe waited on the steps before the door. I couldn't help being fascinated with what I saw. Not the colored robes, or the fares that topped a slim face accented by a well clipped beard. It was something perched on his shoulder, a Baza falcon, its beady eyes, hooked beak and talons gleaming in the moonlight. By what right does an infidel come at this hour? Little case of kidnapping, El Hot Bay. What is your name? Name's Rocky Jordan. Now, where's Tarina? She is quite safe. She is of no interest to such as you. Think again. Tarina was sleeping at my cafe. Mashallah. She was brought there by her father, Ben Abram. I promised to protect her. You know what a promise means. It was not yours to give. But you admit Tarina was brought here against her will. By the orders of my honored nephew, Fingal Jarus. I, as his guardian, since the death of his father, give my blessing. Your nephew sent those two muscle boys to drag the girl from her bed? It was his right. Yeah, well, not in my books, El Bey. Mr. Jordan, it is obvious you have much to learn of the ways of the East. Until then, you had best accept my word. What about Ben Abram's word? It is like dirt at my feet. Supposing the police get wind of this, what will they think? May I suggest that you go now and find out and leave this house in peace? Yeah, not till I see Tarina and get her you story. You will not defile her again by your presence? Let her decide that. Then I have no choice. Batal, Shamak, throw this unbeliever into the streets. I will, master. <laughs> I rolled over three times, got up and started back for the gate till I saw the knives the guards had pulled out from somewhere. Then I knew getting to Torino right now would be about as easy as stealing the Sphinx. But it looked like the best thing I could do was to go to Ben Abram and admit I'd failed him. That took me all the way across Cairo to the East Hills. When I got to Ben Abram's house, it was empty. There was no sign of him, so I waited in the court. He finally showed up almost an hour later. He came staggering in at the point of exhaustion. 
great red marks across his face and his robe spotted with blood. I got to him and helped him to a bench. Please. Please, my friend. My welfare is nothing. But you've been hurt. Look, I'll get you to a doctor. No, tell me of my daughter. Why do you not guard her? I've got bad news, Ben Abram. Oh, tell me quickly. Tarina's in the house of Elhad Bay. It cannot be. I know, I promised. But... Well, two men got in from the roof. They were a little too much for me. They got her away, and I followed them to Sheik Elhad Bay's house. Then there is nothing more. She was taken there by orders of his nephew. Elhad Bay told me he had the right. Yes, it is as he says. No man has that right. No, I think it's time you made a few things clear. Yes, I must tell you now. Mr. Jordan, I loved my daughter more than my life. It was my desire that she marry in dignity. It has been written, an unwed daughter is like a broken wing. Sure, Abram. Three years ago, Mr. Jordan, while Tarina was but a child, I promised her as wife to Fingal Jarus, the nephew of El Bey. But since then, I have learned many things about Jarus. He is a kelp, a vicious man who would bring her nothing but sorrow. I think I'm beginning to see. A few days ago, Jarus came to me demanding that I bring Tarina to him as wife. I begged him to release me from my promise, but he would not listen. Yeah, but as her father... Oh, no, Mr. Jordan. She was his by right of our law. And Fingar would not listen. He threatened to take her from me. I could not entrust her to one of my own people. That's when you brought her to my place. Yes, I was willing to face dishonor to suffer humiliation, but my daughter must be protected from that man. What happened to me was nothing. Yeah, looks like I let you down. I am only grateful for your efforts, Mr. Jordan. Now, there is no way of getting her back. But look, we can do something. No, man's efforts are as nothing against the will of Allah. It was his decree... That my promise be fulfilled. I tried a couple of arguments, but all I met with was despair. I could tell Ben Abram wanted to be left alone, so I finally walked away. Just as I reached the gate, a black limousine pulled up. The back door opened, and after carefully adjusting his fez, out stepped Captain Sam Sabaya, Cairo Police. You will stay with me, Jordan. What's the complaint, Sam? You will learn in good time once I have talked with Ben Abram. He's right there in the courtyard. Come along. Ben Abram. Bismillah, Sephiope. It is with regret that I do not come as a guest of your house. Then for what purpose? To ask if you last night were in the home of Sheikh al Bey. You do not answer. Supposing he was, Sam. What about One him? moment, Jordan. Ben Abram, the marks on your face as from sharp claws. How do you explain them? It is as you say. They are the marks of the falcon. I was at El Had Bey's house. With the bird, he drove me away. Okay, Sam, maybe you'll be interested to know I was there too. I do know. Jordan, have I not warned you to keep away from such affairs as this, which do not concern you or any other foreigner? Abram entrusted Tarina to my care. To me, what has happened is kidnapped. I know our ways aren't always the same. Indeed, they are not, Jordan. Look, how about getting to the point? The nephew of al Bey is dead, slain by the knife. <sighs> Mushfahim. You're not accusing one of us. Perhaps that is not necessary. Wait. At what time was Fingal killed? But a short time after your daughter was brought to the house. Very well. It is best that I confess. Then I'll... I kill Fingal. Now do with me what you will. You are listening to The Broken Wing, tonight's adventure with Rocky Jordan. Don't miss the brand new comedy show coming up tomorrow night on most of these same stations. And steady now, it's called... Breakfast with Burroughs. Yes, the fellow who wrote The Girl with the Three Blue Eyes, the man who gets up so late he has breakfast in the middle of Monday evening, will be on hand with a bright, new, highly original program. And as though you hadn't guessed, his first name is Abe. So tomorrow, 
don't, please don't go to bed until you've had breakfast with Abe Burroughs on CBS tomorrow night at 6.30. Now we return you to Cairo and tonight's adventure with Rocky Jordan, the Broken Wing. Well, ordinarily I don't mix in family feuds, especially in Cairo. But I owed a debt to Ben Abram. When he entrusted his daughter Tarina to my protection, I had no choice. And I failed. Tarina was captured by her promised husband. Shortly after that, he was killed. When confronted with the news, Ben Abram confessed to the murder. Sam Sabaya took us to headquarters, got my story, and put Ben Abram in a cell. Then he let me stay with the old man for a few minutes, and I tried to get some sense out of him. My good Effendi, it is for the best. I don't see it that way, Ben Abram. But you must not concern yourself about me. I just don't think you're a man who would kill, that's all. Mr. Jordan, can you not see? What does murder mean to a soul that is already lost? Tarina is now free from the rash promise I once made. Look, you still have time to change the confession. No, no, please leave me now. I ask but one thing of you. Yeah? The happiness of my daughter. I leave her in your hands forever. I left him then. Ben Abram had given me a tall order, but I had to do what I could. Anyhow, I wanted to clear up a few things in my own mind, so I went back down to the big white house of Sheikh el Bay on the banks of the Nile. There was a steady stream of friends and relatives going in by way of the court. The bay was there at the door, greeting the mourners. The falcon still perched on his shoulder. Have I not sent you once from this house? I uh, just came back to set things right, El Hadbe. And another time, Jordan. My most gracious El Hadbe. What would you have, woman? It is I whom you summon for a few pieces of silver I come to mourn for the departed one. It is well. Take the silver. Uh, Return now to the upper chambers and well with the others. Not a shock here. No, no, money. A moment, woman. Your grief is most restrained. Perhaps a few more pieces of silver. Mm, the bay is most generous. Hey, now, uh, how about a word with me, eh? Have you not gone? I just want you to know, getting mixed up in this wasn't my idea. You have come to tell me that... Sheikh El Bay, the last thing I want to do is meddle in the affairs of your people. I hope you believe that. I regret very much the death of your nephew. I will make peace with you, Bismillah. Thanks. Do you mind telling me where Tarina is? She has no place in my house now. The girl is gone. Where? I do not know. I see. Oh, uh, one thing more. I'd like to see Fingal's body. It has not been prepared for burial. As a special favor? Then I'll go. Very well. I cannot refuse. This way, please. The adjoining room. My nephew is here. The only son of my elder brother. Yeah. I pray you spend little time. A uh, bandage on his chest. The knife was there. You think Ben Abram did it? By his own confession. For this outrage against my house, he also will die. Well, I took my cue and got out. Elhard Bay had no reason that I could see to lie about Tarina. And I knew she wasn't there. But there was no stopping now, till I'd found her and set Ben Abram's mind at rest. I took the long trip back out to Abram's place, but Tarina wasn't to be found. I tried a few people I knew were Abram's friends, and they'd seen nothing of her. For an American man, to find a veiled Muslim girl poses too many problems. I was finally back at Ben Abram's cell, telling him his daughter was gone. You must find her, Effendi. Where would she be? What's she hiding from? She's a tender child, only frightened. This has been a terrible ordeal for her. You still say you killed Fingal? There was no other way. Can you not see... I had a look at Fingal. I'm uh, 
Surprised you went for his throat. It had to be done quickly. The knife at the throat is certain. Ben Abram, you got a promise from me that still stands. But from now on, I got to have the truth. I do not understand. Fingal was stabbed in the chest. Only you didn't know that. Not the throat at all. It does not matter. Well, it does to me. Now, come on, admit it. You didn't kill him. Say what you will. Uh, I thought so. You're covering for Tarina, aren't you? You think she did it? She could have. Please forget this thing, Mr. Jordan. I am an old, disgraced man. She's young with a full life before. But the fact that you didn't do it... I alone am responsible for her sorrow. Should I not pay the penalty? I'm not the one to decide that. Mr. Jordan, before Allah, I swear the guilt shall remain on my shoulders. That's when I left Ben Abram. From now on, it was up to Tarina. She'd have to make the choice. But right then, I was kind of beat. I went back to the tambourine, drew a beer from the tap, and went up the steps and went back to my room where I could do some thinking. Where I'd find Tarina or where the search would begin was anybody's guess. But when I opened the door to my room, that much was answered. I await my mother. Tarina! Where have you been? It was the command of my father that I remain here. I return as soon as possible. How? Nobody saw you. A veiled girl could not enter by the door of this place. I came as the others last night by the roof. You sure know how to get around. My master, I would learn of my father. Where is he? He's in jail, Serena, for the murder of Fingal. But what does my father say? He confessed to me and everybody else. It is as I feared. I pray to Allah it would not be so. And now it's up to you whether he stays there or not. I do not understand. I would do anything. So happens I know Ben Abram didn't kill Fingal. You say he confessed. Is it not so? Only to protect you, Serena. He thinks you did it. And maybe I do too. No. No, that is not true. I said it's up to you, Serena. Keep quiet and you know what will happen to your father. He thinks that'll make you happy, but I don't. My master, let me speak. It is true that my father gave me the knife, charging me to protect myself. When I was taken before Fingal in the house of his uncle, he swore he would have me as wife. It was then that I drew the knife. All right, let's have the rest of it. I drove it at his chest, but I am weak and he was strong. The knife only scratched him. He threw me back in great fury and left the room, shouting I should be taken to the harem. I did not see him again. You think anyone's going to believe that, Serena? They have only to look at the wound, my master. Captain Zabaya speaking. Uh, Rocky, Sam. Yes, Jordan. Uh... Has there been an autopsy on Fingal's Jerus? Auto? Certainly not. For what possible reason do you ask? So you better do it, Sam. You'll find out some things. I will do no such thing. Besides, the burial procession leaves within the hour. Then get busy. There still may be time to stop it. Jordan, you know that cannot be done without cause. All you have to do is check on Sheikh El Bey's background. He was uh, quite a gambler, Sam. Find out how he stands financially. You'll get a surprise. What are you driving at, Jordan? Fingal was the only son of El Bey's elder brother. Now they're both dead. Who stands to benefit most by Fingal's death? That is of no consequence. We have the confessed murderer. But it's all wrong. Now hurry, Sam. Meet me at Elhard Bay's house in ten minutes. Jordan, you will not go to that place at such a time. Think again, Sammy. I'll see you there. What would you have me do, Master? Stay right here, Tarina. And keep those pretty little fingers crossed. I was off again for the big white house of Sheikh Elad Bey. This time, I knew the reason why. In nine minutes flat, I was there, and I didn't make it any too soon. The funeral procession was already moving out across the court. They had a drum beating, and along with the wailers, all in all, it promised to be a first-class affair. Right in the lead came Sheikh Elad Bey, falcon and all. Stand from the gate, Jordan. You're uh, rushing things a little, aren't you, Elad Bey? Can you not see the procession has begun? Why not the usual three-day wait? Afraid the police will come nosing around, maybe? Silence! The infidel would not desecrate the dead. 
Yeah, uh, by the way, just how did Fingal die? By the knife of Ben Abram. Sure. You want your nephew buried real quick so everyone will keep on believing that, right? Of what do you speak now? Supposing an autopsy proved the knife wound was nothing but a scratch. You knew Tarina tried to stab Fingal, but didn't kill him. So you decided to finish the job. Guard your words, Jordan. How'd you do it, with poison? Well, it's easy to find out, Elhut. The main thing is, you knew the blame would go to either Torino or Ben Abram. You didn't care which. And you'd have the family of wealth. Guards! Remove the lying infidel! They needn't bother. I was just going for a chat with the Cairo police. Before I could turn, the giant falcon was on me, striking with terrific power and driving me to the ground. I scrambled to my feet, sealing my face with my arms as the bird knifed in with its sharp claws. My shirt was in ribbons, my arms and head slashed in a dozen places. Now the falcon began circling and striking with its powerful wings, driving me down again. I braced myself for the third strike, but it never came. There was just one shot, and the winged killer lay dead at my feet. Uh, maybe it was loss of blood or exhaustion or downright fear. Maybe all three. Anyhow, for a while after that, I didn't know much. It was water on my face that brought me out of it. I was lying by the fountain. The procession had vanished except for a couple of police at the gate. I was getting personal attention from Sam Sabaya. Uh, lie quietly, Jordan. I will soon have the bleeding stopped. Oh, is it? Is there anything you can't do, Sam? <laughs> when one must contend with your unpredictable escapes, Jordan, much knowledge is necessary. Uh, what about Sheik Elhan? As you said, Jordan, Fengal's knife wound was superficial. The Sheik is being held pending an autopsy. Oh, then my hunch was right. The fact that the Sheik made this bizarre attempt on your life is proof enough at the moment. What about Ben Abra? I've ordered his immediate release. Uh, Jordan, is uh, there nothing more you wish to ask? What about? Tarina. As Ben Abram reminds me, a promise is a man's most priceless gift. What are you getting at? He says he has promised his daughter to you, Jordan. Oh, no. Not on your life. Look, look, you've got to talk to him. <laughs> Calm yourself, Jordan. I have convinced him that you will release him from his promise. You will not have to marry the girl. <laughs> Sam, why don't you mind your own business? CBS again at this same time next week for another story of adventure and intrigue when we take you back to Cairo and the Cafe Tambourine run by Rocky Jordan. Rocky Jordan, written by Gomer Cool and Larry Roman, stars Jack Moyles in the title role and was produced by Cliff Howell and directed tonight by Gordon T. Hughes, with original music by Richard Arant. Larry Thor speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Rocky Jordan. Not far from the Mosque Sultan Hassan in Cairo stands the Cafe Tambourine, run by Rocky Jordan. The Cafe Tambourine, crowded with forgotten men, alive with the babble of many languages. For this is Cairo, where modern adventure and intrigue unfold against a backdrop of antiquity. Tonight's story, The Race. I 
was sitting in my office at the tambourine, trying to beat the terrific afternoon heat. Like everyone else in the cafe, I was too shot to even raise a finger. Then in came this girl. She startled me a little, because she darted in under the tables in high gear, like she was searching for someone. When she began yakking at Chris, my bartender, my curiosity got the best of me. Someone jumping up and down in this heat deserved attention. As I walked over, I noticed she was nice-looking, in a quiet sort of way. In spite of the fact, she looked as if any moment she might spring right through the ceiling. But he has been here, hasn't he? I haven't seen him all day. Yeah. What's up, Chris? Oh, Rocky. This... I've got to find Abdullah, Ben Abdullah. They said he was up here at the tambourine. You know, Ben Abdullah, he owns that little pawn shop up on the corner. Yeah, sure, I know. It's very important. There isn't time to explain. Just tell me where I can find him, please. Every second counts. Well, I haven't seen him all day. I tried to tell her, Do you know but... where he is, then? Hmm, could be one of a thousand places. Why don't you try the pawn he shop? He's got a or... sign hanging on the door, out to lunch. A water vendor at the corner said he'd be up here. It's desperate, don't you see? No, I don't. If I don't get into that store in the next few minutes, there isn't going to be anything left of this whole block. Maybe the heat's got her, Rocky. It's too late to look for it. If I could just get into this hey, shop. Hey, 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 take it easy, lady. <laughs> oh, that won't get a thing accomplished. Now, come on, tell me what it's all about. Well, I, I, I'm afraid it's even too late now to break into this shop. I wouldn't even know where to look for it. Look for what? A high-powered explosive. A what? A bomb. It's in the pawn shop. A bomb? She's nuts. Uh, maybe you'd better start from the beginning. There, there's not time to explain. It will be going off in a few minutes. What we'd better do is clear the entire area before everyone is killed. Sunstroke, if you ask me. Hey, Chris, I don't know whether she's loony or... Don't stand there! Tell everyone to clear the streets! They'll listen to you, not me! Look, lady, I don't like to have my leg pulled. Every second counts now. Please, believe me. Anyone within a hundred yards of the pawn shop is in danger. Okay, okay. Chris, we better play it safe. Call the fire department, the police, and what have you. There's a bomb going off. I think. <laughs> well, maybe Chris was right. Maybe the dame had got too much sun and blown her top. But who could take chances on a bomb going off? I dashed down the street like a poor man's Mel Patton. And in what must have been the world's record, the block was completely empty. The girl attacked right along with me. And once the block was cleared, we made a run for the safety zone where the crowd had formed, a hundred yards away. When we were about sixty yards from it, the girl began to tug her arm and scream wildly at me. I'd fallen flat on my face and curled up like a clam. Outside of my eardrums almost breaking and a torn pair of pants, I was in pretty fair shape. After the thunder stopped, I looked back down the street. There was a black hole that was once Ben Abdullah's pawn shop. None of the shops on the block got off easy. As for the tambourine, there wasn't a window left in it. I turned to congratulate the girl on her king-sized bomb, but she was nowhere in sight. It was the sweetest job of vanishing into thin air I'd seen in some time. I started to get to my feet when I noticed that the where the girl had been lying was a crumpled pawn ticket. As I picked it up, a pair of familiar feet stopped in front of me. I looked up in the face of Captain Sam Sabaya, the Cairo police force, and his erstwhile shadow, Greco. Hi, Sam. Your bartender called us. Uh, give me a hand up. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Well, Sam, just goes to show you. Never underrate a woman. Your bartender explained the entire proceedings. Where is she? Looks like she took a powder. You mean... I do. If I may say so, my captain, it sounds too rehearsed. Ah, uh, good old Greco. And I hate to disappoint you, but I never saw the girl before in my life. Jordan, did she give you any hint as to what was behind the explosion? Nothing. Oh, uh, this pawn ticket might help. I'm sure it was hers. She mm -hmm. must have dropped it when she fell to the ground. I will take it. Thank you, Jordan. Should have her name and address on it. It has a name and address, all right. Only it's a man's name. Rollo Bendata. Hmm. Well, that's one on me. Rocky, you're wanted on the telephone. Oh, all right, Chris. I'll be right there. I want to ask you some more questions, Rocky. Uh, check with me in the tambourine, Sam. You won't have any trouble finding it. It's the only bell in the block in one piece. I hurried back to my office and picked up the phone. From the other end of the wire came the voice of my late friend, 
A young lady whose specialty seemed to be high-powered explosives. Mr. Jordan, I'm sorry I had to run out on you. Well, so am I. You must understand, I couldn't face the police. Uh, where are you now? I won't waste words. I'm in terrible trouble. I need your help. I'll pay anything for it. Well, you can pay for the broken windows and the tambourine. Anything. Will you help me? I'm afraid tossing bombs is a little out of my line. Believe me, I'm not asking for myself. It's for hundreds of innocent people who may be harmed. Yeah, you know, I could back that line with hearts and flowers. Mr. Jordan, if I weren't on the level, would I have warned you about the explosive in the pawn shop? Eh, all right. You tell me, I'll listen. I can't over the telephone. I'll give you an address where you can meet me. Okay. But look, lady, I'm leaving word with my bartender where I'm going. Just in case you got more bombs up your sleeve. She gave me an address that was on the edge of Cairo. As I hung up, I saw Sabaya and Greco coming in the front door, so I took off the back way. I took a taxi and we drove for an hour. The address turned out to be a small house set one mile out in the desert. I paid off the hack went up and knocked on the door. Are you alone? Yeah. Well, you couldn't have picked a closer place. I'm sorry, but I live here. Come in. Huh? Oh, looks more like a laboratory to me. It is. I'm an explosives chemist. I live in the back. Hmm. Dangerous address. I- I'd better introduce myself. I'm, I'm Suzanne Durand. Won't you sit down? Uh, no, thanks. Not on a keg of dynamite. And stop jumping up and down. I, I can't help it. We only have 11 hours left. Hey, look, I've had enough riddles for one day. What's this all about? I, I'll, I'll start from the beginning. But it would help. A, a man by the name of Nagy Sear hired me to develop a time bomb that would have a 24-hour action delay. Why? He needs it. He heads a combine that wants to blast for water in the desert. What? You can imagine what it would mean if you could bring an incessant water supply to Cairo. Well, sure, but uh, why not a regular time bomb or dynamite? He wanted an explosive that would need no wiring so that his company wouldn't attract attention. Why all the secrecy? Why, it's like digging for gold. He thinks he's found a spot where there might be water, and he doesn't want anyone to know till he staked his claim. Well, I think he's crazy. Uh, where does the pawn shop come in? I made two bombs, which I was going to test today. I was afraid my servant might accidentally spoil them, so I hid them in the base of an old clock. I went shopping, and when I came back, the clock was gone. Mm-hmm. The servant must have needed money, so he stole the clock, never realizing the bombs were in there, and pawned it. Is your servant's name uh, Rollo Bendata? Yes. How, how did you know? You left his pawn ticket on the street. It looks to me like Rollo's in trouble, not you. Only one of the bombs went off in the pawn shop. Oh, don't you see? The other one will go off. You mean we're going to have to go through that all again? The bombs were set to go off at different times. Well, but the blast of one could have exploded the second one. Yes, but you only heard one explosion, didn't you? Yeah. Only one exploded, Mr. Jordan. I could tell by the force. Well, maybe Rollo's got the other bomb. I've already talked to him. He swears he knows nothing about them. Oh, fine. I, I don't know where to look for it, and according to my calculations, the bomb should go off in ten hours and forty-six minutes. Well, uh, what's this bomb look like? A, a small object made of lead with a screw arrangement. When it's screwed down, the process begins. Two liquids, one eats through the separation, oh, and... Oh, I, I get it. Hundreds of people will be killed. Look, I... if you want me to help, you got to promise me one thing. Name it. Stop jumping up and down. Uh, oh, I, I, I promise... Uh, this, uh, this guy, Negri Seer, you mentioned. Uh, you know where he lives? Yes. Come on, let's pay him a visit. I'll call a taxi. You're bouncing up and down again. I- I'm sorry. Now relax, will you? You've still got ten hours and forty-six minutes. Ten hours and forty-four minutes. We taxied across town to Negri Seer's apartment house. Negri let us in. He was the oddest little guy I'd ever laid eyes on. Short, skinny, but he had a huge head that should have gone with the body of a giant. <laughs> he looked so top-heavy, I had to control myself from wanting to hold him up so he wouldn't topple over. His apartment was cluttered with bric-a-brac and large packing cases. The latter, I gathered, must have had something to do with his water project. When Suzanne told him about the bomb, he got quite irked, to say the least. Really, my dear, I don't know what you expect me to do if you've lost one of your ghastly bombs. Well, coming here was my idea. And just who are you, Jordan? Suzanne, who is this man? He's trying to help me. You didn't tell him, I hope. I, 
I'm afraid I had to. You were sworn to secrecy. How could you? Well, Jordan, you'll never find out where I hope to get water. I'm not interested in your plan for digging water. I'm only trying to locate the bomb. Oh, this is dreadful. It will be all over Cairo. Everyone will be digging for water. No one outside of this room will know. Besides, you're the only one who knows the locale where the water might be. Huh? So you're going to blackmail me, huh? Or maybe you're going to torture me till I tell you the exact spot. Look, for the last time... What will my partners think? I will tell you nothing. Rocky, we can't afford to waste all this time. Look, Negri, if you'll just answer a few questions. Never. Were you out at Suzanne's place this afternoon? I... Yes, but she wasn't home, so I left. I, I was probably tracking down Rollo. What time were you out there? Our appointment was for two. I'm always on time. Did you see anyone or notice anything that might help us? No, no, no. Is that clear? Very. There are only eight hours left, Rocky. What are we going to do? All right, hang on to yourself. Suzanne, I want you to take this man out of here right away or I'll call the police. We're going. So help me, I warn you. You'll never find out where I'm going to get water. Never. What I'm wondering is if we'll ever find out where to find that other bomb. Ever. You are listening to The Race, tonight's adventure with Rocky Jordan. May we suggest that you vary your CBS listening. Education is one of the most important phases of life today. Starting Monday, tomorrow night, Harvard University's President James Bryant Conant will discuss America's free public school system in a series of five talks each evening next week. As a thinking citizen, you'll find this series informative and important. So find out when the CBS program You and Education will be heard over your local CBS station and tune in. We think it will be well worth your while. Now we take you back to Cairo and tonight's adventure with Rocky Jordan, The Race. It all began when a dame chemist named Suzanne Duran mixed up a couple of bombs for a character called Negri Seer, who had himself a great scheme. He was going to blast for water in the Sahara and make Egypt a garden spot. That sounded sort of screwy, but the noise of one of those bombs exploding sounded anything but. Well, that took care of one, but there was still another bomb someplace in the Near East, and Suzanne figured it would go off in eight hours. Where was it? Well, you tell me. Negri Seer couldn't. We asked him. Well, when we came out on the street, Suzanne was hopping up and down again and on the verge of tears. And uh, she looked at me as though I could supply all the answers. Mr. Jordan, there must be something we can do. Do uh, you know where the office of the Cairo Mail is? Yes. Good. Now listen. And stop jiggling. We have a plan, then? Maybe. We're going to have to split up to save time. All right. Now get out of the newspaper office and ask for Ed Stack. He's a friend of mine. Give him a description of the bomb. What else? That's all. You'll get out an extra and see that it's broadcast, too. That way, everyone will be warned and on the lookout. Oh, that's wonderful. And when you're finished there, go to the tambourine and wait for me. Where are you going? Where can I find Rollo? Native Porters, number 6, Okar Street. Uh, check. Rocky, I, Look, I don't... will you stop worrying? It's going to be okay. Take my word for it. Yeah, it was going to be okay, Sure. Only I wish I could have believed it. I was stymied from ear to ear. I put Suzanne in a taxi and she was whisked off toward the newspaper office. I wanted to cross the street to get a taxi myself when up roared Sam Sabaya, taking the corner on two wheels. Jordan! Well, this is a coincidence, Sam. I traced you through this taxi company. Where's the girl? On her way to the newspaper office. Rocky, I'm losing my patience. You said you did not know the girl. When I finally traced her, I learned she has been with you. Sam, hang on to your brass badge. Got something to tell you. Well, Jordan, I'm waiting. She's working for a character named Negri Seer. Negri Seer? Hmm? Yes, I've heard something of him. He's a dealer in fine art, a collector and such. Fine art, eh? Well, he's got a sideline. What do you mean? The girl's a chemist. He hired her to make a couple of tickless bombs to blast for water in the Sahara. But, Jordan, are you serious? So help me, Sam. That's a story I got. Blast for water in the Sahara? Shh. It's a secret. Jordan, this is not an amusing matter. 
Water in this part of the world is nothing to laugh at. There are those in these desert lands who make of it a, a religion. Yet is it possible to blast for water in the Sahara? Negri Seer thinks so. Or so he says. What could be done to all this arid land? Jordan, is this a trick? Well, your guess is as good as mine. That I am inclined to think it is. Well, the bomb was real enough. Yes, yes, of course. We must make every effort to locate the other... But still... Yes, eh? Jordan, if that girl is not at the newspaper office, as you say, I'm going to hold you responsible for aiding her escape. Sam took off, and I checked the time and shuddered. Then I headed for the home of Ronald Bendata, Suzanne's servant, for my talk with him. I knocked, hopefully, on his door. No one answered, so I tried the door. It was open. The room was kind of dark. I took a few steps and stumbled. I didn't have to look twice to know I'd stumbled over a body. The body was real dead. That's when a door slammed behind me. I wheeled around and right into a native holding a gun. Your hands in the air, Fan. Hey, what is this? You kill my brother Rollo, yes? Rollo? Why you kill him? You're making a mistake, buddy. No, no, you kill him, you despised Westerner. I told Rollo to keep away from Stop you. Stop waving that gun around. First working for the despised Fendi with a big head. Now this. I kill you to avenge his death. <laughs> I told Barnum as he fired, the shots went wild. We rolled around for a while, fighting for the gun. And I pulled away and caught him with a hard right. He dropped to the floor. Well, there was no sense in hanging around, with one of my hosts in the refrigerator and the other in the deep freeze. So Rollo was really working for Negri Seer. I raced up the street till I came to a public telephone and called the tambourine. I wanted to tell Suzanne what I found out about her servant. Uh, Chris, this is Rocky. Boy, I'm glad you called. Sabaya just left. Oh, what's up? He missed the girl again, and he thinks you gave him the business. Well, that's why I'm calling. Where is she? She was only here a minute, then left with some guy. Who? I don't know. He was a little guy with the biggest head. Negri Seer. What's going on, Rock? Uh, it beats me. But there's a noise that's going to rock Cairo in a couple of hours, and I got a feeling Sabaya's going to be looking at me. Well, there were a lot of lies in it someplace. I raced for Negri's apartment, but the place was deserted. Negri was gone. Suzanne wasn't there, but neither were the packing cases that belonged to Negri Seer. That took me to the railroad station double time. I pushed through the crowd till I came to the gates for departing trains. And waiting in one of the lines was Negri Seer. Jordan, what are you doing here? Looking for you. You better step out of line. Do not be too hasty, Jordan. Come on, out of the line before I drag you. Uh, Dear fellow, let us talk this over where no one may overhear us. All right. All right, over into this corner. There. Now... You listen. I... I'm going to do the talking. But, my dear fellow, I... Where's Suzanne? You... But how should I know? I... Oh, I know. You're still trying to trick me into revealing secrets Close that will... It. Rollo Vendetta, Suzanne's servant, was working for you. That means he took those bombs from Suzanne's place purposely, on your orders. That means also he knocked one bomb, the one on the clock, at that pawn shop on your orders, too. Lies! Lies! Deceitful! All right. One bomb hocked, one bomb still on the loose. All on purpose, too, Negri. You figured if one went off, Suzanne would think both of them went off. Meanwhile, you'd have one to toy with. Go ahead, persecute me. Persecute me if you wish. Ah, oh, come off it. So what if I say you are right? What then? So the bomb's going to explode in an hour and a half. I'll make your head ring until you tell me where it is. <laughs> that would never succeed. I will never tell you. I will never tell you where the bomb is or why I have placed it there. That water blasting's a phony deal. Indeed. I bet your packing cases will give me some answer. I am the only one who knows the whereabouts of the bomb, and I will not tell. I will not tell unless... Huh? What's the deal? Allow me to leave Cairo. Allow me to leave Cairo, and I shall reveal the... So Either one of them. Well, Greco. Jordan, you have trapped me. 
You had deliberately led the police to me. Come, the both of you, to police headquarters. Uh, put away that gun, Greco. You're attracting attention. Come, I say. No, you will not capture me. You will not take me and beat. Huh? Don't shoot, Greco. Don't shoot him. He's the only one. No! Oh. Come on, then. Oh. I told you, you will not take me and beat. Hey, you did it up right, Greco. He's dead. I had no choice. He reached for a gun. Everybody, stand back. Uh, you'll probably get a promotion for this. It was me or him. I had no choice. Attention, everyone. Stand back. Now, Jordan. 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 Where are you? I dove into the crowd and got lost. Well, I was free of Greco, but I was right back where I started. I checked the time again. In an hour and ten minutes, that bomb would go off. And the only man who knew where it was was dead. Well, I mulled the whole thing over for a while. All that was left were those packing cases of Negri's. It took me ten minutes to find them. They were being loaded into a baggage car at the end of the line. I hurried up to one of the native porters and tried to con him. Oh, look, I uh, want to check my baggage to see if I forgot anything. Yes, Effendi. Which are yours? Uh, those packing cases over there. Yes, Effendi. Your luggage checks? Uh, luggage checks? I cannot let you look into the cases without them. <laughs> I, uh, I left them with my wife. Oh, sorry, Effendi, but I cannot do it. It is against the regulations and I cannot... I didn't want to hit him, but who had time to argue or explain? I began ripping into the packing cases marked fragile. The first case had some figures carved in marble and some pictures, but they didn't ring any bells. It wasn't until I got inside the second case that I saw the light. It contained a green jade vase that I knew I'd seen before. And right then and there, Negri's whole deal became clear. I knew where the bomb was and why. I scrambled out to the street. When I looked at my watch, I broke out in a cold sweat. It was less than an hour. Fifty minutes, to be exact. I dashed up to a taxi and shook the sleeping driver. Wake up, will you? Come on. Palace of Fine Arts. Come on, let's go. Look, money. Maybe this will wake you up. The night is so hot, Effendi, for such energy. It is dough. All of it's yours, you understand? Step on it. I will try. Well, to... The Palace of Fine Arts. It is closed at this hour. I know it's closed. Let me worry about that. Yes, Effendi. Get in. It is too hot to worry. Can't you go any faster than this? In this weather, the motor gets hot. <sighs> well, excuse me. I didn't mean to keep you awake. Between yawns, we lumbered along, and it was 20 minutes later before we pulled up in front of the Palace of Fine Arts. I threw the money at the driver, raced up the tier of steps that led to the entrance. The joint was dark, but I saw a woman waiting in the shadows of the doorway. Suzanne. Hawk, he said you... Yes. I was beginning to get worried. Maybe he said you had located the bomb and instructed me to meet you here. Well, double talk. Now, don't start jumping. The bomb is in this building. But Negri said Never that... mind, Negri. I'll explain later. We've only got a few minutes. This building covers a square block. Uh, there must be a guard around. Inside. Uh, look, start screaming. I'll bang on the door. Help! On the door! Help! Please! Ah! All right, that's enough. Here he comes. Ah! I said that's enough. Stop it! I'm sorry, I had to hit you. Uh, oh, it, it... It's all right, my, my nerves. I, I I couldn't stop. Oh, here's the guard. Oh, open up. we got to get inside. There's a bomb in there. Go away. We are closed. Open up. There's a bomb in there. It is after hours. Can you not read? He can't hear you. I stand back. I'm going to smash the glass with my foot. Yeah. He's got a gun. You you are under arrest. For the last time, there's a bomb in here. Uh, what are you saying? Someone has planted a bomb here. It's going to go off in about 11 minutes. You... You mean the bomb they have been talking about over the radio? Yes. Oh. C- come in. Now that we're in, Rocky, what are we going to do? Come on, follow me. Look out. There's a million places to look. All right, here. Uh, here's a jade room. Come on. Yeah, over there, that green jade face. It's a 
same as the one Negri had in the packing case. Here, wait a minute. I'll fish down into it. There. There. Well, here's your bomb. That's it. All right, do something to it, Suzanne. Loosen the screw, then pour off the top liquid. Won't go off now. Oh, where's the, where's the guard? Back, back there. He, he fainted. I, I guess he, he couldn't take it. Suzanne, this is no time to leave me standing here alone. Well, that was about it. Negri had himself a fine little deal. The water blasting, of course, was phony. That was just his way of getting Suzanne to make a couple of bombs, tickless ones. The first explosion was to make it seem as though both bombs went off. But the live one that Negri kept, he planted in the Palace of Fine Arts to cut up his robbery. Negri was to walk off with a lot of priceless odd objects, leave some phonies in its stead, then blow up part of the building so that no one would ever know the real art object had been taken. And the tickless bomb was necessary so that it wouldn't attract attention, sitting there real quietly in the green jade vase. Yeah, art can be a pretty interesting subject, I guess. I'll never forget the life class I once took when I was a kid. Funny thing about it, though, it was a pretty fascinating class, but somehow I can't remember that I ever had any time in it for painting. It's CBS again at this same time next week for another story of adventure and intrigue when we take you back to Cairo and the Cafe Tambourine run by Rocky Jordan. Just another reminder to all our CBS listeners, You and Education, a series of five talks, begins Monday and will be heard each night next week on your local Columbia station. Consult your newspaper for the broadcast time. You and Education brings you the views of a distinguished American, James Bryant Conant, president of Harvard University, in a discussion of the free public school system. Be sure to listen to CBS for You and Education. Rocky Jordan, starring Jack Moyles in the title role, is produced by Cliff Howell and directed tonight by Gordon T. Hughes. Original music was by Richard Arant and conducted by Ivan Dittmars. Tonight's story by Bernard Gerard was edited by Gomer Kuhl and Larry Roman. Larry Thor speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, the refreshing, delicious treat that gives you chewing enjoyment, presents for your listening enjoyment, John Lund as... Johnny Dollar. Ed Quigley, Johnny. Are you free? If you mean am I available, yeah. What's up, Ed? Uh, remember Mark San Antonio? The bootlegger? Yeah, sure. What about him? Well, somebody shot him this morning. Shot him to death in St. Petersburg, Florida. Oh, yeah? Great Eastern Fidelity set up a trust two years ago for San Antonio's daughter. They want a full report before they come across. I see. They know who killed him yet or why? No, not a thing, Johnny. Just that he's dead. When can you leave? As soon as I can get a plane. Good. The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum bring you John Lund in a transcribed adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum refreshes you. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum gives you real chewing enjoyment. Yes, for chewing enjoyment plus refreshment, it's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. The lively, delicious flavor of Wrigley's Spearmint cools your mouth, helps keep your throat moist, and gives you a nice little lift. 
The good smooth chewing of Wrigley's Spearmint helps keep you feeling fresh and alert, adds enjoyment to whatever you're doing. So for chewing enjoyment plus refreshment, treat yourself often to Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office, Great Eastern Fidelity and Life Insurance Corporation, 6th and Jordan Avenue, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the San Antonio matter. Expense account item one, $162.03. Transportation and incidentals, Hartford to St. Petersburg, Florida. I arrived exactly ten hours after I received the call from Ed Quigley. The rainy weather there was as bad, if not worse, than the weather I just left. I checked in at the St. Petersburg Hotel, shaved, showered, had a meal, and started in. My first contact was a police officer, Lieutenant Benjamin by name. A big, swarthy man who seemed to know what he was about. I, uh, I don't quite get this, Dollar. What's your part? Just that my insurance company would like a full report on everything that's happened. Oh, you mean a report separate from what we have? Yeah, that's about it, Lieutenant. Well, it's their dough. They can spend it any way they want to. What can I do for you? Well, maybe we can help each other, Lieutenant. If you'll sort of let me tag along and see what's what on the case. <laughs> we'll see. Well, San Antonio bought a big place over on the south end of town 11 years ago, just after he was released from Alcatraz. He's lived there ever since. Quiet, minding his own business, keeping his nose out of trouble. Yeah, so I understand. Well, as long as a man does that, even a man with a background like San Antonio, as long as a man does that, we don't bother him, he doesn't bother us. Well, today was the first peep we ever got out of him. What happened? Seems at six o'clock this morning, he phoned into the station and said that somebody was watching his house. Prowl car went out to have a look around. He told the officers that two men had been hanging around the front of his house, but they got away just before the car showed up. Uh huh. He give a description? Yeah, yeah. Both about six feet, dark, wore dark overcoats and hats. San Antonio didn't recognize either of them. The officers put the description on the air and tried to find them, but they didn't have any luck. Now, San Antonio wasn't the kind of a bird to get excited about a couple of guys staking out his place. He pretty well knew how to take care of himself and handle trouble. Yeah, but you say that uh, he hadn't been in trouble or asked for any around here. That's right, too. And I'm sure he didn't want any either. So his call was treated like any other prowler call. We investigated, didn't find anything, and promised to keep our eyes open. Mm -hmm. The uh, cook came on duty about 8.30. She went in the kitchen, made him some breakfast, took it up to his room, and she found him dead. He'd been shot twice with a Luger. The lab has the slugs now. It was a close-range job. Well, then the surest bet is the two men that San Antonio reported watching his house, huh? Well, that's about it. Wish we could find them somewhere. What about the cook? Uh, she just worked their days fixing his meals and taking care of him. San Antonio must have been past 60. He was 67. <laughs> I guess he was beginning to show a little tread. man who's lived the kind of life he has and done the things he's done is bound to show some wear and want some rest sometime in his life. According to her, he spent his days painting. Painting? Yeah. Mark San Antonio? Every room in the house covered with pictures he's done these last few years. Oil's pretty good, too. And when he wasn't painting, he was listening to records. All kinds of heavy stuff in the way of music around the place. Now, you hardly figure a bootlegger like San Antonio thinking of anything like music and art. Hardly ever. Yeah. Well, and all the time he was in action running booze up in New York and getting himself in trouble with the tax people, he was bound to step on a lot of toes and get himself a lot of enemies. The kind of people who wouldn't forget. You, uh, you talk to him much? Oh, yes. Now and then I'd meet him on the street or in a store. He seemed pretty gentled up. Hmm. How'd he live? Apparently, he saved something from the old days. A house he paid for in cash. The bank in New York used to send him a statement every month. I suppose he had some arrangement with them. Well, that's about it so far. I see. Well, I sure appreciate the information. It's okay. When I get any more, I'll let you know. Crime Lab's still working on some of the stuff in his room. Maybe we'll get something there. Mm-hmm. Say, uh, do you mind if I talk to that cook? Oh, that's your privilege, Dollar. Her name's Olson. She's staying at the San Antonio house during all this. 
Okay. Uh, San Antonio's daughter blew into town this afternoon. She's at the house, too. What did she have to say? Oh, nothing. She she didn't even know Mark San Antonio was her father until your insurance company told her. Didn't know? No, no. She's been living in Philadelphia all these years with an aunt. All very legitimate. The girl's been using the name Randall. Edith Randall. Yes, sir. How do you do? Uh, you Mrs. Olson? Yes, sir. My name is Dollar, Mrs. Olson. I'm from the Great Eastern Fidelity people. You suppose I could speak with Miss Randall? Oh, I don't think so, sir. She's not feeling well. All of this has been quite a shock to her. I see. Well, then I guess my trip out here tonight was for nothing. Well, you come tomorrow, Mr. Dollar. Please. Mrs. Olson? Mrs. Olson? Yes, Miss Randall. Who is it? It's uh, Mr. Dollar. He's from the insurance company. I... Insurance company? Yes. I'd like to talk to him, Mrs. Olson. The woman who stood at the base of the iron grill stairway was tall and dark-eyed. She came toward me smiling, showing a frank, wide, happy mouth. Young kind of face that could have been 20 or maybe 30. Mrs. Olson excused herself and we were alone. I wanted to talk to someone who might be able to give me a little more information about all this. It's all quite new to me. Well, I'll tell you what I can, Miss Randall. Yes, I'm sure you will. From what Mr. Hirth and the insurance offices told me on the phone, I'm to be quite well off because this man was murdered here today. You mean Mr. San Antonio? Yes, Mr. San Antonio. They tell me he was my father. To awaken one morning and discover you're not one person, but an entirely different person. I mean... I'm the daughter of a famous racketeer who's been murdered. You seem to me like a very nice person. And so do you, Mr. Dollar. Will you tell me all about this, please? Well, just our part of it, Miss Randall. Let's see, uh, you're 26 now, is that right? That is. Well, 26 years ago, your father was on trial for income tax evasion. Just before he was convicted, he set up a trust fund with my insurance company... To provide for you. It's been paying money for your support and education all these years. According to the condition of the trust, the rest of the money reverts to you now. It comes to well over $50,000. And that's all there is to it? Yeah, except for this. You mean my father... It's so strange to say that. My father's murder? Mm-hmm. I suppose I'm grateful to my father... I suppose I should be grateful. I can't say that I'm particularly sorry about his death any more than I would be if any human being died violently somewhere. How strangely life treats us sometimes. How very strangely. You know, you've somehow made me feel comfortable in this house. May I offer you a drink? It was strange for me, too, because... I felt comfortable in the house. Over the drinks, we talked of Mark San Antonio. I told her what I knew of his life, of his activities up until the time he'd been sent to Alcatraz. She told me how she'd been reared, far removed from anything that might have connected her in any way with the San Antonio name. Altogether, it was a revealing conversation for both of us. She'd never imagined any part of the kind of life her father had lived. And I never imagined that it was possible for anyone to get away from a man like San Antonio. For the road, Johnny? All right. How long will you be in St. Petersburg? Till all this is straightened out. You mean you'll be here until they find out who killed him? Mm-hmm. How about you? Oh, I really don't know. I really don't even know why I came here exactly. Yes, I do. I wanted to see him, see what he looked like, what kind of a life he led here. Did you see him? No. I suppose I can if I want to. But I have seen what kind of a life he had. He was just an ordinary man, wasn't he? Have you noticed the pictures he's painted? 
Mm hmm. May I ask you something? Well, yes. How do you feel about him now? Is this for your report? Hmm. For myself. Since you've been here, in these last two hours, I've begun to think of him for what he was. My father, I mean. I'd like to know why he was killed and who did it. Will I see you again? I hope so. Edith. Yes? I hope so very much. So do I, Johnny. I left her at the door that night with a warm sensation inside of me. Something I certainly hadn't expected in the routine business of investigating a murder case. The next morning I was back at the house talking to Mrs. Olson. She gave me all the information she could remember about San Antonio's activities up until the time of his death. Same information she'd given the police. All of it accurate, but lacking in any possible clue as to the identity of his slayer or slayers. I had breakfast with Edith there and then went back downtown to spend a solid 12 hours in the company of Lieutenant Benjamin, who had still not located or identified the two mysterious men. However, there were other developments. Say, this may be something. Oh? San Antonio's partner in the old days, Palalici, was murdered in Newark last night. Timmy Palalici? That's the one. Any details? No, just that he was shot to death with a Luger. When the slugs taken from San Antonio's body were compared with those that killed Palalici and were proved to have been fired from the same gun, the case took on new proportions. Every available bit of information regarding the two ex-big shots of the 20s was located, read, and re-read. It meant activity in such cities as St. Louis, Chicago, New Orleans, and Buffalo. But no new information as to the identity of the killer. Johnny. Hey, what is it? You're, you're shaking. Hold me. Hold me, please. I suppose I'm being a terrible fool about it all, Johnny. But they've been after me all day. Cheap little things. A newspaper syndicate wants me to write my exclusive story as the daughter of Mark St. Antonio. Fairy princess, daughter of racketeer. Hey, hey, now take it easy, honey. Even Hollywood called. Some producer saw my picture in the paper and offered me a contract. He says he has a script already. Come on, come on now, come on. I'll try. Women are fools, aren't they? I shouldn't have come here. I shouldn't have shown up at all. Then what would I have done, Edith? Then what would I have done? Make yourself a drink, Johnny, and I'll put on a new face. It had become apparent to me in the five days I had known her and the five days that she'd known of her father that she'd grown to love him, or the memory of him. She stated it very simply. Everyone needs a father. If you find out you have one, or had one, really, well, you love him. We were walking up the gravel path of the house when she said that. I suppose I was thinking of how nice it would be to kiss her at the door when I heard someone behind me. Ah! I twisted, trying for the gun in my inside pocket, but there was nobody to shoot at. At least nobody I could see. Why me? Why me, Johnny? Why? Edith died right there, and I lowered her to the ground. Friends, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, you'll enjoy chewing Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. Chew Wrigley's Spearmint while you're working. The lively, full-bodied flavor of Wrigley's Spearmint gives you a refreshing little lift. The smooth, pleasant chewing of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum helps keep you feeling relaxed and satisfied. Makes your job seem easier. Chew Wrigley's Spearmint Gum in your home, when you're out walking or driving, when you're enjoying sports and other activities. Wrigley's Spearmint Gum tastes good any time, and the natural chewing aids digestion and helps keep your teeth bright and attractive. Yes, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, 
you'll enjoy chewing Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. And now, with our star, John Lund, we bring you the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Ten seconds after Edith Randall died in my arms, I was stumbling down the gravel path that led from the house to the road. It all happened so suddenly and violently that I can't say that what I did from there on or what I felt was entirely rational. All I know is that a car was parked at the deep end of the gateway and two men were just climbing into it. Hey, hey, you two, stop! 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 Get out of there. Both of you. Get out with your hands up. I'm hit. I'm afraid to move. Get out! Come on. I'm coming. I come. All right, you two. Come on, come on. Uh, no use on him, mister. He's used up. You got him real good. You... I, I need the dog. Stay where you are. Mr. Dollar! Mr. Dollar! What is it? What's happened? Go phone the police, Mrs. Olson. Oh. Let me get over here right away. Who are they? What is all Go on, do what I tell you. Hurry. All right, Mr. Dollar. All right. You... You pretty tough fella. What's your name? Giuseppe Rico. Who's he? He was my brother. Giovanni. <laughs> I need the doctor. <laughs> Listen. Tell it to me. Tell it to me right now. There's no policeman around to cover you. Nobody but you and me. If you don't tell it to me now, you'll never tell it to anybody. Now tell it. Tell it. Never, never. I die first. I had one bullet left in my gun. I set the barrel back against his temple and pulled back the hammer. I think I really meant to go through with it. And for the first time, I noticed that my shoulder was covered with blood. My head began to ring, and I had to let go and straighten up. That was not the thing to do. Oh! Lieutenant. Quite a night, this one, huh? Yeah. But... Oh, you stopped one, boy. You were sure curled up when we got there. Edith? I'm sorry, Dollar. I thought I might have been wrong. No, you weren't. How long am I slated for this place? Well, the doctor says you can get out when you want to. Feel like talking? They were just there, and they shot her. That's it. Which one? I don't know. They were together. That's enough, isn't it? Sure, sure. Same Luger that killed San Antonio and Palalici. Just trying to pin it down a little more. We can't get much out of the one that's left. Let me ask him some questions, Lieutenant. Easy, easy. I know how you feel about her. Just lie back there now. (sighs) Did he say anything at all? No, nothing more than his name and his brother's name. Found papers on him that say they're from New York. Police New York are looking him up right now. So far, they haven't been able to find any connection with San Antonio. People like San Antonio and Palalici make enemies, but but that girl, it doesn't figure. And those two flew here from New York just to get her. Yeah, yeah. Dollar, you talked to her a lot in these last few days. What'd she say? Nothing that has anything to do with this. You know yourself, she didn't even know who her father was till he got killed. That could have been an act. No, it wasn't. I knew her well enough to... Mm. Tell you that. Yeah, well, why would they gun her down? Why the trip? That Rico boy you're holding in the jail hospital has the answer. Get it from him. Yeah, we will, Dollar. We will. Oh, there's someone. Hey, just a minute. Sure. Oh, 
Oh, Dollar. Huh? Maybe I spoke too soon. Rico died five minutes ago. As far as my investigation of the San Antonio case went, could have ended right there. The Luger found in the dead Rico brother was the same gun that had fired fatal bullets into all three victims. I got my release from the hospital and late that afternoon walked into Lieutenant Benjamin's office. Dollar, I don't get it. Don't get what? Here. This just came from New York on the Rico boys. Oh? Came to this country when they were 18 and 21. Both of them were naturalized citizens. Records? Not a thing. No trouble ever. Oh, that's funny. What else? Well, that's about it. Police there can't seem to locate their old man. He disappeared a week ago. Lived on the east side somewhere. He a naturalized citizen, too? Oh, that's another funny thing. He's taken out his papers and was due for examination with the immigration people this week. They're looking for him, too. Um, when are you leaving? Tomorrow afternoon on the one o'clock plane. Well, come on, I'll buy you some dinner. We had dinner together and talked about the case. It had been a strange one. The deaths were useless, the motives unknown. The killers weren't even associated with their victims. I parted company with Lieutenant Benjamin and went back to my hotel to trouble it out with sleep. About 11 o'clock, I had a phone call. Johnny Dollar. Hi, Dollar, this is Ben. Oh, what's up? Old man Rico just walked into the city morgue. He wants to take his two sons back to New York for burial. Twenty minutes later, I was standing in the coroner's office when Lieutenant Benjamin led a small, wizened old man into the room and sat him down in one of the chairs. Gave him a glass of water, offered him a cigarette. Old man refused. No, 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 senora, no. Oh. Thank you. Mr. Rico, this is Mr. Dollar. Hello, Mr. Dollar. Mr. Rico? I read of you. You killed my boys. You saw? Yes. They tried to kill me. Yeah, I know, I know. Uh, it's a bad... Why, Mr. Rico? It, it is simple. You was in the way. I don't mean about me. I mean about Edith Randall and Palalici and Mark San Antonio. Why? I take the water now, please. Why? Do you know why? See. Si. And tell me. They're all dead now. I'm still alive. Pietro Rico was held in custody for the immigration officials. He refused to talk about his sons or any of their activities. He just stayed in his jail cell, silent, non-committal to all visitors, including the chaplain. I don't suppose we'd ever have gotten the story of it, except that the will of Mark San Antonio disclosed that before her marriage to him, his wife's name had been Maria Rico. Yeah. More questions, Mr. Dollar? No, I've got some answers. Mark San Antonio's wife was your daughter, wasn't she? Uh... Wasn't she? She. Well, is that all you have to say? I don't talk. Well, and I do, Mr. Rico. Because your daughter had a daughter. A lovely, wonderful daughter. That your two sons killed. I happen to know that girl. She had to die, too. Why? Paralici, San Antonio, and her. They had to die. All are bad. All of us are bad at one time or another. Who made them die? You? See. Si. Who gave you the right? I'm the father. When a daughter marries a bad man, only bad can come of it. He came to our village many years ago and he took her away. He and the men of Palalici helped him. It lived with me. All this time, I live only to destroy him for that. I destroy him and the other man and the girl through my sons. Why the girl? She could not have been good from a bad man. A vendetta. 
Was that it? If you like, Vendetta. He was a bad man who did bad things. Bad man. I smoke now. You got a cigar? The disposition of old Pietro Rico is up to the immigration authorities. I didn't stay around St. Petersburg for all the complex examinations that would have to be made to test his sanity. I had enough of St. Petersburg. Expense account, item three, hotel and board, $79.30. Item four, hospital, $168.13. Item five, same as item one, transportation back to Hartford. Expense account total, $573.49. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, friends, Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum refreshes you. Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum gives you real chewing enjoyment. The lively, full-bodied flavor of Wrigley Spearmint cools your mouth, freshens your taste, sweetens your breath. The smooth, pleasant chewing of Wrigley Spearmint helps keep you feeling relaxed and satisfied, makes whatever you're doing more enjoyable. Yes, for refreshment plus chewing enjoyment, treat yourself often to Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum. Millions enjoy it daily. Get a few packages and always keep some handy. That's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, brought to you by Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, stars John Lund in the title role and was written by E. Jack Newman with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Featured in tonight's cast were John McIntyre, Joe Kearns, Jeanette Nolan, Virginia Gregg, and Jay Novello. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum hope you enjoyed tonight's story of Johnny Dollar and that you're enjoying delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum every day. This is Charles Lyon inviting you to join us again next week at this same time when, from Hollywood, John Lund returns as... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is the CBS Radio Network. Floor wet. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, the refreshing, delicious treat that gives you chewing enjoyment, presents for your listening enjoyment, John Lund as... Johnny Dollar. Philip Shaw, Johnny. Oh, fine. What have you got for me? Mr. Dale Martin is insured with National. He owns a gym, one of those bodybuilding places. Man was killed there. When did it happen? This morning, about an hour ago. Now, we don't know if it's an accident or not. The police are over there now. Anything to work on? Nothing. That's why I called you. Better get over there right away. I'll do it. But I don't take off my shirt. <laughs> The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum bring you John Lund in a transcribed adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum refreshes you. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum gives you real chewing enjoyment. Yes, for chewing enjoyment plus refreshment... It's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. The lively, delicious flavor of Wrigley's Spearmint cools your mouth, helps keep your throat moist, and gives you a nice little lift. The good, smooth chewing of Wrigley's Spearmint helps keep you feeling fresh and alert, adds enjoyment to whatever you're doing. So for chewing enjoyment plus refreshment, treat yourself often to Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious.
Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office, National All Risk Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the blackmail matter. Expense account item one, one dollar and forty cents. Cab fare and tip for ride from my office to Martin's gym. After receiving what little information there was from you by phone, I arrived at 1215 at 1084 6th Avenue in the heart of downtown. On the second floor, I found Dale Martin, a very nervous Adonis, seated at a desk in his office. A policeman at the door informed me that a Lieutenant Nathan of the homicide detail had stepped out for a minute and the coroner was expected soon. Mr. Martin? Yeah. I'm Johnny Dollar from the National Insurance Company. Oh, that's the outfit I'm insured with. Yeah, I know. That's why I'm here. I want to get the facts in case there's any claim. Now, tell me, what happened? I don't know. I went back to the locker room to check on the towels, and I found him lying on the floor. Found who? Uh, his name's Royal. Frederick Royal. He's been coming up here for over a year. Well, why did you call the police and not a doctor? Because I think he was murdered. Why murdered? Well, I've seen a lot of accidents around this gym, but never saw anything like this. It, it wasn't an accident. What makes you so sure? Well, it looked like his neck was broken. I don't know how it happened, so I call the police. That a publicity's gonna ruin what little business I have. Murder always ruins something. You got any idea who might have done it? No. Who was in the place when you discovered the body? My three assistants and three fellows working out. They all still here? Yeah, all of them. Nobody else left or came in? They're just the cops, but business is real slow. Does everybody know about it? No, I took the body and put it back in the rub-down room. Haven't even told my boys. Well, the officer at the door won't let anybody leave, so let's have a look at the body and see what we can find out. Martin left one of his boys to answer the phone, and everyone else was keeping busy wrestling with weights as he led me through the locker room. The one man was taking a shower. At the end of the room, he unlocked the door, and we walked in. The smell of rubbing alcohol was strong enough to give you a hangover. There were white curtains separating two rubbing tables. The first one was empty. In back of that curtain, Mr. Dollar. Okay. Not very pretty. Mm -mm. Circus rubber man would need vulcanizing if he turned his head that far. Busted neck, all right. I wish the coroner would get in and take him away. It hurts me seeing his head hanging like that. Why don't you move him? Oh, no, sir, not me. I caught a good from a lieutenant for moving him in here. Well, don't worry about Mr. Royal. He can't feel a thing. <laughs> Lieutenant Nathan arrived with the coroner, and the latter confirmed our diagnosis. Nathan had Martin keep his clients and assistant muscle men busy. They started comparing biceps and forgot anybody else was there. Nathan was an old friend. So I didn't have to convince him that I was there on business. You saw the corpse, a dollar? Yeah, I took a pair of pretty strong hands to do a job like that. Yeah, that makes everybody around here a suspect. Got any ideas? Yeah, you'd have to know a man pretty well to let him get that close to you without starting something. Yeah, somebody could have been rubbing a kink out of his neck and got carried away with his work. Yeah. Why don't we start asking some questions? Yeah, I'll go out and round up everybody. Might as well start at the beginning. <laughs> Nathan herded everyone together, and the questioning started. The men were very unhappy. This bad publicity that couldn't be helped. Mr. Robert Wells, songwriter, Mr. Michael Darling, car salesman, and the third and last, Mr. Patrick Mullins, jeweler. Three prosperous men, three prosperous denials. The assistants came next... The three men who worked for Martin. First, Bernie Carroll, the man who'd instructed Fred Royal, the one who'd put him through his exercises and sent him in to take a shower before he cooled off and got stiff. Sure. I worked him out and sent him in to shower like always. We tell him to take a good long hot shower to relax the muscles. Isn't that right, Dale? That's right, Lieutenant. That's the way it works. Bernie left him, went over to start on Mr. Wells. Bernie's a pretty strong boy. Yeah. Any one of us could have gone to the locker room at one time or another, Lieutenant. You found him, didn't you, Mr. Martin? Yeah. Why did you happen to go back to the locker room at that particular time? Well, I do it every day. Check on a towel, soap, see that everybody has everything you need. Well, 
Question after question, trying to nail down alibis, trying to make them stick or tear them apart. According to everybody so far, it it was a big mystery. Next man, Jack Olson. Yeah, I went back by the locker room several times. Why? Well, there's an electric coffee maker on a table against the wall back there. I want to get some coffee. Mm-hmm. The other times? Well, once to look at the appointment board and see what's coming in, later to get some chalk for my hands. Chalk for your hands? Yeah. Keeps your hands from aspiring, making blisters, you know, when you're working with heavy weights. Mm. You're fairly new here, aren't you, Jack? Mm-hmm. Three weeks. How'd you know that, Dollar? Well, the other boys all have heavy calluses. They don't use chalk. You know quite a bit about this weightlifting stuff, huh? Oh, sure. I used to lift candy bars when I was a kid. All right, all right. Call in the last one. The last man, Johnny Morgan, and his story was no different than the others. Yes, he'd walked back past the locker room. No, he had not slipped in and popped Mr. Royal's neck while he was preparing to take his shower. The coroner removed the body, and all the rest went down to the precinct to sign formal statements. They were all released and sent home, pending further investigation. I hailed a cab and rode home with Dale Martin. Would you like some apple or carrot juice? Well, I'll try anything once. Good for you. Yeah, I figured that. You didn't kill him, did you, Martin? Don't be silly. If it was the best customer I had, I wouldn't kill off, kill off my business. Here. Thanks. You have any ideas, Dollar? Nope. How long did you say Fred Royal had been coming to your gym? Over a year. What do you know about him? Not much. He was a wolf like the girls. Always talking about the gal he was out with the night before. I got tired of his gab. I put him straight. You know what business he was in? Whatever it was, he had a lot of money. Wore a new suit every time he came around. Oh, excuse me. Hello? Oh, just a minute. For you, Dollar. Oh, thanks. Hello? I got something on the dead man. Got a record. Blackmail. You know where he lived? We're checking. Oh, wait a minute. Now, Martin, you wouldn't by any chance know where Fred Royal lived, would you? Well, I saw a bill to him every month. I got my books here in the apartment. I'll get the address. Oh, Nathan, Martin's got his address. I found something else in his personal effects. Key to a safety deposit box. Boys are checking to see which bank. Here's the mm-hmm. address, Dollar. Fred Royal, 673 East Weeping Willow Circle. <laughs> I told Nathan I'd meet him at Royal's place. I downed my liquefied carrots, said goodbye to Martin. Half an hour later, the lieutenant and yours truly, Johnny Dollar, were tearing Mr. Fred Royal's apartment to pieces. Ah, nothing. Yeah, I came up empty, too. Hey. What's the matter? Here's a date book. Good. Maybe we've been working on a holiday. See, here's a name, Barbara Carroll. Carroll? That's the name of one of Martin's muscle trainers, Bernie Carroll. Mm, same name on some of the other pages. The fifth, Barbara, six o'clock. Again on the second, Barbara, eight o'clock. Again on the twenty-eighth and the twenty-second. Wonder if there's any connection. Oh, it might be his sister. Let's give it a try. Bernie and Barbara Carroll. Sounds like something they'd play at the palace. Well, let's go see their act. <laughs> Here's the apartment. They live with that new fellow. Jack Olson. Yeah, yeah, the quiet one. Uh-huh. Police. Yes? I'm Lieutenant Nathan Homicide. This is Johnny Dollar. How you do? How you do? We'd like to talk to you, Miss Carroll. Well, certainly, Lieutenant. Come here. Thank you. I was just making some lemonade. Would you like some? Yeah, thanks. It is pretty hot out. Maybe you'd like something stronger. No, thanks. The lieutenant's on duty. I, uh, I guess you've heard about the accident... Like your lemonade sweet, Lieutenant? Medium, please. Here you are. Oh, thank you. Your brother didn't mention anything about your going out with Royal. He was probably protecting his little sister. The Lieutenant found your name written in Royal's date book. I've been out with him six or seven times. You know what his business was? He never discussed it. Did you ever meet any of his friends? No. Did he ever mention any of the other fellows at the gym? At the gym? I don't think so. Mm-hmm. Jack Olson lives here, doesn't he? That's right. Whose picture is that on the piano? Oh, that's Jack's father. You don't have any idea why anyone would want to kill Royal, do you? No. 
How did uh, Jack Olson happen to move in here with you and your brother? Bernie asked him to. When he went to work for Martin, he was living in a terrible place. One small room. I told Bernie he could move in here if he shared the rent. Mm -hmm. How well did Olson know Royal? He'd seen him at the gym. Seen him here when he came to pick me up. Mm. Where's Olson now? Working, I think. Well, thanks, Miss Carroll. We'll be talking to you again. More lemonade? Later, maybe, Miss Carroll. Friends, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, you'll enjoy chewing Wrigley Spearmint Gum. Chew Wrigley Spearmint while you're working. The lively, full-bodied flavor of Wrigley Spearmint gives you a refreshing little lift. The smooth, pleasant chewing of Wrigley Spearmint Gum helps keep you feeling relaxed and satisfied. Makes your job seem easier. Chew Wrigley Spearmint Gum in your home, when you're out walking or driving, when you're enjoying sports and other activities. Wrigley's Spearmint Gum tastes good anytime, and the natural chewing aids digestion and helps keep your teeth bright and attractive. Yes, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, you'll enjoy chewing Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. <laughs> And now, with our star, John Lund, we bring you the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Three in the afternoon. Out of Barbara Carroll's cool apartment and down in the blistering street. The thermometer crowding 90 and the humidity sticking to us like a steaming blanket. Ugh, I feel awful. Terrible day to solve a murder. I want to go look through some newspaper files. What for? That picture on the piano. From Jack Olson's father? Yeah. I've seen it someplace before. It's a news story connected with it. Yeah, well, I'll drop you off. i got to get back to the precinct, see if the boys have found the safety deposit box that fits Fred Royal's key. <laughs> Nathan dropped me off with a newspaper, and I went down to the morgue to do some hunting. The air conditioning made the job easier, and by four o'clock, I was headed for Nathan's office. We found the bank and the safe deposit box. Oh? Anything turn up? Yeah, yeah. Royal was doing some pretty fancy blackmailing. Here's a bundle of evidence and a list of names. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Well, I can understand why someone would pay to keep these out of circulation. Yeah. Lousy battalion, isn't it? What'd you find out? Here. Mm, newspaper clipping. Oh, picture of Jack Olson's father. Same as the one on the piano. Prominent banker leaps to death. William Barrett. William Barrett? The boy's name is Olson. That's what he calls himself. William Barrett. Barrett. Give me that list we got out of the deposit box. i just been looking at it. William Barrett's name is on here, all right. Ooh. That article you've got on his suicide mentions that he left a son and a wife. Yeah. Well, let's go pick up Jack Olson or Barrett or whatever his name is. Well, it might not have meant a thing, but at least we had found one person who had a strong connection with Frederick Royal other than socially. The boy who called himself Jack Olson was the son of one William Barrett, deceased, and one of Fred Royal's blackmail victims. Barrett had jumped off a tall building, and according to the newspaper, he had left no reason for his actions. There was a possibility that Fred Royal's blackmail had driven him to it, and if that was so, his son would have had a very strong reason for wanting to break Mr. Fred Royal's neck. We climbed into a squad car and hurried back to Barbara Carroll's apartment where Jack Olson lived as a boarder. Now let's go. Hey, wait a minute. Oh, what's wrong? Jack Olson, coming out of the building. All right, we pick him up on the street. He's hailing a cab. Come on, let's see where he's going. Wouldn't it be easier to just ask him? Oh, stop trying to ruin my afternoon. You know, there's nothing more relaxing than a pleasant drive through quiet, peaceful old New England. <laughs> We started tailing Jack Olson's cab. 
across town, along the Merrick Parkway, across a bridge. He's headed for Long Island. Well, your Connecticut badge won't be much good over there. We kept going across the sound, past the outskirts of a couple of waterfront towns, and onto a long highway. Pretty expensive cab ride. Pretty expensive. Pretty important. Yeah. Well, they're turning off on that road. Hope we don't lose them. We took the road to the right off the highway and spotted the cab up ahead, pulling into the entrance of a large white building. The sign over the tall iron gate read, Lakeview Sanitarium. We waited for him to go in. Is there something I can do for you? I'm looking for a man. Oh, any particular man? Uh, Who's in charge of this place? Uh, Dr. Fedder. Well, run him out, please. I want to talk to him. Which one of you is the patient? Patient? Can't you tell? Look, just go get Dr. Fodder. Fedder. Oh, Fedder, okay. Go get him and tell him Lieutenant Nathan wants to talk to him. Lieutenant Nathan? Uh, of the cavalry. What? Oh, well, I'll get him right away. (laughs) Lieutenant. (laughs) <laughs> you think that's funny, huh? Oh, well, I liked it. Let's see what kind of a reaction it gets out of Dr. Fetter. Cavalry. Nice thing to say in a place like this. Uh, Lieutenant Nathan? Yeah, that's right. I'm Dr. Fetter. Oh, this is Mr. Dollar. How do you do? How do you do? Now, are you related? No, but we've been friends a long, long time, haven't we, Nate? Yeah, I'm a police officer, Doctor. Oh. We've been following a man. He came in here a few minutes ago. Is that right? The lieutenant thinks he might be a killer. I can handle this, Dollar. Uh Doctor, I'm with Central Division Homicide. This isn't my territory, but I'd appreciate it. Which one of you is the patient? Now, look, this is getting a little ridiculous. Here are my credentials. Oh. The man we want came in here a few minutes ago. Well, Mr. Barrett is the only one... And his real name is Barrett. Who's he seeing? His mother. What's wrong with his mother? Mrs. Barrett is seriously ill. Have anything to do with her... Husband's suicide? Everything to do with it. I doubt if Mrs. Barrett will ever recover. We went back out to the car and tried to put it all together. Jack's father had jumped off a roof. He was being blackmailed and couldn't take it. The shock of his suicide had driven Mrs. Barrett into a permanent breakdown. And Fred Royal had been responsible for the whole thing. Motive enough for Jack to get a job with Dale Martin so he could get his hands on Fred Royal's neck. Cavalry. Oh, stop groaning. Tell me what you think of my theory. We still need a confession. We'll get it. Mind if I make a pest of myself and ask how? Let's ride back to town and see Dale Martin. You're going to come up and take a workout and a rub tomorrow, huh? That's right, Martin. And I want you to make sure that Olson takes care of me. Did he do it, Dollar? I think so. But why? He seems like such a nice kid. He had a pretty good reason. But we need a confession, and Dollar has an idea how to get it. I want Olson working on me through the whole workout, especially when I get on the rubbing table. You're in pretty good shape, Mr. Dollar. Well, I'm carrying a few extra pounds. I will knock that off of you in a hurry. Don't try to talk while you're using the pulleys. Hi. Hi, Martin. He's in pretty good shape, Mr. Martin. Now, let's see. Uh, Better not do too much on the stomach the first day. I'll see you later, Mr. Dollar. (sighs) Nice fellow, Martin. Yeah, very nice. Tell me, have you... uh found out anything about Mr. Royal's death? Oh, the police have got a few ideas. <sighs> Lieutenant and I went up to see your roommate's sister. Yeah, Barbara told me. I hope you don't suspect her. She kind of liked Mr. Royal. She wouldn't have any reason to kill him. All right. Let's go back to the rub table before you cool off. Huh? You don't mind going in there, do you? No. 
Why should I? Oh, some people are funny about rooms where there's been a dead person, you know? It doesn't bother me, Mr. Dow. Yeah. <clears throat> Martin's got all his towels piled on the other table. I can move them if you like. Oh, no, no. It doesn't make any difference. Royal wasn't killed in here anyway. All right. Up on your back. Yeah. Give me a good brisk rub. Let me relax for about ten minutes. All right. Slide down a little. Yeah. Uh, what'd you do before you came to work for Martin, Jack? Oh, not much. Went to school, finally decided to look for a job. Found this one. You ever study this sort of thing? No. No, there's really not much to it. Martin shows us how to use the machines to help the clients and rub the neck and back. Well, then all you need is a good build and a strong pair of hands, huh? Yeah, yeah I guess so. Your family live in Hartford? No. I noticed the picture of your father on Barbara's piano. Fine-looking man. He's dead now. Oh, sorry. So am I. Your mother still living? No. Oh! Oh, I'm sorry. Am I rubbing too hard? Oh, no, it's okay. Well, you certainly got the strength for the job. Yeah, I'll turn off the vibrator and just use my hand. Did the police find out anything about Mr. Royal? Yeah. He was a blackmailer. Ow! Oh, I'm awfully sorry. I'm a little nervous today. Maybe I'd better get one of the other fellows to finish a rub. Oh, no, 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 that's all right. I'm just a little tied up. The neck is stiff. Try and relax. Guess I keep thinking about Royal and his broken neck. You think I might break yours, Mr. Dollar? <laughs> well... Wouldn't be hard. If I was good and relaxed, you could snap it in a second. Yeah. Yes, I could. So Mr. Royal was a blackmailer, huh? Yeah. Had a record. They're the foulest people on earth. Yeah, they certainly are. They can ruin a lot of lives. Probably why he was murdered. You think he was blackmailing someone here in the gym? Oh, not necessarily. Well, if he wasn't, then no one in the shop would have a motive for killing him. Well, I've got a theory about that. I think someone in this gym hated him so much that they waited until no one was looking and Royal was all alone. And they slipped in on him and twisted his neck until it broke and he strangled. Well, why would they hate him so much if he wasn't blackmailing him? He might have been blackmailing someone very close and dear to the killer. Maybe the person Royal was blackmailing couldn't stand it. Committed suicide. It's an interesting theory. Take your family, for instance. Ow! Oh, I'm sorry. You weren't relaxing. Supposing Royal was blackmailing a member of your family. Your father, for instance. I can't rub your neck unless you relax more. Maybe your father couldn't take it. Maybe he couldn't pay him anymore. And instead of disgracing his family, he committed suicide. Just turn your head a little to the side, Mr. Dollar. That better? Much. Well, if that happened to my family, Mr. Dollar, I guess I would kill Mr. Royal, not mind a bit. How does your father die, Jack? He jumped off a roof. Now, if you just turn your head a little more, I'll try to pop your vertebrae, huh? We followed you out to Long Island yesterday, Jack. I'm going to adjust your neck, Mr. Dollar. It's better if you relax so it won't hurt. Uh, well, if you wanted to, you could pop it anyway. I couldn't stop you in time. No, I don't guess you could. There, now the other side, huh? Did you kill Fred Royal? Yes. Relax. All right, Mr. Dollar. Let's go down to the police station. Lieutenant's outside with Martin. After you, Mr. Barrett. Nathan took Jack Barra down to the station and got from him a signed confession. I went with Martin, and with every drink I saw another Barrett. So finally I gave it up and came up here to my office. Expense account, 
Item two, four dollars and fifty-three cents, one fifth of very dry gin. Martin forgot his health and hygiene for a couple of hours and finished what I didn't drink. Item three, sixteen dollars seventy-five cents, cab fare for a ride up through the country, all by myself. Expense account total twenty-two dollars and sixty-eight cents. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, friends, Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum refreshes you. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum gives you real chewing enjoyment. The lively, full-bodied flavor of Wrigley's Spearmint cools your mouth, freshens your taste, sweetens your breath. The smooth, pleasant chewing of Wrigley's Spearmint helps keep you feeling relaxed and satisfied, makes whatever you're doing more enjoyable. Yes, for refreshment plus chewing enjoyment, treat yourself often to Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Millions enjoy it daily. Get a few packages and always keep some handy. That's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, brought to you by Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum, stars John Lund in the title role and was written by Blake Edwards with music by Milton Charles. Featured in tonight's cast were Edgar Barrier, Hi Averback, Hal March, Jim Nusser, Tony Barrett, and Virginia Gregg. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum hope you enjoyed tonight's story of Johnny Dollar and that you're enjoying delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum every day. This is Charles Lyon inviting you to join us again next week at this same time when, from Hollywood, John Lund returns as... Yours truly... Johnny Dollar. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, the refreshing, delicious treat that gives you chewing enjoyment, presents for your listening enjoyment, John Lund as... Johnny Dollar. New York Police Department calling. Mr. Dollar, will you accept the charges? Uh, yeah, put them on. Just a moment, please. Ready with your call to Hartford, Connecticut. Go ahead. Hello, Dollar? That's right. This is Sergeant Papish, robbery. I have a notation here. You're the one to contact in the case that came up. Allied Adjustment Bureau? Well, I've done a lot of work for him. What's it about, Sergeant? Well, we've recovered a mink coat you were looking for about six months ago. Oh? Yeah, stolen from a party named Jacoby in Rochester. The Jacobys are in Europe right now, but the furrier's already identified it as the one he sold to him. Jacoby? Rochester? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I remember. It was insured for $5,000. There's some other things taken in the same hall. A watch, rings, bracelet. That's the job. So far, we just have the coat and the girl who was wearing it. What does she say? Nothing. So far, she's got a couple of bullet holes in her. Maybe I better get down there, Sergeant. Room 212, Sergeant Papish. Right. <laughs> The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum bring you John Lund in a transcribed adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum refreshes you. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum gives you real chewing enjoyment. Yes, for chewing enjoyment plus refreshment... It's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. The lively, delicious flavor of Wrigley's Spearmint cools your mouth, helps keep your throat moist, and gives you a nice little lift. 
The good smooth chewing of Wrigley's Spearmint helps keep you feeling fresh and alert, adds enjoyment to whatever you're doing. So for chewing enjoyment plus refreshment, treat yourself often to Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Allied Adjustment Bureau, Markham Building, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Rochester theft matter. Expense account item one, $1.65. Person-to-person collect call from Sergeant Papish, New York Police Department. Item two, $32.56. Train fare and incidentals between Hartford and New York City after clearing authority to resume on the Jacoby case. It had been stalemated six months before when the Rochester police and I were unable to recover any part of the item stolen from the Jacoby residence. I arrived in New York at 1.35, dropped my bags off at the New Weston, then went directly to the Metropolitan Police Station. Uh... Hello, uh, I wonder if you could help me. I'm looking for Sergeant Papish. I'm Papish. Oh, Johnny Dollar, Sergeant. Oh. Thanks for coming down, Dollar. I have a chair. Oh, thanks. There are mink coats in the crime lab. They're looking it over. Uh huh. We still haven't found out much about the girl who was wearing it. What's her name? Yeah, just Jane Doe for now. We didn't have her prints on file here, but we're waiting to hear from Washington now. She's been unconscious ever since we picked her up. Pretty bad shape. Well, what exactly happened? I came in as a complaint about uh, three this morning. A woman over on 57th Street telephoned about a disturbance. The prowl car went over to the address and found this girl lying in the entrance to the apartment house wearing the mink coat. She'd been shot twice. Uh-huh. No one in the apartment house seemed to know her or had ever seen her before. We asked about the neighborhood. No dice. But we did find out how she got there. Oh. Huh? The lady across the street said she saw a man drive up sometime after midnight and unload the girl from his car. She uh, was able to give us a fair description of the car and the man. Yeah. Nice. But nothing definite. No license number or anything like that. Could be any car and any man from what she said. Got an APB out, of course. Was there a purse or anything? Nothing. The dress she was wearing came from a store downtown. Hundreds just like it. The coat was the only item that might have helped, and it turned up listed in the stolen property file. How about jewelry? Small diamond ring on her little finger. When I looked over the list of things taken in that Jacoby robbery, it doesn't fit any of those. You can look at it if you want to. I'll take your word for it. I suppose the insurance company paid off the claim. Yeah, the whole thing. Well, at least we have the coat back for you. Maybe we'll get a line on the other things when this girl regains consciousness. If she does. Pretty bad, is it? Yeah. Nice looking girl, too. Only about 25 or so. Excuse me. Sure. Robbery, Sergeant Pabish. Oh, let me get it down here. Two thirteen West. Right. Okay, see you there. Bye. Just got an answer from Washington. They able to identify the girl? Yeah, dress and all. She had a postal savings once. Name's Eileen Madden. You mind if I go with you? Yeah, come on. Maybe you'll get back all of your loot. I accompanied Sergeant Papish to the address for Eileen Madden. It turned out to be a fairly nice apartment in a fairly nice neighborhood. By the time we arrived there, a full crew of technicians were at work giving the place a complete check. Sergeant Papish introduced me to a tall, heavy set man. This is Mr. Dollar from the insurance company, Walt. Sergeant Walter. All right. How are you, Sergeant? Oh, fine. I'm afraid we haven't done any good for you so far. I haven't found anything here to go with that mink coat. Oh. Have you talked to anybody around here yet? Just getting started on it. The lady who lives across the hall might be able to help us. Where is she? In there. Her name's Ethel Stromberg. Mrs. Okay. I'll take it here. All right. Uh, are you Mrs. Stromberg? 
Yes, I am. I'm Sergeant Papish. This is Mr. Dollar. How do you do? How do you do? How is poor Eileen? Not very good, Mrs. Stromberg. She's still unconscious. Oh, dear, that's terrible. It's just a terrible thing. Where is she? I'd like to go to see her if it's possible. She's at the police emergency hospital right now, Mrs. Stromberg. I'll have them phone you when she can see people. Well, thank you. What an awful thing. How did that happen? What's that all about? Uh, maybe you can tell us something about her, Mrs. Stromberg. Where she worked, how she lived, what people she knew. Oh, dear. How long have you known her? Well, I moved in here about five months ago. I met her the very first day. Mm -hmm. Nice girl? Oh, yes, very nice, very nice girl. Quiet, minded her own business. Do you know where we can contact her family? No, I can't help you there, Sergeant. I, I know they live somewhere in California, but that's about all. She talks about them now and then. How about her friends here in town? What about them? Did she talk about any of her friends to you? What do you mean? Well, she's a pretty girl, young, boyfriends, maybe. Yes, she did talk about them now and then. You suppose one of them had something to Mrs. do? Mrs. Stromberg, Eileen Madden was dumped from a convertible last night after she'd been shot. A witness described the car as possibly blue or black in color, white top, white sidewalls. She said it was a late model Cadillac or Buick. Do you know if any of Miss Madden's friends drove a car that comes near that description at all? Why, yes. Yes, I saw him pick her up one night. I was just coming home. Uh, saw who pick her up, Mrs. Stromberg? A man she called Bill. Bill who? I really don't know his last name. She didn't introduce me to him. But she talks about him. He drove a black Cadillac. Can you tell us what he looks like? Well, he seemed very tall. As tall as Sergeant Papish here? So about your height, very nice looking. He seemed quite big. Husky, sort of. Very nicely dressed, too. What color was his hair? I don't know. He always wore a hat. I, I think it was dark, though. His eyes? I don't know. About uh, how old, would you say? Oh, I'm no good at this, but uh, I say between 30 and 35. Mm, seems to fit what we have from the witness. Yeah. Uh, this bill, would you say he had money? Oh, yes, I would say so. He drove that nice big convertible. He always dressed so nice. And he gave Eileen pretty nice things. Do you know if he ever gave her any jewelry? I don't know. I don't think so. Eileen would usually run across the hall and show me when he sent her something nice. I don't remember her ever showing me any jewelry. I just talked to the hospital. How is she? Just coming around. I think you better go over there and talk to her if you're gonna. Is she bad? They think she's dying, Mrs. Stromberg. She'll make it? Uh, hard to say right now. Sometimes they rally. She must have been in that doorway a half hour or better before we got to her. Mm -hmm. She said anything, Doctor? No. You, know, you might have to wait a little while for her to come around. I see. I'll tell you both. Ask what you have to know quick. Two minutes is about all I can give you with it. Sure, Doctor. Oh, you better put your cigarettes in that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. All right, miss. Okay, boys. Is she conscious? Yeah, she can hear you. Are you Eileen Madden? Is Eileen Madden your name? Yes. Yes. You're seriously hurt, Miss Madden. Can you tell us how it happened? Miss Madden? Bill. Bill shot you? Yes. What's Bill's name? Where can we find him? I... 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 Doctor, watch. <coughs> Nurse, hand me that. Sorry, fellas. There was nothing I could do.
friends, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, you'll enjoy chewing Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. Chew Wrigley's Spearmint while you're working. The lively, full-bodied flavor of Wrigley's Spearmint gives you a refreshing little lift. The smooth, pleasant chewing of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum helps keep you feeling relaxed and satisfied. Makes your job seem easier. Chew Wrigley's Spearmint Gum in your home, when you're out walking or driving, when you're enjoying sports and other activities. Wrigley's Spearmint Gum tastes good anytime, and the natural chewing aids digestion and helps keep your teeth bright and attractive. Yes, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, you'll enjoy chewing Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. <laughs> our star, John Lund, we bring you the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Eileen Madden died at 3.35 in the afternoon without giving us the full name of the man who shot her the night before. I stayed with Sergeant Papish and Sergeant Walters as they continued their investigation of her death and the appearance of the mink coat covered in policy number 27M55567, issued to Roland J. Jacoby, Rochester, New York. The apartment where she had lived yielded some information. Here it is. Letters from Robert J. Madden in Riverside, California. Looks like her father. Okay, we'd better notify him. This might be the best lead. What's that? This picture. Found in one of her closets. Let's see. Hmm. Dollar. Oh, thanks. Love, Bill. He loved her all right. Yeah. Anybody identified this yet? That Mrs. Stromberg's supposed to be here right now. What time you got? Oh, uh, half past. She said she'd be here at six. Anything on the bullets? They didn't check with anything in our lab. Ballistic says it was an Army 45. The old 1911 model. Pretty good gun for killing. What gun is it? Oh, I got the wrong room at first. Oh, come in, Mrs. Stromberg. You remember Sergeant Papish and Mr. Dollar? Yes. Do I have to answer more questions? Not many more. Oh, I'm just all worn out. I can't get over this terrible thing happening to Eileen. Did you get in touch with her family? Business office is doing it right now. Oh, dear, what a terrible, terrible thing. Mrs. Stromberg, have you ever seen this man before? Oh, yes, that's Bill. The man Eileen's been going with? Yes. The man who drives the black Cadillac convertible? Yes, that's him. But did he do this terrible thing? It looks that way, Mrs. Stromberg. Oh, dear, dear. <coughs> Sergeant Pavish. Yeah. Yeah, right. Goodbye. Did Eileen Madden ever mention to you that she had been married? Why, no. She never did. Was she? In the state of New York in 1951. Just found out from vitals. Divorced? Yeah. Her ex-husband's name is Bill. Bill Powers. <laughs> Sergeant Papish, this is Mr. Dollar. Uh, how do you do? What's the matter? May we come inside, Mr. Powers? Sure. Well, what's this all about? Do you know a woman named Eileen Madden, Mr. Powers? Yeah, sure. We were married once. Why? Eileen Madden was shot to death last night, Mr. Powers. Eileen? Yes. What? Are you sure? I... We checked her prints. Oh. oh. Shot? Yes. Who? Oh, what happened? I... Well, how, how could a thing like that happen? That's what we're trying to find out, Mr. Powers. I, I can't believe it. I mean, dead. Have you seen her lately? Well, yeah, I, I saw her last week. Had a drink together. Are you sure it's Eileen? We'd make sure before we came around to news like this. 
Mr. Dollar represents an insurance company, Mr. Powers. Miss Madden was wearing a stolen coat when we found her. Stolen coat? Yes, a stolen mink coat. Was uh, she ever in trouble anywhere? I don't care what she was wearing. I didn't ever steal anything. She was a fine girl, a wonderful girl. I was a fool to ever let our marriage go on the rocks. <laughs> Can you come with us, Mr. Powers? Where? We need a positive identification. Sure. Sure, Sergeant. I'll be right with you. Want to smoke? Thanks. Well, he isn't the bird in the picture. No. Did you see the car in the driveway? Yeah. 51 Caddy, black convertible. On the way to the city morgue with the ex-husband of Eileen Madden, we tried to get more information from him regarding her activities up till the time of her death. But power seemed so distraught that he could only speak of their short marriage and the reason it had ended. It was an old and especially sad story of a man who couldn't provide well enough for a beautiful wife. However, once he'd seen her body at the morgue and identified it, he seemed to get better control of himself. We all walked across the street for coffee. I hope you get whoever did this, Sergeant. I hope you get him fast. We sure want to, Mr. Powers. Why would anybody do that to Eileen? Why? Maybe you can help us answer that. Oh, you're just interested in that coat you say she was wearing. Well, mister, I don't believe she was wearing a stolen coat. What do you think of that? I'm just looking for the facts, Mr. Powers. I'd like to prove what you just said as badly as you'd like to have it proved. But we have to start somewhere. You can understand that. I, I suppose so. You told us you saw her last week for a drink. That's right. Have you been seeing her right along? Yeah, sure. Did you know that she's been going with somebody else? Sure. Then uh, you know Bill? Bill Chambers? Yeah. Well, I, I, I don't know him, but she talked about him a lot. Is uh, this Bill Chambers, Mr. Powers? Yeah. Yeah, that's him. I thought you knew You're that. sure this is him? I'm sure. This picture was in her place. I went there one day and saw it and asked her who he was. I mean, told me all about him. What did she tell you about him? Why, she said she was going with him. She she told me that he wanted to marry her. Said he had lots of money. Did she tell you where he works? No. Or what kind of work he does? No. Do you know where we can get in touch with him? No, I don't know that either. I... Say... Do you think he might have done this to her? We'd like to talk to him. I, I know she's been going with him for a few months, what she told me. And you've been seeing her the same time she was seeing Chambers? We, yeah, yeah, that's right. She didn't want to marry him. She wanted to marry me again. Do you know what kind of a car Chambers drives? Cadillac. Thought you never met him. Well... She told me about his car. It's another thing. I went out and bought one myself. I thought it might do me some good with her. Uh huh. Were you at home last night? Yeah. Can you prove it? Yeah. <laughs> I was home. She was out getting killed. The name William Chambers was checked through the New York police files. They listed 24 persons who more or less fit his general description. It took two days to locate and talk with all of them. Neither Mrs. Stromberg nor the witness who had seen the body dumped from the car could identify any of them. An all-points bulletin regarding the suspect and his car had been issued as soon as we learned his name. Same results. Nothing. <laughs> On the third day, the pawn shop detail turned up two more items that had been taken in the Jacoby robbery. There they are. Huh. Watch and ring. Jacoby stuff? Case numbers on the watch checkout. The ring's engraved. Where'd they wind up? Shop on 3rd Street. The proprietor says it was sold yesterday. Man who sold them signed the buy book James Agenian. How about his description? Fist chambers down the line. Well, at least he was still in town yesterday. Yeah, but the stuff's been on the hot sheet for a long time. If he's had any experience at all, he knew he was taking a chance trying to unload it. 
Probably trying to raise cash to get out of town. That's what I was thinking. <laughs> Gave him an address on Polk Street, a vacant lot. If he keeps on trying to unload it, I'll have all the loot back. If he keeps on trying, we'll keep on trying. Well, they found his car. Where? Used car lot in the Bronx. He sold it at 10 o'clock this morning. At the used car lot, we learned that a man answering the description of William Chambers had driven in that morning and offered a black 51 Cadillac convertible for sale. The used car lot manager had finally settled on a price and made out a check. He reported that the man had seemed extremely nervous and anxious to make a quick deal. The car was impounded and examined. A full set of fingerprints on the steering wheel and dashboard gave us a positive identification of William Chambers. William Carlson, alias William Carls, William Charles, Walter Cameron, male, Caucasian, age 33, 178, 61... Let's see, 14 arrests, two convictions, both car theft. Quite a lad. Aren't they all? <laughs> Doesn't look like a killer, though, does he? I don't know. What's a killer supposed to look like? The search to locate William Carlson, alias William Chambers, extended to all parts of the city. The associates and relatives listed in his criminal file were contacted and questioned. All of them denied having any knowledge of his whereabouts. In the meantime, two more pieces of stolen property connected with the Jacoby theft were recovered by the pawn shop detail. Each of the pawn shop proprietors identified the mugshot of the wanted man. He'd used different names in each instance. The handwriting was the same. Each address had to be checked out. I went with Sergeant Papish to the one he had given on 78th Street. It was not a vacant lot. Hello? Hello. We're looking for William Courtney. You found him? Huh? Cops? Yeah. Come on in. Hold still. I'm clean. Checked me through the buy book yesterday? Yeah. Your name's Carlson, isn't it? William Carlson? Yep. We've been looking a long time for you. I know. Yesterday, I decided I'd let you find me. I get my right address. You want to get your hat? Sure. Look, I didn't mean to kill Eileen. I, I didn't mean to at all. I want you to know that. We'll talk about it downtown. No, no, we won't. I'm not talking to anybody downtown. I'm talking to you two right now, and that's it. So you better listen. Okay. I've been doing pretty good with these house jobs. Real good. Enough to buy myself a nice car, get some clothes, get around a little bit. I work all alone. I met her. I liked her. I wanted to marry her. I did. I, re I really did. We went out the other night, and I gave her the mink coat for a present. I thought that it sent you. She didn't want to take it. She told me she was going to marry some guy she'd been married to before. I, I let her have it. That's all? That's all. That's it, mister. I could have run. Sold my car. Been getting rid of a lot of odds and ends I have around. I decided not to, after all. I don't want to run. Okay, let's get with it. I remember, I let you get me. I wrote my address right down where I knew you'd check it out. Okay. And there's no more talking. You two got it all straight. What's the matter with you, anyway? You got it all? I mean, about everything? I... Yeah, I've got it. Okay. Hey, wait a minute. You yeah. guys are too late. I... I took it when I heard you knock on the door. Where's the phone? It's too late, I tell you. It's in my stomach now. It's too late. Not for me, brother. I handle plenty of babies, just like you. Not too late. Grab him, Miss. I got it. Go. Look out. Ah, shut up. You're going to stand trial, baby. Sergeant Papish had handled attempted suicides. A lot of them. And in the five minutes before the arrival of the emergency ambulance, he managed to force William Carlson to take an antidote that saved his life. The remainder of the Jacoby theft items were found in and around the apartment of the suspect. 
along with other stolen property listed with the New York police. All of the articles on the enclosed list have been impounded and will be available following the trial of William Carlson. Expense account item three, hotel and board while in New York, $88.65. Item four, same as item two, transportation back to Hartford. Expense account total, $155.42. Remarks? Please file a copy of the above report for the information of William Powers in regard to his ex-wife Eileen Madden. I think this is what he wanted. Well, that's it. Here's truly Johnny Dollar. Remember, friends, Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum refreshes you. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum gives you real chewing enjoyment. The lively, full-bodied flavor of Wrigley's Spearmint cools your mouth, freshens your taste, sweetens your breath. The smooth, pleasant chewing of Wrigley's Spearmint helps keep you feeling relaxed and satisfied, makes whatever you're doing more enjoyable. Yes, for refreshment plus chewing enjoyment, treat yourself often to Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Millions enjoy it daily. Get a few packages and always keep some handy. That's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, brought to you by Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, stars John Lund in the title role and was written by E. Jack Newman with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Featured in tonight's cast were Virginia Gregg, John McIntyre, Jim Nusser, Jeanette Nolan, Victor Perrin, and Bill Johnstone. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum hope you enjoyed tonight's story of Johnny Dollar and that you're enjoying delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum every day. This is Charles Lyon inviting you to join us again next week at this same time when, from Hollywood, John Lund returns as... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is the CBS Radio Network. Why let your floors get scuffed up? Beacon Wax stops floor scuffing. The WBBM Air Theater, Wrigley Building, Chicago. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, the refreshing, delicious treat that gives you chewing enjoyment, presents for your listening enjoyment, John Lund as... Johnny Dollar. Hi, Johnny. Frank Preston, Baltimore Liability. Oh, hi, Frank. How's it going? Okay, I guess, Johnny. Say, are you tied up? No, not at the moment. What is it? A bad check artist out on the West Coast has been giving us a lot of headaches lately. Uh-huh. Hotel in Monterey, another one in Santa Cruz, and this morning I had a wire from one of our clients who runs a place in Santa Barbara. $4,500 worth of claims already, and all in five days. Sounds like a very busy man. Uh, that's something else. It isn't a man, it's a woman. A woman? And you've got to stop it, Johnny. <laughs> The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum bring you John Lund in another adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum refreshes you. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum gives you real chewing enjoyment. Yes, for chewing enjoyment plus refreshment... It's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. The lively, delicious flavor of Wrigley's Spearmint cools your mouth, helps keep your throat moist, and gives you a nice little lift. The good, smooth chewing of Wrigley's Spearmint helps keep you feeling fresh and alert, adds enjoyment to whatever you're doing. So for chewing enjoyment plus refreshment, treat yourself often to Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious.
expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Baltimore Liability and Trust Corporation, 418 Virginia Boulevard, Baltimore, Maryland. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Emily Braddock matter. Expense account item one. $158.16. $158.16. Plain fare and incidentals, Hartford to Santa Barbara. My mid-morning arrival was timed for the sun and the sea to show off a sizable and pleasantly crowded harbor, some sprawling hotels, two lush green golf courses, and acres and acres of snug, expensive homes. At the police station, my contact, a Sergeant Lopez, was out, so I went over to the Harbor Inn and met the victimized hotel operator, Glenn Sheridan. Tall, gray-haired, slacks, sports shirt, suntan, and sandals. <laughs> On the face of it, you'd think I'd been in the hotel business 20 minutes instead of 20 years, the way that woman took me. Well, she's done the same thing in several other nice hotels up and down the coast, if that's any comfort. Well, it isn't. I suppose the thing that bothers me most is that if she walked through that door right now and told me none of it was true, I'd probably believe her. She was that good. Mr. Dollar, she was the best. Why, she pranced in here as big as life, and uh, she probably didn't have a nickel in her purse. And what's more, for the whole four days she was here, she didn't break her stride once. What do you mean? Well, only the best of everything. Oh. She gave you a check for $813, is that right? Uh, painfully right. Uh-huh. And I took it, no questions. <laughs> Every night in the dining room, she'd order champagne, special dishes... I've seen my share of grifters and bad check artists, but she tops them all. Perfume, clothes, luggage, conversation, and a very pretty woman, Dollar. Beautiful, in fact. She checked in alone, registered as Mrs. Robert Payne Beverly Hills, right? Mm Mm-hmm. Did it strike you as odd that a woman would check into a place like this, a resort hotel, alone? No, she wasn't alone long. She met other people. Became friends with at least a half a dozen guests in the place. Uh Uh-huh. The way she was throwing my money around, why not? She picked up all the tabs. Well, ordinarily, I'd have been suspicious under those circumstances, Mr. Dollar, but she threw me off right from the very start. Well, how's that, Mr. Sheridan? Well, she showed up about midnight, came in a cab that was just loaded down with expensive luggage. Probably wrote a bad check for that someplace. Yeah, probably. She came swinging in the lobby with a cabbie following her and told the night clerk she wanted to see me. When I came down to the desk, she yelled, Sherry! Ran up and kissed me and asked how my wife was. Can you beat that? Nope. She acted as though we knew each other. And one of those tricks your mind plays on you in this business, I actually thought I remembered her from someplace. I see. She registered as Mrs. Robert Payne. Said she was on her way back from Lake Tahoe. Wanted to rest up. Something about just getting a divorce and being awarded 3000 a month alimony. That impressed me. Well, it didn't impress anyone, Mr. Sheridan. Well, I did make a check. She gave her home address as Beverly Hills, and there was a Robert Payne listed there. Later on, I found out he's in Europe with his wife and children. But his name was in the book. Yeah, and that was enough for me. Oh, she had a wonderful four days here, I'll say that for her. Getting back to that part about her looking familiar. Well, there's nothing in that, Dollar. I did think I had seen her before, and of course she helped me think it, but I was too embarrassed to press the matter with her, I guess. Do you have a copy of her hotel account? I'd like to look it over. Yeah. The police have the check she gave me. It was drawn on a bank in Beverly Hills. Was it uh, personalized? No. Maybe I should have thought something of that, huh? Uh-huh. Well, here's this much. I can't stand to look it over. It makes me kind of sick. $813. <laughs> I spent another hour with Mr. Sheridan as he distastefully covered the items on the bill she'd paid with a bad check. Later that afternoon, I met with Sergeant Lopez, who reported a woman answering the same description had passed bad checks in Burlingame, Santa Maria, and Ojai. Expense account item two, $114.85. Transportation to Monterey and Santa Cruz where I interviewed the other two clients who had filed claims. Their stories were much the same as Sheridan's. (music) Expense account item three, $4.15. Long-distance phone call. That you, Johnny? Yeah, Frank. All the claims are pretty solid. The police have no line on this... Don't come home. 
Oh? Hop down to Malibu Beach. She's done it again. At a place called the Seaside Inn. The guy who runs it found out it was bad 15 minutes after she left. That was this morning. I don't expect any miracles, but if you get down there right away, maybe you can get on her trail. Well, I'll try. Expense account item four, $38 even. Transportation Santa Barbara to Malibu. I didn't even bother to listen to a disgruntled hotel proprietor repeat a story I knew so well. I went directly to the sheriff's station and Sergeant Pell's. Well, that's about the picture. She was at the inn for four days and checked out this morning. She used the name Bradley, Ellen Bradley. She can't be too far ahead of you now. No. There might be a break on this one, too. While she was at the inn, she took up with one of our local residents, a man by the name of Garland. Lives over in the colony. He drove her into town this morning. Have you talked to him? I can't find him anywhere. He has a house over in the colony. The colony? Yeah, uh, that's uh, down the road a piece. They call it that because a lot of movie stars built beach homes there a long time ago. Movie colony, you know? Oh, yeah. Is this Garland an actor? <laughs> yeah, when he gets work, which isn't very often, I guess. Mainly, he keeps suntanned. We're trying to locate him now, and as soon as we do it... Oh, excuse me. Sure. Sergeant Pell. Yeah, right away. Garland's home now. I went with Sergeant Pells to talk with Garland, who was in trunks and sunglasses in front of his house. A healthy, muscular, handsome man in his mid-thirties. He was a little stunned by the news we brought him. Ellen, a phony? Sergeant, are you sure about this? Well, you can ask the man at the seaside inn. He got the check. And Mr. Dollar here has been looking all over the state for it. Uh, well, come on, let's go up into the house. All right. I thought I knew her pretty well. Did you meet her out here or did you know her before? Oh, I met her at the Seaside Inn the first night she was here. Go ahead. Thank you. Now, sit down. Like something to drink? Uh, no, thank you. Not now, thanks. Understand you drove her into Los Angeles. That's right. I took her in this morning. Where did you take her? The Beverly Glen Hotel. Did she check in there? No, she just dumped all her luggage. She told me she didn't know whether or not she'd have to go to Chicago tonight. Something about a house she owned there that had to be rented or sold. Did you leave her there? No, she made a phone call. Said she had to meet her lawyer. Yeah? she say where? Yeah, a bar in Hollywood. Uh, Topper on Coinga. So I drove her over there and left her. When was this? Oh, three hours ago. About one o'clock, I guess. Uh, how was she dressed? A black strapless job. Uh-huh. Did she mention any names, tell you anything about herself? Yeah, she told me that six months ago, a little two-year-old boy was killed in an automobile accident. She said that was the thing that broke up her marriage to this Bradley guy. Uh-huh. Said she needed to believe in something again, that she needed someone to believe in her. Well, I figured her for a pretty nice person, just having a little fling. Even with what you've told me, I believe that part of it. Why? Because she told me... She cried a little when she was telling me. Oh, I don't care how you look at me. I, I don't think anyone could invent a story that tragic without some sort of basis. Well, maybe you've got a point, Garland, but a good liar can see a story in a newspaper, adapt it to his own needs, and uh, maybe even cry a little about it. Well, I still believe it. You know, Mr. Dollar, you ought to try believing what people tell you sometime. Yeah, I'll try it. Next time I have two weeks off. What? In my business, they call that... A vacation. Well, what'll it be, gents? Police. Uh, I'd like to talk to the man who was on duty here at one o'clock this afternoon. Oh, that's me, Sergeant. My name's Lenny uh, Pollard. Anything wrong? No, just routine. Well, can I get you something? No, to... thank you. We're trying to locate a woman who's been using the name Ellen Bradley. We were told she was in here around one o'clock today. Oh, I don't recognize that name. About 5'5", five, five, dark brown hair, brown eyes. Wore a black strapless summer dress when last seen. 30 or under. Uh-huh. No, no one like that. One o'clock's a pretty quiet time. In fact, all afternoon's been quiet. No woman like that's been in here at all. You have been here all the time? Yeah, on duty since 11 o'clock. That's when we open. Uh, you sure this is the right place, the top of Mm-hmm. Uh, sorry. Wish I could help you. When 
we got to the Beverly Glen Hotel, a worried clerk was still wondering what to do with the 14 pieces of luggage Ellen Bradley had left there earlier. No, she hadn't phoned in and given him any instructions. No, she was not registered at the hotel. Sergeant Pells made arrangements for a man to cover the lobby in case she showed up to claim her things. By 8 the next morning, the Central Identification Bureau in Sacramento made a positive identification on a thumbprint taken from her room at the Seaside Hotel. She was identified as Emily Miles Braddock. Her nearest living relative was a sister, Elaine. Address 112 East Orange Avenue, Los Angeles. You! You down there? Yes. Who are you looking for? Elaine Braddock. Are you Miss Braddock? What do you want? I'd like to talk to you for a minute. Well, I don't want to buy nothing. I'm not selling anything. I'm an insurance investigator. You sure you got the right party? Elaine Braddock? Come on up, mister. Just open the door and come on up. Come on in, come on in. You wanted to see me, here I am. What do you want to see me about? The gray-haired woman who had cackled at me from the second story was sitting in a wheelchair by the window. My name's Johnny Dollar. I'm here about your sister. Oh, Emily, huh? Yes, we're trying to find her. Has she been around here? We know she's in the Los Angeles area. Emily was here a little bit yesterday afternoon. Where she's gone now, I don't know. Have no idea. How long was she here? Oh, she stayed maybe two or three hours. I hope I don't ever see her again. She's no good. Well, how did she get here? By car? Cab? I don't know. Just standing at the door yesterday, the same as you, all of a sudden. Well, how did she leave? Walked. Tried to borrow some money from me, but I wouldn't give her none, so she had to walk. Did she make any phone calls or see anybody else while she was here? Well, she made a call. Any idea who it was? No. Did you happen to hear anything she said on the phone? No. Showing up here just like that after not writing or letting me hear from her all the time she was away. Getting herself in trouble with the police. Being in jail. Ten years ago when I got hurt, she promised she'd take care of me. Look how she's done it. I have to live on the county. You know that? I got to live on the county and nobody cares about me. Is, is she in bad trouble? I'm afraid so. Well, how bad is it, mister? Oh, ten years, maybe. Ten years? Ten years? Yeah, two was bad enough, but ten. What'd you say your name was? Dollar. Mr. Dollar, I hope you don't catch her. Even if she kills someone, I hope you don't catch her. And I hate her. You're only young a little while, and that's all you got. Ten years in prison, and she'd... She'd come out worse off than I am. <laughs> Friends, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, you'll enjoy chewing Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. Chew Wrigley's Spearmint while you're working. The lively, full-bodied flavor of Wrigley's Spearmint gives you a refreshing little lift. The smooth, pleasant chewing of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum helps keep you feeling relaxed and satisfied. Makes your job seem easier. Chew Wrigley's Spearmint Gum in your home, when you're out walking or driving, when you're enjoying sports and other activities. Wrigley's Spearmint Gum tastes good any time. And the natural chewing aids digestion and helps keep your teeth bright and attractive. Yes, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, you'll enjoy chewing Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. <laughs> Our star, John Lund, we bring you the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar.
That afternoon, a follow-up came on Emily Miles Braddock. The completed folder included a mug shot that showed a woman of 30 years with dark brown hair, wide-set eyes, a well-formed nose and mouth. I took it with me when I went back to see Tom Garland. Oh, hi. Hi. Mind if I come in? Oh, what now? Your friend. Oh, what about her? I've been thinking about what you told me about her yesterday. That's nice. Here. Take a look at this. That's her, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, that's her. Can we talk now? Okay, come on in. Her name's Emily Braddock, not Ellen Bradley. Up until two months ago, she was in the state correction home for women, serving a two-year term for grand theft. Here, take your picture back. I'm not pushing my weight showing it to you, Garland. But you're a little stubborn about what you want to believe about her. If she lost a baby, as she told you, she was in prison when it happened. I thought I'd better prove this lie. All right, so you proved it. You mind if I sit down? No, help yourself. Thanks. Well, do you have anything else to tell me? Well, I suppose I do, since you don't want to seem to... You don't seem to want to tell me anything. I've been on this case almost a week now. In that time, I've talked to eight different men who have met Emily Braddock... And one woman who knew her by her real name and for what she really is. Garland, every one of those people came out on the short end of things with her. Now, just a minute, Joe. I've looked at I this don't... mug shot. I've heard these men describe her, and I think I can understand why. It's not hard to imagine this face set off with a nice hairdo, some earrings, makeup, and the works. This sister of hers I met this morning lives in a very crummy neighborhood. A family home. She's all Emily has left. Or vice versa. Emily walked out on her. Well, if it's as bad as you say it is, why shouldn't she? For one reason, her sister's a hopeless cripple. But even she would protect Emily. You're my only hope. What? This woman can get away from us right now. She's smart and clever. She can go right on doing the same thing she's been doing all along. Oh, she'll get caught eventually. But, but because I know her and she passed a few bad checks doesn't mean that I'm responsible in any way. You know that. You're right, it doesn't. But you're involved just the same. You're different from a hotel man who's been tilted. You're a boyfriend. True, just a four-day boyfriend. But a woman like that can do a lot of damage in four days' time. Why are you here, Dollar? What do you want? I'm here to disillusion you, Garland. Because I don't think you're disillusioned enough right now. Now, wait a minute. I you're don't a perfect that... stranger to me. I don't know you from a Grand Rapids chair. But I'm doing you a favor telling you that Emily Braddock is a crook and a thief and a forger... And that everything she ever told you was a lie. Now and then a woman walks into a man's life that he'd sell his soul for. But don't ever do any business along those lines with this baby, because all she'll do is give you a bad check for it. She's trouble in a great big way, Garland. And you know it as well as I do. Well, what do you want me to do? Apologize for meeting her? I'll be satisfied if you tell me why you lied. Garland, Emily Braddock never went to that bar you were talking about earlier. You didn't drop her off there. No one there had even seen her. And she's the kind who could walk into the World Series with 50,000 other people around and still be noticed. Where is she now? I don't know. I won't buy that. Not from you. Now, let's try once more. Where is she? What did you do with her after you dropped the luggage off at the Beverly Glen Hotel? Where did you take her? She phoned you from her sister's house yesterday afternoon, didn't she? Right after I'd been here with Sergeant Pels. Garland... You should see that sister. Ellen's in Santa Monica. Where? At a little hotel called El Tonquis. She's registered there as Evelyn Brady. Where's your phone? It's over there. Operator. Sheriff's office, please. Thank you. A dollar? Yeah. Dollar, could it be fixed so that she wouldn't know that I told you? Could be. All of this beats me. I, I don't understand it. What? Oh, what you've told me is true, I know. But an hour ago, she called me up and said, Tom, I love you. That sounded true, too. I, I told her I loved her, and now I'm turning her in. What kind of a crazy world do we live in? Twenty minutes later, Sergeant Pels and I were in the rickety elevator in the El Tanquis Hotel, a place as dingy and old as the Spanish name it bore. 
A little different from the swank hotels where our suspect had lived so gaily. Pels was thinking of it, too. Yeah. Some joint this is. Yeah. What was it, 518? Yeah, it's down this way, I think. This one kind of harpooned you a little, huh? Hmm. Yeah, I suppose so. There are a lot worse things than passing bad checks and telling lies. But the way she handled it, no one even raised an eyebrow. Yeah. Yeah, I heard it. Yes? Emily Braddock. Beg your pardon? I said, is your name Emily Braddock? You must have the wrong room. My name's Evelyn Brady. Sorry, miss. You're the one we want. I'll have to change into a dress. I'll check the room. Excuse me. What's this all about? I think you already know. I have no idea. What is it all about? Bad checks. There must be some mistake. All right, miss. Go ahead and change. We'll wait out here. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry. We'll have to keep this open a little bit. Oh? You can dress behind it if you want. If that doesn't suit you, well, we'll take you down like you are. Thanks again. Uh, two windows on the outside, no ledge. Firelighters across the court. Any luggage? A little makeup kit. Bella? Yeah? Now that you've seen her... What do you think? Well, I'm only human. Too bad she's a crook. Emily Braddock was held at the sheriff's office in Malibu. The officers who questioned her reported that she steadfastly refused to admit any part of some 16 counts that had been filed against her. I wasn't surprised to learn this, but I was surprised when she sent word that she'd like to see me before I left town. Hi. Here you're about ready to beat it. Uh Uh-huh. You're the one who talked to him, aren't you? Talked to who? Tommy Garland. He told you where I was, didn't he? (laughs) Sure he did. I thought you wanted to tell me something. You thought wrong. The same as all these others around here. I'm not going to tell you or anybody else anything. Police are like hotel men. You figure out their little system and then you beat it. If you say so. I don't have a lot of time. We could be pretty good friends, you and I, if this hadn't come up. I mean, a drink or something together. We'd have looked nice. Oh, look, Emily. You're the one who got him to tell where I was. And he asked you to fix it so I wouldn't know. Oh, yeah, Tommy would do that, I know. What I don't know is what you said to him. How did you get him to tell? Is that all you're interested in? It's not asking anything. Well, I told him just what you are. A thief. A crook. That sold him? Well, he told me where to find you. I guess it did. (laughs) I must be slipping. You slept a long time ago. When you walked out on that sister of yours. When you thought you could talk and look your way into anything you wanted. I didn't know I thought that. But if you say so. Whatever I've got, it's worked. Has it? Two years, the last time. Whatever you get this time will be longer, no matter what you say or don't say. I'm not in a courtroom yet. That's where it happens. Not in a lousy jail. We'll see about that. You're just as bad and just as dumb as the worst of them. Any day you believe that. Mm, Like it says in the manual. When a woman suspect is to be interrogated, remember that the strongest appeal to her is in her family connections and moral outlook. Question her regarding these. Stinking cops. Just stinking cops. You never give up, do you? Hardly ever. Stinking cop. Emily Braddock goes to trial next month. I won't be there. But six clients of Baltimore liability will be. Expense account item five. Miscellaneous, $265. Item six, same as item one. Transportation back to Hartford. Expense account total,
$738.32. Remarks. The next time I go after a Czech artist, I hope it isn't a good-looking woman who feels that there's no one in the world she can't dominate. This last one scared me, even if she was behind bars. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, friends, Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum refreshes you. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum gives you real chewing enjoyment. The lively, full-bodied flavor of Wrigley's Spearmint cools your mouth, freshens your taste, sweetens your breath. The smooth, pleasant chewing of Wrigley's Spearmint helps keep you feeling relaxed and satisfied, makes whatever you're doing more enjoyable. Yes, for refreshment plus chewing enjoyment, Treat yourself often to Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Millions enjoy it daily. Get a few packages and always keep some handy. That's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar... Brought to you by Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum, stars John Lund in the title role and was written by E. Jack Newman with music by Milton Charles. Featured in tonight's cast were James McCallion, John McIntyre, Bill Conrad, Stacey Harris, Jeanette Nolan, and Joan Banks. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is produced and directed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. <laughs> The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum hope you enjoyed tonight's story of Johnny Dollar and that you're enjoying delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum every day. This is Charles Lyon inviting you to join us again next week at this same time when, from Hollywood, John Lund returns as yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is the CBS Radio Network. John Lund as... Johnny Dollar. Hi, Johnny. Shelly Thomas in Federal. Well, you're up early today. I've already been at my desk for two hours. How'd you like to work on one for me? What's it about? In cold, hard claim cash, it comes to exactly $12,482.16. That's interesting. What does it mean? Somebody's been filching a lot of merchandise over in Toledo, and it's beginning to hurt. Could you get over there and have a look around? Sure. But it sounds like a police job to me. Well, I don't expect any miracles, Johnny. I just want a good factual report on the whole business for my clients. See you in an hour. John Lund in the transcribed adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Federal Insurance and Claims Adjusters, 2044 Appalachian Drive, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Costain matter. Expense account item one, $49.15. Plane fare and incidentals, Hartford to Toledo. En route, I read over the details concerning the case. Thirty-seven stolen merchandise claims have been filed and paid off in what looked like a first-class shoplifting epidemic in Toledo. I parked my two bags at the Commodore Perry Hotel and went over to the main police station. A Lieutenant Sturgis was in charge. Sit down, sit down. Thanks. Federal Insurance and Claims Justice, huh? That's right. You're here to find out what we've been doing about all this shoplifting, is that it? Well, we represent the insurance companies who've had to pay off on these theft claims. Yeah, sure, I see. Well, uh, where do you want to start? Well, let me see. 
How about this mommy dress shop, Lieutenant? Okay. Uh-huh. Uh, let's see. Uh, February 10th. Proprietor, Mrs. Bancroft, registered a complaint with us that a dress and a coat were missing from the Storax. He's... Uh, well, we went over there and talked to her about it. Made out the report as another shoplifting job and put a description of the coat and the dress in the hot sheet. Mm-hmm. Dress wholesaled at $113. Coat had a fur trim. Went at $395. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Looked a little better than most shoplifting jobs to us. We had it in mind when we got another complaint three days later from a place over on Oak Avenue. That would be, uh, Milady's Shoppy? Yeah. Uh, Negligee and a silk robe. Yeah, we covered that one, too. Both of them came to $286. Yeah, same thing as a mommy. Clerks hadn't seen anyone, didn't know anything. The week of the 15th, we had two more complaints. On the 23rd, three complaints. They've been coming in regular ever since. I think the last one was three days ago. Always the best stores, always expensive merchandise. We rounded up every known shoplifter in our files, and we've had our store personnel at all of our lineups. No one's been able to make an identification so far. First, we thought it was a plain, expert shoplifting done by a well-organized gang. Looks that way. Not so much anymore. Do you notice on your list there that all of these items are for a woman? Yeah. Uh, dresses, coats, blouses, cosmetics, millinery, costume jewelry, and so on. Now, what we didn't pick up until about a month ago is that all of the articles of clothing that have been taken are for a woman who wears a size 10 dress. Hmm. That is a funny one. Yeah, and it rules out a gang right away. There's pattern to it, but... I'm going to have someone else tell you about that. Yes, Lieutenant? Let's see if Sergeant Beidler's in. Right. 99 times out of 100, a shoplifter will take anything he or she can get her hands on regardless of cost, size, color, or anything else. So we don't think this is the work of an old-timer either. You mean somebody's just gathering up a nice wardrobe at my insurance company's expense? Something like that. If any of these stolen articles have been sold or disposed of, we'd have a lead by now. The stuff has been on the hot sheet for months. We've covered pawn shops, second-hand store. Yes? Sergeant Bidler on two. Right. Hello, Sergeant. How's it going? Fine, thanks, Lieutenant. Now, there's a man in my office named Dollar. I'm sending him down to see you. in the department reacted a little differently than the men to all this. How's that, Sergeant? Well, when they went over the stolen property sheets, they were first impressed, of course, by the fact that all of the clothing was for someone who wore a size 10. The other thing, though, was the good taste. Well, a lot of thieves have good taste, I suppose. <laughs> this one seems to have not only good taste, but a pretty exclusive taste. You mean the expensive places that have been robbed? Well, that, but even more. You see here... Uh-huh. On March 4th, one green suede coat missing from Toll's Apparel Shop and here on the 13th. A brown organdy dress from the Commodore and here. Cocoa-colored sports coat. Yeah. Hats and gloves in green and brown, beige, sometimes yellow. No other colors. Well, what does it mean? Any woman who restricts herself to these particular colors in dressing, green, brown, beige, cocoa, yellow... Must have a very definite coloring of her own. We think a redhead with green eyes. Well, you know best about that. But, uh, why green eyes? Couldn't they be blue or brown? <laughs> yes, they could be. But there's been a particular emphasis on green in the coats and dresses that have been stolen. And besides that, there's the cosmetics. Did you cover Jaegers? Jaegers, um, let me see. No. Well, Jaegers is a very plush cosmetic store here. Nothing but perfume and makeup. They reported March 2nd, a whole box of green eyeshadow had been stolen from one of their counters. And green eyeshadow only goes with green eyes? Yes, whereas blue eyeshadow would fit a person with either blue or brown eyes. Now, at the same time the eyeshadow was taken, several tubes of lipstick and rouge were also stolen. Both of those items contained orange tinting. That gives us another reason for thinking the eyes are green. I'm convinced. <laughs> a redhead with green eyes. Oh, and it's a short hair, too. It is? <laughs> look at my hair. I am, Sergeant. With a short hairdo like mine, I'd look rather ridiculous in a big picture hat that requires a hair frame. But a small hat, one with a tight contour, would be all right. Hey, I'm coming around. The case millinery story. Yes. 
Four hats. Total value, $185? Yes, those hats that were taken from cases were small, especially designed for a woman with a short hairdo. We think that some of the costume jewelry that's been stolen ties in with the clothes, too. Uh Uh-huh. Well, how does it stand right now? We've had our troubles on this one. It's impossible to tie up the manpower it would require to cover every dress and apparel shop in town, not to mention the department stores. Sure, sure. We're doing the next best thing. No store has been taken a second time, so we've spotted a dozen police women from my department and as many stores around town that still hasn't been hit. And they're closing as clerks. How long has this been going on? Since Monday. Maybe we'll get a lead this way. Yeah. Sergeant, this is just a wild one, but suppose a red-headed woman with green eyes isn't doing it after all. Suppose somebody's doing it for her. We've thought of that, and it looks like a possibility. None of the personnel we've questioned in any of these stores has been able to say definitely whether or not they saw anyone with red hair on the premises or around the shop to fit the time incidents of the particular robbery. I see. There's another thing we're working on, too, beauty shops. Oh? She's a redhead, and she's got all of these expensive clothes. It's a good bet she keeps herself up. You know, has her hair and nails done regularly. Yeah. We've covered about 50 different beauty salons in town, the best ones. So them the kind of woman we're looking for and giving them an idea of what she'll be wearing. Well, if she's still in town, something should break pretty soon. I'd like to go over the original complaints, if it's possible. Main filings on the second floor. Ask for Sergeant Kelly and he'll give you what you want. I'll do that. Thanks a lot. After a full day and a half of studying the crime reports... I wholeheartedly agreed with Lieutenant Sturgis and Sergeant Beidler. Since none of the stolen articles had appeared in any of the usual places for disposal, I was convinced it was not the work of an organized gang or of a previous offender. All clothing that had been taken was the same size and a small variety of colors, and as Sergeant Beidler had pointed out, suited only to a certain type of woman with definite physical characteristics. Red hair, green eyes. Johnny Dollar. I think we've got something here. What? The lead on one of the coats. I met Lieutenant Sturgis in the police garage, and we drove over to Toll's apparel shop on West Oak Street. One of the clerks there had phoned in and reported she'd seen a woman wearing a green suede coat that had been stolen from the store a month before. The clerk's name was Alice Emerson. I'm sure it was the coat. Well, how can you be sure of that, Mrs. Emerson? Well, it was the only one like it in the entire store. Uh-huh. And as far as I know, in Toledo, it, it had a gathering at the back and gold buttons. I just knew that coat the minute I saw it on her. I just knew it. Oh, uh, this was about a half an hour ago, you say? Yes, I was on my lunch hour, and I was eating at the Westgate. The cafeteria? Yes. She was about three people ahead of me in the line. I didn't remember at first that the coat had been from us, but when I sat down to lunch, I recalled it. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. I really didn't know what to do exactly. Then I thought, well, I'd better make sure it is the coach, you know. I wouldn't want to make trouble for anyone. What did you do? Well, she had a table over by the wall eating her lunch alone. So I finished my lunch, and I walked over near her, and I took a good look at the coat. (laughs) It was our coat, all right. The one that was taken from that rack over there. I was going right out on the street and call a policeman, but I guess she got a little suspicious of me looking at her the way I did, and she got up and left. What did she look like, Mrs. Emerson? Oh, she was a nice-looking woman. About my size, 30 or so. Very nice. What color was her hair? Dark. Very dark. Dark? Black, you mean? Or dark brown. I don't know which. Did you happen to notice the color of her eyes? No, no, I didn't, but she wore glasses. Horn-rimmed. You're certain it's the same coat? Oh, I'm positive. Have you ever seen a woman before? No, never. At least I don't think I have. Nothing familiar about her at all? No. Did you happen to notice which direction she went in when she left the cafeteria? No, I I don't know where she went. She just got into a taxi cab. I went with Lieutenant Sturgis to the offices of the taxi cab company that covered Metropolitan Toledo. There we began checking the way bills as they came in. Since less than an hour had elapsed from the time Mrs. Emerson called in... We didn't have to go through too many of them. 
At the intersection of Oak and Westgate, which was right in front of the cafeteria, cab number 418 had carried a fare to a hotel apartment house called the Colonial on the east side of town, Yondota Street. We spoke with the driver of the cab on the phone when he checked into the office. He remembered the fare. A woman in a green suede coat. Try that. Yeah. Hello, can I help you? Police. Oh? Now, sometime in the last hour, a cab brought a woman to this address. We'd like to talk to her. She's about 5'4", uh, about 30, dark hair, wearing a green suede coat. You know? Well, now let's see. Four horn rim glasses? Well, I've got 175 apartments here. Uh, wait, a, a green suede coat? Yeah. Well, Miss Jones. Jones, huh? Yes, Lillian Jones. She just checked in two days ago. Alone? Yes. What apartment is she in? The 1429. Shall I ring her? No, no, never mind. We'll just go on up. From the description we gave the desk clerk at the Colonial Apartments, he identified our suspect as Lillian Jones, apartment 1429. She'd come in approximately 20 minutes before we'd arrived. As far as the clerk knew, she was still in her apartment. We took the self-service elevator up to the 14th floor. Uh, it'll be down this way. Hey, wait. 1410, then it goes to 21. Yeah. Oh, the corridor. Oh, Yeah. Lillian Jones? What do you want? Police. I'd like to talk to you. Oh, just a minute. May we come in? We can talk here. It'll be easier inside. Here's all right for me. Let's go inside, Miss Jones. Okay. What's this all about? A woman who works at Toll's apparel shop saw you in the Westgate cafeteria at lunchtime today. She said you were wearing a coat that was stolen from them. She's a liar. I don't even know where Toll's apparel shop is. She was pretty certain about it. I've been here all day. I had my lunch here. Anybody with you? What do you mean? Did you eat alone? Sure, I ate alone. Miss Jones... We can get the woman from Tolls to come over here and identify you. Say, listen. And we can get the cab driver who brought you here to identify you, too. It'd all be lying. I've been here all day. You prove it? Sure, I can prove it. Clerk downstairs said you just came in about 20 minutes ago. He's lying, too. It's a green suede coat. You have a green suede coat? No. Listen, you just get out of there. Where's the coat, Miss Jones? I don't know what coat you're talking about. A green suede coat. Now, what'd you do with it? I don't have a green suede coat you have any objection to our looking around? You bet I have. All right, we'll get a search warrant. I'm afraid you'll have to come with us, Miss Jones. I'm not going anywhere with anybody. Get out of here. Get out of my apartment. I'll make plenty of trouble for the both of you. Come on, Miss Jones. Lillian Jones had a record of one previous arrest two years before. The charge, grand theft. She'd been released for lack of evidence. Her profession was listed as a domestic... The sales lady from Toll's apparel shop appeared and positively identified her as the woman she had spotted in the Westgate cafeteria wearing the stolen coat. The cab driver who'd driven her from the intersection of Westgate and Oak to the Colonial Apartments was called in. He also identified her. She still refused to admit anything, maintaining that she hadn't left her apartment all day. Lieutenant Sturgis took a detail of men to her place to search the premises. I stayed with Sergeant Beidler while she questioned Lillian Jones. Why won't you tell us what you did with the coat, Lillian? I don't know what coat you're talking about. Honest, I don't. Mrs. Emerson saw you wearing it at the cafeteria today. The cab driver saw you wearing it. The clerk at your apartment desk saw you wearing it. They're all liars. I don't own a green suede coat. You people have no right to hold me like this and ask me all these questions. I haven't done anything. What did you do with the coat? There isn't any coat. Where'd you hide it? 
I want a lawyer. Can I call a lawyer? Tell us about the coat. You stole it from Toll's apparel shop on March 4th. Isn't that right? I don't know anything about Toll's apparel shop. I told you. It's on Oak Street. I'll drop in and say hello sometime. What about the other thing? What other thing? You know what we're talking about, Lillian. Why don't you get it off your chest? We'll find out sooner or later. (gasps) Who are you working with? I want a lawyer. Where is it hidden? I want a lawyer. You can make a statement now and save yourself a lot of trouble. I want a lawyer. We continue to question Lillian Jones regarding the green suede coat. She denied ever having such a coat in her possession. However, at 3.45 that afternoon, Lieutenant Sturgis returned with his detail of men. They had found the coat, stuffed into a clothes hamper. I took it over to the shop, and the people there positively identified it as the one stolen on March 4th. Yeah? Yeah, it had their label and one of their stock tags in the pocket. Well, that should do it. I don't know what we've uncovered here, though. There wasn't anything else in the apartment to fit any of the other thefts. Yeah? Well, you can hold her on this. Oh, sure. I'll have her booked in right away. Lillian Jones was charged with grand theft. Before she was taken to the main jail, she admitted that she had stolen the coat. But not from the apparel shop. From the home of a family by the name of Costain. She said she'd been employed there for two weeks as a domestic servant. Mr. Costain was a civil engineer with offices in downtown Toledo. They informed us that he'd already left for his home. So we drove out there to interview him. It was a large... 12-room place on the edge of town. A servant took us into the living room. A few moments later, a tall, gray-haired man in his early 50s made an appearance. I'm Mr. Costain. I'm Lieutenant Sturgis, Mr. Costain. This is Mr. Dollar. How do you do? Police? That's right. They hate to bother you around dinner time like this. quite all right. Sit down, please. Thanks. Uh, We're holding a woman downtown named Lillian Jones, Mr. Costain. I understand you employed her at one time. Lillian Jones? Oh, the maid, yes. Is she in trouble? We're just checking her story. I see. She was in possession of a green suede coat at the time we took her in, Mr. Costain. Mm-hmm. She insists that she took the coat from your home. Why would she say a thing like that? Well, we don't know. We thought maybe you could clear that up. I have no idea what she's talking about. I fired her last Tuesday, I believe it was. That was the last I saw of the woman. Was she very angry when you fired her? Not particularly. It's just that she didn't work out here very well. I gave her two weeks' pay, told her to go. The green suede coat with gold buttons down the front. I don't know where she got it, I'm sure, but I know she didn't get it here. Funny she'd tell us she stole it from here? Yes, it is. I don't know why. Is uh, Mrs. Costain at home? Mrs. Costain passed away last February. Oh, I'm sorry. Do you have a daughter? No. We have to check into all these things, you know. Oh, I understand. I wish I could help you. Uh, You can if you will, Mr. Costain. How's that? Would you mind dropping into my office tomorrow and taking a look at the coat? I don't know what good that would do, but I'll be glad to do it. You just might recognize it. Perhaps it belonged to Mrs. Castaigne. Possibly. Although I don't remember it. Room 212 in the main building. All right, Lieutenant. I'll be there in the morning. Fine. Sorry to have bothered you, but I'm not at all. Good night. Good night. Good night. Did you see it? The color print on the piano? Yeah. A red-headed woman with green eyes. A check in the neighborhood revealed that the Costains had been living in Toledo less than a year. Before that, they'd lived in Detroit. Financially, they were in the upper income bracket. The house was completely paid for. There were two expensive late-model cars in the garage. The Office of Vital Statistics informed us that Mrs. Costain had died on February 6th of a heart condition. It also noted that her hair had been red, her eyes green. Lieutenant Sturgis, robbery. Oh, yes, of course. I see. Well, are you going to be home? Bye. I'm with Costain. Yeah? Yeah, he just changed his story. He said he did know that Lillian Jones stole that coat when she left the house. 
You give any reason for not admitting it when we were there? No, just wants to see us. I'm afraid I've caused you some trouble on this. Oh, we don't quite understand why you didn't tell us about it last night. It's rather simple, probably rather silly. I have a devil of a time keeping servants here for some reason. If a notice got in the paper that I'd accused one of them of theft, well, I'd have a difficult time getting another one there that way. A coat's worth over $600, Mr. Costain. Yes, I know. It belonged to my wife. And you let it go like that? Oh, I'm insured for personal loss. Did you report this to your insurance broker? Oh, yes. Did you file a claim? Yes. What's your broker's name? Mr. Levant. He has offices in the Metropolitan Building. When did you report the loss? On Wednesday. You mind if I call him and check this? I don't see why that's necessary. I've just told you what I did about the matter. Oh, we're still puzzled, Mr. Costain. That coat was reported stolen from Toll's apparel shop last March 4th. Hmm. That's absurd, of course. Mrs. Costain bought that coat for herself a week or so before her illness. Did she handle it or did you? What do you mean? Well, did she pay for it or, or were you billed? I... I suppose I was billed. I don't recall. Are you insinuating that Mrs. Costain might have stolen that coat? No, Mr. Costain. Your wife was already dead when that coat was stolen. Oh, no. You're wrong. What do you mean? Edna's not dead. She'll come back. And when she does... When she does, I'll have all these things for her. The things I denied her before. Denied her? Yes. I always told Edna she was too extravagant, that she didn't need all those expensive things. Well, you, you could have bought them. Why did you steal them? I always denied her the things she loved. When Edna went away, I don't know what came over me. I mean, the loneliness seemed too much somehow. And I'd go out during the day from my office and wander through the stores, stores that she used to love very much. And whenever I had the opportunity, I stole the thing she always wanted. What did you do with them? They're in Edna's bedroom, hanging in her wardrobe. Would you like to see them? Expense account item two, seventy-five dollars and twenty-five cents, board and room while in Toledo. Item three, sixty-two dollars, miscellaneous. Item four, forty-one dollars ten cents, plane fare back to Hartford. Expense account total, two hundred twenty-seven dollars fifty cents. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, stars John Lund in the title role and was written by E. Jack Newman with music by Milton Charles. Featured in tonight's cast were Hal March, High Averback, Edgar Barrier, Virginia Gregg, Mary Lansing, and Peggy Weber. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, was transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. This is Charles Lyon inviting you to join us again next week at this same time when, from Hollywood, John Lund returns as... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar.
Barry Craig, Confidential Investigator, starring William Gargan. Barry Craig speaking. Detectives come in three sizes. City cops, big agencies, and guys like me with a small office and an insurance company retainer to pay the rent. Cops don't have to worry about getting cases, and the big agencies have branches from here to Shanghai. But from where I sit, you never can tell where your next case will come from. Last week, it started with my old brown suit. I'd been on a bodyguard case, and the suit looked as if I'd been sleeping in it for a week. There was a good reason for that. I had. I tucked it under one elbow and ducked into George the Taylor's. George had a king-size shoebox in the basement of my office building. Morning, Mr. Craig. Hi, George. What can you do with this suit? <laughs> if you like herringbone handkerchiefs, I could maybe salvage enough goods. All right, so I'm not Adolf Monju. How about it? Tuesday? With the spots out... Thursday. Okay, Thursday. <laughs> oh, say, uh, Mr. Craig, I, I wanted to ask you. I've got a problem. Well, what is it, George? Got a pair of plaid slacks with no coat to match? No, no, no. I, I, I'm serious. My wife says, George, you go to the police. But she wasn't here when that man came. What man? What's the pitch, George? The man said I need protection. Shakedown, huh? The man said I've got to pay $50 a week to stay open. He says, George, you wouldn't want trouble. Maybe a bottle of acid spilled on your racks. Did you pay him? Well, I didn't have $50. I told him to get out. Now I'm scared, Mr. Craig. Look, you're a detective. I want to hire you. You protect me. That won't work, George. Stopping a protection racket is a big operation. You need 24-hour guards, a whole setup to protect all the shop owners. Well, I could pay in installments. You've already paid for protection, George. Your taxes. You better call in the cops. They're the only ones who can swing it. Oh, no. He said they'd beat me up. Maybe kill me. Look, George, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll drop in at headquarters tomorrow and bend the lieutenant's ear. He'll give orders for a cop from the precinct to look after you. And start the ball rolling to find out who's behind this racket. Will you really do that for me, Mr. Craig? Sure, sure. After all, I wouldn't want anything to happen to my brown suit. George disappeared in the spritz of steam and I headed home. I put in a call to Lieutenant Edwards. He was out, so I left a message that I'd call in the morning. I was propped up in bed eating pretzels, reading a medium hard-boiled private eye opus, wondering where he found all the beautiful blondes with the low-cut problems when the phone rang. I left the intrepid uh, sleuth under a falling blackjack and stretched for the receiver. Craig speaking. Mr. Craig, you've got to come quick. George? You've got to come down right away, Mr. Craig. Please, please. What's up? Somebody there? <laughs> Hello, George. George. Hello, George. I slid into my shoes and took off across town. When I hit the pavement outside of George's shop, I had company. A hook and ladder, two pump engines, and a crowd of fire buffs who traveled to Denver to see a lit can of Sterno. The smoke was pouring out of the cellar as I muscled my way through the police lines and ran into Lieutenant Edwards. What do you want to be when you grow up, Craig? A cop or a fireman? I'll take a rain check on the lap, Lieutenant. What are you doing here? Just holding back the crowd. If you ask me, all these fire buffs are nuts. Anybody know what started the fire? Doubt it. Cleaners' stores go up like birthday candles all the time. What does George say? Who? George, the tailor. He runs the shop. Probably at home playing three-handed stuss. No, no. He lives in back of the shop. He called me from here. You sure he isn't around? I haven't seen him. Fire boys said the joint was clean. Maybe. We better find out. Hey, where are you going? Inside. It's chilly out here. I grabbed a rubber chest to from the hook and ladder and headed inside. The first flash had died down and the shop was burning nicely at the proper temperature for browning the turkey quickly. Under the fireman's coat, I was beginning to base in my own juice as I pushed into the back room. I found what I was looking for under the counter. George the tailor, dead. I carried him outside and knocked off a few minutes to pump the smoke out of my lungs and siphon a little oxygen in. You all right, Barry? <coughs> <coughs> You know where I can get a new pair of eyelashes? Craig, what are you doing sightseeing in a fire at this hour of the night? And how did you know that guy was in there? I told you, Lieutenant. George called me. He was up against the protection grip. He tried to hire me. I told him I'd have you look into it. Well? It's too late for a referral now. Yeah? 
Well, it looks like it's my baby now. You better give me the whole shooting match to date. I have. That's all I've got. Anything turned up on your end? Any other complaints of a protection shakedown? Not a mutter. You're lucky you're out of it. I'm not. I haven't welched on a client yet, and as far as I'm concerned, George was my client. Well, it's a good, clean pro job anyway. Tough to prove arson. Maybe not. I found this wedged under George. Plastic? Celluloid scrap. Comes in real handy. Stick a plumber's candle in a pile of it, and by the time it blazes up, the mechanic is clear to Nutley, New Jersey, to establish his alibi. Celluloid, huh? Well, then I'd better make my call in arson. Yeah, and while you've got the precinct on the wire, just casually mention murder. The bus from Bellevue rolled up, and they loaded George's body in the back. I watched it pull away. Then a hand fell on my shoulder. I turned around slow and found a pair of thick eyeglasses staring right through me. Oh, Mr. Craig, I'm Alfred Whittington. Oh, look out for the lapel. This has just become my only suit. Uh, you're the confidential investigator, aren't you? I've got a license. I want to hire you. I pay rent on an office that's open during business hours. If you don't mind, right now I'm tired and a little burnt around the edges. I overheard your conversation with Lieutenant Edwards. You'll get your ear pinched in a keyhole that way. I'd like to talk to you, Craig. Perhaps my apartment? Perhaps not. Would it interest you if I told you I want to retain a detective to find out who killed George the Taylor? Oh. All right, Mr. Whittington, as you say, let's go to your apartment. We rode uptown in the caddy that had to bend to get around corners. The name clicked as we crossed 42nd Street. Alfred P. Whittington. He ran the newspaper that did the big crime series this year. They got Sluts Longo to talk and almost pinned half a dozen rackets on the coattails of Herman Jess, the big operator. Of course, they had to put Longo together with Scotch tape for the funeral, but it made nice reading, and Herman Jess had left town until it all blew over. Whittington's apartment was in the penthouse on top of the newspaper building. We sailed up in a private lift and waded through the nap to his library. It was the kind of a room you see behind the iron gray hair and the whiskey ads. Whittington was a little cozy about speaking his piece, so we discussed interior decoration till he got ready to make the plunge. I, uh, I had this room specially designed for my hobbies. Oh, looks like you make a hobby of hobbies. Guns, original oil paintings, and that fish tank is big enough for a stunted whale. Oh, uh, that isn't all. I've got movie editing equipment in those cabinets. Color slide projector. I'm very interested in photography. All you need is an erector set. Look, Mr. Whittington, I'm not writing an article for House Beautiful magazine. Of course, I, uh... I just like to get to know a man before I talk business. With me, it's the other way around, so let's have it. You, uh, know, of course, the paper's been running a series on crime in the city. The board of directors is very anxious to continue. They've so instructed me. Where do I fit in? I heard you say you were going to work on this protection racket. That's right. Do you, uh... Still intend to? Up to the top. Good, good. We can help each other, Craig. I want to retain you on behalf of the paper. What happened to your reporters? Measles? Contrary to popular fiction, reporters aren't trained as detectives. You are. What do you want? Whatever you can get. Of course, I want reports direct to me, strictly confidential. That comes with the price of the entree. Our legal staff will have to go over everything before we print it. And nobody's to know you're working for me. Bashful? Discreet. The staff here would feel I didn't have confidence in them. Don't you? When I want a job done right, I go to a professional. I want the truth, no matter whom it involves. But I want the story exclusive, as it develops, step by step. All right. Then you're my second client, because George the Taylor comes first. Next morning, I went down to the insurance company that pays me that nice, steady retainer, rain or shine. I waded through the acre of desks in the outer office and rapped on the glass door marked Arthur B. Goldsmith. Art was the company expert on fires. He knew enough angles on arson to burn out an asbestos mine. I planted the scrap of celluloid I found under George the Taylor on his desk and flipped over a few questions. No soap, Barry. Celluloid is standard equipment. It doesn't point to anybody? It'd be like asking which ball player uses a bat. The mechanic plants a plumber's candle in the celluloid scrap, down she burns, and then they can file the insurance claim in the morning. Much doing these days? Average. Not like in the Depression. In 33, the only way to make a profit was burn your own place down every six months. Art, if you wanted to hire the best, money no object, uh, who would you get to start a nice, cozy conflagration? 
pro job? Major League. Now, let's see. Mike DiGiorno is in Elmira. Maybe uh, Irving Turkle, celluloid Harry Bush. I'll give you a list, maybe ten men. Thanks, Art. It's a long shot. Got something else? Not yet, but if you rake a red-headed clinker out of the next fire, that's me. I started checking down Art's list. It was like looking for the clams and a bowl of cheap chowder. Two of them were at peace in the lower bay, hugging a load of bricks. I found Irving Turkle on Center Street, right opposite police headquarters, pushing a baby carriage full of hot charcoal and roasted chestnuts. Hot roasted chestnuts. All hot. Uh, Dimes Worth, Turkle. Who are you? Barry Craig. Hot goldsmith at Federal Indemnity put me on you. Oh, yeah, yeah. Why, I got a lot of respect for Mr. Goldsmith. I got a lot of, a lot of respect. Mm-hmm. Here's your chestnut. Thanks. Look out for worms. Yeah, I will. How's business, Turkle? You push ice cream, turns cold. Switch to chestnuts... You could fry an egg on the sidewalk. Tough, huh? My worst enemy should have it better. You haven't been roasting anything besides chestnuts lately? <laughs> like, like what? Like tailor shops? Oh, Mr. Craig, I, I'm telling you honest, I ain't so much as set fire to cigarettes since the last time I got sprung. Sure. Look, look, I, I, I ain't so young no more. You you could get pneumonia standing out here, but inside those cell blocks, it ain't so nice neither. I ought to know. I, I've been in maybe 18 years since I was... Since I was 13. Warwick, Myra, Clinton. I've been to them all. Enough already. I made up my mind I want to die on the... <coughs> out. <coughs> Could you use five, Turkle? Oh, you're, you're kidding. I want to find a mechanic who did a job on the west side yesterday. A tailor shop? You know about it? I read it in the paper. I got a list from Art Goldsmith. Save me some time, and it's worth a thin. Uh, me, me, Mr. Goldsmith. I should not have put me on the list. I, I retired. I, I wouldn't. How about go... the rest of them? Well, I, I heard somebody the other day saying Harry Bush made a good connection. Where can I find him? All right. Uh, look, Mr. Craig. I'm, I'm, I'm on my own now. There. There wouldn't nobody even feel bad if I got took. I'll cover you, Turkle. All right. Harry Bush has got a drop from Long Island City. Easy glide roller skating rink. All right, Turkle. Thanks a lot. You you tell Mr. Goldsmith I'm retired. You tell him that. I, I got a lot of respect for Mr. Goldsmith. Excuse me. I, uh, I got to get back to work. Chestnuts. Hot roasted chestnuts. Clyde roller skating rink was in a factory district across the river in Queens. It was an oversized barn with high school kids on wheels where the cows should be. I managed to collide with a redhead in a turtleneck sweater and one of those velvet skating skirts that look like the paper panties on a lamb chop. And she told me where to look for Harry Bush. There was a sign on the door that said, Manager, keep out, but I decided to overlook it. Who's that? Hello, Harry. If you want to rent skates, you're in the wrong pew. Mind if I smoke? Who are you? We got a light, a match, maybe a plumber's candle. What are you, a cop? Private license, Barry Craig. It's a nice drop you've got here, Harry. What are you talking about? I'm the manager of this. Been to any good fires lately? What would I be doing at a fire? Lighting it. They say around town, celluloid Harry Bush is working again. You're in the protection racket up to your pointy ears. You're crazy, Craig. I haven't been near a tailor shop. Yeah? I didn't mention any names, Harry. I just said protection. How did you happen to think of tailor shops? I read about it in this morning's paper. They're still burning people for murder in this state, Harry. But then you won't mind. You like fire. I wouldn't even get booked. Listen, Craig, I don't care what you think. It ain't going to do you no good. Somebody covering for you, Harry? What do you think? Who is it? Why don't you find out? Maybe I will. So long, Firefly. Outside, I parked my shoulders against the wall just around the corner and went into a trance. I didn't have long to wait. Celluloid Harry came bouncing out in less than five minutes and headed to town. I stuck with him like bubblegum till he ducked into a doorway in the East 60s. 
I gave him a running start, then I waltzed in in time to see the indicator on the elevator hit five. I ran a finger down the directory. There were only two officers on file. Dr. Martin Kudulik, DDS, and an outfit named Star Enterprises that could stand for anything. I grabbed the elevator on the next bounce and punched the button marked five. I put my shoulder to the door marked Star Enterprises and heaved. Hey, what's the idea? Well, Herman Jess, I presume. I didn't know you were back. Who the devil are you? Where's Sergeant Harry? Who? A little spark plug. He came up here. I have enough trouble without guessing games. Who are you? Barry Craig. You're not police. Private. Now, you can't break in here like this. I'm not a well man. I should be in Florida right now. What's keeping you? Well, that's my business. Yeah, I know about your business. You're really a public benefactor, Herman. Where would a kid get a reefer without you, huh? Yeah. Now, look, now, look, the doctor said I shouldn't get excited, though. That must be a handicap in running your racket. I'm not in rackets anymore. I- I'm retired. What makes you think I'm going to believe that? Now, does it look like I'm running a business here? Well, no, but... I've got uh, no desk, no files, not even a telephone. Now, the doctor says I've got to have absolute quiet. All right, then. Just tell me where celluloid Harry is, and I'll stop disturbing the peace. Now, now look, Craig. You, you want some somebody named Harry. I haven't got him. There's only one door here, and you came through it. Now, take a quick look in the closet and walk out of here. My heart can take just so much. And... I'll take you up on that, Jess. Now, kindly leave. Okay, okay, Jess. But if you haven't quit the rackets, I'm warning you now. I'm after the mechanic that burned George the tailor and the man who bought him. Clear up to the top. Put that in your blood pressure and smoke it. I started for the door with a sinking feeling that I was a sucker in a new style shell game. Celluloid Harry had to be in Jess's office. Unless he was under the rug, I couldn't see him. The elevator door was just sliding closed as I reached it. I got a quick shot of a pretty picture. Celluloid Harry with his finger on the first floor button. The door slammed and I stared at the arrow as it swung around. It didn't add up. It wasn't a jest office. The only other room on the floor was a dentist. I decided to develop a toothache. Can I help you? Yeah, it's my tooth. Uh, this one, see? Hmm? Hurts something awful. Oh. Dr. Weiss is on the first floor, and Dr. Carey on the third. What's the matter with Dr. Padulik? I'm sorry, he isn't in today. How about the fellow just came out? There's been nobody here. Then I guess I made a mistake. By the way, you like roller skating? I beg your pardon? Nothing. A book of matches on your desk says Easy Glide Roller Rink. I thought maybe you liked to skate. <laughs> That dentist setup smelled like a herring factory at high noon in July, but I didn't push the point. I left and found a phone booth in the lobby of the building and poured my story into Whittington's shell-like ears. There might be any number of reasons for that girl lying to you, Craig. Harry might be a boyfriend. She doesn't like to skate. And Herman Jess is right next door. I think the dentist's office is a blind. You think he's fronting for Jess? I'd lay the odds. When the crowd thins out, I'm going up there to check. Well, what do you expect to find? I figure with the rackets Jess is running, he's got to have complete records handy, or he couldn't keep track of the take. I want to find those records. All right. If you come across anything, bring it straight to me. The receptionist had left for lunch, so I rang a few peels on the bell to see if Dr. Padulik was at home. He wasn't, so I let myself in with a bobby pin and went to work on the desk in the inner room. I pulled out a stack of records. That latest date was three months ago. The appointment book past that date was blank. The bills checked. Nothing later than three months ago, except the last one. A bill from the Conmont Memorial Home for $700.84 for the funeral of Martin Perdulik. What are you doing in here? Huh? Who are you? Who do you think I am? Dr. Martin Perdulik. <laughs> He was a rabbity gray little man, looked pretty good for a three months corpse. There was a vein in his forehead, jumping like a kid on a pogo stick. But his hand was steady as a rock, as it was wrapped around a thirty-eight revolver. You stay where you are. What do you think you're going to do? I... 
Well, you broke into my office. I'm going to call the police. Fine, fine. You go ahead. Maybe you can explain to them how you happened to be buried three months ago. What? You're no dentist. You're fronting for Herman Jess. Well, then, you're crazy. Am I? I'll save you time. I'll call the police. Give me that gun. And you give me that gun. There. Fair trade. Now, settle down, friend, while I jam a chair under the doorknob. I'm going to look for Herman Jess's records. I was in a tough spot, and I knew it. The license commission doesn't look kindly on breaking and entering, and if that office was clean, I was in for trouble. I knew I couldn't search that room for anything smaller than an elephant in the few minutes before somebody drifted in, so I kept one eye on my buddy and played it cozy. I yanked the desk drawers out and threw the papers around like a picnic. I pulled the medical books down off the shelves to make sure that there weren't any false fronts. I wasn't getting any cake from the phony dentist, so I headed for the other room. I dumped the instrument trays, and he couldn't have cared less. But when I headed for the file cabinet in the corner, the vein in his forehead beat like a ragtime drummer on bathtub gin. You can't get away with this. I'll, I'll have you in jail. Yeah, yeah. I slid open the file drawers. Nothing but dental records. I slammed it shut and my playmate relaxed like a hangover in a Turkish bath. I couldn't figure it. Those records ought to be near that file cabinet. Maybe a secret panel. I couldn't be sure without an x-ray and then I got it. What are you doing? Taking a look in this box on top of the file. Those are valuable x-rays. Don't get them out of order. Hmm. I won't. I'm taking them with me. This first batch of teeth, all right. But from here on, these pictures didn't come from anybody's mouth. Not unless his molars kept double-entry books. Oh, company. Let me in. I know you're in there, Craig. Not for long. Which way is the nearest fire escape? Hurry! I got him! In the pig's eye, friend! Craig, stand still or I shoot. The window was locked, so I tossed the waste paper basket through it. I was two floors down the fire escape when Jess showed up in the window. I was slamming around like a pinball game with body English. I hit the ground and sprinted for the curb. Then I jumped into a waiting hack. To pull the way, I saw a celluloid Harry bounce out of the building and into another cab. Hey, mister, I wouldn't want to make you nervous, but you're being followed. No, I'm very popular. Can you lose them? Uh, no, my life insurance slapped last week. Would 50 bucks change your mind? What good is insurance after I'm dead? 50 I can spend now. Hold on to your plate. We weaseled through Manhattan. The cab behind us stuck like a mustard plaster. We got into a jam and a transverse across Central Park. Hang on, mister. I'm going to cut inside that bus on the sidewalk. It got caught by the light. Shot straight up to Whittington's mint line sewer. He was showing himself color shots of his copper spaniel on the slide projector when I walked in. Craig, you didn't bring? Doorbells are for process service. I've got Herman Jess and the protection racket in my pocket. Here. What are these? Dental x-ray films. Only there isn't an inlay in the bunch. These are Jess's records. Microfilm to match the teeth x-rays. Are you sure? You can't read them without a magnifying widget. But I'll bet there's enough in that envelope to send Jess up the river like salmon. Shall I call the cops? I'll take care of that, Craig. Wait. You expecting anybody up here tonight? Uh, no, I left orders not to be disturbed. In that case, we'd better get ready to receive company. Somebody's coming up the stairs. I thought I lost Harry, but I guess he's stuck. Chuck that envelope in the fish tank. What's up? Go ahead. It won't hurt the films. Now, I'll try to look innocent. All right, Craig. Get them up. We were just talking about you, Jess. Was your nose itching? You hoist them, too, Whittingham. You can't get away with this, Jess. I'll have you... You won't do anything. You're pretty brave in those crusading editorials. Wrecked my health. Let's see you stand up against the gun. Craig, do something. You got me suggestions. And I want those records this, this sponge brain stole from me. You got me wrong, Jess. Shall I work on them? No, no. I'll try Whittington. What are you going to do? Harry, ask him where those records are. You get away from me. You heard, Mr. Jess. Where are the records? I don't know. Hey! Don't move, Craig. Ask him again, Harry. Come on, Whittington. Where are they? I don't know, I told you. Put me alone. Listen, Jess. Don't move. 
I'm a very nervous man. It would be very bad for me to shoot you. Now you got anything to say? No. No, not when you put it that way. Okay, Harry, go ahead. All right, Whitting. No, no, don't hit me again. No, don't. Where are those records? No, no, not again. There, in the fish tank. Craig hid them there. Harry. I got them. Look inside. It's films, all right. All right, we're getting out of here. Come on, Harry. What's that? Mr. Whittington is having open house. What are you talking about, Craig? I think the boys in blue are coming to tea. The cops. He's bluffing. Care to wait and see? It's the back door, Harry. We don't want trouble on the way out. Take care of Craig. A pleasure! <laughs> Harry was behind me when he let me have it with the butt end of his gun. I retired temporarily from this world, and when I got back, I was looking at a pair of shoulders four yards wide with Lieutenant Buck Edwards cooing gently in my ear. Craig, Craig, you all right? Oh. I'd better send for a doctor. How about Jess? Dad is yesterday's racing form. He tried to shoot it out with the boys I had staked downstairs. And Celluloid Harry's on his way to prison ward at Bellevue. Just dead, eh? Uh, Lieutenant, uh, did you search the body? There was certain evidence. You mean this envelope? That belongs to the paper, Lieutenant. Part of a confidential report. I don't know, Mr. Whittington. I'll uh, take complete responsibility. We rate a break on this story. Craig was retained by us. Go ahead, Buck. Give it to him. Excellent. Excellent. I'll put it in my safe. Better look at it first. What do you mean? You'll find it's a real classy collection of diseased choppers. What are you talking about? They aren't the real microfilm records. They're just a bunch of legitimate x-rays of teeth. I left the real records with the cab driver and told him to take him to Lieutenant Edwards. But you told me... Sure I did. But I like to play it safe. I knew Jess would be after me, and I was afraid he might persuade you to give him back. I... I'm sorry. I'm afraid I was rather weak. But I really thought he intended to kill us. Oh, don't apologize. You were terrific. That was a great strong-arm scene you played with your stooges. Stooges? Sure. Why do you think I ducked those records, Whittington? When I was going through that X-ray file, one thing caught my eye. A color transparency. It didn't exactly belong in that file because I'd seen a print of that picture before on your desk. A very flattering portrait of your wife. My wife? Yes, you made a slight mistake. You must have got it mixed up with your microfilm records when you shipped them back to your boy, Herman Jess. Oh, see here. Are you trying to insinuate that I... I... mean, you're the real boss behind this record, not Harry Jess. Why, well, that's absurd. If that were true, then why would I have hired you? Self-protection. Your board of directors was pushing you to deliver that crime series, but you figured that if I turned anything up, it'd be easy to take care of me this way. Craig, you're out of your mind. You can't prove a thing. Oh, yes, we can. We checked those microfilms, Mr. Whittington. There's a payoff to you listed on every page. You've been under arrest for the last five minutes. Well, Whittington, I guess this squares accounts for George the tailor, but you still owe me for one brown suit. I'll put it on the bill for services rendered. Boy, take him away, boys. Coming, Barry. Coming, Lieutenant. So long, folks. See you next week. You have just heard Barry Craig. Confidential Investigator, starring William Gargan. week, another exciting transcribed story starring America's number one detective, William Gargan, as Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Tonight's story was written by Ernest Canoy and featured Santa Ortega in the role of Alfred Whittington. Your announcer is Don Pardo. All persons and places mentioned in this program were fictitious, and any resemblance to actual persons living or dead is purely coincidental.
chimes mean good times on NBC. Till we meet again next Wednesday for another hard-hitting adventure with Barry Craig, confidential investigator, let me give you a brief rundown of the adventure shows you can hear on NBC. Tomorrow night on NBC, there are a trio of action programs starting off with Mr. Keen, tracer of lost persons, as he investigates another thrilling mystery. Then Dragnet brings you an authentic criminal case history as taken from the files of the Los Angeles police. Later, Counterspy is called in to solve a case which threatens to endanger our national security. Then on Saturday, screen actor Brian Dunleavy takes you down the shadow-filled corridors of mystery on another dangerous assignment. On Sunday, NBC's adventure shows include a spine-tingling visit with Martin Kane, Private Eye, followed by the exciting story of The Whisperer. Later, Douglas Fairbanks is featured in The Silent Men with authentic action stories about your government security agents. On Monday, Herbert Marshall comes to the NBC microphone to assume the mysterious identity of the man called X. Then Tuesday night, here Big Town, and another pulse-quickening story is told by editor Steve Wilson of the Illustrated Press. Well, there you have a complete roundup of the top mystery shows you can hear on NBC. Next Wednesday night, we hope you'll be back with us for another adventure with William Gargan as Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Now it's Meredith Wilson's Music Room on NBC. Bold Venture. Adventure, intrigue, mystery, romance, starring Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall. Together in the sultry setting of tropical Havana and the mysterious islands of the Caribbean. Bold Venture. Once again, the magic names of Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall bring you Bold Venture and a tale of mystery and intrigue. The next time I come to the bank to make a deposit, sailor, I'm going to pay somebody to stand in line for me. Yes, Slate. You know, the things a man has to go through. You'd think the bank would figure out a better way to handle their customers instead of making them wait half the morning. You picked this line. I wanted to get in the next one. But no, you had a system. Stand in back of a filly with the slimmest ankles because they move. How was I supposed to know she's been saving pennies for 20 years? What are you pushing me for? The teller's waving to you. You're next. Oh. Good morning, Philippe. Buenos well, dias, Senor Shannon. You wish change for the parking meter again today? We wish to deposit $14 today, Philippe. I do not believe. Is it your... Show him, Slate. Yeah. Here. 14 bucks. Come on, come on, Philippe. I got things to do. Still, I do not believe. Still, is it your... Two deposits on consecutive days. This has not happened with you before, senor. What are you talking about, Philippe? Eh, I was just surprised, that's all. Yesterday, a deposit of $1,000. What? What $1,000? Senor, I received the transaction myself. A man came, gave me $1,000, and a deposit slip made out to your account. As is shown here, enter on your record. He was a short man, wasn't he? With wings and a wand and pointed ears. A tall man. What struck me immediately was his lack of wings and one. Now, if you please, I will enter the thousand dollars in your passbook. Gracias, señor. Let's get out of here, sailor, before this whole joint goes up in a puff of smoke. Mario. Mario, open up. Come on, kid, open up. It's Johnny. 
Been asleep, kid? No. No, I, I had no sleep. Well, I brought us something to eat. Here's a couple of sandwiches and a can of soup. No, I, I have no hunger. You're a growing boy, kid. You've got to eat. Come on. I'll heat up the soup. Johnny, you say to me you are my amigo, my friend. I am, kid. I'm your good friend. Maybe the only friend you've got. Why you bring me to this port, Mariel? Make me live in shadows? Make me to walk at your side like a dog? That's a fair question, kid. Then answer me. If I brought you into Havana in the bright sunlight, they'd machine gun you on sight. Like they did your father before you. I'm not afraid of them. Let them know I'm here. Let them know I've come to avenge my father, to finish his work. Look, Mario, your old man died in the gutter at my feet. He was my friend. His dying bought me a byline. It was the first one I ever had. Political figure assassinated. Eyewitness account by Johnny Thomas. But I contacted Shannon, Mario. He'll get you into Havana. In the still of the night. You spoke with him? Well, no. I just watched his mouth drop open at the bank when the teller told him that he had a thousand dollars that he never had before. He knew your father. He loved him. A thousand bucks? <laughs> that makes the heart grow fonder. So let's eat, kid. I'm starved. <laughs> Let's ask King Moses if he sees it, too. Uh, he won't see it. I know he won't, but let's try. King, King, come here for a minute. Yes, Miss Saylor. What is it I can do for you? Take this bank book. All right, now open it. Very good. Now look on the last line on page one. What do you see? If you would have come to King Moses, I would have gotten the money for you somehow. I am your friend, and I will come to visit you often and play my guitar to you. I will get it. Shannon's place. What? Mr. Shannon, please. Oh, yes, Mr. Shannon is here. It is for you, Mr. Shannon. A long-distance call. Oh, that Queenie, I told her not to call me. I'd call her. Give me the phone. Hello, Queenie. You got your thousand, didn't you, Shannon? Huh? Who is this? I'll tell you tonight. You want to earn that grand, Shannon? I've got an idea you do. All right. Tell me how. Just take a walk tonight. Main Monument. About 11. Goodbye, Shannon. The main monument by Tropic Moonlight Slate. Monumental, isn't it? You noticed it too, huh? Hey, maybe this will be our guy, sailor. He better be. How long can you wait for someone who slips you a thousand bucks? Hmm. You think uh, all your life would be overplaying it? Would you happen to be looking for two suddenly rich people, mister? I would. The money makes a happy bulge in your pocket, doesn't it, Shannon? Mine too. Who do we have to kill for it, mister? And uh, will you issue the gats? <laughs> this will be the easiest bundle that you ever made, Mr. Val. You know our names? You give us money. The bank opens at nine. Be there. You can have back your grand. Let's go, sailor. Now, listen to me. I'm Johnny Thomas. I scribble for the papers. Maybe you've seen my stuff right next to the comics? Oh, I have. Good, too. That's why you shower bills on us? Because you found someone who read you? Because I want you to get a kid into Havana. A kid by the name of Mario Carrada. Carrada. The name register? Carrada. Hmm. Carrada. Hey! A man by that name was murdered a while back. A man I liked. Admired. Mario's his son. He's at Mariel waiting for you. Pier 12. Do it for two grand and a man you liked. At four this morning? I got the kid out of Havana so he wouldn't die too. What makes him want to go back? Because he figures he's got a mission, you know, a grail. Sometimes that happens to a good kid. Duck, sailor, duck! Get, get the kid, shot. Get, uh... They killed him, Slate. They shot him down. Yeah. Yeah, that's what they did, sailor. That makes two dead. Maybe we can keep a third one alive.
Into my office, senorita. Senor. Now look, Inspector LaSalle. I have been looking. I look at you, I look at Senor Shannon. What I see is invisible, nevertheless there. Violence. The shadow of a dead man's body. Por favor, in. What did you drag us down here for, LaSalle? We told you what happened. We didn't miss a detail. Johnny Thomas phoned me and said... What is Senor Thomas to you? He deposited a thousand bucks in my bank account. Because he is sending you through correspondence school, eh? Because he wanted Slate to do a favor for him. All favors that cost a thousand dollars or over can be illegal. This I had to write 100 times upon the blackboard when I went to the police academy. Why don't you stop pinching your own cheeks and listen to us? I put both palms upon the desk. I smile kindly. I lean forward slightly and I ask you a question. I say please and I ask. Please. How did the name of Mario Carrari intrude into your conversation with Senor Thomas? Please. Let's not get childish, LaSalle. You know as much about Mario as I do. You know his background. You know who his father was. And if I remember correctly, you liked his father as much as I did. Senor, we of the police are never mixed with politics. The axiom is the one concerning the keeping of the clean nose. I permit myself no opinion. Opinion or not, LaSalle, you'd better face it. There are political gangsters in Havana like there are any place else. Mario's father was a good man. You're not giving him credit, sailor. He was a lot better than that. Otto Carrara was assassinated. Havana wept for him, which included me. And the murder of Johnny Thomas is something else to weep about. Because it's all part of the same thing. I will tell you something, Senor Shannon. You are Americano. You are here in Cuba by the grace of my government. You will not meddle in matters political. To me, it's not a matter political. As far as I'm concerned, two men died. Two good men. They were murdered. That's something to meddle in. You want to tell me anything else, LaSalle? No? Wave goodbye to the inspector, sailor. <laughs> You sure Thomas said Pier 12, Slate? Yeah. The machine gun jotted it down for me. We've been waiting here in the Bold Venture for over an hour. Look, it's it's almost dawn. I don't look for anything but the kids, sailor. At dawn, we can see any time. I'm not so sure. This could be our last one. Maybe I ought to go into Marielle and try to find him. Maybe the kid overslept. Maybe he's dancing somewhere. No, Slate. We wait here. If you went looking for him, the boy might get hurt. You might get hurt. Yeah. Well... Maybe I better keep it the way they wanted it. Hey, look, sailor, that power boat is circling in toward us. Maybe the boy's on it. Maybe he's... Ahoy, Paul Venture, ahoy! Yeah? Hold out your hands, Shannon. I've got a package for you. Catch! Got it! Open it, Shannon. And hold it close. It will break your heart. What's in it, Slate? A hat. The initials M.C., Mario Carrada? You think it's his hat? I don't know, sailor, but this... This blood, it's still wet. Throw it away, Slate. I don't want to look at it. Yeah. Let's get out of here. I don't think Mario's going to keep our appointment. Our stars Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall, and the second act of our story. Mr. Slate, Lady Sailor, they go to the bank to deposit fourteen dollar to fill the blank. At the window they get a gratuity, a thousand dollar community property. 
To earn the money is a very small matter. To bring to Havana a person unknown grata. They sail to the port and wait for the boy. But he hot with blood make tears no joy. You're right, King. Makes tears. Carrado was a fine old man. They cut him down on a busy street. The tourists gathered round to watch him die. Now his son. Guy yells, here, catch. He throws me a hat soaked with a boy's blood. Do not try to bring back a dead boy, Mr. Slate. It will only give you more anguish. Who says he's dead? If he is or if he isn't, King's right. Leave it alone. Tell me how I do that, sailor, because I'd like to know. I really would. Give it to the police, to LaSalle. You still haven't told me how it'll leave me alone. (sighs) Yeah, that's how it always is with you, isn't it, Slate? How it's always going to be. So I can get up in the morning and shake hands with myself and say, How do you do, Slate Shannon? Glad to meet you. King said it, Slate. How will you bring a boy back from the dead? What's with you and King? You dead happy? I'm going to look for Mario Carrada. Don't wait up for me, you two. I couldn't take it. How do you feel, Mario? Mario? I, I have a thirst. The, the blood I have lost. You return to Cuba. I cannot permit this. Did Water. Slate Shannon bring you back here to Mariel? No, senor. It's verdad. You will not speak Spanish. You will forget even the language of this country. Else you will die. Comprende? Comprende? Yes. Yes, you understand. Now, Mario, you came to Havana to avenge your father's killing. To kill me? No. No, no, it's not so. It is so. Slate Shannon. What plot have you made with him? Nothing. I, I swear it on, on my father, I swear. Permit me but a sip of water. You see, of course. You are a good boy now, Mario. You have forgotten how to speak Spanish, huh? I like you. I will give you the water if you tell what the Spanish word is for water. The word, Mario. What is the word? For the water, the word. Agua. You remember the Spanish word. (laughs) Suffer a little more until you forget. Perhaps until you die. Sit down, Senor Shannon. You look quite pale, quite worn. Yeah. I am, LaSalle. The only other time I have seen you so is the time when we picked you up after an all-night clam bake. Because you were cracking the clams too loud. (laughs) Yeah, I remember. Yeah, that was quite a party. One of the clams bit back. I was looking for Mario Carrada. Every place I know. Everyone who knew him. He's not there. Nobody knows him. I told you before, senor. Before, I was supposed to pick him up in Mariel. Before, it was a big political secret you wanted no part of, remember? This I have been trying to tell you. I still have no part of it. You have been friendly. Goodbye, senor. Not even if he's dead, maybe. Murdered, maybe. Why do you say such a thing, senor? Why? Come in. Senor Juan Miguel... To what do I owe your presence? Sambi LaSalle, it is that I have come for Mario Carrada. So? This man also wants him, Senor Miguel. This man, Slate Shannon. Just for the record, Senor Miguel. What do you want, Mario? To uh, make amend to him for the dying of his father? To welcome with open arm the boy to Havana? To convince him that I did not murder the splendid man who gave him birth? But you were acquitted of this judge, Senor. They said you were innocent. Ah, see, but in the eyes of the boy, I want to read my innocence in his eyes. I'm just scratching, McGill. I I don't know if the boy is dead. Maybe you'd know, being so close to his father and all. I advise, senor, let me look for the boy. 
then perhaps you will live to welcome him into my arms. Adios, senores. Adios. Mm. Juan Miguel. Thumb through his biography for me, LaSalle. Oh, he is an honored man in Havana, senor. He was the political enemy of Horta Carrara, but as you heard... Permit me, is this where it is to register for a room? Single or double? Single would be pleasant. I can give you room 2B right down the hall. Hot and cold running water. And a stall shower which you can squeeze into with the jet in 2C. And if you stand on the bed, you can see the ocean. Room 2B will be very pleasant. Well, there's the pen right in front of you. Just sign the register. Gracias. I am sure that I will enjoy it here. Hey, you write pretty big, don't you? Took up three lines on the register. So that you can read my name and address? I'm afraid you'll have to carry the baggage yourself because... This baggage I always carry myself. We charge for guns according to their caliber. What is that, uh, 32? Well, that'll be 50 cents... This gun cents. does not frighten you? Even when I release the safety catch? All right, I'm frightened. And I'm curious. What do you want? To do you a favor... To take you to Mario Carrada. Move, senorita, or you will see him through sightless eyes. What do you mean, Sailor's not here, King? She was supposed to be working the desk. Did she tell you where she was going? No, Mr. Slit. I was shopping for the kitchen the whole time. I have no idea what idea came to Miss Saylor. Yeah, she and her girlish whims. Why does she do things like that? If it will make you feel any better, Mr. Slate, we got a new guest. It says here in the register. A gentleman from Mariel. Mariel? Well, that's where I was supposed to pick up Mario. Let's see that register. Juan Miguel. I wonder what he's doing here in my hotel. He's registered for room 2B, Mr. Slate. Why don't we ask him? Yeah. Why don't we? Come on, King. Senor Miguel. Senor. Give me the pass key, King. Huh. He's not in. Hmm. Hasn't been either from the looks of the room. Just the way I left it when I made it up. The way he wrote his name in the book so no one could miss it. And his address in Mariel. And the fact that Miss Salo is suddenly not among us. I will make you a thermos of something hot, Mr. Slate. You will want it for the boat trip to Mariel. Miguel! Hey, Miguel. Who is? Slate Shannon. Open up. Hey, where? Uh, it was behind your back, Shannon. Try real hard, Slate. Open uh, your eyes. Uh. Come on, one more try, and you'll make it. Uh, yeah. Don't try to move your arms. They're in back of you and they're tied. Your legs, too. We make neat bundles. Where are we, sailor? What is this? I can give you a vivid description. We're in the only fish cannery in the port of Mariel. And we're tied up after hours. What are they going to do to us? Can us? I've been sitting here looking at you for the last couple of hours, wondering how you look filleted. I don't think you look good. Never pass inspection. When Miguel took you away, did he introduce you to Mario? Mario's over there. Dead. Shot. Oh. Miguel? Yeah. First he gave Mario a speech on politics. Then he shot him. Miguel's saving us for the ocean, huh? Because we're not Cuban. He doesn't want to be connected with any murdered Americans. Hmm. Fish cannery, huh? What makes you so dreamy about a fish cannery? Just about a conveyor belt. 
See that switch? Mm-hmm. It says off. Well, ease over to it. I'll try. Yeah, that's it. Now, it's right in back of you. Now, reach up. A little higher. Can you make it? I'm trying. It hurts. It's an awfully cold ocean, sailor. Reach. Did you bring a fish to can, or did you just come here for the ride? I'm going to try to use the edge of this conveyor belt for a knife. Slate, be careful. That thing can cut right through your hand. <laughs> yeah, I'll keep it in mind. Yeah, I made it, sailor. Wait a second, I'll untie my feet. Okay, sir. So... Hey, did you turn off that switch? No, Slate. He did. With one hand, Shannon. I needed the other to hold the gun. You disappointed me. I thought that you would die without a struggle, a clean death. Don't let it worry you. <coughs> Duck, sailor. You or me, Miguel. <coughs> Stupido, stupido. You... Uh, now, now pull that trigger and you'll blow your heart out. <coughs> pull it. Go ahead. Uh, you just temporarily saved your own life, Miguel. When are you going to stop fooling around and untie me? <laughs> uh, I like you better this way. Come on, Slate. These cords are cutting into my ankles. And I'd be a fool to let anything happen to those ankles. Hand them up to me, sailor, then I'll take you home. Hey, Slate, it came. What did? The reward. What are you talking about? What reward? For capturing a criminal. Don't you remember? The owner of the cannery said he was going to send us a reward because he got so much favorable publicity. People are eating his tuna like crazy. He's a lucky fellow. What's he send us? Tuna, shredded, grated, filleted, breast of, and creamed. A dozen cans of each. That's a real genuine reward, all right. I've got a reward for you, too. <laughs> because I was so brave and swashbuckling? Because you were so nice about my ankles. You really like them, huh? Better than canned tuna. What's the reward? Come here. Like that? Figure out a way to can that stuff, sailor. I'm a hungry man. <laughs> And so our two stars, Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall, have brought to a close our latest Bold Venture story. Special music was composed and conducted by David Rose. May we invite you to listen again next week at this time for another exciting adventure starring Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall together in Bold Venture. Adventure, intrigue, mystery, romance, starring Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall. Together in the sultry setting of tropical Havana and the mysterious islands of the Caribbean. Bold Venture. Once again, the magic names of Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall bring you Bold Venture and a tale of mystery and intrigue.
Look, Mrs. Baker. Please, let me finish. I, I know I'm not as young as you might like, but I am well off, and I could make you very happy, Mr. Shannon. What are you blushing for, Slate? You've never been proposed to? A catch like you? Now you keep out of this, sailor. Go darn a shoulder strap, mend a sock. Your trousseau's an apple pie order, dear. Besides, if a fellow's going to get married, somebody has to give him away. I give you away. Take him, Mrs. Baker. Thank you, dear. I'm quite sold on him. He's everything they told me he would be, and more. I was recommended, huh, Mrs. Baker? By Darby and Joan. Hmm, Darby and Joan. Joan sounds familiar, but Darby throws me. Look it up in my file, sailor. Darby and Joan incorporated a Lonely Hearts Club. It was there that I saw your picture. There that I fell in love with you. Sailor, have you been handing out my picture again? Stuffing it in mailboxes. Didn't hit a Lonely Hearts Club, though. Too many people were throwing rocks at me. Now, what does it matter how it got there? All I know is that I saw it and they gave me your address and... I'm here to ask for your hand in marriage. Say yes, Mr. Shannon. Look, Mrs. Baker, there are a lot of other fish in the sea. You'll get over it. We'll be friends. Have another cliché, Slate? I just made some fresh. Well, you don't understand. You see, I'm a widow, a lonely, unhappy widow. My husband was lost in the Texas City disaster in 1947. Since then, I, I've tried to replace the man he was. But you're the first one I've found. Oh, I'm that... sorry, Mrs. Baker. Baker, really sorry I can't marry you. You don't know what a happy girl he's just made you, Mrs. Baker. My heartfelt felicitations. I'll get you a cab, dear. <laughs> Having fun, Laura? Love it. I like the way all of this fits you. Swank hotel, heated swimming pool, patio, all of it. It's a good background for you, Laura. Yeah. Yes, it is. Oh. Laura. Want to go in? No. Laura, what are you going to do with my wife? Don't worry about it. She'll be found. She'll make a headline in the paper. Mary Baker and I will have tea. We'll take a walk. She'll be found. Uh-huh. Just don't worry about it. I'm not worried. An executive like you, a career girl who runs a Lonely Hearts Club, odds and ends and details, tea with a woman, walk with a woman, the killing of a woman, second nature for you, Laura. Not really, darling. It becomes a matter of overcoming an obstacle like you did. I guess. After all, Frank, your wife thinks you're dead. Your wife thinks you went up in an explosion. Letting her think that's more cruel than what I'm going to do. Dying only takes a moment. I guess. But understand this, Laura. When that boat went up in Texas City and 500 people turned up dead or missing, well, I became one of the missing. I know. You couldn't stand your wife. That's right. Why I ever married her. For her money, darling. Let's not be coy. That's why you've come back. To get her money. And me. Mostly you. Without your wife's money, darling... I'd look at you sitting beside me and see a man slowly turning to flab. That's me for you. Let's take a dip, Laura. Whatever you say, Frank. Touch your motor, sailor. Okay. Ease her in. I'll hop up on the pier and make her fast. Throw me a line, sailor. Okay, secure. Give me a hand, Slade. <laughs> the sea air make you dainty, I'm busy. Let me to give you my hand, Senorita Duval. I have one I'm not using. Sure you can spare it, Inspector LaSalle? Thanks. Explain a man like Slate to me, LaSalle. What makes him so cozy about handing a girl off a boat? Perhaps his brain is occupied with women he has handed over to death. Hi, LaSalle. Had a rotten day today. No fish. Huh? You said something, LaSalle? You will come quietly, huh, senor? You will not upset the equilibrium of the harbor of my delicate stomach. <laughs> you, you tried by carb? I got some on the boat. Fetch it, sailor. The policeman has a tummy ache. And also in the head. From looking at your picture. You look at it, senor. 
What sickness does it give to you? Are you kidding? It's one of my more glamorous poses. Where else have you seen an open throat like that? You want Slate's permission to wear it in a locket around your necklace, Al? Gee, my Slate, he's in demand. Aren't you, boy? What'll I write on it, LaSalle? To my favorite gendarme with regret? A confession would be nice to write on it. What have you boys been up to? A confession to the murder of a Mrs. Baker. Well, that's the lady who wanted to marry me. You think I'd kill an intelligent lady like that? The motive we will discuss later in the calaboose. But first we will study the matter of her lying on the patio of your hotel with a bullet wound in her heart. With a gun that made the wound in your room where I found it. Next to her purse, empty of $150 and full of this picture of you. You're crazy. That picture was taken by a chubby, red-headed sidewalk photographer for 25 centavos. I never... In the jail, we will take one of you for free, senor. Please, do not make me to shoot you in the leg. Our police doctors are so overworked. But the hangman... Slack for him, huh? Get bail, sailor. After you get your mouth closed, get bail. Miss Sailor! Miss Sailor! Did you get it, King? Yes, Miss Sailor. To the penny. Enough to go, Mr. Slate's bail. Did Mr. Crevelin give you any trouble this time? Oh, Mr. Crevelin was very kind. He said this is the eighth time we have hocked the boat. Two more times and he will put a gold star beside our names. Five more times, a certificate of merit. Ten more times and... Uh, what are you staring at, Miss Sailor? A chubby redhead. It is not true what they say about chubby redheads, Miss Sailor. But this one has a camera. Wait here, King. I'm going to have my picture taken. Hi there. Uh, oh, I fall on my face. You are so beautiful. Take my picture and I'll autograph it for you. Oh, I faint from the sheer joy of such a suggestion. However, I will take your picture and you will send me 25 centavos. See? See. Si. Bueno. Stand as you are. So. So. Smile. So. So. It is done. Uh, my card. My address. Send money. I will send picture. No money, no picture. Known as law of supply and demand. I like the way you handle your camera, senor. Uh, Luis, my name to those who enjoy me. I enjoy you. Tingles all over, see? I'm fighting it, but uh, tingles all over, see? Uh, the picture would still cost 25 centavos, senorita. I'll pay you for Slate Shannon's picture, too. Por favor? Slate Shannon, a man whose picture you took the other day. Is, uh, is a mistake. Adios, senorita. Goodbye. Hey, come back here. Hey, you, Louie. What happened, Miss Sailor? Why is he running? I don't know, King. Let's tell Slate. I'll bet it'll tingle him all over. You get arrested once more, Slate, and we'll be wearing barrels where our jeans ought to be. Well, I get more costly all the time, huh, Sailor? Three thousand bucks to bail me out of a murder rap. You get any more costly, you can drag out the tin cup your Aunt Sophie sent for your birthday. <laughs> ah, good old Aunt Sophie. She knew I'd make it someday. You haven't got much time left for nostalgia, Slate. Better start collecting your memories. I just got you out on bail. You're still number one chum for the murder of Mrs. Baker. Yeah. Tell me again about the photographer, sailor. I told you. I mentioned your name, the wave went out of his red hair, and he took off after us. <laughs> Darby and Joan, Lonely Hearts, Incorporated. Man's wanted for murder, and he thinks of... He thinks of our picture of him got put on the market. Run on home, sailor. No, 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 no. No, no. Better still walk. I'll stand here and watch. And when I'm out of sight? The Darby and Joan. Maybe they'll rent me a murderer. <laughs> Hello. My name's Slate Shannon. You're a lonely heart. Welcome to Darby and Joan, Incorporated. From here on in, your troubles will be bubbles, and the cares that infest the day will be replaced by a bevy of whatever you like. Blonde or brunette, Mr. Shannon? Tall, short, kittenish, or uh, one who bakes bread like mother? <laughs> oh, about like you. Somebody I can't make up my mind about until it's too late. 
I'll help you out. Get up from behind his desk. Well? I'm your easiest customer in months. What do your club rules say I do now? Rule one, we find out if we have a common interest. And talk about it? If it needs talking about. Mine does. Not mine. See, we're different. We won't get along at all. Well, I can recommend Miss Wormsley to you. She's not beautiful, but she crochets like the Dickens. Would she know what my picture is doing in your files? What are you talking about? You heard me. Are you so far away? <laughs> yeah, I am. This better? You're hurting. That's the impression I wanted to give. The picture. In a little while. Hold me. Wait a minute, the door. Forget it, just hold me. Tied a slate like you hate me and want to love me. Yeah. You didn't have to hit him so hard, Frank. That's the way you hit people with the butt of a gun. Well, get him out of there. Drag him away someplace. I can't look at him helpless. He's not that kind of a man. You mean you could go for a guy like that? The way he looks now? All right, don't answer me, Laura. I'll just drag him away. Our stars Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall, and the second act of our story. The thing to do in mental strife, aching for affection, no girl, no wife. When Moon is nicely situated, try Darby and Jones Incorporated. I offer this suggestion with fingers crossed. Walk, don't run, first figure the cost. If love is making you crazy in the head, it once happened to a lady, it killed her dead. King, what is it with you men? What do you mean, Miss Sailor? I mean, what is it? Mrs. Baker was looking for a husband. She was gentle-looking, had a kind of beauty that becomes a woman her age. Why should everything suddenly get violent? I don't know. I just don't know. All people have secrets locked away. Secrets sometimes have death in them. That chubby photographer, King, he's the boy that someone ought to talk to. He's the boy I'm going to talk to. No, wait for Mr. Slate. He will be back from that Lonely Hearts Club soon. I doubt it. When Slate gets mixed up in a club like that, he starts organizing smokers, field trips, good and welfare committees, first aid classes. Oh, I've seen him operate before. That kid's a joiner. I'm going to see that photographer. Oh, oh I'm sorry I didn't see you. Can I help you? Uh, do you have a payphone here? Right over there by the steps. Oh, thank you. When Slate gets back, tell him to wait for me. I'll be back shortly. Hello? Laura, this is Frank. That Duval dame's going to see Louie. Meet me there right away. <laughs> Laura! Over here, in the alley. That's why I adore you, Frank. Your bag is so full of tricks. Why didn't you wait for me in front of Lewis's shop where you told me you'd wait? Someone else is waiting there. Miss Duval. Shannon's good companion. Is the lady shilling for the snapshot artist? Why didn't you go right on in? Because his shop is locked. Because there's a sign on his door that says, Out, back in 30 minutes. And I'll bet the run in my stocking you made him hang it there. Uh-huh. I called him, disguised my voice, told him there was a wedding party that couldn't go on unless he was there with his tripod and flashbulb. Say, that's a bad run. When we've finished, I'll buy you all the stockings you'll ever need. I'll come higher than that, dear. 
Higher because I killed your wealthy widow, remember? I'll remember it like it was our song. Now that you've met me, talk to me in an alley. What? It leads to the back entrance of Louis' shop, into his dark room. That's the one we'll use because it'll be interesting what Miss Duval has to say to our Louis. We break in like common burglars hide in the dark. Uh Uh-huh. A thought tease you, Laura. I did things like this when I was a little girl hiding under front porches. Come on, Frank, it'll be fun. Come on, Louis. Stop fumbling with those keys. Open the door. Very well, senorita. Inside. I will lock it. Now. Now, what is it you wish? The picture you took of Slate Shannon. Por favor, senorita. You talk crazy. All right. Let's hear what the cops think. Unlock the door. Uh, Wait, senorita. You're going to give me that picture? Uh, Wait. Uh, I I will give you the picture. Here. Here it is. One more thing, Louis. Yes. Yes, I will tell you. I will tell you everything. But permit me, there are some prints in the room and back. I must attend to them. I will return immediately. All right, back. Hello, Louis. Huh? No. No, please. Get him out of the way, Frank. Yeah, sure. Hey, what goes on? Where? Don't fight it, my pretty. Just relax. Just inhale. This stuff takes no time at all to put you asleep. That's it. That's it. Oh, yeah. Everybody here. Oh, yeah. Frank, it's the police. They heard the shots. She's groggy enough. Just stick the gun in her hand. Now, let's get out of here. (laughs) Tell me again, Mr. Slate, how the Miss Lonely Hearts took you in her arms and all of a sudden there was a slam, bang, alagazang on the back of your skull and the nightingale sang and the stars dripped gold. (laughs) I really made it live for you, huh, King? Where's Sailor? Fly, Mr. Slate. It is thin fingers of the law. Save it for amateur night, King. Hi, LaSalle. What brings that sparkle to your teeth? Mm, They sparkle when I grin. I grin because I am jolly. I am jolly because I have come to return a deposit you made on your life. What? Your $3,000 bail, senor. We have found the motive for the murder of Senora Mary Baker. It was jealousy. I'm sorry she's dead. She seemed a fine woman. She was. This we have learned. When her husband was lost in the Texas City disaster, she was insane with grief. They had to prevent her from taking her own life. But it didn't stick, huh? She told me she was rich. Who gets her money? For the dead, there are always those who wait to get the money. They weep, then grovel for the money. But from Louise, the photographer, they will get nothing. The redhead? What are you talking about? He has also been murdered, senor, by the same who killed the senora. Murderer, to wit, one Sailor Duval. You lost your marbles, LaSalle? I thought it would interest you. Visiting hours are from 2 to 2.15, senor. And don't bring back the bail. We have no use for it. I will give you three minutes, senor. Thanks. Maybe I can do something for you sometime. Like break your leg. Three minutes, senor. I will stand here watching them fly by on my watch. Look at me, Slate. I'm a killer. Like the role? What happened, sailor? I went to Louie to get that picture of you. He balked. I said I'd call the cops. So he gave it to me. Then he went to the back room to enlarge a snapshot or something. Then there were shots. Then... Then I woke up with a gun in my hand. Louie at my feet. And a cop pulling my eyelids open and saying... Quit stalling, babe, or the Spanish equivalent. Then... You got the picture? Yeah, I'll give it to you. Turn your back, Slate. You go on, stir, happy. Give me the picture. Here. Huh. Well, what do you know? We only saw half the picture the first time, sailor. This is all of it. 
Hey, you see that woman pointing a finger at me there in the background? What about her? I thought she was a tourist pointing out one of Havana's oddities. Ah, that's Laura of the Lonely Heart. Don't go away, sailor. Bounce your iron ball. I'll be back soon. Hi, Laura. I brought you something. Well, you don't have to bribe me. Oh, take a look. You and me together in one picture. We'll take a million more. You were pointing out a pigeon to the photographer. You were showing him Slate Shannon. I wanted you for my album. I stay up late nights with my album. Pigeon. Me. For the murder of Mrs. Baker. Well, I thought you were a man in the crowd. Now I know better. How were we the last time? Like this? Just about. <laughs> about now comes the hit over the head. A jealous customer. We get all kinds. Relax, Slate. This time there'll be no hurt in it. Show me. All right. My lips on your cheek. Here. 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 You'll never make it, Laura. You just got a customer. Get out of here, Frank. I'll see you later. What's he got to give you, Laura? Get out of here. I just gave her something, Frank. A picture. You want to see it? Here. Go ahead. Look at it. Laura. You lost it good, didn't you? Laura here handles all your work, huh? You won't like her, Shannon. Ask her to love, she'll love. Ask her to kill, she'll kill. Either one buys a man grief. Slade, don't listen to him. He's furious because I'm with you and not him. You got anybody you want to kill, Shannon? A photographer? A wife? A wife? You had one of those, Frank? Yeah, I lost her. Uh-huh. No, that's not the way it was. She lost you in Texas City in 1947. Then you followed your wife to Havana and teamed up with Laura because you got lonely for your wife's money. It's a great loneliness. Now what, Frank? Now what? I start running. I'm leaving you, Laura. To Mr. Shannon. He can have you and the two murders on your hands. Bye. Frank. What, Laura? <laughs> Now you know how much I hated him, Slate. You did it for me, huh? I wanted you to see me do it. <laughs> you know, it's a time like this when I'm putty in a girl's hands, especially when she's holding a gun on me. You can change that. How? Make me believe you want to change. All right. Believe me? Uh-huh. Making love at the point of a gun, that's exciting. Throw the gun away. I can take it from here. I believe you. I'll keep my eyes open, Slate. I want to watch your face. Slate, don't touch that gun. Slate. For a girl in the Lonely Hearts business, you sure got a talent for being lonely. Slate, I, I, I believed you. Don't you see this is Laura for you, Slate? For no one else. Listen to me. Listen to me, Slate. Just you and me. Let me know when you're finished, Laura. And we'll take a walk. Sailor's hands must be numb bouncing that iron ball. Hey, Sailor, where are you? Out here on the patio, taking a sun bath. Come on out. Hi, Slate. Sit down. Oh, it's a jazzy sunsuit you're wearing. You like it, huh? Never saw the like. Blue and white striped canvas. The latest thing. <laughs> Picked it out of a mail order catalog, huh? Swiped it while the turnkey wasn't looking. They issue suits like that for the girls in the pokey? Uh-huh. I cut it down for my uniform. Well, bye, Sailor. Hey, where are you going? I don't know. That, uh, that convict suit, uh, yeah, that stuff's liable to rub off. No, it won't. Come here. See? Hey, where are you going? It rubbed off. You made me a happy convict, Sailor. So where are you going? To get me a couple of rocks. I'll make sand out of them with my bare hands. <laughs> And 
so our two stars, Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall, have brought to a close our latest Bold Venture story. Special music was composed and conducted by David Rose. May we invite you to listen again next week at this time for another exciting adventure starring Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall together in Bold Venture. Adventure, intrigue, mystery, romance, starring Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall. Together in the sultry setting of tropical Havana and the mysterious islands of the Caribbean. Bold Venture. Once again, the magic names of Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall bring you Bold Venture and a tale of mystery and intrigue. This is a dirty night to be out on the ocean, Slate. It was a dirty day, too. Those dirty fish ate the bait and swished their tails for more. Fish were biting for me. How do you explain that? What's to explain? You stuck your head in the water and told the fish how good they'd look in a pan. Among fishermen who know fish best, those tactics stink. Fish hate you, Slate. Resign yourself to it. Fish hate other fish, sailor. They don't hate people. They hate you. The word in the briny deep among our finny friends is that... Ahoy! They turn the searchlight over there, sailor. Ahoy! Ahoy! Uh, that's got it. Two guys in the ship's boat, sailor. Cut the motors. Ahoy! Can you give us a hand? We're in trouble. Sure. Come alongside. Right. Boy, are we glad to see you. Hand me a line. Okay, secure. I'll give you a hand up. Thanks. Come on, Chuck. Yeah. <coughs> Hey, you know what they've been talking about, mister? The friend in need. Glad to help. My name's Slate Shannon, and... Hey, sailor, come here. This is Sailor Duval. Joe Donnelly. My friend is Chuck Bishop. Hi. Hi. Howdy. Joe and me were fishing, and that storm started to rise. The sea almost swamped us. Fishing? Where's all your gear? Lost it, I guess. About the only thing we saved is this bait box here. Pretty small box for deep-sea bait. It'd hold enough for about two casts. Well, Joe and me aren't very experienced. Deep sea fishing in a ship's boat. That's a twist. I said we weren't experienced. Cut it out, Chuck. Uh, you say your name's Slate Shannon? Look, Buster, it's the law of the high seas to help someone in distress, but I like the story that goes with the distress. You'll get it. But first, I want you to meet this gun. Surprised, huh? <laughs> I don't blame you. Take the wheel, Chuck. Let's get going. What is speaking? Si, sí, senor. You see, the SS Marino Victory? Un momento, senor. Mm. Ah. The Marino Victory sailed from the port of Havana yesterday at high tide, 7.12 a.m. See, si. I will get the men to plot our position. What is? See. Si. See, si, I have been informed of the matter of the Marino victory. Immediately. It will be taken care of. I have told you, senor. Immediately. Oh. Venga! Come in! 
What do you wish? Be quick. There is a great turbulence here. Senor Juarez, I have come to ask a favor. On a day that has more come, you may ask me, King Moses. At present, I have no moment for the granting of favors. Please listen, senor. Listen to me. Mm. Mr. Slate and Miss Taylor have not yet returned from their fishing. It has been many hours. Many hours since they should have been back. The storm at sea, the winds... <laughs> you have fear for Sharon and the senorita Duval? <laughs> Why? They are children of the sea. They steer a boat as well as they steer each other. But it is long after midnight, senor, and the storms that hover over the waters is greedy for lonely sea voyages. It is... <laughs> yeah, I have heard of your talent for the footlights, King. How you make A productions out of B matters. Please send a party to search for them, senor Juarez. Where would I get such a party, King? But you have many ships, many craft at your fingertips. In the moment when you leave, I will not have them. They will be searching the Caribbean waters for the men who have mutinied on the SS Marino. Desperate men. Men of bloody violence. Murderers. Get me the Coast Guard. All available craft are to begin the search immediately for the murderers, the mutineers of the SS Marino. Their position... This is a real tricky sea, Donnelly. And this isn't the best charted area in the world. There's shoals and reefs all over these keys. Your boy better know what he's doing. Chuck's a slob, but he knows. You two want to breathe easier, I'll tell you something. Not a lot further to go. You know where Dorado Key is? Sure. It's a cone-shaped couple acres somewhere around. If it went for the fog, I could point a finger at it. Ship boat three points off the starboard bow. Yeah. I see it, Chuck. There are boys. Head for them. This is going to be quite a party. That's right. A rendezvous with the rest of the jolly ones from the Marino Victory. They'll be glad to make your acquaintance, I'm sure. Likewise. Now don't get so eager, sailor. This party might not materialize. Hey, Donnelly. Yeah, I see. So they're headed for a fog bank, so? So this. If I'm right, that shadow in the ocean over there is Dorado Key. And just about where that fog bank is rolling is a coral breakwater that belongs to Dorado Key. And just about where that ship's boat disappeared into the fog bank is just about where I'm talking about. And something tells me I was right. Yeah. Hey, Chuck! Give her the gas! Right! Fog bank, Donnelly. Better tell your flunky to ease her. Cut her, Chuck! Look what I just scooped out of the ocean slate. A fresh piece of driftwood. Am I not lucky? Take your hands out of the water. Somebody's liable to shake it. So the boat crashed, Shannon. It doesn't change a thing. Except that whoever was in the boat can't be alive. Not in these waters. Like I said, it doesn't change a thing. There's still the four of us. There's still Dorado Key. I think we'll all be happy. <laughs> Chuck. Chuck, I'm talking to you, me. What do you want? You tired, baby? The rigors of that old devil sea exhaust you? Maybe they did. It hurts me how tired you are. Get up, slob. Keep the fire going. My guests are cold. That's a good slob. Now we can all keep warm. You like it when you're warm, don't you, Miss Duval? Something you'll never know, Buster. The things I like. But the things I hate. Maybe I can prompt you. <laughs> you hate me, huh? <laughs> well, let's start eating the hate away. That way we'll all live to a ripeness. Let's start with a little black box, Joe. What's in it? Souvenirs of the loved ones at home and in Port Socorro? It nibbles at you, huh, Shannon? As long as we're all cozy like this at a beach party, comes the time when we all peel off our secrets. Sure, it nibbles. Well, as long as the time has come, tell them, Chuck. Tell them what's in the box. You're crazy, Joe. You're going crazy. Tell them, Slob. Well, it's dope. Enough dope to... I'll take it now, Chuck. You did elegant. Enough dope that it was a jolly task to kill our captain, his first mate. To watch our sea chums leave stains of their blood on the hungry rocks of Dorado Key. That's what's in the box. Any further questions? Yeah, question. 
How does a happy boy like you live to open the box? The rope around your neck could numb your fingers. I live as long as you. No, longer. A lot longer. I say that to make you bitter about the full, rich life I'm going to... Wait. Where you going, Chuck? I'm asking you. You'll never make Shannon's boat, you slob! Oh, oh! You killed him. Goody for our side, Slate. Uh-uh. Just in the leg. So he won't try to run out on us anymore. So he'll live to hold a gun on you when I get drowsy. Because you two might get coy. Pack up your kits, kiddies. We're moving. Oh, and I'm beginning to love it here. The fire, the shootings in the leg. Lots of legs left, honey. You and me, Shannon... We hide your boat in this cove. The nosy coast patrol will never see it. Then we make for the top of the hill. The cone, you called it. Who knows? Maybe we can top it off with some dead bodies, huh? Well, what do you know? We made the top of the hill. You can lay the boy down now, Shannon. I want you to enjoy the view. (sighs) Thanks. I'll never forget you, Joe, for the things you do for me. Oh! uh, Let let me go, Donnelly. Let me go. You can have it all. Just let me go. Shut up, you slob. You're interrupting the view. Enjoy it, Shannon. You, baby. There's a good tall precipice here, Joe. Why don't you jump off? A belly whopper on the rocks would be tasty and enjoyable. Top of the world. The top of an empty, rain-swept world. You fellas know I had poetry in me? I didn't. Did you know this about Joe Sailor? Uh Uh-uh. The things a fella doesn't know about a fella that makes the other fella stale. The top of the world where I can sit in those pirate ruins over there and watch all the little bloodhounds of the sea smelling for mutineer Joe Donnelly. Uh, Take my hand, Shannon. I'm young again. I want to go exploring. Joe. Joe, I promise you, I I won't breathe a word. I I don't want any part of what you you want. You can cry your heart out to me later, Chuck. Coming, Shannon? Sailor told you. I'm allergic to gun prods ever since I was knee-high to a knee. Sickens you, huh? Glad to hear it. Come on. Those ruins, they'll make a good shelter. For me, honey boy... You sleep where it's cold and wet. You and baby and the slob. I'm not yet, Mother Earth. That's a sinkhole. You got your foot caught in a sinkhole. Why don't you go waiting, kid? Ah, uh, uh, Shannon. Just the tippy toe of my toes. He's... I got it out. Make you sorry and forlorn, huh? Worse than that. I hate myself. I'm not stuffing your mouth in it up to here. Joe! Joe, Joe, listen to me. All I ask is just let me go. That's not much for a slob bass. I got something for you, cripple. Joe! 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 What kind of a man are you? You knocked him into the sinkhole. It'll drag him down. It'll... Get me out! Leave him alone, Shannon. Leave him alone! I want him dead anyway. This is better than anything I dream. You can't let him die like that. Watch me. Leave him alone or you share it with him. This way we don't have to dig him a grave. Adventure, our stars Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall, and the second act of our story. Find anything, Slate? Not a thing. We've been over the whole island. There's nothing edible on it, not even a seagull's egg. What's with the seagulls? <laughs> They're mighty particular where they lay their eggs. That's what's with seagulls. No, the seagulls hate you. Fish and seagulls. You're making a name for yourself in the animal world, Slate. 
<laughs> you kids are born comics. <laughs> I'm full of delight you could make this trip with me. It wells away the hungry hour. We've been on this island two nights and a day, Donnelly. The food on the bull venture was maybe enough for a hearty meal for a skinny man. How come? I'll take it. How come I haven't killed you both? Is that what you're trying to say? If you weren't such a blabbermouth, I could have put it in my own words, but that's what I'm trying to say. Good chap, Slate. You stay right in there with him. There's merit in what the man says, baby. If I'd killed the two of you, I could have had all those canned goods for myself. But remain the question of how do I get me and the dope off this stinking island. We've been staying up nights watching the Coast Guard search for you. They've all gone home. Why don't we take you away from all this right now? Because I don't fall for their crumb bum tricks. Because right now I'm hungry. You are? Gee, maybe you'll starve to death right in front of us. We made you laugh. Turnabout's fair play, Joe boy. I never starved to death in my whole life. Shannon's going back to Havana to bring food. Just food, Shannon. If you bring anything or anyone else, I'll slaughter baby here. Give me the keys to the boat. Eight hours, Shannon. That's all you have. Eight hours. And keep it in mind. From this tall piece of the world I own, I can watch every move you make. Mr. Slade, Mr. Slade, where have you been? How much food stuff we got in the kitchen, King? Food stuff? You and Lady Sailor have been gone two nights and a day, and I have been holding my head in my hands and shaking from side to side. I have been plagued with many thoughts of what has befallen you, all of them evil, and you... Come on, King. Tell me what's in the kitchen. Where's Lady Sailor? On Dorado Key with a man and a sinkhole and a gun. If I'm not back there in five hours with that food, Sailor's going to be a thing of the past. Take me with you, Mr. Slate. Yeah, it's impossible. Donnelly sees me bringing anyone back with me. I'll hide in the boat. There's no necessity for anyone to see me. Then when the night shadows fall, I will creep silently as a leopard upon... Just load the food, King. Well, don't look like that. You can come along. Joe boy. Oh, Joe boy. What's the matter, baby? You lonely? Uh-huh. Look, I feel silly screaming, uh-huh. Why don't you come down from your pirate's tower and talk to your captive girl? <laughs> yeah, the least I could do. Uh... Yeah, I'm here, baby. Talk nice. You haven't sighted the bold venture yet? Shannon's still got another hour. That means he's been gone seven Look, Ma, a regular mathematical wizard. Yeah. I even figured this. In seven hours, you miss him enough to want me at your side. It's a long time between rickshaws. The high altitude makes your head spin, huh, baby? Round and round. Say the right word and uh, I'll gather enough momentum to fly away. That's all I have to do? Say a word? Maybe more. Maybe lots more. And maybe no words at all. Like that, huh? I could be the end of your rainbow, kid. But you've got to find the way yourself. Oh, try this one. With what I keep locked in this little black box, we could make all the neon in the world glow a little brighter. How much do you figure it's worth, Joe boy? I found a way, huh, baby? Fifty grand and hundred grand depends on how good I am at bargaining. If you were real good, I'd walk in your shadow. <laughs> You're a scream, baby, a long, shrill scream. You're dropping your marbles, Joe boy. You never had a better offer. No, not better, baby. Never better, but truer. More from the heart. Go yell it to the wind, baby, how you tried, how you loused it. Crawl away and die for Joe Donnelly. Me, I'll wait for Shannon with the canned goods. Easy through these shores, Mr. Slate. Easy, easy, shoaling off. Ah, oh, Mr. Slate, it is always a sight to see the way you handle this bull venture. <laughs> like poetry, huh? 
Hey, what time is it? A few minutes before five o'clock. Well, that gives us a few minutes. You think he sees us from up there? How do I know? That's the chance we've got to take. That's why I brought the bold venture into this side of the island. Donnelly will probably be watching the other side. The side we tied up at last time. It's getting dark, Mr. Slate. Maybe he couldn't see us anyway. Uh, it's not dark enough. Yesterday, this place was hidden in clouds. Now look at it. Clear as glass. All right, you better get down out of the way, King. We're getting close enough. Right. When we reach the island, what happens? I'm trying to convince myself he hasn't seen us. I'll go ashore. You stay with the boat. But, Mr. Slate, why don't you let me... Hold on, King. I'm going to beat you. You can stop pouting now, baby. Why don't you take a walk for yourself into that sinkhole and sniff yourself a little mud? Oh, baby, just because I don't care for the type you've got... Maybe if I give you a peck on the forehead, it'll make the world all right with you. Maybe if I... Hey. Hey, you know something? Why don't you give it up, Joe? When Slate comes with the food, let us get off the island. We won't go to the police. We'll make out this has all been a wild, wild dream. I promise you, we'll forget about it. It's five o'clock, baby, and neither hide in a hair of Shannon... You know what that means for you? Oh, Slate's never on time. He always plays hard to get. You'll see. <laughs> He'll be here. You can always depend on Slate. <laughs> Dependable Slate, they call him. Through thick and thin, <laughs> Shannon. I never did this routine before. I didn't know it was funny. Look at him. Look at your Shannon. A prowler through the evening woodlands. Watch him die, baby. Put down that gun. Don't, don't shoot him. Get off the arm. Get off it. You lost it, baby. You ruined my aim. Ooh. So sit there and watch. See how your fella's gonna die. It's dark, Slate. I light your way with this gun. Don't be a fool, Donnelly. The food's on the boat. All you have to do is go down and get it. I see you, Slate. Don't move. Coming into that brush after you. I said don't move. <laughs> Did I hit you, Shannon? Don't be crazy. I've got my hands over my head. Well, keep them there. Hi, right, Shannon. Bring back any anchovies. I'm a fool for anchovies. Where's Sailor? Let me tell you about her, Shannon. Your baby's fickle. She wanted to deal you out and deal me in. But all I gave her was a promise I'd let her watch you die. Here we go with the prods again, Shannon. I wanted to see it up close. Taylor tried to tease you away from the gun, huh? Yeah, among other things. But like you see, she didn't make it. She didn't make it at all. You look different, kid. Yeah, pale and puny. That's only from a lack of vitamins. You'll fix that. Oh, I meant the little black box. It's not nestling under your arm the way it always is. Don't worry your ugly little head. I got it stashed away where it won't hurt nobody. Figuring on hanging around here long? Not long. Just long enough to fill in the hungry gaps, get rid of you, make sure the cops are tired of playing hide-and-seek with me. What are you going to do with Sailor? Don't worry. We'll get along. Okay, you can stop now, Shannon. Huh. You're giving me a choice. I can jump into this sinkhole or you'll shoot me into it, huh? That's about it, Shannon. I'm going to give you the choice. Thanks. Hey, sailor! Come here! Your boy's going to die. You want to watch? Hey, sailor! Slate, you shouldn't have come back. Yeah, your boy's been telling me how maybe you didn't want me to come back. Well, I hope you two monsters will be very happy together. Thanks, Slate. Joe, uh, I want to give you something. This. Hey, I hit that box in the ruins. Where'd you get it? In the ruins. You don't want me to have it? Okay. I'll throw it into that sinkhole. No, you, you fool, you stupid... Get it, Slate. Yeah. Oh, no, no, you... Slate, that sinkhole, you can't let him. What's to worry? I've got hold of his ankles. Oh, pull him out. I know what to do with a man in a sinkhole. He needs a mud pack. Sailor, you weren't really going to run out on me for this guy, were you? 
for all I care, you can let go his ankles. That's all I wanted to know. There. Uh, I've got him out. There's grub on the boat, sailor. You can go make me a hot meal. Come here. Yeah, what do you want, sailor? You remember how we went fishing and you couldn't catch fish? Well, don't rub it in. I had an off day. I caught fish. And you remember on Dorado Key you said there were no seagull eggs? Admiral Perry couldn't have found a seagull egg on that key. No. Look. What in the... What's that? It's a young seagull. Goes by the name of Melvin. He's all yours, Slate. Well, don't hold him so close. Sailor, keep him away from me. Melvin likes you, Slate. Well, don't tell me you paid money for this worm bait. Uh-uh. I found the egg Melvin came out of on Dorado Key. Well, how'd he hatch? You remember you fell asleep on the boat coming home? And I loaded you with all those warm blankets? And I told you, don't move? Sailor, you mean... Yeah, I mean... Melvin, say hello to Daddy. And so our two stars, Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall, have brought to a close our latest Bold Venture story. Special music was composed and conducted by David Rose. May we invite you to listen again next week at this time for another exciting adventure starring... Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall, together in Bold Venture. Adventure, intrigue, mystery, romance, starring Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall. Together in the sultry setting of tropical Havana and the mysterious islands of the Caribbean. Bold Venture. Once again, the magic names of Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall bring you Bold Venture and a tale of mystery and intrigue. Sailor, can you think of anything else to put in this letter we're sending to our former guest? What have you got so far? Well, let's see. I've got the item about how we've nailed down the hole in the carpet on the third step. And our casualty list is decreasing by leaps and bounds. Well, that ought to titillate them. Have you mentioned the spigots and the shower in 4B? Well, you've been keeping secrets from me, sailor. What do you know about the spigots in 4B that I don't know? Well, I had King change them around. <laughs> that sounds like fun. How come I wasn't invited? Now, when you turn on the spigot that says hot, hot water comes out. If there's any hot water. Who can ask for a squarer deal than that? Shannon! Huh? You say something, sailor? Shannon! What happened to your voice, sailor? You've been taking those dramatic lessons again? Go pour your face in a waffle iron. You're being paged out on the patio. <laughs> don't pout, sailor. Someday it'll happen to you. Why don't you come right on inside, mister? Don't let the rates on the signs, Kay. We can always work something out. You walked right into it, you naive boy, you. Now that you've shown me your gun, you can have any room in the house. All the other hotels are filled up, huh? You just said something that'll make me chuckle myself to sleep. 
The keys, Shannon. The keys to the dreamboat bold venture. You're not doing this right, Buster. You're asking for the wrong thing. I'm happy you're making it hard for me. <laughs> Lucky me. I get to pick your pockets and everything. Dream a dream of a dreamboat that sailed away, Shannon. <laughs> This bull venture handles like a sweet dream, Paul. Don't fall in love with it, kid. Just dock it. What's the matter? You know this? Dock the boat. Keep it right where we are, kissing this pier. Careful with the dynamite. Don't be nervous. Not nervous, Al. This is the way I throw myself. Be right back, kid. Bring money. That's all you got to do. Good evening, Chico. Buenas noches, senor. But you have the wrong place, see? Eh? Uh-uh. I've been thinking of this place day and night. Oh, senor. Uh, what is it you wish? Part of it is this. <coughs> Inside. You... This, my boy. Again. You... Now close the door. Close it. You want this gun to let the air whistle through you. No. Oh, nice. You did that good. Oh, what mistake are you making, senor? This is the office of the Tomasino Refining Company. I am but the night watchman. I do not know what... <gasps> Tell your friends. <laughs> Tell them all about it. Oh, you're not such a big safe at that, are you? Now, let's see you spill your innards out. Oh, Al's going to be happy to see all that money. Going, Al. Yeah. Looks like I didn't hit that watchman hard enough. Come on, come on. Take it easy. I gotta turn this tub around. Did you get. Uh, you wing you? Oh, uh, yeah. It hurts. Hold the wheel. Grab it. Oh. We're okay, Al. Don't worry about a thing. Don't worry about anything at all. It'll leave a scar where I hit you, Slate. So, now girls will stop on the street and say, who's that interesting fellow with the interesting scar on his forehead? And you know what? I'll tell them. But you can no longer ask them would they care to go for a boat ride, Mr. Slate. Yeah. What are you going to do now that you've run out of bribes, Slate? You've been barred from our better streetcars. Well, let's worry about one thing at a time, huh, sailor? Right now I'm in the mood to shed another tear for a boat I built my life around. I called the lost and found department of the police again, Mr. Slate. Yeah, what they say? They say no boat. Don't call us. We'll call you. They'll find it, Slate. Everyone knows the bold venture. Somebody's bound to. Oh, I'll get it. I'll get it. Slate Shannon speaking. I shall wait for you on Buanapo Beach, senor. Do not keep me waiting too long. I bubble with secrets of the bold venture. <laughs> I wait. You bring yourself? Yeah, I bring myself. Come on, sailor. Let's go talk to a man who's bubbling with all kinds of things. Senor Shannon? That's right. Who are you? Uh, what about the senorita? You'll never know, amigo. Start saying what you have to say, Chico. A man can catch the croup in this night air. See, that is why we shall make it rapid. First, to prove to you my stirring character, all I wish is uh, 50%. 50% of what? Oh, forgive me, I did not explain. I shot at you earlier this evening. You must have used a short, flabby gun, Chico, because... I am not, Chico. I am Senor Malaga, night watchman at the Tomasino Refinery. Malaga, to you with the Senor in front. Slate, turn your back to the man with the Senor in front. Let's get out of here. Now, wait a minute. 
How'd you know anything about the bold venture, Malaga? To refresh your memory, I will give you several items. Item one, the Tomasino refinery was robbed tonight. A fact which I reported to the police. Well, I give you a hearty slap on the back for citizenship. So what's the bold venture got to do with it? Uh, you know too well the bold venture was used as the method of getaway for the crime I mentioned in item one. You are the man who drove the boat away. I consider this intelligence as item two. I'll bet item three is going to chill you to your quick slate. One man, your friend, blew up the safe. You remained with the boat and sped zoom into the night. So you saw the name of the boat and found out who owned it from the ship's registry and came to me. <laughs> and now you want 50% of what was stolen. See how you are right. Or I will make a return appearance at the police and breathe your name. You're going to breathe it, huh? Inhale deep, Chico. Come on, sailor. We'll take it from here. How do you like the tired world we live in, sailor? Oh, tired. You said it, kid. A loyal, true blue night watchman gets beaten on the head, robbed... He tried to make friends with a guy he thinks did it to him for a share of the profits. How do you like it? I have to tell you now, can't you wait until morning? You sleepy? Oh, well, it shows, huh? Or did you just diagnose that because you once took a course in first aid? <laughs> Go on up to your room, sailor. I'll take care of things down here. Hey, hey, look at what just walked in. Yeah, I'm looking. How does a girl stay that fresh this time of night? How does she... Go on up to your room, sailor. I promise I'll take care of things down here. You know what? I ain't sleepy no more. Like that I ain't sleepy. Doesn't it sicken you? If I'd known you were coming, I'd have rolled out a doormat. Welcome. Welcome to Shannon's place. I'm Shannon. And I'm Duval. Of Shannon and Duval. I won't break it up, honey. All I want from your boy is my husband's cut of the dough they stole together. Oh, that'll be the heist your goom and I pulled at the Tomasino refinery, huh? You own the bold venture? Uh-huh. That would be the heist. I, um, uh, came to pick up Al's pay envelope. You know how husbands are, honey. They get their pay, they don't come home right away. Ain't it always that way, honey. A skate works her fingers to the bone. Her guy don't appreciate. He makes hanky-panky. You bore me, kid. The dough, Shannon. I want Al's share of the dough. When we were married, we swore community property to each other. You won't live to break up a love like that. Don't go away, Don. You fascinate me. Shannon speaking. Yeah? Well, why don't you just tell me over the phone, LaSalle? Oh. Okay, right away. You two gals go right ahead with the girl talk. I've got a thing with a cop. Hey, you found it, Inspector LaSalle. You found my boat. You are happy, see? Well, you bet I'm happy, see? I was starting to get frantic, see? Do not stop getting that way, Senor Shannon. Well, what are you talking about? Come aboard the boat. I will show you. What's on your mind? Come aboard. All right. Oh, you mean the muddy footprints on deck? I don't mind. Sailors are whiz with a mop and a bucket. Here. Look here. This man lying there. He had trouble with him, huh? Looks like he's hurt. He is dead. Dead? Why? How? Why on my boat? So what is all this? Wait. Senor Malaga. See, si, Inspector? Malaga? Hey, that's the... I said wait. Hey, uh, Malaga. Take a good look at this man. I have looked. I have made up my mind. This is the man who robbed the refinery, eh? I should have brained you the first time. <laughs> Don't do not let him touch me, Inspector! This is Shannon. Or my gun will cripple your intentions. Hey. That is better. Now you are merely under arrest for murder.
to Bold Venture. Our stars, Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall, and the second act of our story. Please observe, Miss Duval, how the penal system of Cuba provides for the recreation of our cutthroats. Volleyball. He gets rid of the energy. Why isn't Slate playing? Why is he just sitting there with a bicycle pump? This worries me, too. We will find out. Senor Shannon! Venga aquí! Come here! He looks tired. It's about time you got here, sailor. You don't have to snap at me. What's the matter? Won't the other fellows let you play? Won't let me play. I'm the coach, sailor. We're going to tour, give exhibitions at all the pokies in the Caribbean. Oh, it'll be like old times for you, Inspector LaSalle. Uh, mind if I talk to the man alone? For one minute. And this is against the rules. I only acquiesce because of Senor Shannon's contribution to our athletic program. What'd you find out, sailor? I didn't find out anything. Look, sailor... What did that woman tell you after I left? Nothing. She walked out in back of you. Well, you've got to do something. Find that night watchman, Malaga. Make him say he was mistaken. Make him say he never saw me before. How am I going to do that? Just let him stare at you. It'll make him forget everything he ever knew. I want to learn all over again. <laughs> Stop melting, sailor. Here comes LaSalle. <laughs> Whatever you're selling, boy, take it down the hall. I'm fresh in or whatever you've got. You can take the black crepe down off your door, widow chap, and I brought you a happy, happy. Uh, this is a hallway with a big ear, honey. Why don't we go inside? Tell me first, with who do I have the pleasure? Call me Paul, because that's what Al called me. When he died, he whispered my name. Paul. Like that. You try it, honey. You, uh... Brought his widow Al's gift from beyond? Uh-huh. In the right-hand coat pocket. Well, why do you let a widow stand out in a cold hall? Why don't you take her inside? Come on. All right, the dough, the money, the cash. Give me. Here. Five grand. Al told me he'd knock off at least ten on that job. Did he? Did he now? Well, it was only a comment. A girl can be happy with five thousand and no husband to guide her. Just for that, just because you're so nice, I'll throw in me for nothing. Al should have introduced you to me a long time ago, Marge. So we finally meet when there's finally no Al. Oh, it's a bright day, Paul. It drips with sunshine. That watchman identifies Shannon because I'm cute enough to use Shannon's boat. The watchman shoots Al, points a finger at Shannon. Shannon is held for theft and murder. That leaves me and you alone in all the wide, wide world. Oh, bless that watchman. He might get a good look at Shannon one day and know it wasn't him. You're kidding, Marge. I said bless the watchman. Things like this, you say, over the dead. Uh, you want to hang this coat up somewhere? Pardon the disposition of my house, senorita, but I did not expect such as you. Don't apologize, Malaga. I like your place. Cozy and homey. Oh, such as you, senorita. Never have I been so close to one such as you. I am not distasteful to you. Distasteful isn't the word. I am happy. You're going to tell the police you made a mistake, aren't you? Eh? You didn't see Slate at that robbery. For you? For me. Whatever you... Oh, pardon, senorita. <clears throat> senorita! Malaga, what happened? The, oh. the knife beats at my heart. The pain... <clears throat> Look, LaSalle, you finally get me in your crummy pokey. I finally get my cell arranged around to suit a man of my tastes and breeding. Why don't you let me enjoy it? Hmm. I will keep you from your cozy cell only a few moments, Shannon. 
Now, look, don't pull a gun on me. I'll stay and chat with you. You're really lonesome, aren't you, kid? Oh, the gun in my hand is only that I feel nude without it. Policemen have nightmares where he's in a room with a desperate killer and there is no gun in his hands. <laughs> I'm in your nightmares, too, huh, kid? Lucky me. You are decorating my office, Shannon, because Malaga, the watchman who identified you, has been killed dead with a knife. Confess to me who are your hooligan comrades. The hooligans who murder for you while you are in jail. The hooligans who... Let's see now. There's, uh, there's Peppy the Dirk. He's our number one hooligan. And there's Waxy the Finger. They call him that because he always got his finger in his mouth and... Do not make funnies with me, senor. Gee. From this window I gaze upon Havana. And Havana gazes back and she asks me, La Salle... Why do you... You got that nude feeling again, LaSalle, because you just left your gun on your desk and it just leaped into my hand. No, don't turn around. Tell me what Havana was asking you so I can make a smooth exit, huh? You cannot escape, senor. You cannot. I wish you could turn around to watch me, LaSalle. <laughs> uh, the fool thinks he engineered his own escape. <laughs> uh, LaSalle, I... Pat your clever bald head. Here. Pat it with your gun, LaSalle. I don't understand it, but thanks. Get out of here. I give you a chance to prove yourself not guilty. Take it before I change my stupid mind. Tell me again how you escaped from jail, Slate. Oh, I can't. It was too bloody. It'll haunt me always. Go on, tell me. You sure you can take it, kid? I brought my own grain of salt. Uh, by the way, you better order some more. I just cleaned us out. You don't believe it, sailor. You don't believe how I held LaSalle in front of me as a human shield, mowed down three finks who stood in my way. Finks I swore to get. Scaled the prison wall. Those searchlights, those sirens screaming, the Tommy guns, typing out my obituary. The other cons cheering me on. Uh, we're out of salt, huh? Order some. I'm your ma, kid. Been with you through thin and the thick. Mostly the thin. So out with it, knucklehead. What really happened? It's like I told you, sailor. Uh, Mr. Slade, a little boy just came to the door. He had a message for you. I took it. A little boy with torn pants. Yeah, well, you can sew them up later, King. What message? Uh, from a man of the name Paul. This Paul waits for you on Verdugo Key. He say if you want to sit in the fat lap of luxury to bring the bold venture. Who wants to sit anywhere else? Let's go, sailor. I've been waiting to get a fat lap thrown at me. I owe one to LaSalle. Come on, hurry up, sailor. Yeah, I'll give you a hand on the boat. Thanks. I always like to watch a guy hand a girl on to something. Well, if it isn't the man who heisted my boat key... What do you want this time? You were just going over to Verdugo Key to get me. I'm saving you trouble. A uh, point of information. Is your name Paul? Paul. Me and my gun have been reading the papers and wondering about you, Shannon. How come you break out of prison and go right home and the cops never touch you? I remember the boys at Christmas. Uh-uh. That's not why. What they do? Deputize you to find me? Because you're the only one who knows who to look for because I once stole your boat to blast a safe. Tell them who I am, sailor. What? Go ahead. Tell them how we got this boat. Well, uh, the lady who owned it wasn't pretty, but she was middle-aged and wealthy. I believe the phrase is, uh, she was a sucker for a con. What's she trying to say, Shannon? She's trying to tell you that you and I can match backgrounds. You want proof? Just that, proof. Well, there's an easy job we can pull tonight. Consuelo's a jewelry shop on the tourist pier. It's a cinch. This time of night, she can. Okay, Shannon, I'll nurse this boat. This ladder leads to the back of Consuelo's. Bring back money. See you, sailor. Consuelo. Oh, Slade Shannon, baby. 
Why do you walk in my shop the back way on tippy toe? You can come in the front on your flat feet. Do me a favor. Oh, wait, I, I go call my home, tell them I work late at the store tonight. Now, all I want you to do is scream. Uh, this is a, a new approach from the United States? Please, if you've ever done anything for me in your life, scream. Hmm? All right. Okay, you did fine. I need some money, Consuelo, a lot of money, all you've got in the store. You can throw in some choice diamonds, too. You are in trouble, dear one, to me. Yeah, a lot of trouble. Hmm. So, here is money, the, the weaker seats, and here, jewelry, a tray. Consuela, I love you. I will also return the merchandise and another one of these. Hmm. Oh, take another diamond. Adios, dear one to me. What you bring back, Shannon? Cash box full of money and a tray full of jewelry here. Oh, we get friendlier all the time. I heard her scream, Slate. What did you do to her? When I left her, she was numb. Let's get out of here. Now the boat's going to give me trouble. What's with you, Shannon? Get her going. I can't start it. You're clever with boats. You do it. Out of the way. No wonder you didn't turn on the... No, you don't, Shannon. I can't hear you. You want it all, Shannon? I'll give it Not all, just this much. Ah. Is it all over now? Can we go home? Sure, sailor. First we dump this guy on LaSalle's doorstep. Then we go wherever you want. Hey, Slade. What? Where did you get that diamond ring? What ring? Not the one in your nose. The one you're wearing on your finger. A gift from an admirer. Consuela? Yeah, she uh, she admires me because I'm clean living, upright, and a solid citizen. Bully for you. How'd you get the ring? Like this? Come here. You blame her? No. You have a jewelry shop. You give jewels. Once more, Slade. That makes a dime even I owe you. Take another one. I'm having a special this week. Three for ten. And so our two stars, Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall, have brought to a close our latest Bold Venture story. Special music was composed and conducted by David Rose. May we invite you to listen again next week at this time for another exciting adventure starring Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall together in Bold Venture. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic, the non-alcoholic hair tonic that contains lanolin. Wild Root Cream Oil, again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Sam Spade Detective Agency. They offered me a cool million and a half, but I couldn't be bought. Oh, Sam, all the time fooling. Straight goods, Evie. Oh, really, Sam? Why didn't you take it? Oh, but you couldn't, of course. That's right, Angel. Taxes. Oh, you mean it would put you in a bracket? Uh, the girl's name, in case you were going to ask, was Sugar Cane. Was she sweet? Oh, 
Effie, you made a joke. Oh, not much of one, though. That is true. But even though you do seem to be, as you would say, in a jugular vein, I shall be right down, serious and frowning, to dictate a chronicle steeped in the bitter tea of general confusion, brewed in a witch's cauldron of murder, greed, and avarice... That's what gives it that nutty flavor. What, Sam? Silly girl, I refer to the sugar cane caper on which I will forthwith my report be down to dictate on, uh, uh it, uh, uh, with, uh, goodbye. <laughs> Dashiell Hammett, America's leading detective fiction writer and creator of Sam Spade, the hard-boiled private eye, and William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, join their talents to make your hair stand on end with the adventures of Sam Spade. Presented by the makers of Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair. Want to look better on the job? Get Wild Root Cream Oil. Want to look better to that gal of yours? Get Wild Root Cream Oil. Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic improves your entire appearance by grooming your hair neatly and naturally, relieving dryness, removing loose dandruff. If your family hasn't yet enjoyed the benefits of America's leading hair tonic, here's what to do about it. Ask at your drug or toilet goods counter for the new 25-cent Get Acquainted bottle of Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. And now, with Howard Duff starring as Spade, Wild Root brings to the air the greatest private detective of them all in the adventures of Sam Spade. Hello, Sam. How are you, Sam? Hmm? You were so lugubrious over the phone. Sometimes you're so bucolic, but tonight... What am I... When? Lugubrious tonight. Just, just, just bowling over. Do you uh, possibly mean I'm being lush with my verbiage? There, you see? Well, that's because I've been at work in the environs of Snob Hill, where they never use one word if 12 will do. <laughs> Are you uh, ready for the uh, dictation, I guess it is? I plan to be most amusing tonight. Already <laughs> I am yet. <laughs> Look, I haven't even started. Oh. Really, I haven't. All right. <laughs> now... Pencil. Date. <laughs> Alan should have such an audience. Date. October 3rd, 1948, to Clifton Cavanaugh, Esquire. <laughs> Down, Effie. From Samuel Spade, license number 137596. Subject, the sugar cane caper. On Thursday last, at 11 a.m., as I waited for the traffic signal so that I might legally cross Powell Street and order to board a cable car, a cat rubbed up against my leg. I leaned over to stroke it and noticed that it had six toes. I wondered if that meant anything. It didn't. Most Knob Hill addresses don't mean much anymore, but yours still does. The house was big, hideous, and reassuring. Oh. Are you from Peppersnow? Uh, no. I'm in business for myself. Mr. Cavanaugh in? Oh. Well, come on in. I can't understand what happened to that boy from Peppersnow. Oh, uh, pardon me if I seem a little hungover. Gladly, but can you ever forgive yourself? (laughs) I like you. You got a sense of humor. You'll need it. You were trying to tell me you don't approve of Mr. Cavanaugh? That perfume pothead. What did he do to you? He married my mother. Oh, stepfather? Yeah. I'm Fred Blair. Spade's my name. Where do I find him? Detective? Check. I'll give you a clue. Look behind you. I did. I turned and found myself looking straight into your handsome face. You looked several years younger than your stepson, with regular aquiline features, dark, widely spaced eyes, and blue-black hair. Well, so you're the notorious Sam Spade. Well, I don't want to seem modest. Come into the conservatory. There's just the barest chance that we'll not be overheard. Good. There. Sit down. Uh, What's your problem, Mr. Cavanaugh? Problem indeed. Problems, plural. Starting with that junior grade lush that collared you at the door. He's very fond of you, too. Well, you can't imagine what a trial that boy's been to me. Both the children. For some reason, neither Fred nor his sister Eunice ever quite accepted me as their father. You don't say? I suppose my youth counted against me. I think they misinterpreted my motives. When any man marries a wealthy widow twice his age... Yeah. Yeah, Why did you send for me, Mr. Cavanaugh? Well, it all started several months back, before my wife, uh, their mother, uh, uh, 
Where was I? Oh, died. The scandal quite literally killed her. You're sure that's what did the trick? Fred, uh, who, among other talents, was a positive genius for knowing the wrong sort of people, struck up an acquaintance with a hoodlum named Johnny Verona. Nice, clean-cut gangster type, runs a joint on Pacific Street. Precisely. With a positively hysterical name of the Subtropico. Mm -hmm. Well, there was a sordid brawl of some sort. A man shot. Obviously, this Johnny Verona shot him. Fred had to give testimony before the grand jury. It was all we could do to keep it out of the paper. But you did. No. And old Eleanor, my wife, that is, uh, dropped dead when the butler brought in the Chronicle. But the worst was yet to come, Sam. Well, uh, don't keep me hanging, Cliff. Uh, well, Fred continued to frequent this bistro, this dive of Verona's. I understand. I believe the bait is a toothsome little teaser with the unlikely name of Sugar Cane. She likes Fred. No woman in her right mind would look twice at that idiot, even if he were twice as rich and only half a sodden. Then, uh, where was I? Oh, yes, this, this, uh, uh, this Verona person came here several times on the pretext of pouring Fred through the front door and thereby bet, met my, my, my stepdaughter, Eunice. Well, uh, that's uh, a very interesting story, Mr. Cavanaugh. Now, uh, maybe you'll tell me what you want a detective for. Because my stepdaughter has brazenly informed me that she intends to marry this gangster. I want you to help me prevent that marriage. I uh, don't see. Don't see what? I don't see how I can. Well, perhaps I didn't make myself clear. When Verona was arrested for that shooting in his club, Fred didn't tell the grand jury all he knew. Now, if you could prove that Verona is guilty, then we'd be rid of him for good. Is it Verona you want to get rid of or your stepson? Good Lord, you don't, you don't think Fred did it. Do you? Why, no, of course not. Okay, supposing Verona did it, then Fred goes up on a perjury rap, maybe accessory. Oh. Well, I have no overwhelming desire to injure Fred. Uh, look, why don't you tell me what you have an overwhelming desire for? Well, under the terms of her mother's will, Eunice will inherit three million dollars as soon as she marries. When? Uh, when what? When do I meet her? Be serious, man. Now... I will pay Verona $50,000 in cash if he'll stay away from her. Would you take fifty grand as the payoff in a $3 million caper? In this instance, yes. Eunice is not very well, and you may quote me on that. Book, chapter, and verse. To Johnny Verona? Uh, to Johnny Verona. Okay. Water's mighty cold this time of the year at the bottom of the bay, but if you don't care, I don't. Thank you. Let me know how it comes out. Don't give it a second thought. You'll know. Uh, don't get up, Mr. Cavanaugh. I know the way out. Hey, wait up. Well, you look a little better. Listen, there's something you ought to know. He was my sister's boyfriend before he married my mother. He did it out of revenge because Eunice threw him over. He still wants to marry her. Any particular reason? Oh, my mother put that crazy marriage clause in her will. He's been systematically getting rid of every man who's been interested in her. Bought him off, threatened him off any way he could. Why? He thinks Eunice will eventually marry him to get her inheritance. But she won't. She'll kill him first, and if she doesn't, I'll do it for her. Fred. Oh. Oh, yeah? Fred, what on earth are you saying? Who is this man? Well, he's the detective. Sam Spade. You're Eunice Blair? Yes, I want to talk to you. Fred, go, go and... Yeah. Uh, see you later, Spade. I know why my stepfather hired you, Mr. Spade. If you need the money, go ahead. But this time, it won't work. You look as if you'd like to be a nice girl. How did you happen to settle for a cheap grifter like Johnny Verona? Because we understand each other, and he can't be scared off. Any message I can take him from you? Tell Johnny I'll meet him at the usual place. And tell him I still like my coffee black. No sugar. I didn't ask her what kind of sugar she didn't want any of. I thought I knew. The only thing wrong with uh, Sugar Cane's dance was her dancing, but the customers didn't seem to mind, and I didn't either. It was a pleasure to size her up carefully, as I would have felt obliged to do anyway in my professional capacity. She was a black-haired number with aquiline features and widely spaced dark eyes. It was a beautiful combination, and I wondered where I'd seen it before quite recently. I decided to find out. What's the idea of barging in here after me? Can't you see the sign on the door? No customers in the dressing room. Then let's go someplace else. I want to talk to you. Beat it. 
Take it easy. This is on business. Good. I'll fix it up with the boss. Johnny. Yeah, sugar. Uh, what's the matter? Is Joe giving you trouble? He trailed in here after me to cheat, Masher. On the pretext of discussing business affairs. Okay, out you go. Oh, wait a minute. Come on, move. And don't uh, come back. Well? Uh, sorry, I had to give that bum's rush routine. I don't want to get her excited. She's a nice kid, and she doesn't know why you're here. I take it you do. Yeah. Eunice called me and told me you'd be down. Okay, Johnny, I'll give it to you fast and get out. Clifton Cavanaugh will pay you 50 grand to leave Eunice alone. He also made a few idle or not-so-idle threats about what might happen to her if you don't take his money. Uh, for example? He said she hasn't been feeling well, might not live long enough to get married. I don't have to tell you what I think about that kind of talk, and I wouldn't be peddling it if my office rent wasn't due. That's why when you started giving me that bums rush, I made only, shall we say, a token resistance? Yeah. About me, Mary, and Eunice... You can tell Clifton to stop worrying. Hmm? Yeah, Eunice and I got married three weeks ago. You what? Married. Now, you want to see the papers? Why the secrecy? I don't want her to get hurt. You're scared of Clifton? Nah, sugar. She's got a very low boiling point. She's a... Oh, pardon me. Yeah. Yeah, Nick. What is? Go ahead. Yeah, I heard you. No, no, don't touch anything. Don't let anybody in. I'll be right over. Bad news? Yeah, Eunice. She's dead. How? Uh, one of my boys found her in my apartment. She was supposed to wait for me there. How did it happen? He's not sure. He thinks she took poison. I had to give Johnny Verona one thing. He didn't make any pretense about being grief-stricken. But after all, he just inherited three million bucks... Sugar Cane took it standing up, too, but she just lost a rival and got her man back three million bucks richer. I wasn't with you when you got the news, Mr. Cavanaugh. But the one I really wondered about was Eunice's brother, Fred. What brought that on was something I picked up in Johnny Verona's apartment where we found Eunice's body sprawled out over a tray of coffee things. It was a medicine bottle with a doctor's prescription number on the label. The name of the druggist that had put it up was Pfefferschnau. I remembered what Fred had said to me when he admitted me to your house that afternoon. Quote, are you the man from Pfefferschnauz? I wondered if I'd answered yes, would Eunice still be alive? The makers of Wild Root Cream Oil are presenting the weekly Sunday adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. Now, here's important news on good grooming. If you want the well-groomed look that helps you get ahead socially and on the job, listen. Recently, thousands of people from coast to coast who bought Wild Root Cream Oil for the first time were asked, how does Wild Root Cream Oil compare with the hair tonic you previously used? The results were amazing. Better than four out of five who replied said they preferred Wild Root Cream Oil. Remember, non-alcoholic Wild Root Cream Oil contains lanolin, it grooms the hair naturally, relieves dryness, and removes loose, ugly dandruff. So if you want your hair to be more attractive than ever before, get the generous new 25-cent size of Wild Root Cream Oil, America's leading hair tonic, on sale at all drug and toilet goods counters. It's also available in larger economy bottles and the handy new tube. Get Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. By the way, smart girls use Wild Root Cream Oil, too. And mothers say it's grand for training children's hair. And now, back to the Sugar Cane Caper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. The morning papers didn't carry anything new on Eunice's death cause was put down to an overdose of a toxic drug. The doctor who prescribed it said she'd requested it for migraine headaches, which he suggested might have driven her to suicide. He did not explain why she had taken four doses in capsule form and dissolved the rest of it in a decanter of coffee. I thought somebody else had dosed the coffee, and so did you, Mr. Cavanaugh. Verona did it, of course. 
He knew she was taking those pills and dosed the coffee just enough to be fatal when added to what she took voluntarily. You knew all that, too. Well, so did Fred. But you had more reasons, three million more. But they were already married. You know that when you hired me? Yes. Then how come? I knew she was planning to do away with herself. I thought if we could pin it on Verona, after all, he's guilty of that old murder. Fred's a witness to that. Well, if he were convicted, the money would revert to me. Nuts. You don't believe me? She wasn't planning suicide, and you know it. Well, then? I don't care who takes the fall, but I got less on Verona than I got on you. Then I'll give you something. Here. Take a look. Verona's lawyer sent this around before her body was cold. A claim for three million dollars notarized yesterday while Eunice was still alive. Well, Mr. Spade. Pardon me while I drop dead. You did and waited hopefully, but I managed to stay on my feet. I even managed to make it down the hall to the bar where I found your stepson ambushed behind a row of empty bottles. Fine detective you turn out to be. I warned you. Stand up like a man. That's all right. I'll take on both of you. Come on, sober up. Makes sense. Where's my drink? Who took my glass? Here it is. Give me a Sure. You spill it. Ooh, ice on my shirt. Listen to me. This is very important. Important? You were expecting a delivery from a drugstore when I arrived there yesterday morning. Who ordered it? She did. Eunice, she told me to watch for it and bring it to her. Did you do that? No. No, she wasn't here. What did you do with that bottle of medicine? I'm sleepy. I gotta get some rest. Wake up! Oh. I said, wake up! Leave me alone! Now, now, listen. You took that bottle with you when you went out. Where did you take it? If I tell you, will you let me go to sleep? You took that bottle with you, didn't you? You're guessing. I know you're third degree. You went to Verona's apartment, didn't you? Two gentlemen of Verona. Willie Shakespeare. You doped that coffee, didn't you, with the poison that killed your sister? I didn't mean it for her. I didn't know she was going there. Go on talking. I want a lawyer. I, I know my rights. Listen, I'm not a cop. I'm not taking a statement. You're too drunk for it to hold anyway, so you can tell me. Okay. Here's how it happened. She... She took her four pills and went to bed. Yeah? I, I, I sneaked a bottle out of the medicine chest and I went over to his place. His boy Nick was there making coffee for the boss, he said, when he got home. I hung around talking for a while and I, I, I stripped some of the stuff in the percolator while he was getting out the cups. And, and that's all. Why did you want to kill Johnny Verona? So Eunice wouldn't have to marry him. What do you mean, have to? <laughs> She was doing it for me, so he'd keep quiet. About that brawl in the club, that old killing they tried to nail Johnny for? Yeah, yeah, that's it. That, uh, the gun that did it. He, he got rid of it before the cops arrived. That was my gun. Fred, straighten up. Look. Yeah. Johnny dictated the story you told the grand jury. How do I know he didn't dictate the one you're telling me now? Who are you covering for? I, I didn't say anything. I didn't tell you anything. Get out of here! What's the matter with you? I get, get out the window! <laughs> Revolver barrel that crashed through the darkened window pane behind the bar spoke twice. I answered it. I looked out into the darkness, making myself a good enough target to draw some fire. I fired back at the flashes. I was depending more on luck than aim, and luck was what I wasn't having much of. I went back to the place where Fred had fallen. The shots that had dropped him were luckier. He'd been dead before he hit the floor. What is it? What's happened here? See for yourself. Who? Shot through the window. Couldn't see anything but the gun muzzle. Looked like a forty-five. Johnny Verona, he packs a forty-five. Who told you that? It came out of that investigation. One of the reasons they couldn't indict for that old shooting. There were a lot of reasons they couldn't get that indictment. What are you driving at? Neither one of the leading suspects was guilty. I don't follow you. Sugar Kane did that job. Well, that's wild. What if I told you Fred made a statement of that effect before he was shot? You're lying. He confessed. Did I tell you that? Well, he must have. He he always talked about it when he was drunk. All right. All right. I was bluffing. Why? Just a crazy hunch. I thought there might be something between you and Sugar. Now I'm sure there isn't. Of course not. Should have spotted it before. You're too much the same type. Even look alike. I can't make you out. Well, don't try. It's not worth it. Uh, You better call homicide about Fred here. Tell Lieutenant Dundee if he wants my statement, I'll be at my apartment. After I pretended to leave, I came back and did a little eavesdropping of my own. You didn't phone homicide, but you did spend an hour filing out the barrel of a forty-five automatic. Then you went out. 
I tailed you to an address on Sloat Boulevard. A short time after you went in, Sugar Cane came out alone. I followed her to, you know the answer, my apartment. I went in the back way via the fire escape and arrived in time to answer her buzz. Oh, Mr. Spade, thank heaven I found you at home. So am I. Come in. I know it's terribly late Forget it. Won't you take off your uh, coat or something? Can't stay very long. It's not safe. I may have been followed here. Oh, surely not. Sam, you don't mind if I call you Sam? No. I'm so frightened. It's about Johnny Verona. I don't know what he may do. He's convinced that Fred killed Eunice and he's out gunning for him right now. We've got to stop him before he does anything rash. You come to the wrong party, sugar. I'm working for the enemy. Enemy? Kavanaugh. Oh. It's no skin off his nose if Johnny Verona drops Fred Blair or if you all drop. All he does is sit back and collect. Oh, he can't be as cynical as that. You ought to know. Has he told you anything about me? I'd rather hear it from you. May we sit down? Well, there's not much to tell. I played along with Johnny for one reason and one reason alone. To save Fred from that old murder rap. Were you uh, figuring on marrying into that family, too? Oh, sir. A regular pincers movement, wasn't it? Johnny and Eunice, you and Fred. All right. It's true I wasn't in love with Fred, but it wasn't all the money. I was sorry for him. Money's not what I really want. I know that now. What do you want? Someone. Someone I can trust. Me too, sugar. Oh, Sam, you're what I want. Say you want me to. Please say it. Don't answer it, Sam. Why not? Johnny may have followed me here. He's insanely jealous. Well, I gotta face it out with him sooner or later. Might as well be now. Sam, be careful. Stand out of the way, sugar. No, Sam. No, no, please. Don't reach, Johnny. I'm not gunning for you, Spade. In that case, come on in. Well, sugar. I didn't believe him that you were coming here. I had to, Johnny. He got some crazy confession out of Fred while he was drunk. I had to stall him till you and Cliff could talk to him. To save Fred, I mean. Oh, stop horsing around. We all know that we all know Fred is dead, and we all know that we all know who killed him. Oh, uh, then Cliff was leveling. You are trying to pin that on me. I don't need it, but if you want it, you can have it. There's three million bucks in my part of it. I'll split down with the middle with you. If you throw in with them, it's a three-way split. There's no split at all if you take the rap for Eunice's killing. And you will if you throw in with me. It's their word against mine. Two witnesses against one. And all I've got is a confession by a drunk who is now dead. Sam. Oh, Sam, I was sure for a moment you... Get away from me. Sam, (laughs) Go on. Go to work on him. I should have given you a little more time. That wasn't fair, was it, Sugar? I hate you. I hate you both. I never want to see you again. Get back in that room, Sugar. Cliff. What happened, Sugar? Why were you running away? Johnny double-crossed us. Now Sam knows everything. What does he know? The whole caper. Part of it I wasn't quite sure of until I saw you and Sugar standing side by side. That blue-black hair, the same eyes, plus the fact that the bell on Sugar's apartment on Sloat Boulevard reads Kane, parenthesis, Kavanaugh. You took a crazy chance when you knocked off Fred with me right there in the room. The kind of a crazy chance a brother would take to keep his sister clear. I could have told you that. It would have helped a lot, Johnny, but you didn't. A man lets his sister go on dancing in a joint like yours after he's in the chips and she goes on liking it. You can be sure they're both playing for big stakes and for nobody but themselves. What do you think you were supposed to wind up, Johnny? I'll tell you. Drinking that poison coffee that Eunice got hold of by mistake. That isn't true, Johnny. I never told Fred a thing. He thought you really loved Eunice. I don't know how he found out you were forcing her into that marriage. Uh, did you also neglect to tell him that he was innocent? That you pulled a trigger in that old killing and, and shoved a gun into his hand when he was too drunk to know what he was doing? I've heard enough. Watch it, Johnny. No! I winged you a split second before you fired. Your aim went wild. All I saw at first was that it missed Johnny. Then I saw him move forward in her direction. She was leaning against the wall, a puzzled expression on her face. Her hand plucking nervously at a spot of red that was spreading against the white of her dress. He caught her as she pitched forward and carried her over to a couch. She didn't speak again. You and Johnny knelt beside her until the cops arrived. If you were aware of each other's presence, neither of you showed it. Period. And a report. That was a sad ending, Sam. Yes, it is. I'm sorry it ended so sadly. Well, it was bound to one way or the other. There wasn't anybody in the whole gallery that thought about anybody but himself. Except poor Fred, I guess, and his his only friends arrived in bottles and left in the ash can. All those millions and millions. Oh, get the money now, Sam. I'm glad you asked that. It leaves me cold. Go type that up while I knit myself a sweater. 
And now, listen to this. It's the smart mother who sees to it that Wild Root Cream Oil is always kept handy around the house. For she knows that Wild Root Cream Oil grooms her family's hair neatly and naturally, relieves dryness, removes loose dandruff. Get acquainted by asking for the new 25-cent bottle. Also, ask your barber for a professional application of Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. terrible group of unfortunates. Hmm? As you say, it just had to end badly. If you hope to get back in my good graces by quoting me, to trick me into agreeing with you, you have succeeded. Oh, there you go, Sam. So lugubrious. Effie, what is this? What means lugubrious? Oh, Sam, it's wonderful. It's my new habit. Oh. Every time I read a book now, mm-hmm. and you know, like you read a book and there's a word you don't know what it means or you're not sure. Yeah. Well, I make it a practice now to write down and learn three new words per day. Well. And learn the definitions to use them in conversation. You know, like, uh, desultory. And lugubrious. Yes, that's one of my three for today. Mm. You see? Lugubrious. Right here it is. Mm-hmm. To talk a great deal. Um, bucolic, state of being sorrowful. And verbose, to be out in the country. I see, I see. Very praiseworthy. <laughs> Enlarging your vocabulary. Yes, love it, I love am. it. I am. But I don't expect to be really lugubrious for, oh, for the nonce. Uh, look, Effie, why don't you go verbose for the weekend? It's the best cure for the bucolic. Oh, Sam, look what I've done. What have you done? I've clipped the wrong definition to the right words. Well. For instance, lugubrious, well, it isn't that at all. Mm-hmm. And bucolic, oh, let me see. Oh, Sam, I've learned them wrong. I wasn't going to tell you, Effie. It's better to find out for yourself. It's more, uh, Effie cases. My new habit. Oh. Good night, Sam. Good night, sweetheart. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, are produced and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade is played by Howard Dove. Lorreen Tuttle is Effie. The Adventures of Sam Spade are written for radio by Bob Tallman and Gil Dowd. Musical direction by Lud Gluskin with score composed by Renee Garrigan. Join us again next Sunday when author Dashiell Hammett and producer William Spear join forces for another adventure with Sam Spade. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. This is Dick Joy reminding you to... Get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. It keeps your hair in trim. You see, it's non-alcoholic, Charlie. It's made with Susan Lanolin. You better get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. Start using it today. You'll find that you will have a tough time, Charlie. Keeping all the gals away. Are you baldy? Get Wild Root right away. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. My name's Regan. I get ten a day on expenses from a detective bureau run by a guy named Anthony J. Lyon. They call me the Lion's Eye. With Jack Webb as Jeff Regan investigators, stand by for hard-boiled action and mystery and thrilling adventure in tonight's story of The Lost Lady. You'll find it in Hollywood, jammed in between Van Ness and Wilton. Right off the boulevard. Taft Avenue. Starts at a furniture store, runs for about a block, and then crosses Franklin. What happens to it after that, I don't know. I only go as far as the gray apartment building on the even number sign. About the first thing you see. Figures that the guy who built my place never read the earthquake laws. A good crap game and shake it loose. Well, that's where I live. Apartment 308. In the back, where I can keep an eye on a brass drain pipe and a Tired out palm tree. I got a coffee pot and a bed that comes out of the wall. It isn't much, but the phone company had to have an address. 
That's where I was last Monday night, about 8 o'clock. Some Cleveland fans were running up a house tab in the apartment above me when the phone rang. I thought it might be somebody from Boston. It was the lion. Regan, I'm calling you from the office. I stayed late tonight. You should have joined the union. We got a new client. Yeah? Her name's Isabel Sanchez. I just talked to her. Did you make a date? She flew in from Mexico City tonight on American Airlines. She needs help. They're saying that about the Democrats. Comes from a fine family. Lots of influence in Mexico. Try the State Department. She came all the way to Los Angeles to see her sister, but she's disappeared. Did you tell her about the missing persons bureau? I told her about you. What do you mean? You're going to find her sister. I'm no St. Bernard. You'll do till I can feed one. Besides, she could go to the Mexican Council if she wanted to. What's that got to do with it? Remember the Pan-American Conference? We got to be nice to this day. Yeah, well, don't make up a contract. I already did. She gave me 200 bucks. What else did you get? She'll tell you the rest. Don't you ever ask questions. That's your job. She's got a room at the Belmont. Hop over there and see her. She's expecting you to find her sister. Is that all? That's enough. Call me after you talk to her. I hope her check bounces. Don't worry. She paid cash. <laughs> You can tell that the lion only stayed in school long enough to learn how to spell dollar. It took me about 20 minutes to get over to her hotel. Isabel Sanchez had a room on the sixth floor. I found it on the Wilshire side. 610 it was. She was a tall, blonde girl, not the least bit pretty. She had a mouth full of good-looking teeth, but she never learned how to use them in a smile. So, Mr. Regan. That's right. Come in. Please excuse me. I'm still unpacking. Come in. All right. I'm so glad you're here. I suppose Mr. Lyon told you everything. Your sister's missing. You want to talk to me? Yes. Oh, it's terrible. An awful vacant feeling. I was so looking forward to seeing Carmen again. We were very close. You talk like you don't expect to see her. But something might have happened to her. Like what? I don't know. She's always been so independent and... Well, strange. Well, a lot of people have their own ideas. I'm embarrassed telling you this. You've got to tell somebody. Well... Carmen left home against my father's wishes. How old is Carmen? Twenty-two. What was the guy's name? What do you mean? Ah, oh, come on. I gotta have it all, lady. There was a man in it. Yes. Martin Chambers. From here in L.A.? Carmen met him once in Mexico City. He thought she was in love with him. When was this? A year ago. She followed him back. Yes. He took a long time to catch up. I've been very concerned about Carmen. I received this letter from her a few days ago. The first word since she left home. Here. You can see it's not much. She asked me to come here. I took the first plane. Mm hmm. What about this address? There's no such place. I went there right from the airport. Who sent you to us? You're in the phone book. Is that all you got? Well, I have a picture, and it isn't very good. Just a snapshot here. Mm hmm. Blonde, huh? A little darker than mine. We're the same height. We wore each other's clothes. Who else did she know? Just Martin Chambers. Oh, no. Now, wait a minute. She mentioned a Dr. Menlo in her letter. Did she need a doctor? She just said he'd been very kind to her. That isn't very much to go on. I know, but you will follow every lead. Yeah, sure. What are you scared of? Why do you ask that? It's a warm night. You got the shakes. I had a long trip. Oh, yeah. I forgot. You know this Chambers? Yes. You like him? No. What's that you got there in your hand? An evening gown. Why? You didn't bring that for me. Well, our story was smooth, but the clothes didn't fit. All the labels that showed said New York City. I went downstairs to a phone booth, and I got a hold of a friend of mine in the CAA. He checked into it, and he told me that nobody named Isabel Sanchez came in on that Mexico City flight. Uh, the whole thing looked phony like a fan dancer in long underwear. Well, it was about 11 o'clock when I got over to the lion's place. It was a cold night, but the lion looked warm. What do you want, Regan? I'm busy. So am I. I've been looking at that Sanchez dame. Tell me about it in the morning. No, I'm going to tell you about it right now. It's no good. What do you mean? It's another bum client. She gave me 200 bucks. Her clothes are out of New York. Maybe she came the long way. She didn't come in on American. So she's got a donkey. All you gotta do is find her sister. I just told you she's a phony. Let me worry about that. Well, you can start now. Here. 
What's this? The letter and the picture. That's all the lead I got. Now, wait a minute, Regan. What about our contract? New Year's is coming up. You'll need confetti. I can't do a thing like that. We got a moral obligation. And 200 bucks. I'm thinking of our reputation. I've given our word. Take it back. That girl's a stranger in a foreign land. She came to us for help. Oh, stop it, will you? If there was a quarter in the bay, you'd drop your mother overboard and tell her to hold her nose. You're getting out of line, Regan. If she came up with kelp, you'd ring her out for iodine. That's enough. We got a case and you're going to handle it. You're going to handle it. I quit. And I know this girl looks suspicious, but we have to give our clients the benefit of the doubt. Why didn't you send her to missing persons? I'll keep this picture and check with them first thing in the morning. You follow up that Menlo in the letter. Well, a guy named Chambers has got priority. Who's that? The girl's got a love story. It's getting cold out here. Check me in the morning. I'll do that. Remember, Regan, we always work hand in hand. Yeah. That's why I never wear a ring. Well, it was too late to do anything else, so I went home and pulled that bed out of the wall. The next morning, I found a Martin Chambers listed in the city directory with an address on Laurel. Turned out to be a two-story apartment building about the color of a bride's blush. And it was wrapped around a swimming pool the size of a bird bath. Chambers' name wasn't on the mailbox, but a skinny guy with a load of bed sheets told me I could find the manager in apartment 15. When she answered the door, her voice sounded like a beer truck in low gear. Hello, Sonny. Looking for an apartment? You got one? Nope. Come on in. You having some coffee? You want some? No, I'll pass. You don't know me, do you? I just got here. I played the palace in 26. Ah, oh, them was the days. Write it up and sell it to the movies. Damn slobs. Central Casting had called me in four years. You got a card? AFRA, SAG, and the Musicians' Union. I play French horn. None of them call me. I figure it's a record band. I'll talk to Petrello. I hate this dump. A third husband gave it to me. By the way, what are you doing here, Sonny? I'm looking for a man named Martin Chambers. What do you want him for? Talk to him. Cop? No. The day that guy moved in, I had him pegged for a gigolo. His hair was too curly. Some women like that. Not me. I used to have to chase him around the swimming pool to get his rent. You're using the past tense. Where is he now? Forest lawn. That's one way to break a lease. He got boozed up about six months ago and drove off to Malibu Pier. Took him three days to fish him out. Straighten his hair? Yeah, it sure did. <laughs> oh, wait a minute here. I, I kind of like you, Sonny. You get around, don't you? Yeah, when the weather's good. Ever run into Louis B? No, not yet. If you do, mention my name, will you? What is it? Just say that Goldie McMasters was asking for him. He'll remember old Goldie. How could he forget? Allison 26. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when I left, she was thumbing through an old variety. She looked unhappy like a banjo player with a paper pick. Well, what she told me about Chambers took the leading man out of the picture, but there was a bit player named Menlo. Well, I called the office of a Paul Menlo, but they said he wasn't in that day, so I drove out to his address in Encino. It was a ranch house poured all over the top of a hill. From the looks of the place, Dr. Menlo must have been getting over sealing for his cough drops. I parked my car by the gate and followed the flagstones up to the front door. When I pressed a button, I heard something that sounded like chamber music. The door opened in the middle of the second chorus. Good morning. I want to see Dr. Menlo. Your name, please? Regan. You'll have to call the doctor's office, Mr. Regan. I already did. Then they must have told you the doctor doesn't see any patients at his home. Yeah, well, I'm not sick. Keep it up and you will be. Beat it, Pilgrim. No, I came here to see the doctor. You don't want to see you. Uh, get your hands off me, punk. Once I hit a guy in the ear, it busted his leg. Max. I can handle this guy, Vicky. Stop that. Get out, Max. Uh, I'll be in the back if you want. You ever been a referee? I've been a lot of things. Come in, Mr. Regan. I uh, apologize for him. He's so eager. Isn't this better? No, well, everybody's eager now. Anxious is a better word. Hmm. I like blue serge. It's an effect on me. You're the doctor's helper? I hold a stethoscope. My name is Vicky Starr. I'd like to see him. He's busy. Where do I wait? Hmm? Might be quite a while. He just opened the bottle. Well, then I'm right on time. Paul's not sociable like me. He drinks alone. He gets more that way. Let me entertain you. What can you do? Watch. Oh, no, no. Easy, baby. I don't know how to fix a fracture. I've already got a man that can do that. I want one with brains. What's the matter with the doctor? He keeps his in cold storage. Hasn't used him for a long time now. Oh, I don't know. He's done all right. 
This place? He'd be selling papers if his wife hadn't left him a good insurance policy. Don't you like his money? Huh. Don't get me wrong. I like being secure, but a girl has feelings, too. Mm-hmm. They're beginning to show. I'm glad I met you. Why? We're going to have some nice afternoons. It's football season. I have some free time. Want to hear me on the piano, for instance? No, I don't sing. I'll teach you. Paul says I should have an outside interest. Well, keep looking. You'll find one. You smile, good, but you talk nasty. You started this conversation, sis. Max is still in the kitchen. I came here to see Menlo. You didn't say what about. I'll tell him. There's the phone. Call and make an appointment. Yeah, I'll be... Hello, Vicky. Who is it this time? His name's Regan. He hasn't got a business card. Have Max show him out. You, Dr. Menlo? Yes. Yeah, should I turn all my patients over to another doctor? Yeah, well, I know one you forgot. Tell me who. Carmen Sanchez. Go ahead, Vicky. I'll talk to him. Watch yourself, Paul. He doesn't know how to be nice. It'll only take a minute. I'll crack the mic. Good nurse. She's out of uniform. We're casual. You said I had a patient named Carmen Sanchez. Who told you that? Somebody she knew? Your relative? Friend. You heard some wrong information, mister. I never heard of Carmen Sanchez. I read about you in a letter. Must have been another Menlo. No, there's only one with a license. You peak, too. Twenty-five a day? Ten. I work for another guy. Who? Lion. <laughs> Lion's eye. Okay. You're still at the wrong house. You want to show me your files? Why not? Come on. Okay. Hey, keep a duplicate at home. Help yourself. Want a drink? Too early. You don't mind if I have one? No. <clears throat> Anything? Not under Sanchez, no. Now, do you believe me? She could have used another name. Got any ideas? Blonde girl, 5'4", brown eyes. <clears throat> Means that. Do you ever know a man named Chambers? Yeah. In high school, back in Denver. Drove a truck. Well, that doesn't help. I'm sort of retired now. Yeah, that's what Vicky said. Nice girl. Talks to everybody. You satisfied? Not yet. Don't mention. Always glad to help out. There's easier ways to make a living. Yeah, I haven't got a wife with an insurance policy. A year ago, I'd have broke you in half for that. No, it doesn't matter. You can find the door. I'll be back. Don't bother, Regan. Doctor will be out. I left him sitting there with a glass of rye in his hand. It wasn't much of an interview, but there was a story somewhere. What Menlo didn't have in his files, he was keeping in his head. and figured he might open up if I showed him that snapshot in the letter. While I drove back to town, I put in a call to the lion. Nobody answered at the office, so I went home. When I opened my door, I caught a load of taboo. Isabel Sanchez was wearing a dress she must have put on with a shoehorn. He's got the nicest janitor. He thinks I'm your sister. Where'd you meet him? He was in the lobby when I came in. I've been waiting for you. Yeah, well, we got an office, you know. No one answered when I rang. I wanted to be sure and see you before I left. Taking a trip? I leave for Mexico City first thing in the morning. Well, it was a short visit. It was long enough. What about your sister? That's what I came here to tell you. I found Carmen. Oh, you did? Or rather, Carmen found me. I feel foolish now, calling in a detective service and all that. Why? Well, Carmen came to my hotel about noon today. And you imagine she's been looking for me. Last night you said she didn't have an address. Oh, that was another silly thing. On your her mistake. She's not very good at details. Where is she now? Well, she's out buying a few things and packing. I've convinced her to come home with me. All right. Now you want to know what I found? Why on earth should I? I have my sister. You were worried about a man named Chambers last night. Carmen told me she hasn't seen him for months. Did she tell you about her doctor? No. I met him. Only he said he never saw her. Oh, is that so? Well, Mr. Regan, I do appreciate your services. Please thank Mr. Lyon for his kindness. I'm sorry I won't be able to see him. Yeah, he's going to be sorry, too. You'll give him this envelope. with a hundred dollars in it. You're paid up. It's for all the unnecessary trouble I've caused you. And, Mr. Regan, it's all confidential. You read the contract. I wouldn't want any of this to get back. It's wrong. You know some of the wrong kind, do you? Doesn't everyone? Thank you, Dan. 
饭。Hello. You run any expenses on this thing today? No, I didn't. Good. It's all over. Isabel said she didn't see you. There's a guy named Gallagher in missing persons. Got an eye like an eagle. He took one look at that snapshot and opened a file. What kind of file? Dead and unclaimed. What do you mean? Carmen Sanchez has been dead a year, and the county buried her. You are listening to the story of the lost lady. Tonight's adventure with Jeff Regan, investigator. Before we continue with tonight's story, here's an important message from the Adjutant General's office. The Army Nurse Corps Reserve still has commissions available for graduate registered nurses between the ages of 21 and 45. If you believe you qualify for a commission in the Army Nurse Corps Reserve, apply to the Adjutant General. Washington, D.C. And now back to the story of the lost lady and Jeff Regan, investigator. Well, there are enough angles in this thing to write a new geometry book. Isabel Sanchez came to Los Angeles to find her sister Carmen. She called in the lion who started me digging. A doctor named Menlo out in Encino used a milk bottle for a jigger. He was heavy on green stuff but light on memory. He gave me nothing but an ice cube. His girlfriend Vicky was a little different. She gave me a warm glow, but I still drew a blank on the missing sister. Then Isabel walked into my place and said she found Carmen and called off the chase. That's about when the lion rang and said that he found her too. Only his version was a little different. She was holding down a plot in the county cemetery, been dead a year. Well, I caught a cab and I went over to her hotel. A small man with a bald head opened the door and looked at me like I was trying to crash a coming out party. Yes. I'm looking for Isabel Sanchez. Are you a friend? She won't think so. She's uh, not available. All right, I'll wait. What I mean is, could you come back later? What's wrong with her now? Oh, well, you see. The, All right, uh, come on, Buster. Let's throw it in gear. Are you a guest of the hotel? No. Now, could you please tell me the nature of your business? I want to see Isabel. I'm sorry. I I can't let you in until you tell me who you are. Regan, International Detective Bureau. She's a client. Oh, come in. I'm Doctor Stanwyck, the house physician. She need one? Not anymore. Look to yourself. Well, how long's she been this way? Two hours, I'd say. Bellboy found her a few minutes ago. She drank a lot. Alcoholic poisoning. Yeah. Oh, Mr. Regan,、uh, when a thing like this occurs, naturally we don't like it to get around to the other guests. You'll use discretion, I presume. I'll be as quiet as she is. Thank you, Mr. Regan. We appreciate it.、Mm-hmm. The elevator's to your right. I got a good memory. Regan. What are you doing here? I've come to talk to our client. You'll need a Ouija board. What you mean? She's dead. Why'd you let that happen? She wouldn't have done you any good. What you talking about? Yeah, all right. You go to Isabel. You say your sister's buried on the county, but it'll take a little cash to keep it out of the newspapers. Not so now. Go back to your contest, Blanks. Big shot. That Sanchez team didn't come from Mexico, and she wasn't rich. You mean she's been lying? I told you that yesterday. All right, we'll close the Sanchez case. Oh no, we won't. It's still wide open. Where you going? To buy an airwick. <laughs> I went down to the Hall of Records. It's the Brown Building off Temple. It leans over like an old lady with a short cane. I took the elevator upstairs and I walked down to Vital Statistics. The place was empty except for a guy sitting behind the desk. He had on a black suit with dust on his shoulders. His fingernails were dirty and he was reading a dictionary. He must have been at a good part because he looked mad when I nudged him. We're not on that bus. Pick shove it. I want some information. That's what I'm here for. I'm a public servant. Now let's get to the death files, will you? You're a morbid guy. You got a lot of stuff from births and marriages. Ask me something about that. Carmen Sanchez died a year ago in August. Tell me what from. Okay. Okay. How'd you spell it? Just like it sounds. Sanchez. Seventeen. Sawas. Sanaki. Santa. Oh, that's what happened to old Sandy.、Mm-hmm. No wonder I ain't seen him around. Get the Sanchez. All right. I got the Sanchez. Carmen, twenty-two, date of death eight thirty forty-seven. Alcoholic poisoning. She drank a lot. 
Who signed the certificate? P.E. Menlo, M.D. Thanks. Next time, make it something hard. All right. Try this. Menlo's wife died about the same time. Mm. Master, Marie, Melbourne, Babbitt, hmm? Babbitt, hmm? Menlo. Sylvia, 349247, alcoholic poisoning. Certification? P.E. Menlo. That guy can't keep a patient. <laughs> Well, I left and I went back out into the street. It was almost five and the traffic was heavy. I started to cross the street to a sandwich shop on the corner. A yellow cab raced me to the sidewalk, but I won. I went inside and a skinny waitress with peanut-colored hair brought me a cup of stale coffee and a burnt hamburger. I sat there and I tried to figure it. It was like swimming through a tidal wave in hip boots. Three deaths from the same thing and Menlo's name on every one of them. Well, the answers weren't in the coffee cup, so I went home, picked up my car, and drove out to Menlo's place in Encino. The drive was nice, and so was the reception. I built a fire. I forgot the marshmallows. We'll think of something else. You know, I'm not mad anymore. I'm still looking for your doctor. Let me take care of it. No, I want to see him. You'll have to wait again. When's he going to climb out of that bottle? We had dinner at a place on Ventura. Paul found the bar. He'll stay till it closes. I better go there. Questions again? Maybe. I know some swell answers. I bet you do. I've worked for him a long time. One year. How did you know? This is my night off. You here all along? Isn't it terrible? Anything can happen. Mm -hmm. How do you like it? Your way? That's better. Now, let's have a nice, quiet evening. Just you and me. I had a feeling you'd be back. That way you wore that? Like it? Well, you've got talent, lady. Discover me. Mm. There's been a famine of men like you. You don't look underfed. Why didn't I meet you sooner? We didn't travel in the same crowd. Let's start over. Do you keep his files? What's that got to do with us? They'd never pass inspection. Are you talking about something I should know? Carmen Sanchez. What about her? She died. Menlo signed her death certificate. Paul's lost a lot of patience. He's not very good. Did I tell you I played the piano? He told me some other things. Did I? They make a good story. I don't like stories. Well, I'm going to tell you anyway. I thought we were going to have a nice, quiet evening. The girl walked in his office one day and dropped dead. Good opening. Why'd she do that? Alcoholic poisoning. She was a nobody named Carmen Sanchez. Story's getting dull. There was a snapshot in her pocketbook. Not much help. When does the uh, action begin? Right now, lady. The doctor's wife had an insurance policy. He convinced her to take a trip. Why do you want to do a thing like that? So he could pull a name fix and collect his wife's insurance. He had a body. No one will ever believe this plot. He buried an empty box. How do you know? I'm going to have somebody dig it up. What about the body? He turned that over to the county. Everybody lives happy ever after. Don't you like my music? You're going to have to take up the harmonica, lady. Why? The gas chamber isn't big enough for a piano. Who's going to the gas chamber? You, maybe. An insurance fraud's one thing. Murder's a longer rap. You haven't touched your drink. I don't like mine that strong. Now, come on, lady. Get your coat. Max! I thought you were alone. I lied. Hello, Regan. You look excited. It's tough, Max. Yeah, that's easy. Soften him up. Oh! Oh! I was in a white room when the trip ended. I tried to move my head, but it felt like a grand piano. So I just lay there. Pretty soon, somebody put something damp on my face, and I began to see things. Vicky was there, Max. So was Menlo. If I'd have had a deck of cards, we could have played a peanut game. Menlo looked kind of upset, like an ostrich with a sore throat. He had a needle in his hand. I get the shakes. You're all right, Paul. Now go ahead. Just like Isabel. You should have stayed out, Regan. Oh, I wanted one more look at you, baby. I hate to see the nice ones go, but it'll all be over in a minute. All right, Paul. Give me a drink, Vicky. Never mind. Hurry up. Let me have a drink. Oh, you're too slow, Max. Yeah? Keep away from me, Max. I'll kill you. Yeah. Put down that keep gun. away from me. I swear I'll... Oh, just... I told you to keep away. Oh. Menlo slugged for Kara Max, but Vicky shot Menlo twice. And his knees knocked together. He began to pitch around like a toy balloon in a hurricane. He dropped his gun, but he held onto the needle. Then he slumped forward and made a grab for Vicky, and they both went down. He jammed the needle into her arm. 
Same stuff you used on Isabel? Yeah. <laughs> Don't call it alcoholic boys. I'll straighten them out. They can hold my head. Yeah. Here. Call it down there. He'd never make it. Please, Ray, and go up. No dirt. <laughs> Give me five good reasons. Five good reasons? I got Vicky. I'll never use a needle again. And... You only gave me two. Well, we didn't hear from the suburbs, but there were enough ballots to make an election. Homicide got the insurance commissioner down there, and he threw in a vote. Seems that Isabel Sanchez was Menlo's wife, only her name was Sylvia. When a dame named Carmen Sanchez dropped dead in his office, Menlo got kind of ambitious. He talked his wife into the switch, and, well, everything might have worked out. Except one night when he was seeing elephants, he told Vicky the whole thing. She set the squeeze play with Max in the dugout. When Sylvia got back and saw how things were, she called herself Isabel Sanchez and went to the lion with a story about a lost sister. I was hired for scare work, and when she figured they had enough, she called me off. But it didn't take. And you know the rest. Well, the insurance company issued a fee for exposing it to fraud, and the lion got his picture on page one. It was right next to Vicky's. He was wearing one of those French swimming suits. The lion said, that'd do us a lot of good. It did. We each got a free bathing suit. <laughs> Jack Webb is featured as Jeff Regan with Herb Butterfield as Anthony J. Lyon. It's CBS at the same time next week for more hard-boiled action and mystery with Jeff Regan, the investigator. Written by E. Jack Newman and Larry Roman. Produced by Sterling Tracy. The role of Vicky Starr was played by Yvonne Pathy. Lorraine Tuttle was Isabel Sanchez. Ken Christie played Dr. Paul Menlo. And Larry Dobkin was Max Brenner. Original music for this program is by Milton Charles. Bob Stevenson speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. My name's Regan. I get ten a day in expenses from a detective bureau run by a guy named Anthony J. Lyon. They call me the Lion's Eye. With Jack Webb as Jeff Regan, the Lion's Eye, stand by for hard-boiled action and mystery and thrilling adventure in tonight's story of the guy from Gower Gulch. It's a gray building, about the color of moldy bread. It's an apartment house in the middle of Hollywood, and it figures that the guy who built it quit voting when they named the street it sits on, Taft Avenue. My place is furnished with war surplus from the Spanish-American War. Well, it's got a hat rack, and that's where I live, number 308. In back, where you get a view and some fresh air from the alley. One's about as bad as the other. But I got it fixed up kind of nice. Hot plate, coffee pot, an autographed picture of Sally Rand that somebody left there. Only mistake I made was putting in a telephone. It spoils a lot of things. Regan, it's the lion. Wake up. We got a job. Why don't you sleep at night? Lucky for you, I got insomnia. We go broke. Try Ovaltine. What kind of a job? How should I know? Get your clothes on. What are you doing, reading the want ads? I got a note from a client. You mean you got money? Hundred bucks is all. Says he'll match it if we run him an errand. Where to? Santa Ana Canyon? He'll tell you. You know, you got morals like a cash register. Can he write his name? Davy Crockett. He's 50 uh, years old. Well, he's a little old for cowboys and Indians, isn't he? That's his name, Davy Crockett. Well, when's the wagon train pull out? 
Regan. I don't know how I stand for you. Get over there. Get where? Listen, a guy works pretty hard building up a business like I have takes a lot out of him. Well, you got plenty on tap. I just want you to understand that's all. Money doesn't grow on trees. Now, sometimes you gotta play your hunches. Like George Gallup. This time I got a feeling the guy's okay. He writes like a gentleman, Regan. I want you to treat him like one. But where do I find him? He's in a location can give us a lot of business. Where? The city jail. <laughs> Yeah, that's the lion, born under the sign of the dollar. Well, it happened on Monday night, and I found the Lincoln Heights jail looking real tired after a rough weekend. They were putting fresh creosote on the walls in front of the drunk tank, and the guy at the desk looked like he'd burst his radiator if anybody phoned for another reservation. It was about 1 a.m., but after a couple of jokes I know about alligators, Sergeant Gonzalez hauled out a drawer with some cards in it. Under C, he found it. Full name, David Crockett. Cell 273, solitary. Gonzalez walked me through a couple of quarters, and then he opened his cell and let me inside. Davy Crockett was there, awake and standing up. He was about four feet high, skinny, with a head like a sunburned turnip. He had blue veins roaming all over his nose and a handlebar mustache to hold him up. He looked at me like I was holding the fifth ace. Howdy, stranger. My name's Regan, International Detective Bureau. How do I know? Start anything and I'll set up a racket. No, I work for the lion. You called him. Maybe yes, maybe no. You got credentials? Where do you want them? Easy, son. Not talking to an amateur. Flyweight champion, Buenos Aires, 29. Grab yourself a squat, partner. Mm -hmm. What are you so nervous about? Nothing. Precautious, that's all. All right, look, let's start at the beginning, shall we? What are you locked up for? Fire plug. Got him in the dangerous places in this bird. What'd you do? Steal it for your dog? No. Parked my landlady's car alongside it while I ran in there. You don't get jugged for traffic tickets. There were two cops. Looked like a posse. I don't like injustice. All right, resisting arrest, is that all? What more do you want? Told you I'm not a man to be trampled with. Taught judo in Tokyo, 34. <laughs> the Japs still lost the war. Sit still, Regan. You're working. On what? Well, it's... Just another errand. It's not much. Well, come on. Let's pick up the temple, will you? My bicycle's double parked. Say, you ever get saddle sores on a bicycle? I did once. Eight-day race. Yeah, yeah, I know. Now, what about this errand? Little package wrapped up in a sweater. In the alley by the ash can. Go on. I calculate I dropped it about three and a half feet to the left of the big ash can. By accident? Man can't fight with his hands full. I wrote down the address for you here. All right. What's in that sweater you didn't want the cops to see? A pole cat. It fits the rest of your story, yeah. Son, there's nothing in the life of Davy Crockett won't stand inspection. When you get the package, check it in at the Union Station. And then what? Save me the stub, you get a hundred. Save it for bail, you could do this job yourself. Thought I told you, sonny. I'd like to be lonesome. So you had him lock you up on purpose? No, I just like it here. You want a reference? Check any of the boys in Gower Gulch. Movie cowboy, huh? Laddie, you're looking at the greatest jockey since Paul Revere. Eddie Sand... To Eddie Arcaro. I beat them all. Kentucky Downs, 39. Yeah, sure. Well, a job's a job, Davy, but I got a hot tip where I fit in. Where's that? Trailing the field. Well, I left the little man running his fingers through an old copy of Variety, and I went out into the street. It was about 3 o'clock, and a truck was throwing some water out and giving the gutter a shampoo. I picked up my car and started out to play retriever. That's when I spotted the blonde tailing me. She was using a 37 Packard, and the top was down. I could see her in the mirror. I could tell she had yellow hair like a rag doll. It took a few fast turns to get rid of her, but then I was solo when I pulled to a stop by the alley off Gower. It was in back of some old movie studios. About then, a drunk came pouring down the street, did a loop around a fire plug at the head of the alley, and sat down. He was the talented kind, and I figured he thought I was Arthur Godfrey. Well, I scrambled over some broken beer bottles looking for the sweater. It finally showed, lying beside a pack of newspaper and some dame's torn petticoat. That's when the drunk lost his tilt and began looking at me. I picked up an old shoe, I wrapped it in a newspaper, and I started out of the alley. The drunk went back to his audition, moving toward me. Marie, the dawn is breaking. Marie, you'll soon be waking. Hiya, friend. Have a drink. That's not my brand. Don't be a mug. A little drink between friends is real nice. 
Well, we haven't been introduced. My name's Maxwell. What's yours? Slipped my mind. Ah, that's the trouble with the whole world. No fellowship. Except for my girl, Marie. You know Marie? No, I don't. Sort of short and plump, a little sinus trouble. That's too bad. Thought you might have met her. Lots of fellowship in that girl. Every time you look, another fella. All right, move it, buddy. Now, you don't want to get by me, friends. You want to stand right there and have a little drink. You got the subject we're going to talk about? Yeah, sure, sure. What's in the package? Dirty laundry. Ain't that funny, though. I just got me a new Bendix. Why don't you go into business? That's what I'm going to do. You're my first customer. No, I lux my dainties. Yeah, don't go away, friend. I ain't through with my sales talk. Well, hire a skywriter. Hold up, I said. Get your hands off of me. All right, Regan, the round's over. Yeah, what makes you the referee? This does. Friend here wants to play rough, Red. Reconsider, Regan. It'll make you happy. All right, what do you want? The package. You heard what he said, smart guy. Why don't you work for it? Heavy, Max. Don't leave, Regan. We're not finished. I got the package, Red. Give him a tip for picking it up. Mm, sure. Oh. Uh. Guess I overpaid him. Well, it was easy to see. It was their play. I had about as much chance as a midget in a basketball game. The muscles ambled off with the package that they took from me, and I crawled back for that sweater. It was still there, wrapped around something hard and round. And when I ripped it off, a shine caught my eyes. It was a metal can of movie film, and the word Peru was marked on it. Not much for all the hush-hush, but it must have had a story. Well, I looked up a friend of mine who owned a camera shop, and I made a commotion with a five-dollar bill. That shook the sand out of him, and he rented me a projector with sound. The Lion's House was the next stop. We threw up a sheet on the wall and turned on the film. That completed the night. We had a trip to a good neighbor without a passport. Wonders turned out to be a Joan Fitzpatrick giving with some kind of a travelogue. The most colorful in the world. A temple of worship. Home of Peru, 2,000 years old. You get in me perfect to see a movie. Well, stop screaming, will you? It's free. Time. You know I can't stand movies. I got sore eyes. All right, shut up and listen to this. New Peru, the marketplace. A street vendor dressed in gay native costume. Selling delicacies to Peruvian children. Beads and jewels of exquisite beauty wrought by the hands of master Peruvian artisans. Horse racing, an innovation from the modern world. And native dance. I'm going to bed. You won't sleep. I stole your eye shade. Oh, Regan, I got to get up early. I got lots to do. It'll keep. A veritable symphony of motion. And so, it's with heavy heart we say adieu to lovely Peru. Land of the Peruvians. Land of charm and enchantment. And with the setting sun, we take our leave. Well, what'd you get out of it? A headache. Yeah, we'll talk about it in the morning. No, I can't wait. Uh, what you doing now? I'm phoning the city jail. Looking for a room? Looking for information. Davey will supply it. You've been drinking. Now listen, big shot. Somebody's after this film for some reason. I'm going to find it. City jail, Sergeant Gonzalez speaking. Danny's Regan. Oh, hi, you, Regan. I'm glad you called. I just got that joke about the alligators. <laughs> yeah, well, do me a favor, will you? Sure, pal, sure. Say, I told it to the lieutenant. He's still laughing. You know, it may earn me a promotion, pal. Let me talk to Davy Crockett. Oh, I can't do that, Regan. Well, you can say I'm his lawyer. Well, it's not that, pal. He's not here anymore. What do you mean? Some guy bailed him out 20 minutes ago. When I was telling the lieutenant the joke, this guy in the briefcase comes in, slaps down the bail. Out walks your friend. Well, he said he liked it there. And yeah, Davey must have changed his mind. Where'd he go? Not very far. Just over to the morgue. Well, the cowboy from Gower Gulch had spun his last yarn. Gonzalez told me that somebody had shot Crockett as soon as he hit the street. Oh, none of this made sense. The phony job, the blonde who tailed me, the fight in the alley, the corny movie. Now the lion shoved the film in a desk and I went out the door. I cut across his yard, but I stopped on the opposite sidewalk. My car wasn't alone. It was a 40-foot nag sniffing at its rear fender. Hey, Regan. Well, Maxwell. That's me. You look different. Did you take the cure? Shut up. Somebody wants to see you. If it's Marie, tell her my book's full. Thought you might like a lift. No, I got a friend who runs a streetcar. Now go on, beat it. Regan, don't be that way. Oh, Grimm, a Panatella, Maxwell. Who's this, your father-in-law? You smoke, Regan? No, it might explode. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so long. Hold it, Buster. Get in, Max. 
Max, I told you before, you're on probation. That's all right. Don't pick on him, teacher. He didn't hurt me. Get in front, Max. Sure. Where your other boy, Red, we could play some bridge. I thought he'd do better in the shoe business. The one I gave him didn't fit, huh? I'm a much misunderstood man, Mr. Egan. I'm sure you'll put your best foot forward. I'd love to. My card, Horace Grundy. Mm -hmm. Sometime earlier, a little man called me, Mr. Egan. Uh, Custer or Boone or... uh... Davy Crockett? Of course. I want you to understand I get many such calls. Party line. It's a private number, but the salesmen bother me anyway. It's tough to be popular. Davy tell you what he was selling? No. Well, he didn't tell me either. Have it your own way. When I told him I'd meet him, he said he'd arrange to get out of jail. He said all he wanted was a job. And he got one. Yes, only there's no future to it. I wouldn't want anything like that happening to you, Mr. Regan. I'll renew my insurance. No, you'll come with me. It's more friendly. Suppose I don't like to talk. You won't have to, if everything goes all right. Well, it's your taxi. And you're paying the fare. All right, Maxwell. Clover Field. I never knew a guy could say the name of an airport and make it sound like Forest Lawn. Grundy sat in the corner checking the manicure on his fingernails, and Maxwell drove out Olympic. By the time we skidded into Clover, I'd figured absolutely nothing. It was still only 4 a.m., but there was a string of cars parked in the lot. I spotted a 37-packard roadster, but I was too busy getting rushed up onto the field to look for the blonde. Besides, the faster we ran, the more excited Grundy got. And then uh, we rounded the hangar, and the reporters hit us. Say, hey, Louis B's pretty sore, huh? No, no, Louis B and I are friends. Just his plugs are burned. <laughs> Let us through, boys. Hey, wait a second. This Junior who's traveling on the plane. They say he wants a quarter of a million. You going to pay him today? After I see a workout. Come on, Regan. Let's go. Yeah, you're a real big man, Grundy. I'm going to be, Regan. El Romano. Best rip of any horse in South America. So that's it, huh? Where the ruins come from. Uh, what's that? Peru. Oh, sure. Peruvian National Airways gave Julio a special plane. Everything special. Like in the movies. Well, look, suppose you watch him unload. I'll take a back seat here. Oh, no, no, Regan. This is a big day. I want you to see what... What's the ambulance for? Well, don't look at me. Stick around, Regan. It could be you. Hey, get that stretcher over there. Oh, he kicked me, hit me, kicked me. It's Julio. Not the guy who owns him? Must be. I, I tried to hold him, the hold on break. Oh, my ribs. Take it easy, boy. We got you. What happened? Bounce, bounce. The landing, she is rough. That is all. Where is the doctor? You're going to the hospital. Lie down. Oh, I'm broken in six places. Lift up the stretcher. Come on, boys. Hurry it up. Oh, he kicked, he kicked me. Move fast, boys. Yes, hot Hey, Mr. Grundy. Mr. Grundy. Mr. Grundy, my horse. Well, the guy by the plane started to yell just about the time they took Julio toward the rear of the ambulance. Grundy took a dive for the cargo door, and so did everybody else. And then I had to stand there while six feet of big shot cigar turned into a crybaby. Look, Regan. Look at the horse's leg. He's kicked himself. Okay, so he's clumsy. But he might not run again. He was going to be mine, Regan. That's too bad. Call a vet. I have already paid 50000 retainer on the horse, Regan. I'll send you a lawyer. I got an idea. You're connected with this. Oh, dry up, Buster. It's an accident. Yeah? I got an idea there's going to be another accident. Yeah, Grundy. Maybe you're right. Go! Oh, hey, stop him! Well, I didn't wait to see if he went down. Maxwell swung, but I took off through the crowd. I figured that Cloverfield wasn't for me, and I wasn't going to stick around for the daisy. And then I spotted a ride, the rear end of Julio's ambulance. I made it just as the buggy started to move. I pulled the door shut and tried not to step on that stretcher inside. I shouldn't even have bothered that. The stretcher was empty. The only patient was me. You are listening to the story of the guy from Gower Gulch. Tonight's adventure with Jeff Regan, investigator. Commissions are still available in the Army Nurse Corps Reserve. Graduate registered nurses between the ages of 21 and 45 may qualify for service with this fine organization. If you are interested in joining the Army Nurse Corps and believe that you qualify for a commission... Apply to the Adjutant General, Washington, D.C. And now, back to Jeff Regan, investigator, and the story of the guy from Gower Gulch. Well, things were beginning to move like a hula dancer with a hot foot. 
Davy Crockett sent me out to pick up a roll of movie film. A Joan Fitzpatrick travelogue on beautiful Peru. There was something in it that was hot, but Crockett got himself plugged before he could say what it was. There were shots of a horse race in Peru. And when a big buster named Grundy turns up buying a nag from a Peruvian breeder, I figured a connection. So did Grundy. When the horse got hurt and Julio did a disappearing act with his money, everybody looked at me. That's when I took the shortest way to Hollywood in an ambulance, got my car, and made it for home. Only parked up the street from my apartment was that same 37 packet roadster I'd been dodging all evening. The blonde wasn't in it. She was sitting in my place looking real hopeful. Good evening. You keep late hours, Mr. Regan. No, it's the kind of friends I've got. Perhaps you ought to change them. I'll stick it out. What do you want? A little chance to talk to you. It'll keep till morning. Oh, but Mr. Regan, I've been waiting so long, you've got to talk to me now. Why? I'm Davy Crockett's wife. You've got something that belongs to me. I don't see any wedding ring. I... I don't wear one. Scare off the other boys? That's not a very nice remark, Mr. Regan. No, but you'll let it go. Only because it's not important. Oh, stop it. You're not Davy's wife. If the little guy had anybody he could trust, he wouldn't have had to call in the lion. All right, Mr. Regan. I lie. Now, let's have it, lady. What are you after? The roll of film. That figures. It's mine. Convince me. Mr. Regan, you're becoming very annoying. Why don't you call the police? But I tell you, it is mine. Let's see the pink slip. And so it is with heavy heart we bid adieu to... That's enough. Yeah, yeah. I thought I knew that voice. Mm. Davy stole the roll from my library. Now may I have it back? Homicide will turn it over to you when they're ready. I can't wait. Well, what makes it so valuable? I'm not sure. Then how do you know it is? Because I'm not stupid, Mr. Regan. Somebody goes to a lot of trouble to break into my film library... But he only steals one roll of film. Go on. I put the police on Davy, followed them to the jail. So you go after the film. That added up to pretty important business. Did you push those holes in Davy? Of course not. Now, you're going to get a chance to prove that when homicide starts speaking in your cupboard. About the film, I'll buy it from you. No sale. There's the door, lady. Use it. I threw the light switch and grabbed for the floor. When the noise stopped, I looked up. My landlady was going to be mad. The shots plowed a few holes into her flower pot. The blonde turned a couple of different colors and decided she could find safer company. She left with a fire escape without even goodbye. Well, I headed for the lions. The idea being to make sure that he'd turn that film over to the police and advertise that I didn't have it anymore. That figured to cool me off and I could catch some sleep again. When I got there, the lion looked kind of excited. He was wrapped up in a silk robe with red and gray stripes, and he carried a drink to match. He was holding a piece of that movie film up to the light. Hey, Regan, I've been calling all over for you. Where you been? I've been looking for a bed. I don't pay you to sleep. You're on a job. Now, I've been thinking since you left. We're handling this wrong. Yeah, now, that's what I figure. Get on the phone. What for? To tell Homicide you got a package for him. You're turning over that film right now. Easy, Regan. You heard me, big shot. I'm tired of playing the fall guy. Now, Regan, you don't know what you're saying. I've been running over the section on that Peruvian horse race. And you know what? You picked the winner. And we're going to collect. Who's making book? The insurance company. Well, come on. Clear it up. Look at this clip. Yeah. Well, what do you see? What do you see? Looks like a horse. But look at him. He's way out in front. El Romano. Yeah, maybe. Now, here's the way I add it up. This film tells a story, or everybody wouldn't be grubbing around for it. Well, now, that takes a big brain. So somebody's engineering a phony. Who? That's what you're going to find out. But I'll tell you one thing. That nag's insured by Banner Trust, and they pay off big if we can turn up the swindle. All right. Give me that picture. Where you going? Over to Grundy's to check the horse. Now you're talking, Regan. You dig that out, and we'll be eating squab. Yeah, And if you don't, you'll be collecting your unemployment insurance. Well, the payoff's about the same. I didn't like it any better than a fan dancer likes a wind tunnel. I'd already seen enough of Grundy and his boys for one night, but when the lion gets an idea, he's like a hangman with a new rope. So I went out to test it. I found Horace Grundy's place. It was a bright new house in the San Fernando Valley. There was some fancy fence in back, and a stable looked like the paint was still wet where it said El Romano. A trailer was parked on the road with a truck from the veterinarians. When Grundy opened the front door, he looked like he'd been sitting a three-day wake, but without any beer. Hello, Regan. Well, what's the verdict? It's bad, Regan. Bad. Tendons torn. Never run. Never. Yeah, you said that. I can't believe it. Uh Uh-huh. I knew somebody else liked animals. A guy from Gower Gulch. Decided to talk? Maybe. 
you keep your hands in the audience. What else did Crockett say? Now you got him on the wheel. All right, you drive. That's better. You know the horse is insured? Not by me, it isn't. You don't own it. You just paid a deposit. Sure, 50 G's. You got it back yet? There's plenty of time. Julia was in the hospital. Oh? Well, now, if it wasn't for the accident, you would have coughed up another 200,000. Yes. No. What difference does it make? The whole deal's a bust now. Well, that horse is a phony. Say some more, Regan. I don't know much more. Davy Crockett was a movie fan. You're doing fine. You had pictures? I wouldn't advertise them, but there's a shot of a horse winning a race. Take a look here. Give me that. All right, it's economy size. You're going to ruin your eyesight. I got a magnifying glass for my income tax. Well, let's get a light behind it. Now, what do you see? Horse. Right, you get a star. Four white feet. I can do that well myself. Listen, Regan. Horse in the stable's got three. That does it. My boss gets promoted. Come on. Come on outside. I'll show no, you. No, I'll take your word for it. Let go of me. I got my information. Max. Maxwell, where are you? I told you, don't whistle the bulldogs. You're in it now, Regan. You're on my side. All right, drop your blood pressure. There's a handkerchief on the play. Hey, wait. Wait. Hello. I look for somebody. Good morning. Pan America. Si, si. I'm Julio. Is Mr. Grundy? No, it's the guy with his mouth open there. How do you do? I'm so glad to meet him. Talk- Choke it. Okay? You switched horses. Mm, no, no, you'll not understand. El Romano, he kicked me. Wait for the encore. Mr. Grundy, with belief, I'm telling you... Now, look, you better make it fast, Julio. This guy goes Shut off. Shut up, Regan. A man trades a stretcher for a slab. Let him talk. Mm, oh, the hospital. I did not go. Julio is honest. A debt comes first. The interest's going up. When El Romano hurts himself, I know the deal is off. I know I must see the consul, so we cash the check. What? Here we are. Ten thousand, twenty, thirty, forty, fifty. Your down payment is up. Now we are one big happy United Nations, no? Well, that's what happened. Now there were two guys with their mouths open. By the time we got him closed, the little gent from Peru had waddled off someplace, and Grundy folded his money and started to laugh. He was happy, and at least I had what I came for. Figured I could dump the whole plate of spaghetti on the lion. The lead horse in the travelogue was a different nag from the one in the stable. So I got in my car and headed for home. But I picked up a newspaper on the corner, and then the whole bucket turned upside down again. The green sheet was loaded with publicity shots of El Romano from South America. And he was exactly the same oat burner that came in on the plane, feet and all. No switch there. Well, if there was something phony in this act, it was that winner in that Fitzpatrick film. Well, for a minute I felt like a test pilot in a yo-yo factory, and then the string broke. I took a fast run to the lions and one more look at those movies. I had it. The case was beginning to wind. Ten minutes later, I was back on Gower Gulch. Regan, you alone? Don't be insulting. I'll open the door. What's the matter? You're slow. What do you want? Ask me in. No, no. Ask me in. Regan, look out. Be careful, Regan. I have a gun. Well, Julio. Uh, Yes, Julio. Uh Uh-huh. What are you doing here? Well, I told you. I know. Back at my place, you're aiming at her, not me. She's been to Peru. She has the films. You knew that. You wish like I know it. I go to the movies like everybody else. I keep my eyes on the winner. After Hollywood Park, I should have known better. Yeah, there are lots of races. El Romano was a dud. He came in last. Sixty lengths with Davy Crockett digging in the spurs. You gave the nag a build-up. Phony publicity to the sucker and insurance company. A quarter of a million I was over. Can it. You could have never closed a sale without Grundy watching a workout. That would have been a slow boat to China. You want to be a sailor, too? Oh, stop being tough, will you? You wore yourself out when you kicked up El Romano in that plane. It looked good. Yeah. Not to me or Joan. Look out, Regan. You're asking for a daily double. Yeah, well, I'm going to take it across the board. Give me that no, gun. No, leave me alone. Robert. No, you're breaking my arm. That's the idea. I'll kick you in the stomach. No. Oh. You better go back to his stretcher. Wow. Well. Yeah. My, you can be useful. Well, when I'm working. What about after hours? I'm not bad, you know. No, I never noticed. Look again. No, I'm all through with the ponies. Wanna bet? Davy Crockett told me to play my hunches. Here I am. Yeah, but you're a loser. What do you mean? You threw those holes into Davy. It was Julio. You're trying real hard, but he was on the plane. What do I do now? Well, you might bid a fond ado to Gower Gulch. That's not funny, Regan. I know it. But you ran out of film.
thing blew up like a hoop skirt in a high wind. Julio had a real good thing until he ran into the little man with a good memory and a dame with a fast trigger finger. Her blackmail pitch was already set up, but Davy figured to queer it, so she had to knock him off. Well, the hospital boys came after Julio, and homicide dated Joan, the travel queen. The lion was pretty excited about the way things worked out. He figured that the insurance company would come across with some green stuff for exposing a fraud. They did. That was the color of the season pass they gave him to the Burton Holmes travel lectures. Jack Webb is featured as Jeff Regan with Herb Butterfield as Anthony J. Lyon. It's CBS at the same time next week for more hard-boiled action and mystery with Jeff Regan, Investigator. Written by Larry Roman and Jackson Gillis, produced by Sterling Tracy. Included in tonight's cast were Leo Clary, Clayton Post, Devon Patey, Ed Bagley, and Herb Ellis. Twenty-nine thousand nurses are needed to join the new Army Nurse Corps Officers Reserve. For the first time in history, qualified nurses have the opportunity of receiving commissions in the regular Army Reserve. These nurses will remain on inactive status, ready to serve their country in time of emergency. Four thousand of them, if they wish, may choose active duty. All nurses who receive commissions will benefit from the opportunity for specialized training offered to them by the Army. Inactive reserve status will not interfere with the nurse's civilian life, but the educational opportunities offered her by the Army Medical Department will be of a great advantage in her work. Don't wait. If you're a registered graduate nurse between the ages of 21 and 45, drop a card for complete information to the Adjutant General, Washington, D.C. Original music for this program is by Milton Charles, Bob Stevenson speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. I get ten a day and expenses from a detective bureau run by a guy named Anthony J. Lyon. They call me the Lion's Eye. With Jack Webb as Jeff Regan, the Lion's Eye, stand by for hard-boiled action and mystery and thrilling adventure in tonight's story of the Pilgrim's Progress. Cosmopolitan Building, 7th Street near Olive, downtown L.A. A mess of granite thrown together by an architect who must have taken his degree on the rock pile at Leavenworth. It's up on the third floor, room 308, right next to a credit dentist who shares his office with a collection agency. On the other side, there's a school for models, and the lion's got sore eyes trying to see through that cloudy glass. International Detective Bureau, Anthony J. Lyon, President. He's also vice president, secretary, treasurer. I work for him. Well, the office isn't much, but there's enough elbow room for a client to write a check. I went to the office Friday night, about 5.20, answering the lion's call. He was sitting behind the desk, sucking on a quarter cigar. He looked real pleased, like a fat lady locked in a cream puff factory. Man I know had a baby. Plumber named Broman or Groman or something like that. Uh, Mazel tov. Canceling arrangements you got for the night. I got something for you to do. Got your car? It's in the lot. Gas it up. You're taking a trip. Where to? Calabasas. A man wants to see you. I got no friends out there. Friend of mine. Name's Hendricks. He counts his money with an adding machine and his finger's always swollen. What's the problem? I don't know. He didn't say. He just called and told me to send out a man. How much did he give you for a retainer? When an important man like Hendricks calls you, don't insult him by asking for money. Oh, stop it, will you? You're the kind of guy who'd steal pennies out of parking meters. That's enough, Regan. If one of them turned up empty, you'd sue the city. Here's the Hendricks address. Now get out there. All right. Uh, Regan. Yeah? Remember, do a good job and I'll give you Thanksgiving off. And I'll pay you. With what? Cranberries? Well, I hit.
headed out Beverly and then up through Hollywood. You know, it's only November, but Santa Claus is breaking out all over the boulevard. I fought my way over Coenga Pass, and by the time I was dodging station wagons on Ventura, it was dark. Calabasas is a place with a couple of service stations, a hot dog stand, and a few road signs full of buckshot. The Hendricks place turned out to be about five miles down a road that the Indians built for hauling firewater. I guess they couldn't keep the cork in. But the house itself was strictly prohibition stuff. A big pile of slate roof and leaded windows. It looked dark and lonesome. I figured somebody had their holidays mixed. <laughs> It was a big fat guy. He was holding a six-foot gun in the shape of a straightened-out tuba. He came closer, and I could see his hat. It was a high one with a buckle on it. He was dressed in black, and he had buckles all over him. Well, I figured that I'd been eating too much Quaker oats. What's the matter, Pilgrim? A little shooting make you nervous? That's a big gun there. Shoots musket balls. Good for Indians. <laughs> well, I'm no Indian. Oh, I wasn't aiming at you. Well, that gun wouldn't know the difference. It's a blunderbuss. Great weapon. Is it? I, I saw you. Now you prop it up on a crutch. You keep fooling with that thing and we'll both need one. Shut up. Be quiet. Load the barrels. Lots of powder. Look, why don't you give that thing back to the museum? He does it. More powder. <laughs> Gotta use lots of this black Powder, Buster, you need black coffee. Come on, give me that thing before it blows yeah, up in your... Oh. Uh, you broke a window. Oh, it's all right. It was only the attic. You live here? Of course not, Pilgrim. I'm Miles Standish. Well, where's the rest of the party? All inside, talking to John Olden. Yeah, sure, sure. Oh, right, you just think I'm kidding, don't you? Pilgrim, you just haven't got the Mayflower spirit. No, you drank it all. It's just cider. Nothing better on a cold New England night. Thanksgiving's not for a week. Come on, get off it. Shh, shh, shh. Hark. What's the matter? Engine. Put that down. I'm not going to shoot him. He's the friendly type. Brother Regan. Yeah? If thou wilt follow me, please. Oh, you too, huh? I beg your pardon. Okay, okay. Well, so long, Pilgrim. Yeah, keep your powder dry, Standy. I'll see you on Plymouth Rock. <laughs> okay, this way, Brother Regan. Now, look, Sunshine, you work here. My name is Felt. Why don't you lock that guy up? I'd be outnumbered, sir. For 21, Pilgrim. Bad winter. They make you wear those corduroy knickers? Knee breeches, sir. It was Priscilla's idea. You need a union. I need more shapely legs. Through here. Now, well, it's quite a place you got. Well, it looks better without the decorations, sir. Yeah. How do you keep from stepping on these pumpkins? It's only when they use them for bowling that it's difficult. Come on, fill me in. What's this all about? Thanksgiving, sir. 1621. Okay, this room here, sir. Go right in. Okay. Shut the door. Shut it. Mr. Hendricks around? He's not here. Come over, sit down. Who are you, Priscilla? Don't. Please don't say another word of that silly rigmarole or I'll start screaming. Yeah, well, I could use a little yell myself. I'm Agnes. I'm Mrs. Hendricks. Or Agnes. It doesn't make any difference. Does to my friends. Didn't I say sit down? Yes, you did, and I didn't. So you don't like the party, huh? I'm not much of a Puritan, Mr. Regan. Well, that great Dane says the masquerade was your idea. Oh, Phelps is stupid. This goes on all weekend, Mr. Regan. It's called a turkey shoot. Oh, so that's it. Who gets the bird? The Pilgrim Fathers. My husband's friends. They ought to be shot, every one of them. Yeah, well, I'm not from the SPCA. Oh, wait a minute, Mr. Regan. I, I like you. That's not the point. I won't bore you. Your husband might. Him. He's crazy, Mr. Regan. Crazy as the things he does. Shooting, drinking, spending money. It's a hard life. I don't know how I stood it for as long as I have. My lawyer says I'm the most patient woman in the world. Yeah. Well, thanks for the conversation, Miss Hendricks. Why did my husband send for you? I don't know. Yes, you do. You do know. Tell me. I don't know. Please. 
You don't realize what kind of a man my husband can be. I never met him. You don't know how much I need help. How lonely I am. Well, where is he? I'll tell you if you promise to come back to me. No, I'll write you a letter. <sighs> He's out in the shed, other side of the patio. Thanks. I wouldn't act this way if I weren't so frightened. You don't know what it is to be frightened all the time. No, but I'm learning. I wish you'd stick around, Mr. Egan. Well, thanks, Mrs. Hendricks, but the pin feathers are a little sharp. <laughs> Mrs. Hendricks went back to her worrying, and I wound my way through the house looking for the back entrance. My legs got tired before it finally showed on the other side of the pantry. It poured out into a flagstone patio as big as the Palladium. A walk took me to a shed. It was a two-story redwood place that must have made a loud noise on the cash register, and alongside, fenced in with chicken wire, was a whole population of turkeys. Well, I went into the shed. There was a little round-faced guy with pink skin was leaning over a barrel of cider. He wore a blue silk smoking jacket with gold initials E.H. on the pocket. When he caught my footsteps, his head bobbed up, and he gave me a deep look like he was trying to see the back of my eyeballs. Yes? I'm Regan, International Detective Bureau. Oh, I've been expecting you. I'm Hendricks. Yeah, I know. Why the fireworks? Huh? Oh! <laughs> Miles Standish and his blunderbuss, eh? Oh, just having fun. It's a party, you know. Big party we're having here. Yeah, well, the neighbors will complain. <laughs> ah, neighbors. None for miles around. That's why I like it out here. Have trouble finding me? You ought to put up signs. Eh, huh? signs? Uh, glass of cider, Regan? Carefully. Bless. I'm not thirsty. Yeah... Uh, that's not what it's for. Uh, strong kind. Oh, go on Thanksgiving soon. Get the spirit. No, I can hold out till Thursday. Well, suit yourself. Excuse me. <coughs> well, well, uh, yeah. Well, there's going to be quite a party here, you know. Your wife's got a different version. Oh, you spoke to her? Yeah. You were told to come out here to see me? I got sidetracked. It's not good for a man in your position. All right, Hendricks, why am I here? What'd she say to you? I forgot. Regan, you're making me angry. Now, look, mister, you didn't get me out here to make a pilgrim out of me. Hey, that... <laughs> no, no, of course not. Fine woman, Mrs. Hendricks. We've been married for years, you know, happily. Fine, fine little woman. So she makes me a little nervous at times. Mm -hmm. Would you like the sound of guns going off? Ah, she shouldn't get so excited. Boys just having little fun. It's only once a year. What's wrong with that? Come on, now, what's the job? Oh, didn't the lion tell you? He said you would. Oh, well, <laughs> nothing to be so mysterious about. They've just got a package I want you to take to. Here it is. A turkey. You got me all the way out here to play escort to that bird? Well, I just want to be friendly. Here. Yeah. Now, go on, go on, go on. It's a long way back to L.A., and you want to be there for Thanksgiving. What's the difference? I got the turkey. I can celebrate any time. <laughs> Sixty miles to do a delivery job on a dead bird. Well, I wandered back to my car and I listened to the crickets and the gunshots try to outdo each other. And then I dumped the turkey into the back seat and I started the car down the drive. I just thrown it around the bend when the headlights caught a pair of buckled shoes and black knee breeches. Miles Standish was lying face down in the dirt and there was a wet shine on his side. He was breathing hard. The blunderbuss was lying beside him and I figured that he blew out the wrong end. I would have gone for the Hendrix phone and a doctor, but I got a good look at the holes in them, and I headed for a hospital instead. The blunderbuss may have been kicking up a fuss, but the holes in Miles Standish were 20th century, about the size of a 32. Well, I turned him over to an emergency hospital, and I put a call into the sheriff's office. I gave the story to uh, Lieutenant Robinson, and then I headed back toward town. At the lion's place, the lights were still on, so I figured he didn't have company. I rapped on the door, and he flung it open before the echo could die away. He had a carving knife in one hand, and he was wearing an apron. His eyes were big, and he had an eager look like a college couple on Mulholland Drive. Regan, you're back. Oh, now that takes a big brain. I've been waiting for you. You know, I had a chance to go to a classy party tonight. Russian caviar and champagne and favors to all the guests. You know why I didn't go? You lost your crash suit, huh? I said to myself, is it fair to go out and have a good time while my employee is working real hard for international detectives? The answer came out yes, but the party was called off. <laughs> well, as a matter of fact, it was. But I wouldn't have gone anyway. Where is it? Where's what? The package from Hendricks. Now, you can change your plans, big shot. 
You're getting a bundle of trouble instead. What do you mean? Turkeys aren't the only thing they're knocking off out on that ranch. Huh? Somebody's handy with a 32 and he's found a target. You've been drinking? Check the county emergency hospital. They'll show you the holes. I send you out on a simple little job and you come back with a crazy story about a shooting. You're out of your mind. Now listen, you, there's a big smell out in Calabasas. What about my turkey? The sheriff's office are going to have a lot of questions. You got the answers? I don't know anything. I was miles away. Well, then find out something. Check into the guy who shot. Find out who he is, what he does, and what he was doing out at Hendricks. Where are you going? To scratch around in the Hendricks closet. They tell different stories about their wedded bliss. Hey, Regan. Yeah? Where's my turkey? It's too rich for your blood, fatso. Stick to chicken. Well, I left him standing there with his apron hanging out. Miles Standish might get enough wind to, through that extra hole to say who shot him, but more likely not. Anyway, with the bucket load he had, he would have sworn it was the last of the Mohicans. But there was an angle of that Hendricks woman, even if it didn't show. So I walked up the street to where my car was nuzzling a lamppost. And the turkey and I were just going to wake up a newspaper office, only something changed my mind. A newspaper. It was wrapped around a bundle, and the bundle was under a guy's arm, and the arm was shutting the door of my car. Now, good evening, Pop. Yeah. Uh, uh, hi. Going somewhere? Sure, sure, Find a place to sleep, that's all. Want a cigarette? Say, I don't mind if I do. <laughs> Thought you was a bull for a minute. You mind if I take two? No, help yourself. My brother smokes two. And not much in the streets these days. Yeah, it's bad all over. Yeah, something ought to be done. Well, no, no I... stick around, Pop. No, no, Sonny, you give me smokes. I don't hit you for cash. It's a rule I got. I'll make the touch. Is that? What's in the newspaper? Russia. Inside. Uh, funny paper. Yeah, sure. Well, now take it easy. Boss, the guy's got a right to his privacy. You weren't sleeping in my car. Oh, so that's it. Yours, huh? Small world, ain't it? Yeah, come on, let's unwrap. Uh, now, it's Thanksgiving, Mac. Ain't you heard of Thanksgiving? I'm going to plug my ears. Give. Oh, please, Mac, show me the spirit. Once in my life, both drumsticks. Now, huh? stop it. You're breaking my I heart. I mean it, Mac. Let me have it. I I'll break the wishbone for you, Sonny. I will. You ain't got no use for all that meat, have you? Oh, you have, huh? What's so long, Mac? Hey, wait a minute. Hold it. No, I let go of my arm. That was a pretty dance, but you should have changed your shoes. What's that? You didn't get those buckles in the bread line. Oh. Now, come on. Change the record. Who are you? That's none of your business. Let go of I me. said talk. I will not. You're from the Hendricks place, aren't you? You're from the... Oh. Thank you, Phelps. That's all right. Got the bird? Sure. Let's go. Yeah. Nighty night, Pilgrim. You are listening to the story of the Pilgrim's Progress, tonight's adventure with Jeff Regan, Investigator. Commissions are still available in the Army Nurse Corps. Graduate registered nurses between the ages of 21 and 45 may qualify for service with this fine organization. If you are interested in joining the Army Nurse Corps and believe you qualify for a commission, apply to the Adjutant General, Washington, D.C. And now, back to Jeff Regan, Investigator, and the story of the Pilgrim's Progress. None of it made sense. The lion sent me out to pick up a turkey on the Hendricks Ranch in Calabasas. And the Mr. and Mrs. were having an old-fashioned turkey shoot, and all the guests carried blunderbusses and dressed like pilgrims. Only it wasn't just the turkeys who were acting as targets. One of the pilgrims ended up with some 32 caliber holes in them. And then the Hendricks lackey and a buddy shoved a gun at me and stole the lion's bird. Well, I picked myself up and I went home. A heavy man was doing a heist job on my icebox. He was pouring himself a glass of milk to wash down a sandwich he was munching on. Hi, Regan. Yeah, right ahead. Help yourself. Yeah, yeah, thanks. I didn't know how long I was going to have to wait, and I was getting hungry. There's a restaurant just up the block. I like it better this way, homemade. Fix you a sandwich? Pretty good deviled ham. Come on, let's close the box and open your mouth, buddy. Why not? We had a date, remember? Robinson, sheriff's office. Yeah, that's what I figured. You don't mind me coming in like this, do you? What if I did? Well, I'd leave. Sanctity of the home, you know. You can throw me out even though I got a badge. Uh, let's cut away the fat, mister. What do you want? Answers to a couple of questions. What were you doing at the Hendricks place? Picking up a turkey. 
Well, that's a new one. Now, look, you ask him. I'll answer him. Never mind the feature page. How long have you known the Hendricks? Never met him before. Wrong answer. What do you mean? We found this out at the Hendricks house. A page torn out of the yellow directory with a red circle around international detective. Well, that doesn't say a thing. Maybe yes, maybe no. I'm still scratching around. It'll ruin your manicure. You know, Regan, you don't seem to realize the seriousness of this. That pilgrim you dragged in died. Well, I figured. We don't like unsolved murders messing up our record books. Well, then you're wasting your time here. I got lots of it. I don't come up for pension for 12 more years. What was that pilgrim's name? Well, he gave me Miles Standish. Sounds like a fake. Well, don't count on it. I once knew a John Smith. Give me the real name. I don't have it. All right. He's not a town boy, but we'll track him down. Now, straighten out something for me, Regan. How long did you say you knew the Hendricks? Now, look, I gave this to you once. Nothing's changed. How come we find a $5,000 check in that joker's pocket made out to cash and signed by Hendricks? Go ahead, answer. Just don't make a date. You may not be available. Yeah? Mr. Regan, this is Mrs. Hendricks. I, I must see you right away. Who did you say? Mrs. Hendricks, you remember? Charlie? No, no, there's no Charlie here. You must have the wrong number. Sort of annoying, isn't it, Regan, when you get a wrong number late at night? Well, it happens. Sure, sure, it does happen to me once. Anything else you want? Another deviled ham sandwich? Kitchen's closed. Pretty rotten hospitality. Well, you weren't asked. Okay, I gotta move anyway. See you later, Regan. Keep the mud off your shoes. We are three, four, oh, eight. Hello? Mrs. Hendricks, this is Regan. Well, I just called you. Well, I couldn't but... talk. What do you want? Can you come out, Mr. Regan? Right away. You're still lonely? Things aren't going well. Well, murder's like that. I've got to talk to somebody. Won't you please come? Give me a reason. I can tell you some things now I couldn't mention before. Like why your husband wrote a $5,000 check to the dead man? Check? Well, but there must be some mistake. What do you mean? My husband couldn't write a check that large. He doesn't have any money of his own. It's all in my name. All right. Put a lantern in the window, lady. I'll need some light. Well, I headed out there fast. But when I raised a racket with a brass knocker, nothing happened. I tried a window, and a couple of scratches later, I was in the hall. The place looked empty like the Rose Bowl on January 2nd. I found Miss Hendricks' room where I talked to her and stepped inside. The decorations were different. This is Regan. I got something for you. It better be good. You're going into overtime. What do you mean? Bring some boys out to the Hendricks place with a wet rag. Somebody blew out Mr. Hendricks' fuse. Well, I backed out of the room and I made it for the bar trying to turn up a bottle. In the corner, something else turned up instead. Another dead body. The turkey Phelps and his buddy had stolen from me. Somebody real eager had done a carving job on it before it was even cooked. They'd torn it apart like they were looking for something. It was morning before the sheriff's boys cleaned up the Hendricks mess and we got back to town. Robinson had a few more questions, but I was still short on the answers. Ballistics had one, though. Same gun did the job on both Miles Standish and Hendricks. That's all. Homicide was getting places in a hurry, like a snail hauling a piano. Well, the lion was waiting for me outside the sheriff's office and he pulled me to the side. His eyes were lit up like a pinball machine and you could tell he'd caught the scent of a greenback. They treat you okay, Regan? Eh, good enough. No rough stuff? Well, nothing that shows, no. Thinking we're in luck. I've been turning up things. We've been playing the wrong horse. Well, that figures you're good at picking losers. Hendricks is a piker, a social climber. He's a dead one. I'll send him flowers. But I'm telling you, he could only write checks for five Gs. With a big bounce. Somebody else in this thing can write bigger ones. Well, let me guess who. Mrs. Hendricks, that's who. Uh, I tell you, Regan, it pays to keep up your connections. How high can she go? The sky is below sea level. What else you got? Standish is a phony moniker. That's grammar school. Real name, Jeffrey Kelly, age 42. He's a wholesale jeweler. He had a little business with Mrs. H. $250,000 worth. That's going to run up his taxes. He can handle it. What did he do for her? I drew a blank, but he deposited her certified check in the bank yesterday morning. Mm-hmm. How does Phelps figure? I don't know. 
Well, who's the little man in the big overcoat? I can't do everything. You gotta do some work, too. Yeah, sure. Now, find Mrs. Hendricks. Offer her the services of international detective at our usual nominal rate. But don't underplay it. Now, get busy. Where are you going? Home to bed. A man's gotta get some sleep. Well, the time was ticking out, but the game wasn't over yet. I figured to have a fast finish, and the lion had a pretty good idea about catching some shut-eye. So I moved for the office and to stretch out on the couch. But through the glass, I could see there was a light on. Company was inside. Crestview 2045. Phelps, no luck. If I looked all over, I... I told you, I tore the place apart. Nothing's here. If I'm trying my best, stop harping. Oh, well, it must be someplace else. Okay, okay, right away. Leave a nickel, Buster. Huh? Oh, Regan. You're looking for something? Yeah. You, Pilgrim. What else? Plymouth Rock. Come on, punk, level it. All right, coax me. All right, Nick, because you've been crying for this. <laughs> now, flatten out. <laughs> well, it felt good to watch the big guy fall. He folded in like a steeple in an earthquake. When his head bounced on the lion's carpet, it figured he was due for a long sleep, so I went through his pockets. Ticket stubs from the prize fights, the gun, and a pocket knife I dumped into the safe. It was a pass to the Don's game on November 25th. He must have swiped that from his boss, so I filed that in the lion's desk for future reference. But this guy Phelps had taken orders from somebody besides Hendricks. I just heard him do it on the phone. So when I turned up an old envelope with 832 North Palm stretched in the back, I crossed my fingers. He'd been calling a Crestview number, and the phone book said that I had a lead... North Palm was in the Crestview Exchange area. So I called for the cops to sweep up Brother Phelps, and I climbed back onto my broomstick. I drove out through Beverly Hills. I wound up in front of a big Spanish house with potted $10 bills on the driveway. There was a new Nash sticking out of the garage, and I walked around to take a look. But honest John had beat me to it. Who's there? Now, stick around. I want to talk to you. Stand back. Stand back. You like cars, don't you? Maybe you want a hot rod. No, you don't. Get away from me. Hey. Well, it was the little turkey fan that I'd last seen in an overcoat. Phelps' buddy. He took out of there like a cow in deer season, so I let him go. No license. Well, I took a look around the car he'd been sniffing, but nothing showed except the registration. It said Mrs. Agnes Hendricks. I went to the house and rang the doorbell, and she answered. Oh, what's you? I... Mr. Regan. All right, I'll ask myself in. Yes, come in. Who are you expecting, John Alden? No, I... I'm glad to see you. That's one thing. I couldn't help it. I, I couldn't wait for you to come all the way to Calabasas. You got impatient on account of a body in the house. You saw him. Yeah, after I tripped over him in your room. I didn't do it. Did I say you did? You've got to believe me. Relax. I look like a jury. You've got multiple vision. Oh, Mr. Regan, I was so frightened. I didn't know which way to turn. We've been through all that woman driver routine. You don't like your husband. You wanted to get rid of him. But only in Reno. All right, now let's get back to page one. You gave 250 Gs to a jeweler named Kelly. You bought a rock. A rock, Plymouth rock. It's a diamond. It's got to be. Well, Why'd you do it? Who'd you buy it for? Myself. My lawyer said I should get it for myself. That's all. He likes you pretty, huh? No, no. It was a community property thing. He said I could keep my husband from knowing how much money I had when he asked for a divorce settlement. Only hubby got wind of the deal. I guess so. Now, you're making sense. Only why did he write a check to Kelly? Well, it was a small one. It must have been for a paste imitation, don't you think? It's not my business. Keep dealing. I mean, maybe he planned on switching them and getting my real one. Uh, that's been done. But he actually did it. Because all through this, there's been a diamond in the place where I always keep it. All right, you got a strong boy, Phelps. Had him out looking for the real diamond. What? And the other guy, the old man, was out in the garage. No. Phelps tore up my office, phoned here to you. Mr. Regan, Now, look, he... there's been two guys killed. Mr. Regan... <laughs> Good evening, Pilgrim. Where's your overcoat? Stand still, please. Yeah, my foot's in a crack. Mr. Regan, this is... This is John Alden. Oh, can it, will you? I've seen him act one part already. That's true. Mine is the only name that's real. This is my house, Mr. Regan. Lawyer? Yes, I came here to see him, Mr. Regan. I just got here before you did. Be did. quiet, Agnes. Well, I got it all now. You won't keep it. Phelps took his orders from you. It's a waste of testimony. You started this. Spotted the gem switch. Figured to cash in. You're losing your chip. Shut up, will you? I got aces. Hendricks outfoxed you. You never found the real diamond. Five in a hand draws blood. Mr. Alden, don't... Now you keep out of this, Agnes. She's not in it. You are. That's all, Regan. All right, come on. Drop it. Come on, drop it. Go over there. I... I guess I hit him with the paste one. Huh? 
Look, the diamond. It, it broke. Yeah. It was just luck. I, I had the other one, too. I thought Alden was honest. I came to tell him I found it in my husband's cider. Well, that tears it. Come on, Priscilla. That docks the Mayflower. <laughs> Well, the whole thing folded in like an elephant on a pogo stick. Yeah, the lawyer did it all right, both of them. When he spotted what Hendricks was up to with that diamond switch, he moved in, but not for his client. The jeweler, Miles Standish, alias Kelly, got bumped because he was the only one who could tell the real diamond from a phony. But Hendricks got wise to the muscle act, and so he got shot. Well, the lion was real happy the way it worked out. That dame with the nerves wrote him a check. So he invited me out to Thanksgiving dinner. He offered me any part of the turkey that I wanted. I told him. But I got it anyway. Jack Webb is featured as Jeff Regan with Herb Butterfield as Anthony J. Lyon. It's CBS at the same time next week for more hard-boiled action and mystery with Jeff Regan, Investigator. Written by Larry Roman and Jackson Gillis. Produced by Sterling Tracy. Featured in tonight's story were Mary Lansing, Marvin Miller, Paul Fries, and Paul Dubuff. Original music for this program is by Milton Charles. Bob Stevenson speaking. CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The National Broadcasting Company wishes to call your attention to a program regularly heard on Monday evenings at 10 p.m. New York time over most of these stations. We invite you now to listen evaluate, and perhaps become a fan of this regularly scheduled Monday night program. Here then, for your approval, is... Night Beat. Hi, this is Randy Stone. I cover the night beat for the Chicago Star. Stories start in many different ways. Tonight's story began when one man tried to destroy another with the strangest weapon of all, darkness. Night Beat, starring Frank Lovejoy and Randy Stone. When your job is to walk into the darkness and discover what makes a city tick, you pick up some mighty strange friends. The winos dreaming of a muscatel paradise and cold, dark doorways. The petty larceny boys with their fast deals. The painted little dames defying the world with their brassy laughter. The homeless and the hopeless. In the city, the night is for the lost. Sometimes you feel a hunger to be with someone of the everyday world. Some nice, well-adjusted soul who's got a reason for waking up tomorrow morning. I guess that's why I dropped in to see Bessie Chatfield tonight. Bessie, a little gray-haired librarian who has charge of a small storefront library on Huron Street. No one around this time of night but Bessie and a young fellow in a gray raincoat alone at a reading table. We haven't seen you, oh, in such a long time. <laughs> well, since Forever Amber, you haven't had the kind of high-type literature that interests me. <laughs> <laughs> and when you finally do drop in, look what time you get here. Ten o'clock. Why would I have to go over and start turning off the light? Oh, I timed it that way so I could get you behind these bookcases away from that fellow at the reading desk. <laughs> I'm afraid your timing is about 35 years off, Mr. Stone. Oh, these light switches. Why do they always put them so high up? Aren't you going to tell that fellow it's time to go home? <laughs> this is the way we tell them. We flick off the lights and then flick them on again. First, off like this. Now, 
Don't do that, no! What? Turn the lights on quick. Let me handle this. What was the idea of doing that, mister? Is that supposed to be smart or something? Oh, now, take it easy, fella. Take or did it he easy. pay you to do it? Is that the deal? Hmm? You tell George Brewster that the game doesn't amuse me anymore. You tell him if he keeps it up, I'll... I'll kill him. I turned the lights out. It's closing time. What? Closing time? Oh. Yes, of course. What's wrong with you, buddy? Are you sick or sick? sick? Yeah, that's me. Sick. Only mine is a... It's a childhood disease. Childhood. Childhood. Now, what in the world was that? Ever seen him before? He's come in a couple of times this week. Spent all his time reading some reference books at the table. Seemed to be such a nice, polite young man. Consider it kindly. Hmm, let's, let's take a look at those books. Oh, my heavens. My heart is beating a mile a minute. And, and, and did you see his face? It frightened me. He was even more scared than we were. Of what? These are the books he was reading? Yes. The Mind in Limbo. Abnormal Psychology. Modern Psychiatry. Why would he want books like this? Maybe he was looking for somebody in these books. Who? Himself, Bessie. Probably himself. Bessie was pretty upset, so after she locked up for the night, I started walking her to the elevated station over on Lake Street. We'd walked a couple of blocks through the dark, empty streets when suddenly Bessie grabbed my arm. Mr. Stone, what? that man down the street, looking into that store window, hmm? that's him. Oh, yes, same gray raincoat, same lad. And look, Mr. Stone, what's that in his hand? It's a piece of pipe or something. He's breaking that store window. Yes, you wait right here, honey. Oh, be careful, Mr. Stone, be careful. The fellow was reaching through the broken window glass for whatever it was that had struck his fancy. He heard me coming and he turned toward me. The wan streetlight did something to his face. It seemed twisted and torn. Blood was running down his hand where the glass had cut him. Then I saw what he'd taken from the window. A gun. What's the idea, pal? He spun around and he started running for the elevator station down the block. And in the best tradition of the Rover boys, I stayed right on his tail. He turned back to see how I was doing and stumbled over a trash can near the curb. I caught up with him, grabbing his arm. Let go of me. Leave me alone. Uh-uh. Let go of me. He slashed the gun across my face and began running again. I stopped long enough to take a quick inventory of my teeth. Up above, I heard the elevator train coming into the station. The young fellow had reached the station steps and was going up fast, trying to make that train. I reached for one of his legs. He turned and gave it to me right in the stomach. I folded up, and I just sat there, listening to the train pull away with the fellow on it, and remembering what Bessie had said about him being such a nice, polite young man. After a while, I began to feel somewhat human again. I notified the police what had happened, and they sent a squad car out. After they left, I remembered something. A name this nice, polite young man had been throwing around. George Brewster. I found a phone book in a cigar store. There were three George Brewsters. The first number didn't answer. I tried the second. Hello? I'd like to speak to George Brewster. Oh, he's not in right now. Any message? Uh, who is this? I'm his sister. Is anything wrong? Well, if this is the right George Brewster, something is wrong. Is there any reason why a young fellow would want to kill your brother? Oh, that would be Morrison. Oh, I warned you. Morrison, huh? Tom Morrison. Where does he live? Uh, our old apartment, 612 Hamlin Avenue. What makes you think he wants to kill George? Well, this character broke into a store tonight and stole a gun. I sort of think he had your brother in mind when he did it. Oh, no. Well, lady, I know what I'm going to do. As fast as I hang up and can get another nickel into this phone, I'm going to call the police. Oh, I feel so bad. It's not really Morrison's fault, poor man. No, no, no. He's just a prince of a fellow. Goodbye, lady. I've got to make that call. But then it turned out I didn't have a nickel. And on the way to the counter for change, I started wondering why the sister of the man he was going to kill felt sorry for Morrison. And why Bessie thought he was such a sweet character. And well, the night was young. 612 Hamlin Avenue couldn't wait, and I could call the cops later. 
612 North Hamlin Avenue was a second floor flat on the north side. I got there a few minutes after 11. All the windows were lit up. I rang the bell and waited. I felt a little bead of sweat zigzagging down my face like it didn't have any place to go. Yes? Oh, it's you? No, let's not close the door just yet. In fact, let's push it open all the way. What do you want? My two front teeth and a few ribs. Get out of here. Now look, pal, don't tempt me. Wait a minute. Now look. I came against my better judgment to listen to what you've got to say. If I leave now, the only place I'm going is the nearest police station. Police station. I guess maybe that would be the best. Hmm? Otherwise, I don't know what's going to happen. Yes, I get it. I guess you better call the police, mister. What do you think you're doing? Calling my bluff? The phone's right behind you. Okay, buddy. You asked for it. You're sure this is the way you want it? Yeah, it's better this way. I'm at the end of my rope. I don't want to kill him. George Brewster? Yes, George Brewster. I know how it'll end if he doesn't stop it. Stop what? You call the police, mister. You'd be doing me a favor. Since when have I got to do you favors? Why aren't you calling? I'm an Eagle Scout in good standing, and I haven't done my good deed for today. Well, you can't help me, whoever you are. Stone is the name. What makes you so sure that I can't? Thanks for even wanting to. After the bad time I gave you. Bad time? That's the understatement of a year. Well, I was panic-stricken. He's got me half crazy. What have you got to lose if you tell me about it? No. Okay. Oh, wait, wait. I don't know. I... I'm like a drowning man grasping at straws. Look, maybe if you talked to Brewster, told him what he's doing to me, maybe... Maybe then he'd leave me alone. Well, you never can tell, but I'd have to know what I'm talking about. Quite a story, mister. These lights... Look at them. Bright as the sun, aren't they? Lamps. Overhead chandeliers. Just look at them. I'd hate to see your light bills. Well, like some men need drugs. That's how I need these lights. Come again? My sanity depends on it. On these My... lights? Yes. You see, it's a sickness. They've even got a name for it. Noctophobia, it's called. It's fear of darkness. Fear of darkness? But that's for kids. It... I'm sorry. Don't they? I quite agree. Kids are neurotic women. But in a man of my age, it's quite ridiculous. Only when the day starts drawing to a close, when the night starts crowding in. Have you been to doctors? Sure, I've been to doctors. They tell me I shouldn't feel too badly. Plenty of people with my trouble. Hangover from childhood, an illness like heart trouble is an illness. I'll take the heart trouble. Maybe you haven't gone to the right kind of doctor. Maybe psychiatry could help you. Nothing is going to help me. George Brewster's going to see to that. What about this Brewster? He's trying to destroy me. <laughs> With the strangest weapon of all. The strangest weapon of all? Yes. His weapon is the night. NBC is bringing you an encore performance of Night Beat, starring Frank Lovejoy as Randy Stone. Before continuing with our story, here is the star of another NBC program, Brian Donlevy. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be listening here with you to Night Beat. This encore performance is NBC's way of introducing you to one of its regularly scheduled Monday night broadcasts. If you're enjoying Night Beat today, why not make it a habit to listen to the series each week in its regular time period? You'll find Night Beat just ahead of my own adventure series, Dangerous Assignment, every Monday. So, if you enjoy adventure and mystery, give a listen to Night Beat and Dangerous Assignment tomorrow night and every Monday night on most of these NBC stations. But now, let's listen again to Randy Stone. With a weird feeling standing in Morrison's brilliantly lighted parlor listening to him tell me about his terror of darkness. A sturdy, healthy-looking man trapped by a childhood nightmare. I felt guilty listening to him like I was eavesdropping into a dark corner of his mind that was nobody's business but his own. And yet he had to tell me because he needed help. Because George Brewster was using Morrison's fear to destroy him. I was sent to Chicago by our company to replace Brewster. 
Until he found out why I was here, he couldn't do enough for me. He even got me this apartment. Oh, greater love hath no man. And then he found out what the setup was, and he changed fast enough. How did he find out about this fear of yours? I'm trying to tell you how. The other night, the two of us were working alone in the big vault down at the office. Working on some old account. And the overhead light blew out. Mm-hmm. Well, it was so sudden, I couldn't help myself. I tried to keep calm, but it's like something tearing me to pieces inside. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't... Finally, I had to run. So he found out about... No, no, I wasn't sure. But it started him thinking. Yeah? The next afternoon, he came over to my desk. He was jovial, friendly, like he'd been in the beginning. Saying we'd been at each other's throats long enough. Inviting me to have dinner with him that night. Right from work, we went to his favorite spot on the north side. It was a place called the Catacombs. I began feeling uneasy the moment I entered. How do you like this place, Tom? That's okay. It's mine. Been a favorite of mine for years. One spot in particular, the wine cellar. Uh, How do you feel about wine? I like it all right. Come on with me. I'm a wine man from way back. Oh, I say, George, I... uh... I wanted to talk to you about that little outburst last night. They have a different wine cellar with a different temperature for each type of wine. I haven't been sleeping very well, you see. Me? Speak. I prefer Riesling myself. Here we are. Huh? Uh, the white wine cellar. We'll select our own brand for our supper. Here, I'll open the door. This is a privilege only an old customer like me can get away with. Come on. Dark down there. That's why they've got this candle here on the ledge. Got a match? I... A match, Tom? Mm, yeah. Here. Okay. Get this candle going. Good. Now, let's go downstairs. George, you think we should do this on our own? Mm, done it hundreds of times. Been coming here for the last ten years. Now, let's go down these stairs. Careful. Uh... I was explaining about last night. Candle casts funny shadows, doesn't it? Notice how cool it is? Twenty feet below street level. Look, I want to talk to you about last night, George. I uh, don't want any misunderstanding. Hmm? It's just that I've been working pretty hard. Look, to see... Tom, would it make you feel any better if you showed me you're not afraid of the dark? Okay. I'll blow out the candle. Just what are you trying to prove, Brewster? Nothing at all. It's your idea. Where are those matches I gave you? You gave me some matches? I must have lost them. It's not going to work, Brewster. I'm not insane, you know. I can stay down here until you're quite Funny, satisfied. Funny, isn't it? About the darkness. The way it seems to close in on you. The way you start thinking you can't breathe. I can see how someone could... What's the matter? This is ridiculous. Something so suffocating about a dark room. Stop it. Stop it. Only the heavy, smothering blackness. Stop it. Where are you going, Tom? Anything wrong? (laughs) Anything wrong? Anything wrong? Anything wrong? Anything wrong? I ran out of that cellar like a scared kid. That was a rotten thing for him to do. Like a kid playing Halloween jokes. He's fighting for his job, Stone. He's not so young anymore, he can't start all over again. So he'll do anything. Great. I'm sure he's told the people down at work. I'm sure they're all laughing at me behind my back. You don't know what that does to me. I can imagine. Today I found a new desk lamp on my desk, courtesy of George Brewster. Every day, something like that. Did you ask him why he's doing it? He won't admit he's doing anything. Says it's all my imagination that maybe I ought to see a doctor, or better still, maybe a change of climate would help. I'd leave town in a minute. Only my future's at stake, too. And before I let him drive me crazy, I'll kill him. Well, I'm going now. I'm going to talk to this bird. Where does he live? Out in the suburbs, Lake Forest. Lives with his sister. All right, I'll give you a ring as soon as I've seen him. I hope you can do some good, Mr. Stone. Yeah. Oh, say. I almost forgot something. What? That gun you made off with. I... Maybe if we're lucky, we can talk the store owner out of pressing charges. I'll try a crazy thing to do. I was so desperate. Wouldn't have done you much good. When they put them in the window, they never loaded. I'll let you in on a secret. If I hadn't known that, I wouldn't have been such a hero coming here tonight. I'll let you in on a secret, Mrs. Stone. You can get bullets without a license. 
The gun's loaded now. <laughs> oh, great. Go and get it for me. All right. Yes, I want to give it to you. It's in my bedroom. He started for the bedroom. It was almost like a comedy routine where, after the big build-up, the punchline comes out right on cue. The moment he entered the other room, every light in the house suddenly went out. What happened to the lights? Take it easy. Now, where's the fuse box? I don't know. I've never had occasion to use it. Besides, if it was the fuse, all the lights wouldn't go out. It wasn't you. Use your head. How could I do it? I'm getting out of here. The hall light's out, too. Stone. Maybe something went wrong with the central wiring. But why should it happen exactly now? Wait. Huh? The downstairs apartment. Their lights are on. If it was the wire... All right, all right. Let's ask them where the fuse box is. Yes? Oh, Mr. Morrison. Uh, my lights went out. It might be a fuse... Where are the fuse boxes for these apartments, do you know? Uh, out in the back. I'll get a flashlight and show them. Hmm, here we are. The fuse box is right here below our meters. And if the people from the light company come out, they have a dickens of a time finding it. Will you hold the flashlight steady? Let me take a look. Wait a minute, Stone. Lower the flashlight just a little. Huh? It's not the fuse. Look at the master switch on my meter. And look at the one of Mrs. Graham's. Why, somebody pulled your switch down to off. Yes. Yes, someone surely did. Oh, here, let me push it up. There. And look upstairs. All your lights are on again. Probably some kids playing a joke. How do you suppose the rascals ever found it? It's so well hidden. Well, I, I have a theory all kids come equipped with special radar for finding things like this. Mrs. Graham, tell this gentleman who used to live in my apartment before I did. Why? Tell him. Why, you know. He even got the apartment for you. Your friend, Mr. Brewster. But what is Tom, that, that doesn't prove he did it. For me, it does, Stone. For me, it does. Morrison went around to the front of his house and up the stairs to his flat. I waited in the hallway until he came down again. He looked different. His face was hard and set. His eyes were like chunks of glass punched into the flesh. What are you waiting for, Stone? Well, when we were so rudely interrupted, you were going for the gun. I've got it now. Oh, yeah. Well, hand it over and I'll bring it back. No, thanks. Well, where are you going and what are you going to do? I'm fighting for my sanity and my life. He's never going to do this to me again. Never. I can't let you do that. You're going to have to. The minute you leave here, I'm going to call every cop in the book. Yes, that's what you do, isn't it? Yeah. And I'd better give you the gun. This could become habit forming. I dropped to my knees in the hallway. And then the hallway subdivided like something under a microscope. And there were two hallways. And then there were four. And then everywhere I looked, there were hallways. Morrison tried to push me aside to get by me. Only it was a whole circle of Morrison's. I grabbed at his legs to hold him back. It was like grabbing at a centipede. And then all the Morrisons and all the hallways brought all their guns down on my one poor head. And that was it, brothers and sisters. That was it. Feeling better, Mr. Stone? Oh, if I felt any better, I'd call the embalmer. Oh, what a business. I heard a commotion and I came out and you were lying here. Is this a head or a cantaloupe? Oh, how did it happen and where's Mr. Morrison? Oh, Morrison, yeah. How long ago did you hear this commotion? Just a couple of minutes ago. Oh, you came out of it real fast. Yeah, an iron constitution. Have you got a phone? Yes, but don't you think you better... Come on, lady, grab my head, put it back on nice and neat, and let's get to that phone. Hello? This is the fellow who called you before, Miss Brewster, about Morrison and your brother. Oh, yes. He's not there yet, huh? No, my brother... I don't mean your brother, I mean Morrison. He... Yes, yes, he sure is. Now, give me your address. The minute you hang up, get away from your house as fast as you can. Morrison's got a gun. He's half crazy. Maybe we should call the police. Maybe we should, but I'm not going to. They'd throw the book at him ten years for attempted murder. I think I can stop him before he does anything. I can't tell you how sorry I am about this. Lady, you and your brother should be. The cab got me out to the Lake Forest house in less than 20 minutes. 
The house was on a hill, and the flagstone path wound round and round for a city block until it reached the front porch. As I ran up the walk, my head started rattling like a handful of pennies in a tin cup. I felt weak and tired. All the time, I tried not to think about what I might find when I reached the house. And now I was at the end of the path, walking toward the front porch. A nerve deep in my throat started jangling like a burglar alarm. The house was in darkness. Morrison was standing beneath a little porch light. His gun pointed right at me. You won't quit, will you, Stone? What have you done with him, Tom? He hasn't done anything with him yet, Mr. Stone. Huh? Ah, who... I'm sitting over here at the end of the porch. I'm George's sister. Oh. I didn't see you in the dark. Why didn't you get away like I told you? you see, I won't hurt her. It's him. He'll be coming along soon. George should never have done what he did. I begged him not to. To take advantage of a man's weakness. Well, Mr. Booster is coming home. What? His car is stopping at the bottom of the hill. Now he's starting the long climb. Morrison, listen you to me. Just it. sit there, the both of you. And I must insist that you be very quiet. Please listen to me. Please. Please. Keep coming up that path, Brewster. It's a long, long way. You must listen to me. Morrison, you waiting near the porch doing. light, the gun in his hand. George hurt you. We shouldn't have done Far that. below the small figure what of George Brewster, so making the long, hurt. slow climb. You're going to kill George because he found out about your fears. But don't you see? George is afraid, too, of being 53. Brewster being had stopped at the first landing to catch his breath. That's now he was climbing he up the you. path again. His back was Maybe to the a hundred wall. steps from he his death. He was fighting for his life. Just I found as you were myself counting the steps. Closer. Why? Why are Closer. you afraid of the dark, Mr. Marston? Don't you see? If you weren't afraid, George couldn't hurt you anymore. Please, listen to me. Keep your voice down. If you try to warn him, you both die too. Keep coming, Brewster. What yes, is there to yes, fear he kept about coming. the darkness? No more than the 70 steps now. The nothing in itself. All it does the is hide the world up in the for a little while. And Brewster getting closer. If you believe Less than in 50 God, steps now. If you believe in your own steps. soul, how can you fear the night? 25. What is there in the darkness that can hurt you? There's such peace in the darkness. After the heat of day is gone, the rush, the tumult, the struggle, you can breathe easy again. You can let the tightness inside unwind. He's almost close enough. Listen to me. Please, listen. It's not going to work, Miss Brewster. I'm going to try and wait. Miss Brewster, stay where you are, Miss... No! You must see me in the light. I tell you, stay where you are. Um, look at her. I didn't realize. I'm not afraid. What right have you to fear? Julie, is that you on the porch? What right have you to fear, Mr. Mar? What right? What a long climb. I must be getting old. What are you doing here, Morrison? And who's this? Oh, don't mind me. I just came along for the ride. What's this all about? I... I just came to... to say goodbye, Brewster. You leaving? Yes. I'm going back and tell them you've done a good job here. But it's not fair to replace you after so many years. You sure nobody scared you away, Morrison? Well, look at him, Brewster. Does he look like he's afraid? I don't know if Julie cured Morrison of his fear of darkness. Cure is a pretty strong word. But maybe she helped. I kind of think so. I do know this. It's going to be mighty hard for Tom to fear the darkness knowing Julie is not afraid. But neither Tom nor I will ever forget what we saw as that porch light lit up her face. Julie Brewster, who did not fear the darkness, was blind. And now that part of the story they always print in heavy type, the moral. And don't smile so indulgently. Morals are very nice things. Some of my best friends have morals. <laughs> Seriously, 
Julie's whole life is a moral in itself. And trying to top it is like trying to follow Al Jolson with a mammy song. The best you can do is tip your hat to the fellow who wrote, Out of the night that covers me, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. He must have had someone like Julie in mind. Four o'clock in the morning, a stale cup of coffee, a tired sandwich, a story to dictate, and I worry about my unconquerable soul. Honey. Copy, boy. Nightbeat, the new dramatic series, stars Frank Lovejoy as Randy Stone. Nightbeat is written by Larry Marcus and directed by Warren Lewis. Music by Frank Worth. David Ellis played Tom. Lorene Tuttle was Ruth. Others in the cast were Charles Seal, Margaret Brayton, and Ruth Parrott. Frank Lovejoy will next be seen in Milton Sperling's production, Rock Bottom, released by Warner Brothers. NBC has presented for your approval a special edition of Night Beat to acquaint you with this regularly scheduled Monday evening program. If you have enjoyed this repeat broadcast, join the millions of listeners who each Monday tune for Adventure in Mystery on the regular Night Beat series. Listen then tomorrow night when again you will hear Frank Lovejoy as Randy Stone in another great action-packed story on Night Beat. Music today, hear Harvest of Stars and American Album on NBC. Listen while the makers of Rexall drug products and 10,000 independent Rexall family druggists bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Evening. This is your Rexall family druggist speaking to you for the 10,000 independent druggists who have made the word Rexall part of our own store names and who recommend and sell the 2,000 or more drug products made by the Rexall Drug Company, like Rexall MI-31, for example, Rexall's popular and versatile mouthwash, gargle, and breath deodorant. Full-strength MI-31 kills contacted germs almost instantly, yet will not harm the delicate membranes of the mouth and throat. Ask for Rexall MI-31 at Rexall drugstores everywhere. And remember, you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Good health to all from Rexall. Now your Rexall family druggist brings you another exciting half hour with Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. I'm a detective agency. When it's murder or less and you're caught in a mess, if you can't pay my fee, my advice is confess. <laughs> Rick, you old son of a gun. <laughs> this is Frank. Frank? Oh, Frank Bowers? Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's good to talk to you again, Rick. How you been? Well, no complaints, Frank. What's with you? Uh, doing great, Rick. Just great. Bought me a half interest in a gym here in town. Yeah? Sell all your fighters? Oh, but one. Boy by the name of Max Farmer. Say, he's going to the main event tonight. You want to catch him? Well, it all depends. Who's throwing him? <laughs> no, Rick, no. This boy's really good. Say, why don't you drop by the arena tonight? Oh, sorry, Frank. I got a date. And she hates the sight of blood. Ah, talk her into it, boy. I'll leave a couple of passes for you at the gate. Uh, passes? Yeah, sure, sure. Well, I'm a sucker for a good argument. See you tonight, Frank. That night, I led Helen to our seats at ringside. She was dressed to kill, and from the look on her face, I thought I might be the first on her list. Rick. Yes, baby? Would you mind telling the man behind me to stop dripping mustard on my mink? Oh, sure, sure, honey. Hey, Buster, please do not feed the animals. That's the good boy. 
Rick, why of all places to fight? But, honey, these are $10 seats. Hey, Ricky, Ricky, glad you could use the passes. Boing. Move your feet, Rockefeller, and let the man in. <laughs> oh, gee, it's good to see you again, Rick. <laughs> say, say, I want you to meet Lorna Thorne. I, uh... Wow. Hanging on to Frank's arm, I saw why boys like girls. She was wearing slightly more than the fighters. Had so many curves, I got seasick just looking at her. As I stared, I suddenly felt a strange sensation in my legs. Helen was digging her heel into my shin. Come up for air, Ricky, dear. Mm. Oh, uh, honey, uh, honey, I want you to meet Frank Bowers. Sally, I know you anywhere. Rick's told me a lot about you. Frank, yeah? that was five years ago. This is Helen. Oops, <laughs> my mistake, huh? <laughs> Lorna, I want you to meet Helen. Hiya. Well, when in Rome... Hiya. What a spot for a thesaurus. Hey, sit over there, will you, honey? I want to sit next to Rick. Oh, Rick, it's a shame I didn't tip you to this fight earlier. You could have put some dough on my boy and really cleaned up. Uh, you think he'll win, huh? No, I know he'll win. He's fighting Lou Scott, strictly a bum from upstate. The syndicate made the match just to build up Farmer's name and pick up some easy dough on the side. Now he tells me. <laughs> there. There's my boy getting in the ring now. I watched Max Farmer climb through the ropes, stop, smile at the television cameras, then at the crowd, and then at the cameras again. If the people at home thought they were seeing a reissue of The Hairy Ape, then television had improved. Because that's exactly how Max looked. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your main event. Ten rounds of boxing. In the white corner, wearing black trunks, Weighing 175 and hailing from Buffalo, Lou Scott! And in the black corner, wearing purple trunks, weighing 179 and right from our own New York City, Max Farmer! The boys met in the center of the ring, received some fatherly advice from the referee, shook gloves, and went back to their corners. Okay, Max! Okay, our boy, do it! Go on, get him! Get him! Well, Frank was right. It certainly was a pushover. Two minutes later, the fight was seven counts from being over. Only it wasn't Lou Scott who was fast asleep on the canvas. The sleeping beauty was Frank's boy, Max Farmer. Max! Max, get up! Max, please, come on! Shut up! Max! Hey! Max, get up! No! Get up, you bum! Hey! Don't you teach your fighters to duck, Frank? Oh, I don't understand it. It's all wrong, Rick. Rick, how can that man sleep up there with all this noise? Oh, Helen. Just call me, Sal. Now can we go home? Sure, baby. Rick, Rick, uh, stick around, uh, will you? I may have a job for you. Oh? Yeah, yeah. Look, I'm going down to the dressing room. Meet me there in ten minutes. Come on, Lorna. From the look on Frank's face, I could tell he was worried. So I took Helen outside and put her in a cab. She was a good sport about going home alone, though. Didn't say a word. Not even goodbye. Then I went back inside and made my way to Farmer's dressing room. Come on, come on. Inside, I could hear Frank's angry on, voice. All right. All right, so you won't tell me who. But you ain't gonna get away with the snacks. I'll find out, and when I do, you'll be back there. Frank! I'll be right out, Rick. And remember this, you bum... We're through, see? Through! Uh, hello, Rick. Aren't you a little tough on the guy just for losing a fight? Farmer lost that fight before he ever got into the ring. It was fixed. Well, that's strong talk, Frank. Got anything to back it up? Look, I know this boy. I trained him myself. He could have won tonight's fight with his eyes shut. Somebody paid him to take a dive. Maybe it was his own idea. Uh, Max, don't get ideas. He's too dumb. Whew. Rick. Rick, I want you to find out who is behind this fix. Well, you make it sound simple. Got any leads? Maybe. Drop by the gym the first thing in the morning and we'll start from there. First thing next morning, I went down to Frank's gym. They say the early bird gets the worm, and I guess it's true. For standing right inside the door was none other than Sergeant Otis. Pride and joy of the 5th Precinct. Uh, pardon me, but aren't you Jack Dempsey? Uh, no, my name is... Uh... Oh, Diamond, you here? Very observant, Otis. You're improving. Learn to blow a whistle yet? Oh, why do I always have to run into you? Aren't you afraid to be out without your keeper? Where's Walt? 
Frank, what are you doing here? Oh, hi, Walt. Hi. Well, I've got a client here. What's your excuse? Routine check on a suicide. Guy by the name of Frank Bowers leaped from the Brooklyn Bridge. What? Frank Bowers? Yeah, know him. Yeah. Well, are you sure about this? It's open and shot. Three witnesses saw him do it. We pulled his body out of the river this morning. Oh, I can't believe it. Frank had no reason to kill himself. I was with him all last evening. That's a good reason. Shut up, old yes. Sorry, Rick, but these things happen. No, not to guys like Frank. He was no quitter. You sure about those witnesses? They're ordinary citizens, Rick. We took their statements this morning. That still sounds phony, Walt. Look, Rick, I know it's hard to believe a friend would take the easy way out, but in this case, it's a fact. Walt, Frank was a good friend. And before I believe he killed himself, someone's got to convince me. All right, all right. Otis, drive Diamond out to those witnesses' homes. I'll walk back to the office. Oh, Lieutenant, why do you always pick on me? Fate, Otis. Don't fight it. It's bigger than us. Come on. Otis drove like a madman, which was strictly in character. The first witness, a butcher named Henry Burton, was at work. But the butcher's wife, a typical homemaker, gave us her version of Frank's death. And just like I told the police, off went the overcoat and over he went. Oh, it was awful. The woman trembled, Otis gloated, and I grabbed my hat. Her husband worked at a nearby market and their stories checked. That took care of the first two witnesses. Then we drove to the home of Bill Voss, the third and final witness. Well, uh, I was coming home from a late movie and I started across the Manhattan approach to the bridge. Uh, this guy, uh, Bowers, was about ten yards in front of me. I was foggy, and I couldn't see him very well. But I could make him out when he stopped. He threw off his top coat, climbed the guardrail, and dived in. I, I yelled, but it was too late. Uh, I'm the one who called the police. The story's all checked. But I still wasn't convinced. So I had Otis drop me off at Frank's gym. If Frank did kill himself, then there had to be a reason. I decided to check on Frank's partner, one Ben Lamb. I found him in his office. It's too bad about Frank. Lamb, what about the business here? Any trouble that might explain why Frank did it? No, everything's running smoothly here. Of course, it was last night's fight, but... Ah, that's out of the question. Well, then maybe it's an answer. Keep talking. Well, the syndicate is looking for whoever fixed last night's fight. Uh, they play kind of rough when they're mad. And, well, maybe Frank was afraid of what they might do to him. Huh? You mean he'd kill himself just to save them a bullet? Yeah, that's false economy. It's just the thought. Forget it. I have. But I take it you think Frank was behind the fix. I didn't say that. But Farmer couldn't plan it himself. He's too dumb. And Frank was too smart. I said it just a thought. That you may be partly right. Maybe Frank's death does have something to do with last night's fight. Is Max Farmer around? I saw him outside earlier. Thanks. Now, uh, Mr. Diamond, might I ask what makes you so interested in Frank's suicide? Was it suicide, Mr. Lamb? Well, wasn't it suicide? I ask you first. See you around, Lamb. Before we continue with the adventures of Richard Diamond, private detective, here's your Rexall family druggist. Last week, a customer told me that... Something I really like about Rexall Milk of Magnesia is that one bottle won't be so thick I can't even pour it, and the next one thin and watery. Somehow, Rexall Milk of Magnesia always seems to be just right. Well, ma'am, that's because every bottle of Rexall Milk of Magnesia has to meet an exacting standard of viscosity or it won't wear the Rexall label. What do you mean by viscosity? Well, an easy definition would be the degree of thickness in the liquid. Now, Rexall scientists conduct scientifically precise tests on every batch of Rexall Milk of Magnesia to make sure it meets this constant standard of viscosity because that's one big reason why you'll always get a uniform dosage from every bottle. Oh, and I thought it was all just an accident. Oh, no, ma'am. There are no accidents behind the fact you can always depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. And now back to tonight's adventure with Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. <laughs> the center of Frank's gymnasium, certain that Frank's supposed suicide had something to do with last night's fight. 
But how? That was the jackpot question. In one corner of the gym, I saw Max Farmer hitting a punching bag with a methodical, monotonous rhythm. I walked over to him. Max? Yeah? My name is Diamond. Yeah? I was a friend of Frank Bowers. Yeah? Well, if you can spare any more words, I'd like to ask you a question. Look, if it's about last night, forget it, see? I don't know nothing about nothing. No argument there, but I came to see you about boxing. Huh? I don't get you. Well, Frank always said you were one of the best, and I thought you could give me a few pointers. Oh, you, uh, you a fighter? No, no, no. I just like to show off at the Y. You know how it is. Oh, sure, sure. Well, you get some trunks from the shower boy and we'll go with you. You can learn plenty from me. Good, Max. That's just what I'm hoping to learn. Plenty. The shower boys gave me a pair of gloves and purple trunks. I felt like a self-conscious tulip as I entered the ring, but Max seemed quite impressed. Hey, you got a pretty good bill. I also go steady. You all set? Yeah, I'm ready. Put them up. No, not above your head. Max, we come from different environments. Okay, let's go. <laughs> hey, you're, you're not bad. Uh, just just lucky. Hey, wait till I tell my friends that, that I box with the Max Farmer. Yeah, they like that, huh? Like it? I'll be a hero. After all, Max, you've never lost a fight. Oh, oh, I, I, I forgot last night. Sorry. Oh, uh, don't no, think nothing about that fight. I'll be up there again. You'll see. Oh, no doubt. Hey, 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 wait a minute, wait. Let, let's take a break. I, I'm winded. Okay. Whew. You know, you, you, you fighters have a lot of perseverance. Huh? Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, that's what we got, all right, uh, what guess... you said. I guess good athletes are just born, huh? Not made. Buddy, that's the truth. You know, I've been in sports since grade school. Uh, still at it? What, sports? Uh, skip it. I bet you were good even then, Max. Oh, boy, was I. I played football in high school. Made all state. Weren't always a boxer, huh? No, no, I've done everything. Hey, tell me, tell me. What's the greatest exhibition of sports in the world? Go on now, go on, Think. Uh, Shriners Convention? Shriners? Ah, uh, nah. The, the Olympics. And I was in them, too. Would have won, but Marshall Wang beat me on points. My, my. Would I have a lot to tell my friends. You know, there's just one other fighter I'd like to brag about sparring with. That's Lou Scott. Lou What? That Scott's a bum. I could whip him with my eyes shut. Oh? I heard that's how you lost. Look, forget about last night. That fight was... Fi- uh, go on, Max. Uh, yeah, I had a headache last night, that's all. Now I gotta take a shower. See you around. It was the first time I'd ever gone fishing in a boxing ring. I was hoping to find out who was behind the fix. That might throw some light on Frank's death. But to coin an old phrase, the big one got away. Next on my list was the girl Frank was with at the fight. Lorna Thorne. She danced at the Silver Circle, a small nightclub not far from the gym. I went backstage, climbed the iron stairs, and found her room. Just a sec. Well, Mr. Diamond. Hello, Miss Thorne. Sit down. Care for a drink? It all depends. Are we drowning our sorrow or celebrating? I don't get you. Well, you don't seem too upset about Frank. Oh, that. I'm not the type to cry, honey. Ruins mascara. Oh, don't get me wrong. I liked Frank. Liked him a lot, but we were both in it just for the last. Mm-hmm. Tommy, did Frank come up here after he left the arena? Yeah. He came up and we talked till it was time for my number. He left about midnight. Did he seem upset? Now that you mention it, he did. Lorna, uh, how well do you know Ben Lamb? Only seen him around. Why? Well, Lamb thinks Frank might have been behind a fixed fight. Hmm, could be. He sure was nervous. Mm, I see. You and Lamb didn't compare stories by any chance? I told you, I've only seen him around. Uh-huh. Hey, this is a nice mink coat. Been saving unemployment checks? I'm a working gal, remember? Oh, come now, honey. You don't earn enough here to buy this kind of coat. I'm a bookie on the side. Hmm. Pedersen's Furrier's on the label. That's real richy, kid. Thanks. Now I gotta change. Okay. Oh, don't run off. I'll only be a minute. Uh, some other time, honey. Suit yourself. I'll be around. I'll bet you will.
I went back to my office, locked the door, put my ox buds up on my dusty desk and tried to think. There was no logical motive for suicide, but there was plenty for murder. Lamb would inherit Frank's half of the business. Farmer might have been afraid Frank would blackball him with other managers. And Lorna was the type who would do anything for a fast buck. But then there was that constant headache, the three witnesses. My thoughts were all jumbled up. I kept trying to remember everything that had been said today. I kept hearing voices in a jumbled sequence. Yeah, the syndicate plays rough. Frank may have been afraid. Why well, I've been in sports since grade school. It's an open and shut case, Rick. You're a hard man to convince, Shamus. Then over he went. Oh, it was awful. Frank behind it? Yeah, it was only a plot, damn it. I'm not the type to cry, honey. It ruins mascara. Then he climbed the rail and dived in. I don't want to only marshal away and beat me on points. Climbed the rail and dived in. Marshal away and beat me. Marshal away. Wayne! Then he dived in. Dived in. Dived. Dived. I had it. I knew how Frank was killed. Hello? Mr. Diamond, this is Francis. It was Helen's butler calling to invite me to dinner that evening. He said something about Helen expecting me, but I wasn't listening. I kept hearing that witness say Frank dived in. It was the answer to the whole thing. Mr. Diamond, sir, are you listening? Francis, Francis, if you were going to commit suicide... Sure, I beg your pardon, sir. Look, if you were going to kill yourself from the Brooklyn Bridge, what would you do? Oh, dear, I'd reconsider. No, 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 Francis. If you really were, would you jump or would you dive? Why, uh, I'd probably jump, sir. Yes, I, I'm sure I would. Well, of course. It's a natural thing to do. See you later, Francis. The pieces began to fall into place. I remembered something Max Farmer had said earlier. Marshall Wayne had beaten him on points. Marshall Wayne. I had associated that name with boxing, but now... I checked in the sports almanac... Listed under the 36 Olympics, I found Marshall Wayne won the high diving competition that year. And Max had competed with him. Now I was certain. First, I put in a call to Federson's Furriers for some information. So far, so good. Then I called Walt and told him to meet me at the gym. It was closing time when I got there and most of the fighters were leaving. But I caught sight of Max Farmer as he made his way out of the showers. How's the water, Max? Huh? Diamond. What's the matter? You don't look happy to see me. What are you doing here? The boys at the Y, remember? I came for some more pointers. It's closing time. Oh, that's too bad. That's the only reason you don't want to spend some time with me, huh? Yeah, yeah. You, uh, you're not too tired. Me? I'm never tired. They're just closing up, that's all. Well, Max, old pal, I've got good news for you. I fixed it with lamb for me to lock up when we're finished. Huh? Well, I... Not, uh, scared by any chance. Me scared of you? Why? Get some trunks. You'll see who's scared. I wondered if my Blue Cross plan was still in effect as I changed clothes and followed Max out to the ring in the middle of the deserted gymnasium. Max had an ugly scowl on his face, and I knew that this time he would pull no punches. Ouch. Hey, playing rough, eh, pal? You got a lousy guard. That's all. Uh, hi. You act nervous. Tired of boxing? Maybe you'd rather be swimming, huh? Uh, huh? Oops, sorry. Now your guard is down. Of course, a, a born athlete like you would be happy doing anything in the way of sports, I suppose. Maybe even diving. Uh, your guard, pal, your guard. You... You don't make sense. No, I think so. Your mind's wandering, Max. Keep your guard up. You know, for a real sport, like, say, high diving, there's really no place around here to practice. Unless, of course, you tried the Brooklyn Bridge. I'll bet a really good diver could make it from the Manhattan approach without a scratch. Now, listen, what's the... The guard, Samson. Better watch it. Hold it a minute, hold it a minute. What's the big idea? Well, the big idea came when I figured out how three witnesses could see a suicide that wasn't a suicide. You're a loony. Am I? 
Those witnesses didn't see Frank because he was already in the river. You had pushed him in. You waited for some people to show up, and then you dived in. No. Yes, Max, yes. But you weren't alone in this. Someone had to talk you into taking a dive in the fight and a different kind later on. You'd have thrown the fight for any man's money, but you'd only risk your neck for a particular species. Female. Men are funny that way. It ain't true. It ain't true. Max, Max, Lorna confessed an hour ago. What? I'll kill you for this. That's your third and final dive, Max. That's a nice right cross, Rick. Oh, I seen better. Ah, oh, the little boys in blue. About time. Walt, when Joe Palooka here wakes up, I think he'll confess. He believes the girl already did. Yeah, so I heard. Rick, how did you figure her in this mess? Well, like most females, she couldn't wait for a mink coat. According to Fetterson's furrier, she bought an expensive coat the day after the fight. Paid cash for it. <laughs> These amateur criminals. Yeah, someone had to be the brains behind Max's action, so I put two and two together and got two. Max and Lorna. Yeah. Otis, go pick up Lorna Thorne. Well, stop fixing your tie and move. Oh, let him alone, Walt. First date he's had in years. What is it? Do you have to play so loud? Well, I can't help it, baby. It's the brute in me. Mm Mm-hmm. And that shiner, darling. What happened? Client or doorknob? Young lady, I have been boxing. Just call me Kid Diamond, please. Oh, no. Boxing? You? Well, why not? It's so strenuous. Well, (laughs) I'm in fair shape. What do you use for muscles? You just put up your dukes and I'll show you. All righty. Now get up and sing. I'm young and healthy, and you've got charm. It'd really be a sin not to have you in my eye. I'm young and healthy, and so you. When the moon is in the sky, tell me what am I to do? If I could hate you. I'd keep away, but that ain't my nature. I'm full of vitamin A. I'm young and healthy, so let's be bold. In a year or two or three, maybe we will be too old. If I could hate you, I'd keep away. But that ain't my nature. I'm full of vitamin A. Ooh, I'm young and healthy. So let's be bold. In a year or two or three, maybe we will be too old. Rick, I'm sorry I hit you so hard, but you're such a show off. Now, look, honey, you got the wrong idea about this whole. Uh, uh, begging your pardon, Mr. Diamond, sir, but I just wanted to tell you. That I've changed my mind. I would dive off the bridge. What, Francis? You see, I've always been afraid to dive and... Well, it would be fun just at once. Oh, no. Again, here's your Rexall family druggist. Whenever you have a headache, remember this about Rexol aspirin. When taken with water, the five full grains of pure aspirin in every Rexol tablet are ready to go to work for you even before they reach your stomach. So whenever you have a headache, remember that about Rexol aspirin. Ask for it at Rexol drugstores everywhere. And remember always, you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexol. Good health to all from Rexol.
Richard Diamond, Private Detective, stars Dick Powell in the title role and is written by Richard Carr and Marvin Marks with music composed and conducted by Frank Worth. Featured in tonight's cast were Virginia Gregg, Ted DeCorsia, Wilms Herbert, D. Tatum, Wally Mayer, Howard McNear, Hi Aberback, and Jay Novello. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, is produced and directed by Jaime Del Valle. This is Bill Foreman inviting you to be with us next Wednesday at this time when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Hiya, beautiful. Get lost, bristle puss. You need a shave. But I have shaved. What else do you want me to do? Silly boy, she wants you to go stag. Go stag? But why? Because stag is Rexall's exclusive line of men's good grooming aids, like stag brushless shave cream. No fuss, no massage, just smooth it on and presto, you get a clean, close shave. Your face stays smooth and whiskerless all day long. I'll do it, I'll do it, I'll go stag. That's it. Join the stag line now at Rexall drugstores everywhere. Yes, to make girls care. Go stag. This is NBC, the National Broadcasting Company. Listen while the makers of Rexall drug products and 10,000 independent Rexall family druggists bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, private detective. Good evening. This is your Rexall family druggist speaking to you for the 10,000 independent druggists who have made the word Rexall part of our own store names. We've done that because we recommend and sell the 2,000 or more drug products made by the Rexall Drug Company. Like Plenamins, for example, Rexall's famous multivitamin capsules. Two Plenamins a day give you more than your daily minimum requirement of every vitamin for which such requirements have been established, plus valuable liver concentrate and iron. What's more, Plenamins cost you only pennies per day. Ask for Plenamins at Rexall drugstores everywhere. And remember, you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Good health to all from Rexall. Now your Rexall family druggist brings you a transcribed half hour with Richard Diamond, private detective, starring Dick Powell. I'm a detective agency. We trail them, we nail them. If they're guilty, we jail them. No charge for poetry. Oh, no. Edgar Guest with a shoulder holster. Hello, Helen, baby. Rick, guess what's in town? Unless I win something, I give up. The carnival. Well, is the balloon concession tied up yet? Oh, Rick, I'm serious. I haven't been to a carnival since I was little. Let's go tonight. You mean peanuts, popcorn, cracker jacks, and all that? Yes. Sounds awful. Oh, now, Rick. Uh, okay, honey. I'll be around at eight. Shall I wear my knickers? Rick. Bye. That night, I picked up Helen, and we went to the carnival. There were more people on the midway than Rexall has stores, and we got pushed so much, I felt like the tax bill in Congress. Helen decided she wanted a Cupid doll, so we stopped at the shooting gallery. That's pretty good shooting. Think nothing of it. Just three more bullseyes and you win a dial. Well, here's your dial. Where'd you ever learn to shoot like that? At the skeet club. Would you like to try a shot, Rick? Uh, no thanks. Come on. Oh, Rick, isn't this doll cute? I... And now, to your amazement and proof of my statement, I'll ask him to step out here. And here he is, ladies and gentlemen, the one and only Samson, the strong man. Step right up, folks. He'll thrill you with his amazing feats of strength. 
Now crowd right in. Don't be shocked. There is no... Standing on the platform with the biggest collection of muscles I'd ever seen. Samson looks like an overgrown orangutan. And at least three tigers had contributed their all to the loincloth he wore around his middle. Samson, the great. And now our sensational offer. One hundred dollars to any man who will step up here and defy the mighty Samson to put him to sleep by squeezing his chest. Now it is harmless, my friends. And if any one of you daring gentlemen think the mighty one cannot put you to sleep with a mere squeeze, then step right up. If Samson fails, then one hundred dollars is yours. Well, Rick. Now I tell you, friends. Well, Rick, what? Don't you want to show off? Not my insides. Rick, you mean you're afraid just to let him squeeze you? you Honey, I'm afraid to let him breathe on me. Come on, let's go see that fortune teller. I steered Helen toward the next booth before she could talk me into anything my bones would regret tomorrow. The sign outside the tent read, Madam Tanya, your past, your present, your future. And inside, we found Madam T staring intently into a crystal ball. She wore gypsy clothes and a heavy makeup that covered what might have been very lovely features. Welcome to the inner sanctum. Hmm. Haven't I heard you on the radio? She didn't crack a smile, and I didn't exactly blame her. She motioned us into chairs around the crystal. The room was decorated in about the same motif as the tattooed lady, and would have impressed a man with a bad case of DTs. Madame Tanya went back to staring at the crystal, so I followed suit. I couldn't see a thing in the glass ball, but then maybe she picked up television on clear night. The crystal grows dim. Ah, I can see that you are both very much in love. Well, go on. It is good. This man adores you. He worships you. He idolizes you. Wake me up when I propose. You are an unbeliever? Oh, let's be modern. I'm a cynic. The crystal does not lie. But to make certain, I will consult the cards. She picked up a deck that was too big for poker and too small for canasta. I should pay to watch a girl play solitaire. I nudged Helen. We were about to leave when a tall, thin young man pushed back the canvas flap and walked in. Hey, Tony, I just... Oh, I didn't know you were busy. Excuse me. The boy pushed back the flap to go out and then made a sharp, gurgling noise in his throat. He doubled with pain and fell to the floor. Even from where I was sitting, I could see the big, ugly bullet hole in his chest. Bruce! Don't scream. We'll have the whole crowd in here. Stand back, Helen. Is he hurt bad? You don't need a crystal ball for this, honey. He's dead. Even under the heavy makeup, I could see her face turn pale. I sent Helen to call the police, and then I looked around outside. The killer had either used a silencer, or else the shot was not heard in the confusion. Twenty minutes later, Lieutenant Max Talbert arrived, followed by Sergeant Otis, wearing his Hopalong Cassidy badge. Hi, Rick. Well, hello, Max. Where's Walt Levinson? He's on vacation, Rick. I've taken over his cases. Also, his problems, I see. Hello, Otis. Hi, Shamus. So there's been another murder, huh? And you just happened to be here. Sounds suspicious to me. Otis, why don't you stick your head through a piece of canvas and let people throw baseballs at it? And get my brains knocked out? Oh, no. Why not? You got nothing to lose. Rick, uh, Miss Asher told me over the phone what happened. It sounds like we'll be looking for a needle in a haystack. You want to work on the case with us? Not particularly. I just happen to be here, that's all. Yeah, I still think that's awful funny. Otis, I'll send you my confession in the morning. So long, Max. It's not that I wasn't interested in the case, I was. But in my business, you can't poke your head into murder on a gratis basis. So I took Helen home. The next morning, I went to my office as usual, and then around 10 o'clock, I had a visitor. Mr. Diamond, I need your help. Well, thank my lucky stars. Sit down. Thank you. She looked like a well-dressed Lady Godiva, minus horse. I stifled a drool as she sat down, and then I realized that I'd seen her before. This was Madame Tanya, minus the heavy makeup, gypsy garb, and the phony accent. It's about last night's murder. You see, it's not the first. Four men have been killed within a year. And all because of me. Go on. My real name is Tony Lawrence. About a year ago, a boy I knew asked me for a date, and we went out. Next day, he was killed. There were two more after that who showed an interest in me. They both died, too. It's getting so every time a man looks at me twice, he's murdered. Well, it's a pleasant way to die. But uh, what about this kid last night? Well, he, 
He'd asked me for a date at a small party we had after the show one night. He worked in the show, but I hardly even knew him. I see. Did you tell Lieutenant Talbert all this? Oh, yes. He says he'll have to make a systematic check on everyone on the show. That could take months. Yes, it could. Talbert's a good cop, though. Why'd you come to me? I want you to go back to the lot with me. I'll arrange to get you a job there. Honey, I got a job. I'm a private detective. Oh, I know. I'll pay you what you ask. Oh, well, uh, that uh, understanding will just continue. Well, maybe working undercover, you'll be able to find out who's behind all this. Well, I, uh... Oh, I'm sure it'll work. I'll get you a job as Barker for the girl show. Mm. You know, I've always wanted to run away with the girl show. We drove back to the carnival, and I became Rick Diamond Boy Spieler. The kid who was murdered last night had asked Tony for a date at a small party. There were only three other people at that party, and it seemed logical that one of them was the killer. First on the party list was Chuckles, the clown. Tony took me over to his trailer. Here we are. I think you'll like Chuckles. He's got a great sense of humor. Well, Tony, come on in. Can't stay long, Chuckles. I want you to meet Rick Diamond. He's the new Barker on the girls' show, and the boss wants me to introduce him to everyone. Well, any friend of Tony's is a friend of mine. Glad to know you, Rick. Yeah. How are you, Chuckles? Yeah, oh, just fine. <laughs> so you got the job at the Shakers, huh? You ever bark before? Only at pet shows. Oh, well, you'll do a good business over there. All the old fogies go to see Karen. She's the head shaker. Is that all she shakes? <laughs> hey, hey, that's pretty good. Put some gags in your pitch. The crowd eats it up. We'd better go, Rick. You start to work soon. Yeah, well, drop around any time, huh? <laughs> Number two on the suspect list was Samson, the strong man. I remembered him from last night and took a last look at my fingers as we shook hands. Glad to meet you. Do you wrestle? No, but I'm a demon with jacks. Oh, I can't find no one around here to play with. Oh, you poor kid. Have you tried the lion cage? Rick's going to pitch the girl show, Samson. Oh, poor, that's no fun. Hey, look, kid, you work out with me, and someday you can be a strong man, too. Well, that's a tempting offer, but I'm afraid I'm just a natural-born sissy. Well, if you change your mind, come around and... And uh, you'll change my posture, I know. Glad to have met you, Samson. So long. Playful little character. He's really very nice. Hey, let's stop here for a hot dog. Good. My favorite meal. Give the man a cooked one, Maisie. You think, Tony? Uh, loaded with onions, honey. No date tonight. Aren't you hungry, Tony? Uh-uh. I've got to change for my act soon. Tell me, uh, how did a pretty girl like you get tied down to a crystal ball? Oh, I don't know. I grew up on shows. Mom and Dad were wire walkers. Well, I don't like high places, so I decided to be an actress. Mm-hmm. Well, after a few feeble stage attempts, I came back here. Now you do your acting in a tent. That's right. But these murders aren't solved soon. I'll be on the move again. Those, uh, those two characters we just met, you think one of them might be the killer? Gee, I don't know. They've always been friendly with me, but... Well, they did overhear that boy ask me for the date. Karen was there, too. Oh, yes, uh, the shaker, as Chuckles put it. You'll probably meet her later on. She's always quick to discover a new man. Well, I can hardly wait. Say, I'd better get back. I'll see you after the show tonight. You are, mister. It's got enough onions to keep you out of circulation for a week. Tony walked away, stopped, turned, and gave me a smile that made me feel warmer than the hot dog I began munching. She was a very pretty girl. Pretty enough for someone to kill any man she got interested in. And that someone was either a clown, a strong man, or a hula dancer. Yeah, it was quite a mess, and here I was in the middle of it. But as P.T. Barnum always said, as a sucker born every minute... Before we continue with the adventures of Richard Diamond, private detective, here's your Rexall family druggist. Whenever you develop a simple headache, what's the first thing you think of for fast relief? Why, aspirin, of course. Right. But it's also smart to think one step further and choose Rexall aspirin. <laughs> Give me three good reasons why. Okay. First, every Rexall aspirin tablet contains five full grains of pure aspirin. Second... There is no faster-acting aspirin made. What do you mean by that? I mean that when taken with water, a Rexall aspirin tablet is ready to go to work for you even before it reaches your stomach. 
sounds swell so far. What's the third reason? Just this. In the economy size 200 tablet bottle, Rexall aspirin costs you little more than three tenths of a cent per tablet. That I'll remember. And remember this also. You can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. And now back to tonight's adventure with Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Hurry, hurry, hurry. Step right up and see Karen and her friend. Come on, boys, don't be bashful. Put your wives on the Ferris wheel drawn in. Get away from me, son. You bother me. Only one-tenth of a dollar plus 15 cents in your old set. You'll see Karen at the Blonde Bombshell. That night, I yelled my head off. The crowd was heavy and the men poured into the tent until there was panting room only. I looked at my watch and saw that I had four more hours to go. So I warned my tonsils and kept right at it. My mistake, Mr. Go on in. Four hours later, I felt like a politician and had a voice like Andy Devine. Tony met me after the crowds had left and we had a Coke. Tired. Tired? Me? No, no. 37 hours sleep and I'll be as good as new. <laughs> You'll get used to it. Oh, do I have to? I thought the girls' show would be great, but they're inside. I'm outside. Well, you'll meet Karen soon. Ah, uh, that's some consolation. Now, I'm saying, while I think of it, maybe we'd better not be seen together so much. I've got a great affection for life. Yeah, I've thought of that. You'd better go on from here alone. But, Ricky, be careful. I gave her my for you I will look, and then she left. I had been assigned a bunk in one of the trailers and was about to head toward it when something grabbed my arm. At first, I thought one of the snakes had left the charmer's neck. But this one had long blonde hair. Hi. My name's Karen. You got a match? I'd heard the match line in a movie, but what this gal carried around could never pass the censor board. I'd been singing her praises all evening, and now I could see that I'd been guilty of understatement. Thanks. Oh, that's all right. I'm loaded with them. <laughs> hey, you're cute. The last guy had a lousy voice, but you're cute. What's your name? Diamond. You can call me Rick. You want to buy me a Coke? Sure. Well, never mind. I just wanted to see if you wanted to. Well... Any more party games up your sleeve? Oh, sure. Lots more. Uh, I've seen you with Tony. You like her? Well, shouldn't I? Mm, I don't know. Only the way things have been happening, it ain't so healthy. Yeah, so I heard. You like her? She's all right. Burns me, though. She makes more dough than I do, and she's strictly no talent. She just makes up them stories. Now, me, I give the boys the money's worth. Well, uh, I bet you do. You know, I bet we get along real swell, you and me. Well, I I hope we do. You know, there's nothing but jerks around here. You look sort of like a gentleman. Sorry, I'm, uh, I'm just tired. Oh, I like it. You, uh, want to take me into town and go dancing? Well, I'm all worn out tonight. Oh, but... I don't really want to go. Just want to know if you'd like to take me. Oh, we're back at that. Yes, I would like to take you. Good. Oh, gee, it's a nice night for a walk. Oh, would you like... Uh, let's not go around again. <laughs> Say, you're awful cute. Good night. That night, I went to bed with a lot on my mind and an ice pack around my neck. I was after a murderer who left no clues. The only apparent motive was to keep men away from Tony. Chuckles or Samson? Maybe they were in love with Tony. On the other hand, Karen might be jealous enough of Tony to commit murder. I didn't count sheep that night, just characters. Next morning, while I was roaming around the carnival grounds, I found Chuckles sitting on the steps of his trailer, sewing a bright-colored costume. Well. Hi there. Sit down. Uh, thanks. Hey, you're pretty handy with that needle. Oh, you gotta be. How did it go last night? Well, I'm a little better, but I'm in no condition for a cigarette test. <laughs> I'm glad I don't have to yell my lungs out every night. I just stand around and let people laugh at me. I have a friend named Otis who does the very same thing. Say, you should have been around yesterday if you like excitement. Guy was murdered. Oh? 
What happened? Somebody shot him. Seems like the only reason was because he liked Tony. You mean the girl who showed me around yesterday? Yeah, that's her. Oh, I guess not many guys give her the eye. No. <laughs> yeah, there's one fellow that kind of likes her, though. A guy by the name of Leonardi. Oh? Yeah, he don't work here no more. He's on another show. Tony and him write a lot, though. I'm always mailing letters for him. Well, maybe they're just friends. Yeah, that's what she says. He worked on this show before I came over here. I don't really know him, but I bet there's something between those two. Maybe he's the one behind all this. Could be. Well, it's not good to poke your nose into other people's business. You're telling me. Well, I guess I'll look over the show. Yeah, well, drop around any time. <laughs> I left Chuckles and wandered on up the midway. About half past the merry-go-round, I ran into Karen, the curve cram kid. Hi, handsome. Hi, yourself. You know, I dreamed about you last night. You do wonders for my ego. Mm, you do wonders for my dream. Uh, care if I walk along with you? Not at all. Uh, Karen, do you know a guy named Leonardi? Oh, sure. Used to work here. Why, why do you ask? Well, I've heard he might be interested in Tony. That's risky business, you know. Tony and Leonardi? Oh, no. Now, somebody's pulling your leg. Oh, why Rick, I've been looking... Oh, I didn't know you had company. Hello, Karen. Hi. I... I just thought I'd see if you were getting along all right, Rick. He's in good hands. That's all a matter of opinion, dear. Uh, look, why don't you girls amuse yourselves while I make a phone call? Karen, you do the shimmy while Tony tells your fortune. I'll be right back. Both girls were exchanging icy stares as I pulled up my coat collar and walked away. So far, I'd accomplished nothing, and the case was still as mixed up as a chef's salad. I called Max to see if he'd uncovered anything on the latest murder. Max, this is Rick. How are you coming on that circus murder? Oh, Rick, what a headache. Gets screwier every minute. Yeah, I know. The fortune teller hired me. Oh, well, then you know almost as much as I do. Uh, there's one new development, though. Well, don't be greedy, Grandpa. Shoot. And that's what someone else did last night. And a guy by the name of Leonardi. Leonardi. The guy Chuckles told me about. The one who liked Tony. Max filled in with the details... The killer had written a letter to Leonardi and told him to come to a hotel room in the city because Tony was sick and had been asking for him. Then the killer rigged up a gun trap so that when Leonardi opened the door, the gun would go off and kill him. Only Leonardi was still alive. The killer had made one mistake. I thanked Max and went back to Tony's tent, certain I could use that mistake to my advantage. Hello, Ray. Hey, where did little Miss Wigglehips go? I don't think she liked your leaving her. She went back to her trailer. Mm, good. Now, Tony, you told me that only three people were present at the party when Bruce asked you for the date. Are you certain of that? Why, yes. Just Samson, Chuckles, and Karen. They dropped in after the show, and we had coffee. Mm-hmm. Well, I want you to invite our three friends over again after the show tonight. Will you do that? Well, yes, but I don't understand. I went back to the girls' show and began my afternoon pitch. That evening, I went through it again, and then around midnight, I went to the party in Tony's tent. They were all three there when I entered. Sit over here, honey. Thanks, Karen. Hi, you weakling. Oh, please, Samson, I'm sensitive. <laughs> Say, you should have seen the matinee today. We did a bang-up routine, and the crowd ate it up. We did the old one, where we all pile into a car... You know, you... They were all relaxed, and I decided it was time to try my long shot. Chuckles was just finishing his story as I took a deep breath and crossed my fingers. Back, and then we all pile out of this little car. Oldest trick in the book, but they loved it. Uh, Chuckles, remember that guy you told me about the other day? I think his name was Leonardi. Sure, what about him? Well, nothing. I was just curious. Did you know him, Samson? Know him? Why, Leo and I used to room together where we worked here. Him and me is the best of buddies. And you, Karen, you said earlier that you knew him, right? Yeah, but I didn't think he was so great. He was nothing but a pest. Hey, you can't talk that way about my buddy. Oh, Samson, please. This is a party. Yeah, take it easy, Muscles. Now, let's see. You both knew Leonardi. That lets you out and leaves only Chuckles. You said earlier that you joined the show after Leonardi left, didn't you, Chuckles? Yeah. <laughs> Say, why all these questions about Leonardi? Because you tried to kill him last night. What? You thought there was something between Tony and him. What's this? <laughs> it's a joke, that's all. Yes, clown, but the joke's on you. You're the only one who didn't know Leonardi. 
The only one who would rig up a gun trap the way you did. What are you... What are you getting at? When Leonardi opened the door, the bullet went over his head. Oh, well, over his head? That's right. You rigged the trap to shoot a normal-sized man. You're the only one here who didn't know Leonardi, didn't know he was a midget. Well, you, you're kidding. <laughs> he, he's a midget? That's right. Still feel like laughing? Well, I, I, well, it, it, it's on me. <laughs> the joke's on me. <laughs> you tried to kill my little pal. And, and there wasn't anything between Tony and him, huh? <laughs> Just friends, like she said. <laughs> Oh, what a laugh, a midget. <laughs> Boy, you dirty... Take it easy, Samson. Little Leo's my pal. I'll kill this bum when he wakes up. Never mind, friend. That's the job for the state. And so, dear Helen, my life at the carnival ended and I have come back to you. Beaten, perhaps, but ready to continue my valiant fight against the forces of evil. Justice must prevail. Truth must march ahead to... Oh, Rick. Quiet, I'm auditioning for Portia Face's life. Rick. Hmm. Was that Karen person pretty? Mm Hmm. Mm-hmm. What kind of a dance did she do? Well, she started by, uh... And then she... Well... Oh. One of those. Mm Mm-hmm. Only more so. Well, I hope you enjoyed yourself. Helen, you're so thoughtful. Rick. Yes, baby? I wonder how I'd be doing that. Doing what? Helen, please. This is more your type. Sweet, lovely, sweeter than the roses in May. Sweet and lovely, heaven must have sent her my way. Skies above me never were as blue as her eyes. And she loves me, who would want a sweeter surprise? When she nestles in my arms so tenderly, there's a thrill that words cannot express. In my heart, a song of love is taunting me, melody haunting me, sweet and lovely, sweeter than the roses in May. And she loves me, there is nothing more I can say. So that's my type, is it? Come here. Mm, wow. Well. Oh, I guess a man's entitled to change his tune. Again, here's your Rexall family druggist. Tonight, I'd like to say a special word to users of mineral oil. I know that what you search for is one with an extra heavy body. Well, Rexall mineral oil is refined by a special process to obtain just that. And because it's so exceptionally pure and bland, Rexall mineral oil is non-irritating and non-habit forming. What's more, it's tasteless, odorless, colorless. Next time, try Rexall mineral oil. And remember, you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Good health to all from Rexall. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, stars Dick Powell in the title role and is written by Richard Carr with music composed and conducted by Frank Worth. Featured in tonight's cast were Virginia Gregg, Bill Johnstone, Wilms Herbert, Lucille Meredith, Parley Bear, Joe Duval, and Joe Gilbert. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. This is Bill Foreman inviting you to be with us next Wednesday at this time when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective.
Hi, you beautiful. Get lost, Bristlepuss. You need a shave. But I have shaved. What else do you want me to do? Silly boy, she wants you to go stag. Go stag? But why? Because stag is Rexall's exclusive line of men's good grooming aids. Like stag brushless shave cream. No fuss, no massage, just smooth it on and presto, you get a clean, close shave. Your face stays smooth and whiskerless all day long. I'll do it, I'll do it, I'll go stag. That's it. Join the stag line now at Rexall drugstores everywhere. Yes, to make girls care. Go stag. Wednesdays this fall, hear Groucho, Gildy, and the Halls of Ivy on NBC. The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. The people who make 76 gasoline and Triton motor oil, Union Oil Company, present... The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis. If some of you have wondered where Mike Shane has been during regular office hours the past few days, you'll find the answer on the front page of this evening's San Francisco papers. That's right, the murder trial of Jack Holmes. At this moment, which is along about 6.30, Phyllis Knight has one of those newspapers spread out on the desk before her. As she glares at the headlines, Mike is talking on the phone to Inspector Faraday. Yeah, Faraday, yeah, I just got back from court. Didn't take the jury long to decide. Less than two hours, Mike. That boy is no more guilty than I am. Sure, somebody killed the watchman, but not Jack Holmes. Now, don't take it so hard, Mike, just because his sweetheart hired you to investigate. All right, all right. Maybe I'm sentimental about those two kids, but I say Jack Holmes isn't the killer type. And with a nice girl like Janet Miley... Oh, Faraday, Faraday, I let him down, and Janet was so certain I could take help him. Take it easy, Mike. You did your best, but... The evidence was against you. Yeah, sure. If you're sure it was. Is that unusual? Why, I've cleared dozens of guys when it looked like... Janet, like... what's wrong? Hello. Hello, Mike. I'll talk to you later, Faraday. The girls just walked in. Janet, are you sick? You're white as a sheet. Here, get us some water, honey, quick. Yeah. Mr. Shane. Yes? Jackie. Yeah? Jackie. Oh, here, here, sit down, honey. Let me help you. Oh, the poor kid. She's all unstrung about the verdict. No, it's more than that. Her hands are like ice. He didn't do it. I just... Discovered what? the grocery. What? Janet, what are you trying to say, honey? My room. Somebody went through. Huh? Oh, oh, Janet. Here, here, Janet, drink this water. Janet. 12.15. I, I just discovered. I went and told him. I thought he would. Oh. Mike. Mike, she's fainted. I'm going to call a doctor. Phyllis. Yeah? Call Inspector Faraday. She's dead. Okay, Mike, I fixed it. We can go to Jack's cell now. All right, all right. Now remember, honey, not a word about Janet's death. Jack will go all to pieces and we'll learn nothing. I know, I know, but it seems so hard hearted. This way, kids. Ah, oh, boy. Sad business, eh? Guess the girl figured after that jury's verdict she didn't have anything left to live for. Suicide? Uh-uh. No, no. If Janet found something she thought would clear Jack, she certainly wouldn't take poison. Unless she took the poison before she got the information that would clear Jack. Hmm? No, then she would have called a doctor. If we can believe her dying words, she went first to some man, told him her discovery, then came to us. She didn't even know she was poisoned. All right, but who did it? We only knew what she was trying to tell us. Better pipe down. That's Jack's cell with a jailer standing outside. Oh, yes, sir. Now, let me do most of the talking. All right, Morrissey. Open it up. Yes, Inspector. Hello, Jack. Hello. How do you feel, Jack? Oh, top of the world. 
It's so cheering to be condemned to death for a crime you didn't commit. You had a fair trial, my boy. The jury could decide only on the evidence presented. I told them I left the warehouse that night way before it happened. At 12.15, I was at home. But no, they take the word of that cab driver. He did pick you up at the warehouse door, and he said the clock in the drugstore read a quarter past 12. I checked the clock myself the next day. It was an electric right on time. So did I, Jack. Unless the cab driver was lying, and he seemed like an honest guy. I see. Even my loyal detective, Mr. Shane, says I'm guilty. Oh, no. No, Jack, you don't understand. Go ahead. Say I killed the watchman. Say I stole the diamonds. You never were working for Janet and me. Yes, we were, Jack, and we still are. That's why we're here. It's about Janet. She's not so good. What? What are you trying to say? She came to the office a little while ago and tried to tell us something, some new evidence she had found, but, well, she got sick. What's wrong? Is she all right? Where is she? Now, easy, son, easy. She's still at the office. She said a lot of mixed-up things, Jack. Her room had been ransacked, something about a grocery that you weren't guilty, and she had discovered proof and told him so. Him? Who's him? Oh, that's what we don't know. Did, uh, uh, does Janet have any close men friends she might go to? Not that I know of. We've been engaged for almost a year now. She never mentioned any. Our boss, Mr. Phillips, is a good friend of both of us. Yes, yeah, he's paying the fee on the case. She might have gone to him, or maybe to his partner. Mr. Russell? Oh, no, not that old crap. Well, why come to me? Janet's the one to tell you. Well, as we said, Jack, she's all busted up over this thing, and she isn't well. Well, she can talk, can't she? She... Can't she? Jack. I can see it in your faces. Something's happened to her. What is it? Tell me. She's dead, isn't she? We're awfully sorry, son. See, you went out to my home, Mr. Shane. That's right, Mr. Phillips, and your wife told us you were working at the office this evening. Yes, Russell and I spent so many days in court on the trial. We had to work evenings to keep up with business. Well, I wouldn't imagine there'd be such a turnover in the wholesale jewelry line. You'd be surprised. Our firm cuts and mounts gems for at least half the better jewelry stores in the city. Then the robbery and loss of the diamonds didn't hurt your trade. It would have, Inspector, except for the capture and tile of Jack Holmes. Of course, we're covered by insurance. If you'll step into the office. Oh, Mr. Phillips. Mr. Phillips. Yes, Bauer? May I see you a moment, sir? Uh, yes. Excuse me, please. Uh, go right into the office. Okay. Sure. Thank you. Well, good evening, Mr. Russell. Miss Russell. Good evening. I uh, believe you and your sister know Inspector Faraday. Of course. Yes. How are you, Inspector? Fair enough, thanks. So the lady executives work nights around this company, too. If she's the treasurer, she does. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry to keep you waiting. And now, Mr. Shane, I suppose you'd like your fee, now that nothing more can be done for poor Jack. Well, I'd hardly bring Inspector Faraday along just to collect the check, Mr. Phillips. <laughs> well, I assume... The case is cracked wide open again. Janet Miley has just died. What? Janet? She was poisoned. She staggered into our office about an hour ago, gasped out a few words, and she died. I was afraid of this. Remember, Anne, I said to you, if the jury brought in a guilty it verdict... It wasn't was no... suicide, Mr. Russell. I said she was poisoned. Poisoned? Her dying words were that she'd found new evidence and that she had gone to him, some man, and told him. Well, of course, she came to me, but she didn't say anything about evidence. What time was this, Mr. Phillips? About six o'clock. She was crying and hysterical. Begged me to help Jack to get a retrial or an appeal. I tried to comfort her. Excuse me, Mr. Phillips, but I thought you'd like these invoices. Though. I'm very busy, Mr. Bauer. Oh, yes, sir. I'll leave them here on the desk. If Jim had found any new evidence, it'd hardly be likely to clear Jack Holmes. I'm pretty well convinced that young man is a born criminal. Mr. Russell, that's unfair. Is it? Look at the court testimony. Phillips and I found shorties in Jack's account books. We called him back to the office that night to explain he couldn't. Said he wanted to spend the night checking back through his records. Phillips and I left. Next thing we know, 1,300 carats worth of diamonds are missing... Night watchman's found dead. You never found the diamonds? Of course not. He hid them. I'm afraid it's true. The watchman's clock was smashed. It stopped at 12.10. The cab driver picked up Jack at 12.15. Uh, Mr. Bauer, would you mind leaving the room? Oh, oh, yes, sir. I'm sorry. He's new here. Bauer is the nosiest secretary I've ever hired. Bauer! Now I remember. Remember what? Well, 
I was in the outer office this evening. When Janet came out of this room, Bauer stopped her. I heard him say something about going out to a bar and having a little chat. I'm going to call him back. A bar, eh? Do you suppose the poison was slipped into a drink? Mr. Bauer! Oh, Mr. Bauer, hold on. Stop! Hey, Inspector, what? what's wrong? He's running for the front door! He's We'll return to Michael Shane and his adventures in just a moment. Week in and week out, a lot of motorists go along wondering why their engines lack power without realizing that much of their trouble may be due to dirty or worn-out spark plugs. Yes, that's right. Defective or worn spark plugs are to blame for a great deal of poor engine performance. For example, engineering tests show that faulty spark plugs can waste one tank full of gasoline out of every ten, which not only cuts down your mileage, but causes your engine to lose power. So, friends, if it's been 3,000 miles or more since your spark plugs were checked, or if your engine has been losing power, it's a pretty safe bet that the Union Oil Minuteman Spark Plug Service can do you some good. Union Oil Spark Plug Inspection is scientifically performed. The condition of each plug is carefully measured on a special machine, and you can see the results for yourself. If your plugs are dirty, the Minuteman will clean and adjust them. Or if new plugs are indicated, he can quickly install them. The cost of this service is only a few cents per plug, and you'll soon save that in extra mileage. You'll find Union Oil Minutemen ready to serve you wherever you see the sign of the big orange and blue 76. While Inspector Faraday hurries off in pursuit of the fleeing Secretary Bauer, Mike and Phyllis have set off on an errand of their own. And now in the hallway of a certain apartment house. Oh, here we are. 327. Oh, my skeleton key. Mike, that secretary, Bauer, he's tied into this somehow. Mm -hmm. Snooping around to hear what we said and then running from the inspector. Well, leave that problem to Faraday, you know. Wow. Well, the place looks all in order. Hey, wait a minute, honey. Her bed. It's not made up, it's cut to pieces. Yeah, the stuffing pulled out of the mattress. What on earth were they looking for? Let's go here, let me see. Oh, the bathroom. Mike, look at the medicine cabinet. And the floor. Uh-huh. Bottles and jars scattered all over the place. Oh, every one of them with his top or oh, this cold cream jar. Here, the cream's been scooped out and dropped all over the basin. Huh? Oh, that's an old trick, honey. Hiding gems in a woman's makeup. Mike, you don't think Jet. But she had the diamonds. Well, somebody thought so. Maybe she did. No. No, that guess that. That's too dizzy. Well, come on, let's check the other room again. Yeah, there's something worth looking into. A desk. Yeah, somebody else found it, too. Drawers yanked out, everything's a mess. Well, I doubt if there's anything left for us, but I'll double check. Still searching. No. No, just the usual stuff. Say, how about that wastebasket, honey? How about it? Here. Put huh? in my thumb and pulled out a plum. What a big girl am I? Yeah. A check torn in half. Mm -hmm. Paid to the order of Janet Miley. Two thousand dollars. And signed by... Well, I'll be a... Anne Elizabeth Russell. I think this note went with it, Mike. It's the same handwriting. Janet, take this and do as I say. And that's all. Take this and do as I say. Which apparently Janet did not... $2,000 is a rather expensive no thanks. Well, step this in your first thing. You were about to go places and ask questions. You know, if you ask me, Shut Miss Russell... Quiet. What? Hmm? So this is the door. Quick, snap off the lights. Yeah. I'll flatten against the wall. I'll jump him when he comes in. No, the light. All right, buddy. Come on, up with your hands. What? Let go of me, you dope. What? Faraday. You? Yeah, me. Oh, I thought you were chasing Bauer. Got away. I phoned Phillips for Bauer's home address. Turned out to be a gas station. Oh, a phony, eh? Well, we've got a lead that may be better. Come on, let's go. Give the doorbell another push, Mike. You know, I wish these people would stay put. First we go to their homes, but they're working at the office. Now they're not at the office, they're home. Somebody's coming now. Yes? Oh, it's you again. 
Don't strain your enthusiasm, Mr. Russell. May we come in? Uh, yes. Mr. Russell, we would like to talk to your sister. And? Oh, well, she's upstairs. Will you ask her to come down, please? Yes, if you'll go into the living room. And? Oh, Ann, will you come downstairs? May I ask what you people want? Oh, you'll hear it. Oh, by the way, sir, I believe your sister is treasurer of your company? She is. For how long? Six or seven years. How long was Janet Miley with your firm? Mm, several years. She worked in the same department with Jack Holmes. Look here, I insist on knowing what this is about. Alfred? Are you in here, Ann? Oh, so you're all back. Yes, these people say they want to talk to you, Ann. Phyllis, uh, give me that check and note. Ready and waiting. Miss Russell, would you look at this note and check, please? So Janet gave them to you. What did she tell you? Right now, I'm more interested in what you told her. What was Janet to do for your $2,000? Two thousand. And what's the meaning of this? I was merely trying to save you from yourself, brother dear. Save me? I've watched you for a long time, Alfred. What is... I saw the way you were mooning around Janet. I don't know what you're talking oh, about. Oh, don't you? I know you proposed marriage to the girl. And now with Jack out of the way, you thought she'd say yes. But I'm not going to have another woman in this organization. I have trouble enough as it is. That doesn't explain the $2,000, Miss Russell. Of course it does. I offered her the money to get out of town and not come back. And what right had you? You're not running my life. Well, this puts a new slant on everything. Could be that Russell wanted Jack out of the way so he could have a clear track with Janet. Mm -hmm. The diamond robbery might have been conveniently arranged. That's a lie. If Miss Russell didn't want her brother to marry Janet and the girl wouldn't buy off, then perhaps Big Sister thought of another way out. You mean the poison route, Phil? Well, how dare you? You, you, uh, 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 you mustn't. I know some naughty names, too. Oh, surely, Mr. Shane, you've got some brains. You don't believe such insane twaddle. Are you referring to my colleagues, Miss Russell, or to your story? No. It could be possible Ooh. you and your brother Alfred have been uh, putting on a little act for us. I'll answer that remark, Mr. Shane, but right now you're wanted on the phone. What? Oh, thanks. Hello? Mr. Shane, this is Power. Yeah? I've got to see you at once. What? Where are you? Listen. I have the real dope on the murder. Meet me at the old Dutch windmill in Golden Gate Park. What time? Let's see, it's just about 10 o'clock. Make it 10.30. And come alone. Don't tell anybody. Okay, Bauer. So it's Bauer. Where is he, Mike? Shh, quiet, Inspector. Well, Mr. Russell, I, I think we'll be running along. If we have any more questions, we'll be back. I'm sure you will. No, no, please. Don't bother to see us to the door. Mike, where are we going? Golden Gate Park. Bauer wants to talk to us secretly. A great secret with somebody listening on the line. What? Who's listening? Miss Ann Russell on the extension phone right in the hall here. What time is it, Mike? 10.28. Now keep back in the shadows with Faraday. Oh, this guy Bauer certainly picked a romantic spot to meet the old Dutch windmill in the loneliest corner of the park. Not to mention spooky. Look at those four huge veins above us, like the arms of a giant hovering over our heads. Oh, Angel, your poetry picks the doggondest times to bust loose. But I can't help it. I'm nervous. What time is it now? 10.29. I don't know. This may be a trap. Bauer may be after you, Mike. I don't like anything about that bird. I don't like anything about tonight, period. Psst. I see a light through the bushes. Car's coming around the turn. Got your gun, Mike? I'm all set. Now keep back in the shadows. This sounds like he's driving fast. What was that? Sounded like a gun. Why, Grandma Faraday, your nerves. Here he comes. Mike, he's passing you. Mike? Hey, Bauer! Bauer! He's skidding. Is he hurt? Is he can't, hurt badly? Can't tell yet. Open his shirt, Mike. What's well, a waste of time, Inspector? Look at the back of his head. Oh, guess I was right. We did hear a shot. But who would do it? Who knew he was coming here to talk? Oh, that phone call. Yeah, Ann Russell. Well, I guess there's no mystery about this killing. Hey, Faraday, here's his wallet. Maybe it will answer a few things for us. Let's see. 
scheme. Well, what is it? What is it? I'm old enough to be told. Mr. Bauer wasn't any ordinary secretary. He was an insurance detective. Planted in that office to find the missing diamonds. Well, then maybe he ransacked Janet's apartment. Yes, he did. It says so here in his pocket notebook. Search girl's room, no evidence, no jewels. Janet went in to see Phillips. Something's up. Took her to bar. Told me to check on mistake. 12.15. 12.15. Mike. Remember? Huh? Janet tried to tell us something about that. Twelve fifteen. That was when Jack was picked up by the taxi driver. Yes, according to the clock in the drugstore window. Inspector, let's telephone the coroner and then then what? Go take a good look at that clock. <laughs> Oh, this is a waste of time, Mike. I checked that clock the day after the robbery. So did we, Inspector, before the trial began. It's an electric. It keeps perfect time. It couldn't be wrong. Save your breath, pal. Mike's in another stubborn spell. Oh, the drugstore's closed for the night. Yeah, but there's the clock. You can read it a hundred feet away. Neon hands, neon numerals. Uh, it says 11.10. What time have you got, Faraday? 11.10. Now are you satisfied? Jack came out of the jewelry place two doors north of the drugstore. The taxi picked him up. The driver saw the clock in the window... The window. What are you staring at, Mike? The grocery store over there. Inspector, call a cab and get the driver who picked up Jack Holmes. In just a moment, we'll return to Mike and Phyllis. A few minutes ago, we mentioned some of the advantages of Union Oil's spark plug service. As a featured part of this service, the Minutemen also inspect your ignition cables. These cables are the small, fine wires which deliver electricity to the spark plugs. Normally, they give little trouble. But if anything happens to them, if they get broken or frayed, or if the insulation is damaged, even brand new spark plugs won't help your driving. In other words, a faulty ignition cable will leak electricity. And by the time the charge gets to the spark plug, there isn't enough juice left for the rich, full spark needed for complete combustion. So for a careful check and double check on your car's firepower, have a Union Oil Minuteman service your spark plugs and ignition cables. You'll get honest, accurate work, and you'll notice the increased power and snap from your engine as soon as you drive away. You'll find Union Oil Minutemen ready to serve you wherever you see the sign of the big orange and blue 76. It's a few minutes past midnight. At a lonely street corner in the commercial district, Mike, Phyllis, and Inspector Faraday are talking to a scared little taxi driver. Look, fellas, it's just like I said in court. I'm cruising along here and I see this guy. The inspector and I know that, Smitty. Now, we just want you to show us. Now, do exactly as you did that night. Yeah, cruise down the street and pretend you're picking up Jack Holmes. And we'll get in the back seat and ride along. Okay, okay. Climb in. Here, darling. Come in. Thank you. I turns this corner here, see? Mm-hmm. And I'm moseying along when I spot him crossing the street. He waves at me, so I slows down. I stops right about here. Jack was standing in the middle of the street. You opened the door. Which one? The right one. He climbs in and gives me the address. Well, go ahead. Open the door, Smitty. See, ain't you got no imagination? Now, Smitty, when did you see the clock? Right now, when I leans over to close the door. There it is in the window, see? All lit up with neons. Okay, look at it. What time does the clock say? Uh, gee, it's just like that night. 12.15. Mike, you were right. He made the same mistake all over again. Look at it again, Smitty. Look hard. Now, come on, look hard. What do you mean, look hard? The clock says, hey, there's something screwy. The numbers, they're backwards. Right, Smitty, right. You're not looking at the clock. You're looking at the reflection in the grocery store window. The real clock is across the street in the drugstore. The drugstore clock reads a quarter to 12, but the reflection looks like a quarter after 12. 30 minutes different, Smitty. Gee, I got a sworn. Say, I did swear you ain't going to pinch me, are you? No, Smitty. Now, are you willing to do something for us? Me? Yeah, sure. Anything, fellas. All right. We're going to pick up three passengers. And one of them is the murderer. Here we are, folks. 
Phillips. Here's the office. Right. Mr. Shane, I doubt we'll find anything in here that the police haven't already gone over. Well, they had the wrong slant, Mr. Phillips. You see, someone planned to steal those diamonds, but they needed a fall guy, Jack Holmes. So they faked the shortage in his account books. Then they called him that night, very indignant at discovering his dishonesty. Just a minute. I was the one who found him out. Shut up, Anne. Jack said he wanted to check back through his records. He didn't leave till a quarter to twelve. About midnight, the thief came here and stole the diamonds. The night watchman surprised the thief and was killed. Then the cab driver blundered about the drugstore clock and Jack was really on the spot. For the killer, it was a beautiful out. Janet discovered the mistake this afternoon. She told it to Bauer. He checked her story. When he discovered Janet was dead, he tried to tell me what Janet told him. That's why he was killed. Oh, that's rubbish. Bauer ran away from the inspector. Why? He must have had a reason. He had. He wasn't ready to talk yet. You see, there's one detail we didn't tell you people. Bauer was a detective himself. He was what? Oh, yes, yes. Hired by the insurance company to find those diamonds. You mean that he was... What? Do you think he found the diamonds? I'm sure he didn't. If we can step inside the office, Mr. Phillips, I'll show you why. Now, Bauer had a suspect, but it was the wrong one. He did know, however, that Jack was innocent. And uh, when he telephoned me, the same call you listened in on, Miss Russell, the killer knew he was trapped. Unless... I don't believe it. I didn't hear anything on that phone. Oh, oh, yes, you did, Miss Russell. You ought to have recognized it. Now, perhaps you will now. Mr. Shane, stop this cat and mouse business. Shh, please, please. That clock on the bookcase there, in five seconds, it's going to strike the hour. Now, listen. One, two, three. This is fantastic. Four. Well, distinctive chimes, aren't they? This is the same clock I heard strike while I was talking to Bauer on the phone. He called from this very room. There was only one man who knew where I was who could tell Bauer where to phone me. Mr. Phillips. Me? You're insane. Am I? Bauer told you Jack was innocent. You sat there in your chair and heard him say to meet me at the old Dutch windmill at 10.30. So you killed him. He trusted the wrong person, just as Janet did. She came to you, told you about the drugstore clock. You had to stop her tongue. You poured her a drink from this water jug in your desk with poison in the glass. You anything to say to that, Mr. Phillips? No. No, nothing. I thought not. All right, Inspector. Oh, come on in the house, kid. Huh? Mrs. Faraday will be glad to fix us some eggs and coffee. Oh, no, no, no. It's pretty late, Faraday. I think we all better get to bed. Look at Phil here. She's almost asleep. I am not. I was just thinking. How did you know, Mike, that the clock you heard over the phone was in Philip's office? Oh, I heard it the first time we went there, dear. It just took me a little while to get it placed in my memory. Oh. Clocks ran all through this case, didn't they? The watchman's clock stopped at 12.10. The drugstore clock that convicted poor Jack. The office clock that caught the murder. Yeah, sometimes a clock can tell more than the time of day. Oh, oh, Mike, that's corny. But hmm? I knew you'd say it. I was just waiting for it. Well, <laughs> I guess Michael's entitled to a little corn off the cob tonight. <laughs> that was neat thinking, my boy. A clock reflected in the window and the hands reversed by 30 minutes. Doubt if I'd have thought of it myself. Oh, Faraday, please, Mike's ego. Huh? Besides, I think I know why he's so leery of clocks lately. Mm -hmm. Oh, now listen here, honey, if you mean yes, Go on, please. Phil, let's have it. Well, no, Mike no. had a date with me for six o'clock, and he was an hour late. No, no, Angel, please, and no, no. And guess what his alibi was? What? He thought he saw a clock that said 5 p.m. It was a grocery scale with five pounds of potatoes in it. <laughs> <laughs> This is Mike Shane again. On June 4th, we come on the air one half hour earlier. Remember now, that's not next Monday night, but the Monday for following, June 4th. Tune in again next week at 8.30 for another adventure with Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis, with Joe Forte as Inspector Faraday. Tonight's story was written by Richard DeGraff and based on the character created by Brett Halliday. Music was composed and directed by Bernard Katz. This is John Lang saying goodnight for the people who make 76 gasoline 
and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System.